individual began to yell, scream, and spit at the officers. As officers attempted to restrain the individual, all parties fell to the ground where he, quote, continued to be noncompliant, which required officers to restrain the individual. The video has sparked an investigation from the Lehigh County District Attorney and the Allentown Police Department. The horrific killing of Army Specialist Vanessa Guillen has swept the country. In an interview with Telemundo, President Trump called it absolutely horrible. He will be briefed on her case today. NBC's Morgan Burrell was at Fort Hood where a massive memorial was held. As hundreds of cars, trucks and motorcycles piled into a massive football stadium parking lot. We want her to get the justice that she deserves. Nina Ramos, the event organizer, couldn't help but reflect on Vanessa Guillen's story. The 20-year-old Fort Hood soldier murdered on base by a fellow soldier, family attorneys say. Her remains discovered not far away, two months after she was reported missing. To see her mom standing there begging to bring her daughter home on American soil was just something that I couldn't imagine. It's a story that touched the lives of many here in Military City, USA, including Manuel and Frank Arevlo. We felt it was a tragedy and we felt compelled to be here to support as the parking spaces filled up, everyone raised their flags and held up signs demanding justice for Guillen, who allegedly confided to her family shortly before she disappeared she'd been sexually harassed on base. We're here in mass to support the military changing their policies to protect women a lot more. And as this convoy made its 13-mile journey from the city's west side to this memorial for Guillen on the south side, many thought about what they might say if Vanessa's family were here. We are behind their family, that we support them 100%, and that the community in San Antonio is with them. And thanks to Morgan for that report. One way to strike back into theaters, Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back was the number one movie of the weekend. And the last time it topped the weekend box office charts was in 1997. Without new movies hitting the big screen, drive-in theaters are resorting to classic films. From 1980 to now, sequels and prequels to Star Wars A New Hope have topped the weekend box office more than 40 times. If there's a time to rehash and go back and watch those, and especially That's for the kids right. who have never seen it, now's the time to do it with these classics. <laughs> Great way to introduce yeah. it to them. There you go. What's old is new again. Speaking of, a sealed copy of the Super Mario Brothers became the highest selling video game ever at auction on Friday with a winning bid of $114,000. Cartridge from 1985. Ah, that sound. Hear it? It's so Oh, just it brings back memories. Well, it was in its original ceiling and it went to an anonymous bidder at the Heritage Auctions event. It beat the previous auction record of $100,000 for a single video game, earning its spot as the most expensive game ever sold. You're so right. Once you hear that sound, it automatically <laughs> right? takes you there. A 23 year old Brazilian model is making history as the first openly transgender model to be featured in Sports Illustrated, their swimsuit edition. Her name is Valentina Sampaio and she was crowned the 2020 Rookie of the Year for the upcoming issue, which hits stands on July 21st. She also made history last year when she was hired by Victoria's Secret as the lingerie brand's first openly trans model. We'll be right back. We're back with a unique way some dads are bonding with their daughters. It is a chance to become a better role model, even if it means leaving their comfort zone a little bit. Here's NBC's Kate Snow. Get up to the middle. It's the beauty of ballet reimagined. In an unconventional class combining dance with yoga, creating a special connection between dads and daughters. Lifelong dancer Aaron Lee founded the Isha Pei Dance Arts Studio seven years ago in Philadelphia, but started this class just last year. Back then, it was a class in a studio, a special place for fathers and their little girls to bond and build character. Go to the front of dad. It's to really change the narrative of of fatherhood, of black fatherhood. Lift up and swirl up. And um, the role that they have in their daughter's lives. Here we go. Ready, Noah? Up to your child. Julian Myers goes with his six-year-old, Nola. Tell me what's different about this class, Julian. And it's all about just showing them that we're here to support you, we love you, real men do ballet. Especially dads. James Jackson is an essential worker delivering meals to those in need. When the pandemic hit and the classes went online, he and daughter Jay adjusted. It's like, now we got to do stuff in the living room, you know what I mean? Just to try to, you know, stay together. And, and now that we, you know, 
due to Zoom meetings and things like this, we can kind of still stay connected. And we're going to bring it up over our heads. And during these uncertain times, instructor Tamisha Anderson is helping these families make new memories. By having my dad there, he is right next to me, and he helps me, and he is doing the dances with me. What's fun about it? Um, because my daddy spin me around. How is your dad as a ballet dancer? He is a little bit good. <laughs> Still dancing despite the distance, but hoping for the day when they can all be in class together again. This is something that we'll never lose. Those daddy-daughter moments where, you know, she'll grow up and she's like, yeah, my dad did yoga with me. As I get older, I'll look back like, hey, you remember this? Our thanks to Kate for that report, and I can't wait for the recital where you see with the, yes. all the outfits that they're going to wear. It'll be the start of many father-daughter dances, oh. the wedding, the first father-daughter dance at the wedding, and then after that, the so first perfect. man these girls will ever love. Always be their hearts. Mm, love it. Wonderful. All right, sports and Hollywood celebs teed up in Lake Tahoe for a good cause. Among them, Patrick Mahomes, Steph Curry, Charles Barkley, Tony Romo, Jerry Rice, and Ray Romano. This year, former tennis pro Marty Fish took home the title. Proceeds will benefit social justice. COVID-19 and regional charities. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Breaking overnight, Kelly Preston, wife of actor John Travolta, has died after a two-year battle with breast cancer. Details just ahead. The Sunshine State overtakes New York by the thousands as Florida records the largest new number of cases for a single day, topping 15,000. And with those staggering numbers, the death toll is also on the rise. An explosion and massive fire on board a Navy ship in California. Sailors injured, smoke visible for miles. New details this morning on dangers at one of our most important bases. And the end of an era as Washington's NFL franchise will reportedly announce the end of the team's historic name and logo later today. A busy Monday ahead. Early today starts right now. Glad you're starting your week off with us. I'm Francis Rivera. And I'm Corey Coffin. We begin with some heartbreaking news out of Hollywood where actress Kelly Preston, also mother of two and wife of John Travolta, has died of breast cancer. She was known for roles in movies including Jerry Maguire, Jack Frost, and Battlefield Earth, and most recently opposite her husband in 2018's Gotti. Travolta delivered the devastating news in an Instagram post with a single photo of Kelly writing in part, quote, it is with a very heavy heart that I inform you that my beautiful wife Kelly has lost her two-year battle with breast cancer. She fought a courageous fight with the love and support of so many. Kelly's love and life will always be remembered. Travolta also said he'll be taking some time off to be with the couple's two children, daughter Ella, who is 20, and nine-year-old son Benjamin. In September 2019, Travolta and Preston celebrated their 28th wedding anniversary. According to a family representative who spoke to People magazine, Kelly chose to keep her fight private and had been undergoing medical treatment for some time, supported by her closest friends and family. Kelly Preston dead at the age of 57. At least 21 people are waking up in a California hospital this morning after they were injured in a fire aboard a military ship in San Diego. Officials say fire crews were called to the scene early Sunday morning after an apparent explosion at a three-alarm fire broke out on the USS Bonham Richard. NBC's Dan Shetterman has the latest on the investigation. It was before 9 a.m. when firefighters received the first of three alarms at Naval Base San Diego. We have an awful, there's a large amount of smoke. This is not going to be a good spot up here. An explosion and a fire on board the USS Bonhomme Richard sent clouds of smoke into the sky. Um, the fire was initially engaged by ship's company, and Naval Base San Diego activated their emergency operations center to alert level three. The Navy says 17 sailors and four civilians were sent to a local hospital with minor injuries. Hope for the best and uh, hope that they're okay. 160 sailors were on board the USS Bonhomme Richard. The Navy says all are safe and accounted for. An 1,800-foot perimeter has been established around the USS Bonhomme Richard and the surrounding buildings uh, on, on the base and been evacuated to ensure safety of personnel. The vessel is based in San Diego.
and was undergoing routine maintenance. The cause of the fire is not known. Dan Shenneman, NBC News. As the coronavirus continues spreading around much of the country, the U.S. has now recorded more than 3 million confirmed cases. Florida reported 15,300 new cases in just one day. It is the largest daily increase both for that state and for any state throughout this outbreak. Meanwhile, the former epicenter of the virus, New York City, reportedly zero deaths yesterday, a first in four months. But as infections rise in the South and West, our Aaron McLaughlin takes a look at what officials fear could be a rising death toll. Corey, across the country, we're seeing surging cases and a climbing death toll. Experts are worried this situation could get out of control. More than a thousand American lives reported lost this weekend and a grim warning from the White House task force. We do expect deaths to go up. If you have more cases, more hospitalizations, we do expect to see that over the next two or three weeks before this turns around. With at least 3.2 million cases and 135,000 dead, the White House testing czar insists America does not need to shut down again if 90 percent of people in hotspots wear masks. If we don't have that, we will not get control of the virus. But with no nationwide mask mandate, in some places, wearing one is still left up to individuals. People aren't taking it serious. I'm walking out and I see at least 10 people going in and they don't have masks on. In Texas, confirmed cases continue to climb. Nearly 6,000 reported. It is serious. It's not a hoax. It could drop on anyone at any time. And in Arizona, an alarming positivity rate, more than 120,000 confirmed cases. We are setting records of the type you don't want to set for the use of ventilators by COVID patients, acute care beds. Back in April, there was hope of a summer break from the virus. It dies very quickly with the sun. Now a distant memory as a heat wave hits some of the country's hot spots with temperatures forecasted to be as high as 115 degrees. I think the summer temperatures have actually made things worse in a lot of places because they've created uh, opportunities for people to be spending a lot of time indoors together. Hard hit Michigan now seeing an uptick in cases after hundreds attended July 4th lake parties. Several partygoers have since tested positive for the virus. Health officials say the parties were so packed, contact tracing's impossible. Meanwhile, at a nursing home in San Diego, an infectious disease control strike team tries to contain a massive outbreak. 11 residents have died, more than 100 others infected. As the virus spreads, so too does concern things will only get worse. We're heading towards large shutdowns. About half the country is either in deep trouble or going to be there soon unless they really ratchet things back. Experts say some states open too soon and too aggressively, opening restaurants and bars despite evidence that it wasn't safe. Corey? Okay, Aaron, thank you. Six months into the coronavirus pandemic, and President Trump finally wore a mask for the first time in public. He did so while visiting Walter Reed Medical Center this weekend. This is reports that the Trump administration is actively trying to discredit Dr. Anthony Fauci. For more, we go to NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Tracy Potts. Tracy, good morning. Hi, Francis. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. What we are seeing is a disconnect between what President Trump has been saying and what Dr. Fauci is saying about about the spread of this virus. It's been happening for a while, and now members of the Trump team are trying to discredit Dr. Fauci, the nation's top infectious disease expert, as a result of this disconnect. They're now saying that he's been simply wrong on some things and using some of his own words against him early on in the pandemic. In fact, even before the pandemic hit the United States, when Fauci said that coronavirus was not a major threat to the United States and people didn't need to be walking around wearing masks. That was actually before the first case was reported in the United States when the president was actually saying some similar things. But now because of this disconnect that's going on, uh, they're highlighting and downplaying uh, Dr. Fauci. As far as we know, he is still part of the coronavirus task force. But Fauci has said he saw the president a few weeks ago, but has not personally briefed him in two months. Francis? All right, Tracy, thank you. 
Police in Allentown, Pennsylvania are speaking out after a video has surfaced of an officer kneeling on a man as they were trying to arrest him. We want to warn you, this video may be disturbing. It shows three Allentown police officers hold down a man outside of a hospital. One officer uses his elbow on the man's neck. Well, he then uses his knee. Well, the police chief says during the incident that the individual began to yell, scream, and spit at the officers. As police attempted to restrain the individual, all parties fell to the ground ground where he continued to be non-compliant which required officers to restrain the individual. This video here has sparked an investigation from the Lehigh County District Attorney and the Allentown Police Department. All right, let's get a check now of our weather and how we're starting off the work week. Here's meteorologist Michelle Grossman. Great to see you, Michelle. So good to see you. And we are talking about heat all week long. We're seeing extreme temperatures in the south once again. A humongous area of high pressure. It's sort of like a heat pump just pumping in that heat from the south. Also the moisture from the ocean. So you factor that in. It's going to feel worse uh, than what it actually is. Right now we're looking at temperatures warm this morning. And as we go throughout the day, we're going to see temperatures right around 100 degrees in Houston. It's going to feel like 109. It's going to feel like 102 in Charleston and in Orlando, 94. Now with that heat. Also the trigger of a cold front. We're looking at the potential for some severe, even strong storms in the central and northern plains and into the upper Midwest. We're looking at damaging winds. Could see winds over 60 miles per hour, hail up to an inch, and also the risk for a few tornadoes. Otherwise, we're looking pretty good in the northeast, 86 degrees in New York. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. All right, my goodness, look at this pink on the map. We are looking at extreme and dangerous temperatures in the south, in the northeast. The story in New England will be some showers and also some thunderstorms. Not looking too bad in the mid-Atlantic. All right, that July heat is in full force. We're going to talk about that expanding to the east later on this week. Back to you guys. Mm -hmm. We're going to want to hear about that, Michelle. We'll check in with you later. Time now for today's quick hits. LeBron James has decided to forego the option of wearing a social justice-related statement on his jersey during the NBA restart. The Lakers star said, quote, it didn't really seriously resonate with my mission, my goal. After 110 years of aviation, the U.S. Navy has its first black female tactical jet pilot. Lieutenant Junior Grade Madeline Swingle is set to receive her wings of gold in a ceremony July 31st. Victoria Beckham's son, Brooklyn, announced his engagement to actress Nicola Peltz. The 21-year-old model shared the happy news on Instagram, saying, I'm the luckiest man in the world. Leading the news, Washington's NFL franchise reportedly plans to announce later this morning that they will change its team's name. The anticipated announcement comes after mounting pressure from sponsors and fans. The organization previously released a statement saying it would be undertaking a thorough review of the nickname due to its racial stereotypes. According to the Sports Business Journal, the team is not expected to reveal a new name until a later date. Meanwhile, the Atlanta Braves will not be following the same path. The organization said in an email to season ticket holders they will not be changing their nickname, but will also take a further look at the future of the Tomahawk Chop Cheer that's often done at games. The letter read in part, quote, through our conversations, changing the name of the Braves is not under consideration or deemed necessary. Now to a Telemundo exclusive. Our own Jose diaz Balart sat down with President Trump to talk about the COVID crisis and DACA and his pledge to help dreamers become U.S. citizens. So that's as an executive order, not as a congressional If bill. you look at the Supreme Court ruling, they gave the president tremendous powers when they said that you could take in, in this case, 700,000 or so people. Right. So they gave powers. Based on the powers that they gave, I'm going to be doing an immigration bill, one of the aspects of the bill that you'll be very happy with and that a lot of people will be, including me and a lot of Republicans, by the way, will be DACA. We'll give them a road to citizenship. When is this going to be? Uh, I would say over the next four weeks. After our interview aired, the White House put out a statement saying they were, quote, working on an executive order to establish a merit-based immigration system to further protect U.S. workers that would not include amnesty. I also asked him about the coronavirus surge in the South and West. You have called yourself a wartime president. Is the United States losing the war against COVID? No, we're winning the war, and we have areas that flamed up, and they're going to be uh, fine over a period of time. But unfortunately, we had this plague sent in from China. 
and it's a disgrace that they didn't stop it in China. They should have stopped it. I put the ban up. If we didn't put the ban, it would have been much worse. If we didn't do a closure, we would have had millions of deaths instead of where we are right now. But it's far too many. One is far too many. But our testing is far superior to anybody's. So we've now tested almost 45 million people, and that's helping greatly. But it flared up in areas where they thought it was ending, and that would be Florida, Texas, a couple of other places. And uh, they're going to have it under control very quickly. Mr. President, Vanessa Guillen, Army soldier, immigrant. Have you heard of her? I, I have, yes. Yes, I have. She was killed. That's right. She Very was in an Army base in, in Texas. Yeah. Is there uh, something that you could do to, to have more transparency in the way the armed forces investigate sexual harassment and sexual abuse? Well, we're going to look at that very... I saw that on the news the other day, and I thought it was terrible, and I gave specifically orders. I want to know everything about it. They're going to be reporting to me on Monday about it, and uh, I'll be able to release something to you at that time. I thought it was horrible. I thought it was absolutely horrible. And the president also says that executive order on immigration will come in the next few weeks. Our thanks to Jose diaz Blart for that report. Because we were Actress Jada Pinkett Smith confirmed that she dated singer August Alsina during a temporary split from her husband, Will Smith. She used her Red Table Talk platform on Facebook Watch to explain that a romance with Alsina happened during a difficult time in her marriage and that she and Smith were separated at the time. Smith also spoke up, saying, quote, to make mistakes without the fear of losing your family is critical. Will and Jada Pinkett Smith are married in 1997 and have two children together. During these trying times of COVID-19, people all over the world have found creative ways to spread joy to others. A man in New York has been using the power of laughter to lift spirits in his community by posting cringe-worthy dad jokes outside of his home. Reporter Mac Paddock from our affiliate at WETM has more. The sound of scissors gliding through paper. A stroke of the pen. These are the sounds Woody Latour hears every morning. It's the fun thing, and we've had so many responses. For the past 100 days, Woody's been lifting spirits on this heavenly street in Bath and across the country through the power of laughter. Honor down in South Carolina had this idea. She drove by this house in South Carolina, and she saw people have a joke of the day. She says, well, that's good, pretty cool. So she sent it to me, so I said, well, we can do that here. Woody's daily dad jokes reaching as far as Arizona through his Facebook page. We just need some positive stuff. It's just everything's negative. I guess we need a positive, uplifting theme or something like that, and this just does it. So. But I wanted to put Woody's dad joke skills to the test. How did the hamburger introduce his girlfriend? Meet Patty. Call a monster that likes to dance. I don't know, man. The boogeyman! Oh. <laughs> Our glass coffin's gonna be a success. Remains to be seen. Uh, knock, knock. Who's there? Boo. Boo who? Woody, don't get upset. I'm beating you in the dad <laughs> show contest, man. <laughs> you both did a great job, but I gotta give it to Matt. <laughs> Woody, I'm. <laughs> You don't look happy about that, Woody. What's going through your head right now? No, jeez. A oh, hundred days I've done this, and this is what I get. Ah, <laughs> uh, hang in there, Woody. We've got to check out all of those jokes on that Facebook page. That is so, so great. great to see, and classic, classic dad jokes. Oh there, yeah, right? we need that in our life yes, right now. <laughs> we do. All right, thanks to Matt from our affiliate for that report. All right, welcome back. Let's talk about the week ahead. We're talking about that extreme and dangerous, even record-breaking heat in the south. To the north, uh, the northern and central plains, we're looking at strong storms. The Storm Prediction Center has that area into the upper Midwest under the uh, threat for severe weather. In the east, we're looking pretty good in the mid-Atlantic. We're looking at the possibility for some showers and thunderstorms in New England. And of course, that Texas heat hangs on through midweek. That expands to the west. Back to you guys. All right, nice, Michelle. Thank you. That is the time of year when families normally hit the road for a summer vacation, but as the pandemic rages, many Americans are staying put, which has been devastating to resort communities. Here's NBC's Kevin Tibbles. In a typical summer, the Tommy Bartlett Show draws several hundred thousand tourists to its Wisconsin Dells Arena to bear witness to perilous water skiing feats. That was last season. This is now. 
facing social distancing restrictions, owner Tom Deal made the difficult decision to close this summer for the first time in the show's nearly 70 year history. Could you possibly open safely given the fact that our business model is based upon having 2,500 people in this amphitheater every single day for 110 straight days? And the answer was no, there was no way we could do it. Deal is one of several business owners in the Wisconsin Dells feeling pandemic pain this summer. The Dells is officially Wisconsin's top tourist destination and unofficially the nation's water park capital attracting 4 million tourists last year, who brought in nearly $2 billion. This year, the pandemic forced attractions to close for two months, and tourists have been slow to return. At the original Duck Boat Tour, ticket sales are down 40%. Noah's Ark, the nation's largest water park, reporting the same. For generations, tourism has been the city of Dell's lifeblood. Either you work in a resort or you own a resort. You know, everything we do here is tourism related. The city's put on hold plans to purchase two new police cars, a filter for the public pool, a generator for the community storm shelter, even new windows for the police station. To have a business and to watch that erode with something like COVID-19, boy, those are those are just tough things to swallow. When the pandemic hit, Mike Kaminsky, owner of Chula Vista Resort, was forced to furlough more than 400 employees. Since reopening, weekday business is down more than 60%, and convention and wedding bookings have plummeted. We're north of $15 million of lost revenue. Business owners worry a COVID spike or second wave could force more closures and put this water park capital underwater. I don't want to end this way, so we're going to give it everything we have to get open next year. For now, in this community known for rough waters, high hopes for smoother sailing in the months to come. Kevin Tibbles, NBC News, Wisconsin Dells, Wisconsin. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Breaking news overnight. John Travolta's wife of almost 30 years, Kelly Preston, has died after a battle with breast cancer at the age of 57. We've got the latest details, including a statement from Travolta. An explosion and massive fire on board a Navy ship in California. Sailors injured. Smoke visible for miles. Few details this morning on the dangers at one of our most important bases. The Sunshine State overtakes New York by the thousands as Florida records the largest number of cases for a single day, topping 15,000. And with those staggering numbers, the death toll is also on the rise. A massive show of support to honor Fort Hood soldier Vanessa Guillen, found murdered after her family says she complained of sexual harassment. Will justice be served? And we'll introduce you to the sanitation worker who dared to make his dream come true. A busy Monday ahead. Early today starts right now. And good morning to you. I'm Corey Coffin. Nice being with you. I'm Francis Rivera. We begin with breaking news. Hollywood has lost a star. Actress Kelly Preston and wife of John Travolta has lost her two-year private battle with breast cancer. And she kept that fight private. Travolta, her husband of 28 years, broke the news on Instagram in a heartbreaking post, writing in part, it is with a very heavy heart that I inform you that my beautiful wife Kelly has lost her two-year battle with breast cancer. She fought a courageous fight with the love and support of so many. Kelly's love and life will always be remembered. Travolta also said he will be taking some time off to be with a couple's two children, daughter Ella, who is 20, and nine-year-old son Benjamin. In September of 2019, Travolta and Preston celebrated their 28th wedding anniversary. According to a family representative who spoke to People magazine, Kelly chose to keep her fight private and had been undergoing medical treatment for some time, supported by her closest family and friends. Kelly Preston, dead at the age of 57. We turn now to San Diego, where emergency crews are investigating a fire aboard a military ship that left at least 21 people injured. Officials say firefighters were called out to the scene about 9 a.m. Sunday morning after an apparent explosion on the USS Bonham Richard. The three-alarm fire sent plumes of smoke pouring from the ship and into the sky as firefighters battled the flames. At a press conference, the commander of the Expeditionary Strike Group hinted at what may have caused the incident. There was a report of uh, an internal explosion 
Um, what we cannot ascertain is exactly what that explosion was caused from. Uh, initial reports is sort of a backdraft of, of an overpressurization um, as the compartment started heating up. Um, that caused a pressurization and that was sort of uh, what caused that explosion. About 160 sailors were on board that ship at the time of the fire. The entire crew was able to disembark and each sailor accounted for. 17 sailors and four civilians are being treated at local hospitals for non-life-threatening injuries, including smoke inhalation and heat exhaustion. The official cause is still under investigation. As the coronavirus pandemic spikes around the world, here in the States, Florida shatters a new record. The Sunshine State had the highest number of cases in a single day with more than 15,000 infections. Our Sam Brock is in Orlando with the latest. Francis, good morning. Florida didn't just smash its own record with those 15,300 cases. It smashed the record of any state in the country since the pandemic started with a single day of new COVID cases. Nonetheless, not a word so far in this state of the possibility of a lockdown or even a mandatory mask mandate throughout Florida. For a state already smashing COVID records, Florida soared into a new stratosphere, 15,300 cases. That's a lot of new cases? Wow, that's a lot. Of that number, I, it's a little bit ridiculous. Physicians sounding the alarm. People are dying. They're not just getting sick, they're dying. Our loved ones are dying. And you should care about those people that you're interacting with. Florida's fatalities this week, over 500. In Miami-Dade, hospitals are at 94% ICU capacity, with the mayor confirming six are now full. It's our ICU capacity that's uh, causing us concern. Mm. But again, like I said, we can crank up another 500. If the Sunshine State were its own country, it would rank fourth highest in the world for new COVID cases, behind the United States, Brazil, and India. Despite the explosion of infections, many rules remain unchanged. Masks are not required statewide, and Florida's beaches and businesses remain open. As you can see, they are doing temperature screenings as soon as you load off the boat dock. Even Disney World, back this weekend, the Evans family from California says conditions are not what you might expect. The capacity is very, very reduced. I mean, you can walk anywhere in the park and not bump into anybody. Signs of social distancing and cautious behavior, key to keeping this already spiraling crisis from deepening. What you're seeing across the state right now, on a scale of 1 to 10, how worried are you? On a scale of 10, I have to admit that I am on that 8 to 9 scale of worry. There isn't an infinite supply of physicians that can take care of COVID patients. As you digest the record numbers, it is important to point out that testing is part of the story here. Florida performing 140,000 tests, easily the most so far. Four days ago, the rate of those coming back positive was over 20 percent. Now, 13 and a half percent. Nonetheless, concerns that our hospitals and ERs could be overwhelmed. Francis, back to you. Sam, thank you. Six months into the coronavirus pandemic and President Trump finally wore a mask in public for the first time. He did so while visiting Walter Reed Medical Center this weekend. This is reports surface that the Trump administration is actively trying to discredit Dr. Anthony Fauci. For more on this, we head to NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Tracy Potts. Tracy, good morning. The dire warnings. Uh, they don't like these dire warnings that uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci has been giving. Uh, the White House uh, spokeswoman saying that Fauci has made mistakes. Another member of the coronavirus task force says uh, that he's gotten some things wrong. There has been a big disconnect between uh, some of those warnings from Dr. Fauci and President Trump uh, saying that we're doing great dealing with this virus. Fauci instead saying we could get to the point where we see 100,000 new cases a day. He has criticized some states for reopening too soon. And now the administration is trying to use some of its very early words against him before the first case was even uh, reported here in the United States when Fauci said coronavirus was not going to be a major threat. He is still, as far as we know, on the coronavirus task force, but he stayed in the background. In fact, uh, he's not commenting about this latest, uh, these latest efforts to discredit him. But Fauci did say that uh, last week that he had not briefed the president personally personally in the last two months. They're keeping him in the background. Back to you. Okay, Tracy, thank you. The horrific killing of Army Specialist Vanessa Guillen has swept the country. In an interview with Telemundo, President Trump called it absolutely horrible. He'll be briefed on her case today. Her death sparked renewed calls for a closer look at how the military handles claims of abuse and harassment. NBC's Kathy Park has the latest. 
A convoy of cars in San Antonio traveled 13 miles in honor of Army Specialist Vanessa Guillen. Her disappearance gaining national attention with protesters demanding justice. And now the Army Secretary is ordering an independent review of the command climate and culture at Fort Hood, adding we are saddened and deeply troubled by the loss of one of our own. Guillen was last seen on base April 22nd, setting off a surge with local law enforcement, fellow soldiers and military police. Investigators found the 20-year-old's remains in late June, not far from Fort Hood. According to a criminal complaint filed in federal court, Army Specialist Aaron Robinson, a suspect in her killing, died by suicide when confronted by police. Cecily Aguilar, a civilian, is accused of helping Robinson dispose of Guillen's body. The soldier's grieving family wants answers and accountability. My sister deserves justice. An attorney representing the family says Guillen told them before she vanished that she had been sexually harassed by a supervisor. The Army's criminal investigative organization said they had no credible report this happened. President Trump weighed in on the case during a one-on-one -on -one with Jose diaz Ballard. Is there uh, something that you could do to, to have more transparency in the way the armed forces investigate sexual harassment? and sexual abuse. They're going to be reporting to me on Monday about it. I thought it was horrible. Loved ones are fighting to keep Guillen's story alive. My family does not deserve this. Vanessa Guillen did not deserve this. Kathy Park, NBC News. All right, time to get a check of your Monday weather with meteorologist Michelle Grossman. Good morning, Michelle. Happy Monday. Good morning, Corey. Happy Monday to you. And it's going to be a hot one in the South. We've had that extreme heat in place last week. We're going to see it all this week, too, that area of high pressure fully in place. And it's really just like a heat pump that's going to pump that heat in. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of the temperatures, temperatures that you can expect today. We're looking at temperatures near 100 degrees, a lot of temperatures over 100 degrees in many spots. So Lubbock 108, Del Rio 111, Phoenix 113. You can look at the map, see those reds, uh, pinks, and let you know just how hot it's going to be. And you factor in the humidity, it's going to feel a lot hotter than that. So the extreme heat stays in place. Roswell 104 on Wednesday, Thursday 102. To. Even Tulsa, we're looking at temperatures in the upper 90s. You factor in the humidity, it's going to feel a lot hotter than that. Austin 103, Wednesday 100 degrees, 98 degrees um, there on Thursday. So in addition to the heat, we have that heat in place. We have the moisture in place. We're going to have a cold front. That will be the trigger for some storms in the upper Midwest, also northern and central plains. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. All right, look at those temperatures. Oh my goodness, it's extreme. We're going to see a lot of kitties in the pool today. Temperatures over 100 degrees in many spots. The Mid-Atlantic not looking bad today. Temperatures good, but some storms in the northeast. All right, that heat uh, expands to the east, including parts of New York, Mid-Atlantic, New England. So we'll talk more about that coming up. Okay, we'll want to hear about it. Thank you, Michelle. Crossing guards in one Florida county are ditching their classic whistles for a new device. Since guards have to now wear masks, the traditional blowing of a whistle to signal safe crossing is changing. Instead, they'll use a handheld device that makes a similar sound at the press of a button. The new tradition is supposed to prevent the spread of COVID-19 when it's time for kids to return to school. Very smart. I love that idea. Leading the news, the search for missing Glee actress Naya Rivera is expected to resume in Southern California this morning. On Sunday, authorities searched cabins in the area while boat crews continued to scan the murky waters of Lake Piru, where she disappeared last Wednesday. Investigators say Rivera likely drowned during a boating trip with her four-year-old son, who was found sleeping in his life jacket on the boat. Leading the news, Washington's NFL franchise reportedly plans to announce later this morning that they will change their team name. The anticipated announcement comes after mounting pressure from sponsors and fans. The organization previously released a statement saying it would be undertaking a thorough review of the nickname due to its racial stereotypes. According to the Sports Business Journal, the team is not expected to reveal a new name until a later date. Meanwhile, the Atlanta Braves will not be following the same path. The organization said in an email to season ticket holders they will not be changing their nickname but will take a further look at the future of the tomahawk chop cheer that's often done at games. The letter read in part, quote, 
through our conversations, changing the name of the Braves is not under consideration or deemed necessary. A 23-year-old Brazilian model has made history as the first openly transgender model to be featured in the high-profile Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition. Her name is Valentina Sampaio, and she was crowned the 2020 Rookie of the Year for the upcoming issue, which hits stands July 21st. She also made history last year when she was hired by Victoria's Secret as, a as the lingerie brand's first openly trans model. In today's quick hits, LeBron James has decided to forego the option of wearing a social justice related statement on his jersey during the NBA restart. The Lakers star said, quote, it didn't really seriously resonate with my mission, with my goal. After 110 years of aviation, the U.S. Navy has its first black female tactical jet pilot. Lieutenant Junior Grade Madeline Swegel is set to receive her wings of gold in a ceremony on July 31st. Congratulations to her and Victoria Beckham's son Brooklyn is engaged to actress Nicola Peltz. The 21-year-old model shared the happy news on Instagram writing, quote, I am the luckiest man in the world. Well, we have been talking a lot about the financial impact of COVID in our economy and retail has taken a huge hit. And along with that, malls. Once a mainstay of the American shopping experience, they are now on the brink of extinction. Here's NBC News and business and technology correspondent Jolene Kent. Lots of space in this mall. It's been a part of American culture and the economy for generations. But the future of the traditional mall more uncertain than ever, with the COVID crisis closing stores for months on end, and in some cases closing up for good. That's what happened at Metro Center Mall in Phoenix, going out of business last month after almost 50 years. We're really sad about it. I have a lot of childhood memories here. Came here every Saturday with my mom. Metro Center is the latest casualty in the retail apocalypse. Brick and mortar stores shutting permanently as online shopping becomes an even bigger part of the new normal. What has coronavirus done to the demise of malls? We could be talking about 400 malls that may not make it as a result of COVID because tenants don't have the ability. It's not that they don't want to pay their rent. They don't have the financial means. That's what ultimately forced legendary names like Brooks Brothers, J.C. Penney, Neiman Marcus and J. Crew to file for bankruptcy in the pandemic. And now experts say in this economic and health crisis, shoppers are spending more carefully than ever and avoiding malls and crowds. Coronavirus has also devastated multiplex movie theaters that are attached to malls. So many of them still closed or selling fewer tickets to maintain that social distancing, cutting off an important source of foot traffic for the mall. How does the movie theater factor change what happens for malls and their ability to survive? Well, that is the $10 million question. I think that the future of the movie theaters are going to be actually the biggest change in the mall. We've spoken to some landlords who are already thinking about how to reuse that space, but we have to think about it in a different way. If we don't, we're just kidding ourselves. That reinvention is already underway in Houston. This former Sears will soon become a new home for startups, academic research, apartments, and yes, some retail stores. Other ideas? Turn the sprawling spaces vacated by department stores into mini fulfillment centers, grocery stores, gyms, and dividing up the real estate for smaller stores that got their start online. Perhaps a new circle of life for retail as we know it. Jolene Kent, NBC News, Los Angeles. All right, welcome back on this Monday morning where we're going to talk about the heat that is still in place in the South. Dangerous, extreme heat, even record-breaking heat in parts of Texas. Now, with that heat in place, also the trigger of a cold front, we're going to see the potential for strong storms, even severe storms in the northern plains, the central plains, into the upper Midwest. As far as the East Coast goes, the mid-Atlantic looks good. It looks so that we're going to see showers and thunderstorms uh, in New England and also the trailing parts of Virginia and also the Carolinas. That storm risk moves to the east by Wednesday. So the Ohio Valley, you are in the uh, mix now and that will move to uh, the east to mid-Atlantic on Friday. Back to you guys. All right, Michelle, thank you. We are back with an inspiring story about never giving up. A former Maryland garbage collector reaching for a dream so many said couldn't be achieved and how he proved them all wrong. Here's NBC's Jose diaz Balart. I'm like really nervous about this one. It's the nail-biting moment going viral. Can you click it? 
the minute just before 24-year-old Rahan Staten found out whether or not he got into law school. All right, all right, I'm clicking it. Not just any law school, but his dream, Harvard. Congratulations! Tell me a little bit about that moment. It was just the greatest moment in my life. The greatest moment in a life marked by hardship. A mother gone when Rehan was just eight. Long bouts of illness for himself and his dad and his family's financial struggles. There were times where we just didn't have electricity. We didn't have food in, in the fridge. And concentrating in school was just the hardest thing to do. I mean, I didn't even see a place for me at school. Well, none of the colleges you, you applied to said yes to you. All of them said nope. But he never gave up, working for years collecting trash to help support his ailing father, even after finally getting accepted to college in Maryland. Sometimes you didn't even have time to kind of tidy up to go to school. Yes. The, that, was, that was pretty, more so embarrassing than anything else. Rahan's loved ones never gave up on him either. Cousin Dominic urging him to aim high. I've always wanted to see him succeed. Big brother Reggie putting his own college studies on hold, working in the waste industry, stepping up to help the family make ends meet. It, it wasn't about me. It was about making sure my brother made it to where he needed to be. And he's on path for that. Now, a mentor even setting up a GoFundMe site to help cover Rehan's tuition costs. Let's go! Everyone's hard work leading up to that fateful moment. When you see Harvard, what do you see? I, I literally just see my family. And like all of my accomplishments are an extension of their sacrifices. And that's just what comes to my mind. Like It's not like I'm going to Harvard. It's like we're going to Harvard. Like We, we are here. We finally did it. Thanks to Jose Diaz Villar for that story and the selflessness right across the board right there saying it's yeah. our victory. In the meantime, Rehan is helping other aspiring law students by offering free and low cost tutoring for them. Another example, he's like, this is for everybody else to benefit from, not just me. Incredible. Yeah, not just my family. I want to spread the love out. Yeah. What a bright future. How about this next one? Divers in the Florida Keys partied at an underwater music festival. The four hour long event featured mermaids on guitars, water centric songs. Of course, they had to include the theme song, The Little mermaid one person even had a sign that said wear a mask reminding partiers that they can go with the flow and stay safe you're watching nbc news now we've got some breaking news if they do go back to their jobs they want to make sure that they are protected it's news made for your streaming world live weekdays starting at 6 a.m eastern Breaking news overnight, Kelly Preston, wife of actor John Travolta, has died after a two-year battle with breast cancer. Late details just ahead. And developing overnight, new details surrounding the massive military ship fire in San Diego that left 21 injured. Florida setting a staggering new single-day record for COVID cases, topping 15,000. Hospitals overwhelmed and the White House continues its feud with Anthony Fauci. A massive show of support to honor Fort Hood soldier Vanessa Guillen, found murdered after her family says she complained of sexual harassment. Will justice be served? Plus, we'll take you to the daddy-daughter class that's helping these pairs build stronger bonds. It's Monday, July 13th. Early today starts right now. Good morning, I'm Corey Coffin. And I'm Francis Rivera. We begin with some breaking news out of Hollywood. Kelly Preston, actress and wife of actor John Travolta, has died of breast cancer, according to her husband, who announced the late news on Sunday on Instagram. In a heartbreaking post, Travolta wrote, in part, it is with a very heavy heart that I inform you that my beautiful wife, Kelly, has lost her two-year battle with breast cancer. She fought a courageous fight with the love and support of so many. Kelly's love and life will always be remembered. Travolta also said he will be taking some time off to be with the couple's two children, daughter Ella, who is 20, and nine-year-old son, Benjamin. According to a family representative who spoke to People magazine, Kelly chose to keep her fight private and had been undergoing medical treatment for some time, supported by her closest family and friends. Kelly starred in such movies as Jerry Maguire, Jack Frost, Battlefield Earth, and most recently, Opposite husband John Travolta in 2018's Gotti. Kelly Preston, dead at the age of 57. 
Well, it turned out to San Diego where emergency crews are investigating a fire aboard a military ship that left at least 21 people injured. Officials say firefighters were called out to the scene about 9 Sunday morning after an apparent explosion on the USS Bottom Richard. The three-alarm fire sent plumes of smoke pouring from the ship and into the sky as firefighters battled those flames. At a press conference, the commander of the expeditionary strike group hinted at what may have caused the incident. There was a report of uh, an internal explosion. Um, what we cannot ascertain is exactly what that explosion was caused from. Uh, initial reports is sort of a backdraft of, of an overpressurization um, as the compartment started heating up. Um, that caused a pressurization and that was sort of uh, what caused that explosion. 160 sailors were on board that ship at the time of the fire. The entire crew was able to disembark and each sailor accounted for. 17 sailors and four civilians are being treated at local hospitals for non-life-threatening injuries, including smoke inhalation and heat exhaustion. The official cause still under investigation. As the coronavirus pandemic spikes around the world, here in the states, Florida shatters a new record. The Sunshine State had the highest number of cases in a single day with more than 15,000 infections. Our Sam Brock is in Orlando with the latest. Francis, good morning. Florida didn't just smash its own record with those 15,300 cases. It smashed the record of any state in the country since the pandemic started with a single day of new COVID cases. Nonetheless, not a word so far in this state of the possibility of a lockdown or even a mandatory mask mandate throughout Florida. For a state already smashing COVID records, Florida soared into a new stratosphere, 15,300 cases. That's a lot of new cases? Wow, that's a lot. Of that number, I, it's a little bit ridiculous. Physicians sounding the alarm. People are dying. They're not just getting sick, they're dying. Our loved ones are dying. And you should care about those people that you're interacting with. Florida's fatalities this week, over 500. In Miami-Dade, hospitals are at 94% ICU capacity, with the mayor confirming six are now full. It's our ICU capacity that's uh, causing us concern. Mm. But again, like I said, we can crank up another 500. If the Sunshine State were its own country, it would rank fourth highest in the world for new COVID cases, behind the United States, Brazil, and India. Despite the explosion of infections, many rules remain unchanged. Masks are not required statewide, and Florida's beaches and businesses remain open. As you can see, they are doing temperature screenings as soon as you load off the boat dock. Even Disney World, back this weekend, the Evans family from California says conditions are not what you might expect. The capacity is very, very reduced. I mean, you can walk anywhere in the park and not bump into anybody. Signs of social distancing and cautious behavior, key to keeping this already spiraling crisis from deepening. What you're seeing across the state right now, on a scale of one to 10, how worried are you? On a scale of 10, I have to admit that I am on that eight to nine scale of worry. There isn't an infinite supply of physicians that can take care of COVID patients. As you digest the record numbers, it is important to point out that testing is part of the story here. Florida performing 140,000 tests, easily the most so far. Four days ago, the rate of those coming back positive was over 20 percent. Now, 13 and a half percent. Nonetheless, concerns that our hospitals and ERs could be overwhelmed. Francis, back to you. OK, Sam, thank you. Now to another battle in this country over face masks. As retail employees are forced to deal with growing verbal and even physical abuse from customers who refuse to follow the rules. Here's Ann Thompson. At Black and Brew Cafe in Lakeland, Florida, employees know how to make the perfect latte and now how to cool down the percolating issue of a local mask mandate. But what does it mean to be kind? When we're approaching a situation like this, what does it mean? Smiling face. <laughs> Empathy. How do they see your smile? Smiling eyes. Smiling, smiling eyes. Owner Chris MacArthur teaching his 50 employees at two locations conflict resolution. Now get to work. To avoid scenes like this. Anyone harassing me to wear a mask? You guys are violating federal law. As mask requirements push patients past the boiling point. Back off! Yes. Threat me again! with retail and How other workers taking leave? fire. Please leave. They're the ones that, that have to enforce this thing. They're the, going to be the ones that are, are having those tough conversations. Conversations MacArthur's employees say are easier with a strategy. 
One person came in, they said, hey, you know, my mask's in my car, can I just order a cup of coffee? We say, hey, we'd love to give you that coffee as soon as you grab that mask. Already working long hours and constantly exposed to the public, some argue frontline workers shouldn't have to be the mask police as well. Enforcement really belongs with local law enforcement. It, it is just simply unacceptable and unreasonable for that to fall to a retailer. There are plenty of signs at the Black and Brew and gentle reminders. There's always going to be like difficult customers and that's just how the service industry is, you know. And when those customers step out of line, just like the no shoes, no shirt, no service requirement, legal experts say the law sides with the business. And if a customer becomes violent, then the customer can be prosecuted for assault or other crimes, regardless of whether there's a mask mandate in place. But before it gets that far, this business hoping a smile and a kind word will make covering up easier to swallow. Ann Thompson, NBC News, New York. After being front and center with the White House Coronavirus Task Force, Dr. Anthony Fauci is being sidelined. Our Kelly O'Donnell has more. The White House writing its own new prescription for managing the pandemic crisis, a strategy to sideline the nation's top infectious disease expert, Dr. Anthony Fauci, reducing his public visibility. We are still knee deep in the first wave of this. Officials are quietly providing a list of Fauci's public comments and advice dating back several months to undermine his credibility. The White House pointed to Fauci's January predictions that coronavirus was not a major threat and likely had no asymptomatic spread. Officials offered this February right TV appearance. Moment. There is no need to change anything that you're doing on a day-by-day -day basis. Officials failed to note that Fauci's views were considered accurate at the time, but the science evolves. The effort to diminish him starts at the top. I disagree with him. You know, Dr. Fauci said don't wear masks, and now he says wear them. The president's head of coronavirus testing also undercut his colleague. I respect Dr. Fauci a lot, but Dr. Fauci is not 100 percent right. Dr. Fauci has served six presidents and was awarded the Medal of Freedom. His approval rating was 67 percent last month. The president in that same poll lagged behind at 26 percent approval. Their assessments about the crisis now often diverge. We have the greatest testing program in the world. I don't think you can say we're doing great. Dr. Fauci declined comment. This weekend, the president ultimately followed that mask advice, donning one for the first time in public Saturday. Of course, this White House strategy did not point out the many instances where the president has said false or misleading things about coronavirus over these many months. The document about Dr. Fauci had the appearance of opposition research that would be used in a political campaign against an opponent. Dr. Fauci remains a part of the coronavirus task force, and he's still on the job. Francis? Kelly, thank you. Some pretty big sports news this morning. Washington's NFL franchise plans to announce later this morning that they will make changes to their team name. The anticipated announcement comes after mounting pressure from sponsors and fans. The organization previously released a statement saying it would be undertaking a thorough review of the nickname due to its racial stereotypes. According to the Sports Business Journal, the team is not expected to reveal a new name until a later date. Meanwhile, the Atlanta Braves will not be following the same path. The organization said in an email to season ticket holders they will not be changing their nickname, but will take a further look at the future of the Tomahawk Chop, cheer often done at games. The letter read in part, quote, through our conversations, changing the name of the Braves is not under consideration or deemed necessary. Formula One star Lewis Hamilton took a dramatic stand after winning the Styrian Grand Prix. After clinching his first win of the season, the British racer raised his right fist in the black power salute as he got out of his car and also while standing in the podium. Hamilton also wore a Black Lives Matter t-shirt and then raced with a helmet printed with the BLM logo. All right, let's get a first check of your forecast this morning with Michelle Grossman. Good morning, Michelle. Good morning, guys. I'm so, so happy to be with you this morning. And we are talking all about the heat once again this morning. A huge high dome of high pressure in place, and that is pumping in that hot air today. So we are looking at another dangerous day of heat, an extreme heat, even record-breaking heat as we go throughout this Monday. Let's take a look at some of these temperatures. They are warm. We're over 100 degrees in many spots. You factor in that humidity 
humidity, though, that's where it gets real dangerous. We're looking at 109. That's what it's going to feel like in uh, Houston and 102 in Charleston. That's what it feels like temperature. And that's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. All right, we're looking at very hot temperatures in the south. Temperature at 107 in Lubbock, 106 to the north. Uh, the northeast, we're not looking too bad in terms of temperatures. We have a cold front that's going to bring some showers and storms to New England. All right, you guys, I know it's July. It's going to be hot, but it's going to get even hotter in the east, and we'll talk about more storms later on this week. Boy, we better enjoy it now. We got it. All right, Michelle, thank you. Walking for justice, an Alabama man has completed a 1,000-mile, 40-day trek from, from his home state of Minnesota, and it was all in the name of racial quality. 35-year-old business owner Terry Willis finished the trip on Sunday. He says he embarked on the journey to march for racial quality following the police killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and other African Americans. Leading the news, the search for missing Glee actress Naya Rivera is expected to resume in Southern California this morning. On Sunday, authorities searched cabins in the area, while boat crews continued to scan the murky waters of Lake Piru, where she disappeared last Wednesday. Investigators say Rivera likely drowned during a boating trip with her four-year-old son, who was found sleeping in his life jacket on the boat. Police in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania are speaking out after a video surfaced of an officer kneeling on a man as they were trying to arrest him. And a warning, the video may be disturbing. It shows three Allentown police officers holding down a man outside of a hospital. One officer uses his elbow on the man's neck, and then he uses his knee, but it is unclear if the knee is on the man's head or neck. The police chief says during the incident, the individual began to yell, scream, and spit at the officers. As officers attempted to restrain the individual, all parties fell to the ground where he, quote, continued to be noncompliant, which required officers to restrain the individual. The video has sparked an investigation from the Lehigh County District Attorney and the Allentown Police Department. The horrific killing of Army Specialist Vanessa Guillen has swept the country. In an interview with Telemundo, President Trump called it absolutely horrible. He will be briefed on her case today. NBC's Morgan Burrell was at Fort Hood where a massive memorial was held. As hundreds of cars, trucks, and motorcycles piled into a massive football stadium parking lot. We want her to get the justice that she deserves. Nina Ramos, the event organizer, couldn't help but reflect on Vanessa Guillen's story. The 20-year-old Fort Hood soldier murdered on base by a fellow soldier, family attorneys say. Her remains discovered not far away, two months after she was reported missing. To see her mom standing there begging to bring her daughter home on American soil was just something that I couldn't imagine. It's a story that touched the lives of many here in Military City USA, including Manuel and Frank Arevlo. We felt it was a tragedy and we felt compelled to be here to support. As the parking spaces filled up, everyone raised their flags and held up signs demanding justice for Guillen, who allegedly confided to her family shortly before she disappeared she'd been sexually harassed on base. We're here in mass to support the military changing their policies to protect women a lot more. And as this convoy made its 13-mile journey from the city's west side to this memorial for Guillen on the south side, many thought about what they might say if Vanessa's family were here. We are behind their family, that we support them 100%, and that the community in San Antonio is with them. And thanks to Morgan for that report. One way to strike back into theaters, Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back was the number one movie of the weekend. And the last time it topped the weekend box office charts was in 1997. Without new movies hitting the big screen, drive-in theaters are resorting to classic films. From 1980 to now, sequels and prequels to Star Wars A New Hope have topped the weekend box office more than 40 times. If there's a time to rehash and go back and watch those, and especially That's for the kids right. who have never seen it, now's the time to do it with these classics. <laughs> Great way to introduce yeah. it to them. There you go. What's old is new again. Speaking of, a sealed copy of the Super Mario Brothers became the highest selling video game ever at auction on Friday with a winning bid of $114,000. Cartridge from 1985. Ah, that sound. You can hear it. It's so 
so just, it brings back memories. Well, it was in its original ceiling and it went to an anonymous bidder at the Heritage Auctions event. It beat the previous auction record of $100,000 for a single video game, earning its spot as the most expensive game ever sold. You're so right. Once you hear that sound, it automatically <laughs> right? takes you there. A 23-year-old Brazilian model is making history as the first openly transgender model to be featured in Sports Illustrated, their swimsuit edition. Her name is Valentina Sampaio, and she was crowned the 2020 Rookie of the Year for the upcoming issue, which hits stands on July 21st. She also made history last year when she was hired by Victoria's Secret as the lingerie brand's first openly trans model. We'll be right back. We're back with a unique way some dads are bonding with their daughters. It is a chance to become a better role model, even if it means leaving their comfort zone a little bit. Here's NBC's Kate Snow. Get up to the middle. It's the beauty of ballet reimagined in an unconventional class combining dance with yoga, creating a special connection between dads and daughters. Lifelong dancer Aaron Lee founded the Isha Pei Dance Arts Studio seven years ago in Philadelphia, but started this class just last year. Back then, it was a class in a studio, a special place for fathers and their little girls to bond and build character. Go to the front of that. It's to really change the narrative of of fatherhood, of black fatherhood. Lift up and swim And um, the role that they have in their daughter's lives. Here we go. Ready, Noah? Up to your child. Julian Myers goes with his six-year-old, Nola. Tell me what's different about this class, Julian. And it's all about just showing them that we're here to support you, we love you, real men do ballet. Especially dads. James Jackson is an essential worker delivering meals to those in need. When the pandemic hit and the classes went online, he and daughter Jay adjusted. It's like, now we got to do stuff in the living room, you know what I mean? Just to try to, you know, stay together. And, and now that we, you know, do the Zoom meetings and things like this, we can kind of still stay connected. And we're going to bring it up over our heads. And during these uncertain times, instructor Tamisha Anderson is helping these families make new memories. By having my dad there, he is right next to me, and he helps me, and he is doing the dances with me. What's fun about it? Um, because my daddy spin me around. How was your dad as a ballet dancer? He is a little bit good. <laughs> Still dancing despite the distance, but hoping for the day when they can all be in class together again. This is something that we'll never lose. Those daddy-daughter moments where, you know, she'll grow up and she's like, yeah, my dad did yoga with me. As I get older, I'll look back like, hey, you remember this? Our thanks to Kate for that report. And I can't wait for the recital where you see with the, yes. all the outfits that they're going to wear. It'll be the start of many father-daughter dances, oh. the wedding, the first father-daughter dance at the wedding, and then after that, the so first perfect. man these girls will ever love. Always be their hearts. Mm, love it. Wonderful. All right, sports and Hollywood celebs teed up in Lake Tahoe for a good cause. Among them, Patrick Mahomes, Steph Curry, Charles Barkley, Tony Romo, Jerry Rice, and Ray Romano. This year, former tennis pro Marty Fish took home the title. Proceeds will benefit social justice. COVID-19 and regional charities. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Breaking overnight, Kelly Preston, wife of actor John Travolta, has died after a two-year battle with breast cancer. Details just ahead. The Sunshine State overtakes New York by the thousands as Florida records the largest new number of cases for a single day, topping 15,000. And with those staggering numbers, the death toll is also on the rise. An explosion and massive fire on board a Navy ship in California. Sailors injured, smoke visible for miles. New details this morning on dangers at one of our most important bases. And the end of an era as Washington's NFL franchise will reportedly announce the end of the team's historic name and logo later today. A busy Monday ahead. Early today starts right now.
Glad you're starting your week off with us. I'm Francis Rivera. And I'm Corey Coffin. We begin with some heartbreaking news out of Hollywood where actress Kelly Preston, also mother of two and wife of John Travolta, has died of breast cancer. She was known for roles in movies including Jerry Maguire, Jack Frost, and Battlefield Earth, and most recently opposite her husband in 2018's Gotti. Travolta delivered the devastating news in an Instagram post with a single photo of Kelly writing in part, quote, it is with a very heavy heart that I inform you that my beautiful wife Kelly has lost her two-year battle with breast cancer. She fought a courageous fight with the love and support of so many. Kelly's love and life will always be remembered. Travolta also said he'll be taking some time off to be with the couple's two children, daughter Ella, who is 20, and nine-year-old son Benjamin. In September 2019, Travolta and Preston celebrated their 28th wedding anniversary. According to a family representative who spoke to People magazine, Kelly chose to keep her fight private and had been undergoing medical treatment for some time, supported by her closest friends and family. Kelly Preston dead at the age of 57. At least 21 people are waking up in a California hospital this morning after they were injured in a fire aboard a military ship in San Diego. Officials say fire crews were called to the scene early Sunday morning after an apparent explosion at a three-alarm fire broke out on the USS Bonham Richard. NBC's Dan Shetterman has the latest on the investigation. It was before 9 a.m. when firefighters received the first of three alarms at Naval Base San Diego. We have an awful, there's a large amount of smoke. This is not going to be a good spot up here. An explosion and a fire on board the USS Bonhomme Richard sent clouds of smoke into the sky. Um, the fire was initially engaged by ship's company, and Naval Base San Diego activated their emergency operations center to alert level three. The Navy says 17 sailors and four civilians were sent to a local hospital with minor injuries. Hope for the best and uh, hope that they're okay. 160 sailors were on board the USS Bonhomme Richard. The Navy says all are safe and accounted for. An 1,800-foot perimeter has been established around the USS Bonhomme Richard and the surrounding buildings uh, on, on the base and been evacuated to ensure safety of personnel. The vessel is based in San Diego and was undergoing routine maintenance. The cause of the fire is not known. Dan Shenneman, NBC News. As the coronavirus continues spreading around much of the country, the U.S. has now recorded more than 3 million confirmed cases. Florida reported 15,300 new cases in just one day. It is the largest daily increase both for that state and for any state throughout this outbreak. Meanwhile, the former epicenter of the virus, New York City, reportedly zero deaths yesterday, a first in four months. But as infections rise in the South and West, our Aaron McLaughlin takes a look at what officials fear could be a rising death toll. Corey, across the country, we're seeing surging cases and a climbing death toll. Experts are worried this situation could get out of control. More than a thousand American lives reported lost this weekend and a grim warning from the White House task force. We do expect deaths to go up. If you have more cases, more hospitalizations, we do expect to see that over the next two or three weeks before this turns around. With at least 3.2 million cases and 135,000 dead, the White House testing czar insists America does not need to shut down again if 90 percent of people in hotspots wear masks. If we don't have that, we will not get control of the virus. But with no nationwide mask mandate, in some places, wearing one is still left up to individuals. People aren't taking it serious. I'm walking out and I see at least 10 people going in and they don't have masks on. In Texas, confirmed cases continue to climb. Nearly 6,000 reported. It is serious. It's not a hoax. It could drop on anyone at any time. And in Arizona, an alarming positivity rate, more than 120,000 confirmed cases. We are setting records of the type you don't want to set for the use of ventilators by COVID patients, acute care beds. Back in April, there was hope of a summer break from the virus. It dies very quickly with the sun. Now a distant memory as a heat wave hits some of the country's hot spots with temperatures forecasted to be as high as 115 degrees. I think the summer temperatures have actually made things worse in a lot of places because they've created uh, opportunities for people to be spending a lot of time indoors together. Hard hit Michigan now seeing an uptick in cases after hundreds attended July 4th lake parties. Several partygoers have since tested positive for the virus. Health officials say the parties were so packed, contact tracing's impossible. 
Meanwhile, at a nursing home in San Diego, an infectious disease control strike team tries to contain a massive outbreak. 11 residents have died, more than 100 others infected. As the virus spreads, so too does concern things will only get worse. We're heading towards large shutdowns. About half the country is either in deep trouble or going to be there soon unless they really ratchet things back. Experts say some states open too soon and too aggressively, opening restaurants and bars despite evidence that it wasn't safe. Corey? Okay, Aaron, thank you. Six months into the coronavirus pandemic, and President Trump finally wore a mask for the first time in public. He did so while visiting Walter Reed Medical Center this weekend. This is reports that the Trump administration is actively trying to discredit Dr. Anthony Fauci. For more, we go to NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Tracy Potts. Tracy, good morning. Hi, Francis. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. What we are seeing is a disconnect between what President Trump has been saying and what Dr. Fauci is saying about the spread of this virus. It's been happening for a while, and now members of the Trump team are trying to discredit Dr. Fauci, the nation's top infectious disease expert, as a result of this disconnect. They're now saying that he's been simply wrong on some things and using some of his own words against him early on in the pandemic. Pandemic. In fact, even before the pandemic hit the United States, when Fauci said that coronavirus was not a major threat to the United States and people didn't need to be walking around wearing masks. That was actually before the first case was reported in the United States when the president was actually saying some similar things. But now because of this disconnect that's going on, uh, they're highlighting and downplaying uh, Dr. Fauci. As far as we know, he is still part of the coronavirus task force, but Fauci has said he he saw the president a few weeks ago, but has not personally briefed him in two months. Francis? All right, Tracy, thank you. Police in Allentown, Pennsylvania, are speaking out after a video has surfaced of an officer kneeling on a man as they were trying to arrest him. We want to warn you, this video may be disturbing. It shows three Allentown police officers hold down a man outside of a hospital. One officer uses his elbow on the man's neck. Well, he then uses his knee. Well, the police chief says during the incident that the individual began to yell, scream, and spit at the officers. As police attempted to restrain the individual, all parties fell to the ground ground where he continued to be non-compliant which required officers to restrain the individual this video here has sparked an investigation from the lehigh county district attorney and the allentown police department all right let's get a check now of our weather and how we're starting off the work week here's meteorologist michelle grossman great to see you michelle so good to see you. And we are talking about heat all week long. We're seeing extreme temperatures in the south once again. A humongous area of high pressure. It's sort of like a heat pump just pumping in that heat from the south. Also the moisture from the ocean. So you factor that in. It's going to feel worse uh, than what it actually is. Right now we're looking at temperatures warm this morning. And as we go throughout the day, we're going to see temperatures right around 100 degrees in Houston. It's going to feel like 109. It's going to feel like 102 in Charleston and in Orlando, 94. Now with that heat. Also the trigger of a cold front. We're looking at the potential for some severe, even strong storms in the central and northern plains and into the upper Midwest. We're looking at damaging winds. Could see winds over 60 miles per hour, hail up to an inch, and also the risk for a few tornadoes. Otherwise, we're looking pretty good in the northeast, 86 degrees in New York. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. All right, my goodness, look at this pink on the map. We are looking at extreme and dangerous temperatures in the south, in the northeast. The story in New England will be some showers and also some thunderstorms. Not looking too bad in the mid-Atlantic. All right, that July heat is in full force. We're going to talk about that expanding to the east later on this week. Back to you guys. Mm -hmm. We're going to want to hear about that, Michelle. We'll check in with you later. Time now for today's quick hits. LeBron James has decided to forego the option of wearing a social justice-related statement on his jersey during the NBA restart. The Lakers star said, quote, it didn't really seriously resonate with my mission, my goal. After 110 years of aviation, the U.S. Navy has its first black female tactical jet pilot. Lieutenant Junior Grade Madeline Swingle is set to receive her Wings of Gold in a ceremony July 31st. Victoria Beckham's son, Brooklyn, announced his engagement to actress Nicola Peltz. The 21-year-old model shared the happy news on Instagram, saying, I'm the luckiest man in the world.
Leading the news, Washington's NFL franchise reportedly plans to announce later this morning that they will change its team's name. The anticipated announcement comes after mounting pressure from sponsors and fans. The organization previously released a statement saying it would be undertaking a thorough review of the nickname due to its racial stereotypes. According to the Sports Business Journal, the team is not expected to reveal a new name until a later date. Meanwhile, the Atlanta Braves will not be following the same path. The organization said in an email to season ticket holders they will not be changing their nickname, but will also take a further look at the future of the tomahawk chop cheer that's often done at games. The letter read in part, quote, through our conversations, changing the name of the Braves is not under consideration or deemed necessary. Now to a Telemundo exclusive. Our own Jose diaz Balart sat down with President Trump to talk about the COVID crisis and DACA and his pledge to help dreamers become U.S. citizens. So that's as an executive order, not as a congressional. If bill. you look at the Supreme Court ruling, they gave the president tremendous powers when they said that you could take in, in this case, 700,000 or so people. Right. So they gave powers based on the powers that they gave. I'm going to be doing an immigration bill. One of the aspects of the bill that you'll be very happy with and that a lot of people will be, including me and a lot of Republicans, by the way, will be DACA. We'll give them a road to citizenship. When is this going to be? Uh, I would done? say over the next four weeks. After our interview aired, the White House put out a statement saying they were, quote, working on an executive order to establish a merit-based immigration system to further protect U.S. workers that would not include amnesty. I also asked him about the coronavirus surge in the South and West. You have called yourself a wartime president. Is the United States losing the war against COVID? No, we're winning the war, and we have areas that flamed up, and they're going to be uh, fine over a period of time. But unfortunately, we had this plague sent in from China, and it's a disgrace that they didn't stop it in China. They should have stopped it. I put the ban up. If we didn't put the ban, it would have been much worse. If we didn't do a closure, we would have had millions of deaths instead of where we are right now. But it's far too many. One is far too many. But our testing is far superior to anybody. So we've now tested almost 45 million people, and that's helping greatly. But it flared up in areas where they thought it was ending, and that would be Florida, Texas, a couple of other places. And uh, they're going to have it under control very quickly. Mr. President, Vanessa Guillen, Army soldier, immigrant, have you heard of her? I, I have, yes. Yes, I have. She was killed. That's right. She Very was sad. in an army base in, in Texas. Yeah. Is there uh, something that you could do to, to have more transparency in the way the armed forces investigate sexual harassment and sexual abuse? Well, we're going to look at that very... I saw that on the news the other day, and I thought it was terrible, and I gave specifically orders. I want to know everything about it. They're going to be reporting to me on Monday about it, and uh, I'll be able to release something to you at that time. I thought it was horrible. I thought it was absolutely horrible. And the president also says that executive order on immigration will come in the next few weeks. Our thanks to Jose diaz Blart for that report. Because we were Actress Jada Pinkett Smith confirmed that she dated singer August Alsina during a temporary split from her husband, Will Smith. She used her Red Table Talk platform on Facebook Watch to explain that a romance with Alsina happened during a difficult time in her marriage and that she and Smith were separated at the time. Smith also spoke up, saying, quote, to make mistakes without the fear of losing your family is critical. Will and Jada Pinkett Smith are married in 1997 and have two children together. During these trying times of COVID-19, people all over the world have found creative ways to spread joy to others. A man in New York has been using the power of laughter to lift spirits in his community by posting cringe-worthy dad jokes outside of his home. Reporter Mac Paddock from our affiliate at WETM has more. The sound of scissors gliding through paper. A stroke of the pen. These are the sounds Woody Latour hears every morning. It's the fun thing, and we've had so many responses. For the past 100 days, Woody's been lifting spirits on this heavenly street in Bath and across the country through the power of laughter. Honor down in South Carolina had this idea. She drove by this house in South Carolina, and she saw people have a joke of the day. And she says, well, that's pretty cool. So she sent it to me, so I said, well, we can do that here. Woody's daily dad jokes reaching as far as Arizona through his Facebook page. We just need some positive stuff. It's just everything's negative. I guess we need a positive, uplifting theme or something like that, and this just does it. So. But I wanted to put Woody's dad joke skills to the test. 
How did the hamburger introduce his girlfriend? Meet Patty. Call a monster that likes to dance. I don't know, man. The Boogeyman! Oh. <laughs> Are glass coffins going to be a success? Remains to be seen. Uh, knock, knock. Who's there? Boo. Boo who? Well, you don't get upset I'm beating you in the dad <laughs> show contest, man. <laughs> you both did a great job, but I gotta give it to Matt. <laughs> Woody, I'm... <laughs> you don't look happy about that, Woody. What's going through your head right now? No, jeez. A uh, hundred days I've done this, and this is what I get. <laughs> uh, hang in there, Woody. We've got to check out all of those jokes on that Facebook page. That is so, so great. great to see. And classic, classic dad jokes. Oh, right yeah. Now, right? We need that in our life yes. right now. <laughs> we do. All right. Thanks to Matt from our affiliate for that report. All right, welcome back. Let's talk about the week ahead. We're talking about that extreme and dangerous, even record-breaking heat in the south. To the north, uh, the northern and central plains, we're looking at strong storms. The Storm Prediction Center has that area into the upper Midwest under the uh, threat for severe weather. In the east, we're looking pretty good in the mid-Atlantic. We're looking at the possibility for some showers and thunderstorms in New England. And of course, that Texas heat hangs on through midweek. That expands to the west. Back to you guys. All right, nice, Michelle. Thank you. That is the time of year when families normally hit the road for a summer vacation, but as the pandemic rages, many Americans are staying put, which has been devastating to resort communities. Here's NBC's Kevin Tibbles. In a typical summer, the Tommy Bartlett Show draws several hundred thousand tourists to its Wisconsin Dells Arena to bear witness to perilous water skiing feats. That was last season. This is now. Facing social distancing restrictions, owner Tom Deal made the difficult decision to close this summer for the first time in the show's nearly 70 year history. Could you possibly open safely given the fact that our business model is based upon having 2,500 people in this amphitheater every single day for 110 straight days? And the answer was no, there was no way we could do it. Deal is one of several business owners in the Wisconsin Dells feeling pandemic pain this summer. The Dells is officially Wisconsin's top tourist destination and unofficially the nation's water park capital, attracting 4 million tourists last year who brought in nearly $2 billion. This year, the pandemic forced attractions to close for two months and tourists have been slow to return. At the original duck boat tour, ticket sales are down 40 percent. Noah's Ark, the nation's largest water park, reporting the same. For generations, tourism has been the city of Dell's lifeblood. Either you work in a resort or you own a resort. You know, everything we do here is tourism related. The city's put on hold plans to purchase two new police cars, a filter for the public pool, a generator for the community storm shelter, even new windows for the police station. To have a business and to watch that erode with something like COVID-19, boy, those are, those are just tough things to swallow. When the pandemic hit, Mike Kaminsky, owner of Chula Vista Resort, was forced to furlough more than 400 employees. Since reopening, weekday business is down more than 60 percent and convention and wedding bookings have plummeted. We're north of $15 million of lost revenue. Business owners worry a COVID spike or second wave could force more closures and put this water park capital underwater. I don't want to end this way, so we're going to give it everything we have to get open next year. For now, in this community known for rough waters, high hopes for smoother sailing in the months to come. Kevin Tibbles, NBC News, Wisconsin Dells, Wisconsin. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Breaking news overnight. John Travolta's wife of almost 30 years, Kelly Preston, has died after a battle with breast cancer at the age of 57. We've got the latest details, including a statement from Travolta. An explosion and massive fire on board a Navy ship in California. Sailors injured. Smoke visible for miles. New details this morning on the dangers at one of our most important bases.
The Sunshine State overtakes New York by the thousands as Florida records the largest number of cases for a single day, topping 15,000. And with those staggering numbers, the death toll is also on the rise. A massive show of support to honor Fort Hood soldier Vanessa Guillen found murdered after her family says she complained of sexual harassment. Will justice be served? And we'll introduce you to the sanitation worker who dared to make his dream come true. A busy Monday ahead. Early today starts right now. And good morning to you. I'm Corey Coffin. Nice being with you. I'm Francis Rivera. We begin with breaking news. Hollywood has lost a star. Actress Kelly Preston and wife of John Travolta has lost her two-year private battle with breast cancer. She kept that fight private. Travolta, her husband of 28 years, broke the news on Instagram in a heartbreaking post, writing in part, it is with a very heavy heart that I inform you that my beautiful wife Kelly has lost her two-year battle with breast cancer. She fought a courageous fight with the love and support of so many. Kelly's love and life will always be remembered. Travolta also said he will be taking some time off to be with a couple's two children, daughter Ella, who is 20, and nine-year-old son Benjamin. In September of 2019, Travolta and Preston celebrated their 28th wedding anniversary. According to a family representative who spoke to People magazine, Kelly chose to keep her fight private and had been undergoing medical treatment for some time, supported by her closest family and friends. Kelly Preston, dead at the age of 57. We turn now to San Diego, where emergency crews are investigating a fire aboard a military ship that left at least 21 people injured. Officials say firefighters were called out to the scene about 9 a.m. Sunday morning after an apparent explosion on the USS Bonham Richard. The three-alarm fire sent plumes of smoke pouring from the ship and into the sky as firefighters battled the flames. At a press conference, the commander of the Expeditionary Strike Group hinted at what may have caused the incident. There was a report of uh, an internal explosion. Um, what we cannot ascertain is exactly what that explosion was caused from. Uh, initial reports is sort of a backdraft of, of an overpressurization um, as the compartment started heating up. Um, that caused a pressurization and that was sort of uh, what caused that explosion. About 160 sailors were on board that ship at the time of the fire. The entire crew was able to disembark and each sailor accounted for. 17 sailors and four civilians are being treated at local hospitals for non-life-threatening injuries, including smoke inhalation and heat exhaustion. The official cause is still under investigation. As the coronavirus pandemic spikes around the world, here at the States, Florida shatters a new record. The Sunshine State had the highest number of cases in a single day with more than 15,000 infections. Our Sam Brock is in Orlando with the latest. Francis, good morning. Florida didn't just smash its own record with those 15,300 cases. It smashed the record of any state in the country since the pandemic started with a single day of new COVID cases. Nonetheless, not a word so far in this state of the possibility of a lockdown or even a mandatory mask mandate throughout Florida. For a state already smashing COVID records, Florida soared into a new stratosphere, 15,300 cases. That's a lot of new cases? Wow, that's a lot. Of that number, I, it's a little bit ridiculous. Physicians sounding the alarm. People are dying. They're not just getting sick, they're dying. Our loved ones are dying. And you should care about those people that you're interacting with. Florida's fatalities this week, over 500. In Miami-Dade, hospitals are at 94% ICU capacity, with the mayor confirming six are now full. It's our ICU capacity that's uh, causing us concern. Mm. But again, like I said, we can crank up another 500. If the Sunshine State were its own country, it would rank fourth highest in the world for new COVID cases behind the United States, Brazil and India. Despite the explosion of infections, many rules remain unchanged. Masks are not required statewide and Florida's beaches and businesses remain open. As you can see, they are doing temperature screenings as soon as you load off the boat dock. Even Disney World, back this weekend, the Evans family from California says conditions are not what you might expect. The capacity is very, very reduced. I mean, you can walk anywhere in the park and not bump into anybody. Signs of social distancing and cautious behavior, key to keeping this already spiraling crisis from deepening. What you're seeing across the state right now, on a scale of 1 to 10, how worried are you? On a scale of 10, I have to admit that I am on that 8 to 9 scale of worry. There isn't an infinite supply of physicians that can take care of COVID patients. 
As you digest the record numbers, it is important to point out that testing is part of the story here. Florida performing 140,000 tests, easily the most so far. Four days ago, the rate of those coming back positive was over 20 percent. Now, 13 and a half percent. Nonetheless, concerns that our hospitals and ERs could be overwhelmed. Francis, back to you. Sam, thank you. Six months into the coronavirus pandemic and President Trump finally wore a mask in public for the first time. He did so while visiting Walter Reed Medical Center this weekend. This is reports surface that the Trump administration is actively trying to discredit Dr. Anthony Fauci. For more on this, we head to NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Tracy Potts. Tracy, good morning. The dire warnings. Uh, they don't like these dire warnings that uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci has been giving. Uh, the White House uh, spokeswoman saying that Fauci has made mistakes. Another member of the coronavirus task force says uh, that he's gotten some things wrong. There has been a big disconnect between uh, some of those warnings from Dr. Fauci and President Trump uh, saying that we're doing great dealing with this virus. Fauci instead saying we could get to the point where we see 100,000 new cases a day. He has criticized some states for reopening too soon. And now the administration is trying to use some of its very early words against him before the first case was even uh, reported here in the United States when Fauci said coronavirus was not going to be a major threat. He is still, as far as we know, on the coronavirus task force, but he stayed in the background. In fact, uh, he's not commenting about this latest, uh, these latest efforts to discredit him. But Fauci did say that uh, last week that he had not briefed the president personally personally in the last two months. They're keeping him in the background. Back to you. Okay, Tracy, thank you. The horrific killing of Army Specialist Vanessa Guillen has swept the country. In an interview with Telemundo, President Trump called it absolutely horrible. He'll be briefed on her case today. Her death sparked renewed calls for a closer look at how the military handles claims of abuse and harassment. NBC's Kathy Park has the latest. A convoy of cars in San Antonio traveled 13 miles in honor of Army Specialist Vanessa Guillen. Her disappearance gaining national attention with protesters demanding justice. And now the Army Secretary is ordering an independent review of the command climate and culture at Fort Hood, adding we are saddened and deeply troubled by the loss of one of our own. Guillen was last seen on base April 22nd, setting off a surge with local law enforcement, fellow soldiers and military police. Investigators found the 20-year-old's remains late June, not far from Fort Hood. According to a criminal complaint filed in federal court, Army Specialist Aaron Robinson, a suspect in her killing, died by suicide when confronted by police. Cecily Aguilar, a civilian, is accused of helping Robinson dispose of Guillen's body. The soldier's grieving family wants answers and accountability. My sister deserves justice. An attorney representing the family says Guillen told them before she vanished that she had been sexually harassed by a supervisor. The Army's criminal investigative organization said they had no credible report this happened. President Trump weighed in on the case during a one-on-one -on -one with Jose diaz Ballard. Is there uh, something that you could do to, to have more transparency in the way the armed forces investigate sexual harassment? and sexual abuse. They're going to be reporting to me on Monday about it. I thought it was horrible. Loved ones are fighting to keep Guillen's story alive. My family does not deserve this. Vanessa Guillen did not deserve this. Kathy Park, NBC News. All right, time to get a check of your Monday weather with meteorologist Michelle Grossman. Good morning, Michelle. Happy Monday. Good morning, Corey. Happy Monday to you. And it's going to be a hot one in the South. We've had that extreme heat in place last week. We're going to see it all this week, too, that area of high pressure fully in place. And it's really just like a heat pump that's going to pump that heat in. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of the temperatures, temperatures that you can expect today. We're looking at temperatures near 100 degrees, a lot of temperatures over 100 degrees in many spots. So Lubbock 108, Del Rio 111, Phoenix 113. You can look at the map, see those reds, uh, pinks, and let you know just how hot it's going to be. And you factor in the humidity, it's going to feel a lot hotter than that. So the extreme heat stays in place. Roswell 104 on Wednesday, Thursday 102. 
or two. Even Tulsa, we're looking at temperatures in the upper 90s. You factor in the humidity, it's going to feel a lot hotter than that. Austin 103, Wednesday 100 degrees, 98 degrees um, there on Thursday. So in addition to the heat, we have that heat in place. We have the moisture in place. We're going to have a cold front. That will be the trigger for some storms in the upper Midwest, also northern and central plains. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. All right, look at those temperatures. Oh my goodness, it's extreme. We're going to see a lot of kitties in the pool today. Temperatures over 100 degrees in many spots. The Mid-Atlantic not looking bad today. Temperatures good, but some storms in the northeast. All right, that heat uh, expands to the east, including parts of New York, Mid-Atlantic, New England. So we'll talk more about that coming up. Okay, we'll want to hear about it. Thank you, Michelle. Crossing guards in one Florida county are ditching their classic whistles for a new device. Since guards have to now wear masks, the traditional blowing of a whistle to signal safe crossing is changing. Instead, they'll use a handheld device that makes a similar sound at the press of a button. The new tradition is supposed to prevent the spread of COVID-19 when it's time for kids to return to school. Very smart. I love that idea. Leading the news, the search for missing Glee actress Naya Rivera is expected to resume in Southern California this morning. On Sunday, authorities searched cabins in the area while boat crews continued to scan the murky waters of Lake Piru, where she disappeared last Wednesday. Investigators say Rivera likely drowned during a boating trip with her four-year-old son, who was found sleeping in his life jacket on the boat. Leading the news, Washington's NFL franchise reportedly plans to announce later this morning that they will change their team name. The anticipated announcement comes after mounting pressure from sponsors and fans. The organization previously released a statement saying it would be undertaking a thorough review of the nickname due to its racial stereotypes. According to the Sports Business Journal, the team is not expected to reveal a new name until a later date. Meanwhile, the Atlanta Braves will not be following the same path. The organization said in an email to season ticket holders they will not be changing their nickname but will take a further look at the future of the tomahawk chop cheer that's often done at games. The letter read in part, quote, through our conversations, changing the name of the Braves is not under consideration or deemed necessary. A 23-year-old Brazilian model has made history as the first openly transgender model to be featured in the high-profile Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition. Her name is Valentina Sampaio, and she was crowned the 2020 Rookie of the Year for the upcoming issue, which hit stands July 21st. She also made history last year when she was hired by Victoria's Secret as, a as the lingerie brand's first openly trans model. In today's quick hits, LeBron James has decided to forego the option of wearing a social justice related statement on his jersey during the NBA restart. The Lakers star said, quote, it didn't really seriously resonate with my mission, with my goal. After 110 years of aviation, the U.S. Navy has its first black female tactical jet pilot. Lieutenant junior grade Madeline Swegel is set to receive her wings of gold in a ceremony on July 31st. Congratulations to her and Victoria Beckham's son Brooklyn is engaged to actress Nicola Peltz. The 21-year-old model shared the happy news on Instagram writing, quote, I am the luckiest man in the world. Well, we have been talking a lot about the financial impact of COVID in our economy and retail has taken a huge hit. And along with that, malls. Once a mainstay of the American shopping experience, they are now on the brink of extinction. Here's NBC News and business and technology correspondent Jolene Kent. Lots of space in this mall. It's been a part of American culture and the economy for generations. But the future of the traditional mall more uncertain than ever, with the COVID crisis closing stores for months on end, and in some cases closing up for good. That's what happened at Metro Center Mall in Phoenix, going out of business last month after almost 50 years. We're really sad about it. I have a lot of childhood memories here. Came here every Saturday with my mom. Metro Center is the latest casualty in the retail apocalypse. Brick and mortar stores shutting permanently as online shopping becomes an even bigger part of the new normal. What has coronavirus done to the demise of malls? We could be talking about 400 malls that may not make it as a result of COVID because 
Tenants don't have the ability. It's not that they don't want to pay their rent. They don't have the financial means. That's what ultimately forced legendary names like Brooks Brothers, J.C. Penney, Neiman Marcus, and J. Crew to file for bankruptcy in the pandemic. And now experts say in this economic and health crisis, shoppers are spending more carefully than ever and avoiding malls and crowds. Coronavirus has also devastated multiplex movie theaters that are attached to malls. So many of them still closed or selling fewer tickets to maintain that social distancing, cutting off an important source of foot traffic for the mall. How does the movie theater factor change what happens for malls and their ability to survive? Well, that is the $10 million question. I think that the future of the movie theaters are going to be actually the biggest change in the mall. We've spoken to some landlords who are already thinking about how to reuse that space, but we have to think about it in a different way. If we don't, we're just kidding ourselves. That reinvention is already underway in Houston. This former Sears will soon become a new home for startups, academic research, apartments, and yes, some retail stores. Other ideas? Turn the sprawling spaces vacated by department stores into mini fulfillment centers, grocery stores, gyms, and dividing up the real estate for smaller stores that got their start online. Perhaps a new circle of life for retail as we know it. Jolene Kent, NBC News, Los Angeles. All right, welcome back on this Monday morning where we're going to talk about the heat that is still in place in the South, dangerous extreme heat, even record-breaking heat in parts of Texas. Now, with that heat in place, also the trigger of a cold front, we're going to see the potential for strong storms, even severe storms in the northern plains and central plains into the upper Midwest. As far as the East Coast goes, the mid-Atlantic looks good. It looks so that we're going to see showers and thunderstorms uh, in New England and also the trailing parts of Virginia and also the Carolinas. That storm risk moves to the east by Wednesday. So the Ohio Valley, you are in the uh, mix now and that will move to uh, the east to mid-Atlantic on Friday. Back to you guys. All right, Michelle, thank you. We are back with an inspiring story about never giving up. A former Maryland garbage collector reaching for a dream so many said couldn't be achieved and how he proved them all wrong. Here's NBC's Jose diaz Balart. I'm like really nervous about this one. It's the nail-biting moment going viral. Can you click it? The minute just before 24-year-old Rahan Staten found out whether or not he got into law school. All right, all right, I'm clicking it. Not just any law school, but his dream, Harvard. Congratulations! Oh. Tell me a little bit about that moment. It was just the greatest moment in my life. The greatest moment in a life marked by hardship. A mother gone when Rahan was just eight. Long bouts of illness for himself and his dad and his family's financial struggles. There were times where we just didn't have electricity. We didn't have food in in the fridge. And concentrating in school was just the hardest thing to do. I mean, I didn't even see a place for me at school. Well, none of the colleges you, you applied to said yes to you. All of them said nope. But he never gave up, working for years collecting trash to help support his ailing father, even after finally getting accepted to college in Maryland. Sometimes you didn't even have time to kind of tidy up to go to school. Yes. The, that, was, that was pretty, more so embarrassing than anything else. Rahan's loved ones never gave up on him either. Cousin Dominic urging him to aim high. I've always wanted to see him succeed. Big brother Reggie putting his own college studies on hold, working in the waste industry, stepping up to help the family make ends meet. It it wasn't about me. It was about making sure my brother made it to where he needed to be. And he's on path for that. Now, a mentor even setting up a GoFundMe site to help cover Rehan's tuition costs. Let's go! Everyone's hard work leading up to that fateful moment. When you see Harvard, what do you see? I, I literally just see my family. And like all of my accomplishments are an extension of their sacrifices. And that's just what comes to my mind. Like It's not like I'm going to Harvard. It's like we're going to Harvard. Like We, we are here. We finally did it. Thanks to Jose diaz Balar for that story. And the selflessness right across the board right there saying it's yeah. our victory. In the meantime, Rehan is helping other aspiring law students by offering free and low-cost tutoring for them. Another example, he's like, this is for everybody else to benefit from, not just me. Incredible. Yeah, not just my family. I want to spread the love out. Yeah. What a bright future. How about this next one? Divers in the Florida Keys partied at an underwater music festival. The four-hour-long event featured mermaids on guitars, water-centric songs. Of course, they had to include the theme song, The Little 
Little Mermaid. One person even had a sign that said wear a mask, reminding partiers that they can go with the flow and stay safe. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Breaking news overnight. Kelly Preston, wife of actor John Travolta, has died after a two-year battle with breast cancer. Late details just ahead. And developing overnight, new details surrounding the massive military ship fire in San Diego that left 21 injured. Florida setting a staggering new single-day record for COVID cases, topping 15,000. Hospitals overwhelmed, and the White House continues its feud with Anthony Fauci. A massive show of support to honor Fort Hood soldier Vanessa Guillen, found murdered after her family says she complained of sexual harassment. Will justice be served? Plus, we'll take you to the daddy-daughter class that's helping these pairs build stronger bonds. It's Monday, July 13th. Early today starts right now. Good morning, I'm Corey Coffin. And I'm Francis Rivera. We begin with some breaking news out of Hollywood. Kelly Preston, actress and wife of actor John Travolta, has died of breast cancer, according to her husband, who announced the late news on Sunday on Instagram. In a heartbreaking post, Travolta wrote, in part, it is with a very heavy heart that I inform you that my beautiful wife, Kelly, has lost her two-year battle with breast cancer. She fought a courageous fight with the love and support of so many. Kelly's love and life will always be remembered. Travolta also said he will be taking some time off to be with the couple's two children, daughter Ella, who is 20, and nine-year-old son, Benjamin. According to a family representative who spoke to People magazine, Kelly chose to keep her fight private and had been undergoing medical treatment for some time, supported by her closest family and friends. Kelly starred in such movies as Jerry Maguire, Jack Frost, Battlefield Earth, and most recently, opposite husband John Travolta in 2018's Gotti. Kelly Preston, dead at the age of 57. We turned out to San Diego where emergency crews are investigating a fire aboard a military ship that left at least 21 people injured. Officials say firefighters were called out to the scene about 9 Sunday morning after an apparent explosion on the USS Bottom Richard. The three-alarm fire sent plumes of smoke pouring from the ship and into the sky as firefighters battled those flames. At a press conference, the commander of the expeditionary strike group hinted at what may have caused the incident. There was a report of uh, an internal explosion. Um, what we cannot ascertain is exactly what that explosion was caused from. Uh, initial reports is sort of a backdraft of, of an overpressurization um, as the compartment started heating up. Um, that caused a pressurization and that was sort of uh, what caused that explosion. 160 sailors were on board that ship at the time of the fire. The entire crew was able to disembark and each sailor accounted for. 17 sailors and four civilians are being treated at local hospitals for non-life-threatening injuries, including smoke inhalation and heat exhaustion. The official cause still under investigation. As the coronavirus pandemic spikes around the world, here in the States, Florida shatters a new record. The Sunshine State had the highest number of cases in a single day with more than 15,000 infections. Our Sam Brock is in Orlando with the latest. Francis, good morning. Florida didn't just smash its own record with those 15,300 cases. It smashed the record of any state in the country since the pandemic started with a single day of new COVID cases. Nonetheless, not a word so far in this state of the possibility of a lockdown or even a mandatory mask mandate throughout Florida. For a state already smashing COVID records, Florida soared into a new stratosphere, 15,300 cases. That's a lot of new cases? Wow, that's a lot. Of that number, I, it's a little bit ridiculous. Physicians sounding the alarm. People are dying. They're not just getting sick, they're dying. Our loved ones are dying. And you should care about those people that you're interacting with. Florida's fatalities this week, over 500. In Miami-Dade, hospitals are at 94% ICU capacity, with the mayor confirming six are now full. It's our ICU capacity that's uh, causing us concern. Mm. But again, like I said, we can crank up another 500. If the Sunshine State were its own country, it would rank fourth highest in the world for new COVID cases, behind the United States, Brazil, and India. Despite the explosion of infections, many rules remain unchanged. Masks are not required statewide, and Florida's beaches and businesses remain open. 
as you can see, they are doing temperature screenings as soon as you load off the boat dock. Even Disney World, back this weekend. The Evans family from California says conditions are not what you might expect. The capacity is very, very reduced. I mean, you can walk anywhere in the park and not bump into anybody. Signs of social distancing and cautious behavior, key to keeping this already spiraling crisis from deepening. What you're seeing across the state right now, on a scale of 1 to 10, how worried are you? On a scale of 10, I have to admit that I am on that 8 to 9 scale of worry. There isn't an infinite supply of physicians that can take care of COVID patients. As you digest the record numbers, it is important to point out that testing is part of the story here. Florida performing 140,000 tests, easily the most so far. Four days ago, the rate of those coming back positive was over 20 percent. Now, 13 and a half percent. Nonetheless, concerns that our hospitals and ERs could be overwhelmed. Francis, back to you. OK, Sam, thank you. Now to another battle in this country over face masks as retail employees are forced to deal with growing verbal and even physical abuse from customers who refuse to follow the rules. Here's Ann Thompson. At Black and Brew Cafe in Lakeland, Florida, employees know how to make the perfect latte and now how to cool down the percolating issue of a local mask mandate. But what does it mean to be kind? When we're approaching a situation like this, what does it mean? Smiling face. Empathy. How do they see your smile? Smiling eyes. Smiling, smiling eyes. Owner Chris MacArthur teaching his 50 employees at two locations conflict resolution. Now get to work. To avoid scenes like this. Anyone harassing me to wear a mask, you guys are violating federal law. As mask requirements push patients past the boiling point. Back off! Dance. Threaten me again! with retail and How other workers taking leave? fire. Please leave. They're the ones that, that have to enforce this thing. They're the, going to be the ones that are, are having those tough conversations. Conversations MacArthur's employees say are easier with a strategy. One person came in, they said, hey, you know, my mask in my car, can I just order a cup of coffee? We say, hey, we'd love to give you that coffee as soon as you grab that mask. Already working long hours and constantly exposed to the public, some argue frontline workers shouldn't have to be the mask police as well. Enforcement really belongs with local law enforcement. It, it is just simply unacceptable and unreasonable for that to fall to a retailer. There are plenty of signs at the Black and Brew and gentle reminders. There's always going to be like difficult customers and that's just how the service industry is, you know. And when those customers step out of line, just like the no shoes, no shirt, no service requirement, legal experts say the law sides with the business. And if a customer becomes violent, then the customer can be prosecuted for assault or other crimes, regardless of whether there's a mask mandate in place. But before it gets that far, this business hoping a smile and a kind word will make covering up easier to swallow. Ann Thompson, NBC News, New York. After being front and center with the White House Coronavirus Task Force, Dr. Anthony Fauci is being sidelined. Our Kelly O'Donnell has more. The White House writing its own new prescription for managing the pandemic crisis, a strategy to sideline the nation's top infectious disease expert, Dr. Anthony Fauci, reducing his public visibility. We are still knee deep in the first wave of this. Officials are quietly providing a list of Fauci's public comments and advice dating back several months to undermine his credibility. The White House pointed to Fauci's January predictions that coronavirus was not a major threat and likely had no asymptomatic spread. Officials offered this February right TV appearance. Moment. There is no need to change anything that you're doing on a day-by-day -day basis. Officials failed to note that Fauci's views were considered accurate at the time, but the science evolves. The effort to diminish him starts at the top. I disagree with him. You know, Dr. Fauci said don't wear masks, and so now he says wear them. The president's head of coronavirus testing also undercut his colleague. I respect Dr. Fauci a lot, but Dr. Fauci is not 100 percent right. Dr. Fauci has served six presidents and was awarded the Medal of Freedom. His approval rating was 67 percent last month. The president in that same poll lagged behind at 26 percent approval. Their assessments about the crisis now often diverge. We have the greatest testing program in the world. I don't think you can say we're doing great. Dr. Fauci declined comment. 
This weekend, the president ultimately followed that mask advice, donning one for the first time in public Saturday. Of course, this White House strategy did not point out the many instances where the president has said false or misleading things about coronavirus over these many months. The document about Dr. Fauci had the appearance of opposition research that would be used in a political campaign against an opponent. Dr. Fauci remains a part of the coronavirus task force, and he's still on the job. Francis? Kelly, thank you. Some pretty big sports news this morning. Washington's NFL franchise plans to announce later this morning that they will make changes to their team name. The anticipated announcement comes after mounting pressure from sponsors and fans. The organization previously released a statement saying it would be undertaking a thorough review of the nickname due to its racial stereotypes. According to the Sports Business Journal, the team is not expected to reveal a new name until a later date. Meanwhile, the Atlanta Braves will not be following the same path. The organization said in an email to season ticket holders they will not be changing their nickname, but will take a further look at the future of the Tomahawk Chop cheer often done at games. The letter read in part, quote, through our conversations, changing the name of the Braves is not under consideration or deemed necessary. Formula One star Lewis Hamilton took a dramatic stand after winning the Styrian Grand Prix. After clinching his first win of the season, the British racer raised his right fist in the black power salute as he got out of his car and also while standing in the podium. Hamilton also wore a Black Lives Matter t-shirt and then raced with a helmet printed with the BLM logo. All right, let's get a first check of your forecast this morning with Michelle Grossman. Good morning, Michelle. Good morning, guys. I'm so, so happy to be with you this morning. And we are talking all about the heat once again this morning. A huge high dome of high pressure in place, and that is pumping in that hot air today. So we are looking at another dangerous day of heat, an extreme heat, even record-breaking heat as we go throughout this Monday. Let's take a look at some of these temperatures. They are warm. We're over 100 degrees in many spots. You factor in that humidity that humidity though, that's where it gets real dangerous. We're looking at 109. That's what it's going to feel like in uh, Houston and 102 in Charleston. That's a feels like temperature. And that's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. All right, we're looking at very hot temperatures in the south. Temperature at 107 in Lubbock, 106 to the north. Uh, the northeast, we're not looking too bad in terms of temperatures. We have a cold front that's going to bring some showers and storms to New England. All right, you guys, I know it's July. It's going to be hot, but it's going to get even hotter in the east, and we'll talk about more storms later on this week. Boy, well, we better enjoy it now. We got it. All right, Michelle, thank you. Walking for justice, an Alabama man has completed a 1,000-mile, 40-day trek from, from his home state of Minnesota, and it was all in the name of racial quality. 35-year-old business owner Terry Willis finished the trip on Sunday. He says he embarked on the journey to march for racial quality following the police killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and other African Americans. Leading the news, the search for missing Glee actress Naya Rivera is expected to resume in Southern California this morning. On Sunday, authorities searched cabins in the area, while boat crews continued to scan the murky waters of Lake Piru, where she disappeared last Wednesday. Investigators say Rivera likely drowned during a boating trip with her four-year-old son, who was found sleeping in his life jacket on the boat. Police in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania are speaking out after a video surfaced of an officer kneeling on a man as they were trying to arrest him. And a warning, the video may be disturbing. It shows three Allentown police officers holding down a man outside of a hospital. One officer uses his elbow on the man's neck and then he uses his knee, but it is unclear if the knee is on the man's head or neck. The police chief says during the incident, the individual began to yell, scream and spit at the officers. As officers attempted to restrain the individual, all parties fell to the ground where he, quote, continued to be noncompliant, which required officers to restrain the individual. The video has sparked an investigation from the Lehigh County District Attorney and the Allentown Police Department. The horrific killing of Army Specialist Vanessa Guillen has swept the country. In an interview with Telemundo, President Trump called it absolutely horrible. He will be briefed on her case today. NBC's Morgan Burrell was at Fort Hood where a massive memorial was held. 
as hundreds of cars, trucks, and motorcycles piled into a massive football stadium parking lot. We want her to get the justice that she deserves. Nina Ramos, the event organizer, couldn't help but reflect on Vanessa Guillen's story. The 20-year-old Fort Hood soldier murdered on base by a fellow soldier, family attorneys say. Her remains discovered not far away, two months after she was reported missing. To see her mom standing there begging to bring her daughter home on American soil was just something that I couldn't imagine. It's a story that touched the lives of many here in Military City USA, including Manuel and Frank Arevlo. We felt it was a tragedy and we felt compelled to be here to support. As the parking spaces filled up, everyone raised their flags and held up signs demanding justice for Guillen, who allegedly confided to her family shortly before she disappeared she'd been sexually harassed on base. We're here in mass to support the military changing their policies to protect women a lot more. And as this convoy made its 13 mile journey from the city's west side to this memorial for Guillen on the south side, many thought about what they might say if Vanessa's family were here. We are behind their family, that we support them 100% and that the community in San Antonio is with them. And thanks to Morgan for that report. One way to strike back into theaters, Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back was the number one movie of the weekend. And the last time it topped the weekend box office charts was in 1997. Without new movies hitting the big screen, drive-in theaters are resorting to classic films. From 1980 to now, sequels and prequels to Star Wars A New Hope have topped the weekend box office more than 40 times. If there's a time to rehash and go back and watch those, and especially That's for the kids right. who've never seen it, now's the time to do it with these classics. <laughs> Great way to introduce yeah. it to them. There you go. What's old is new again. Speaking of, a sealed copy of the Super Mario Brothers became the highest selling video game ever at auction on Friday with a winning bid of $114,000. Cartridge from 1985. Ah, that sound. Hear it? So just it brings back memories. Well, it was in its original ceiling and it went to an anonymous bidder at the Heritage Auctions event. It beat the previous auction record of $100,000 for a single video game, earning its spot as the most expensive game ever sold. You're so right. Once you hear that sound, it automatically <laughs> right? takes you there. A 23 year old Brazilian model is making history as the first openly transgender model to be featured in Sports Illustrated, their swimsuit edition. Her name is Valentina Sampaio and she was crowned the 2020 Rookie of the Year. For the upcoming issue, which hits stands on July 21st, she also made history last year when she was hired by Victoria's Secret as the lingerie brand's first openly trans model. We'll be right back. We're back with a unique way some dads are bonding with their daughters. It is a chance to become a better role model, even if it means leaving their comfort zone a little bit. Here's NBC's Kate Snow. Get up to the middle. It's the beauty of ballet reimagined. In an unconventional class combining dance with yoga, creating a special connection between dads and daughters. Lifelong dancer Aaron Lee founded the Isha Pei Dance Arts Studio seven years ago in Philadelphia, but started this class just last year. Back then, it was a class in a studio, a special place for fathers and their little girls to bond and build character. Go to the front of that. It's to really change the narrative of of fatherhood, of black fatherhood. Lift up and swim around. And um, the role that they have in their daughter's lives. Here we go. Ready, Noah? Up to your toes. Julian Myers goes with his six-year-old, Nola. Tell me what's different about this class, Julian. And it's all about just showing them that we're here to support you, we love you, grow them and do ballet. Especially dads. James Jackson is an essential worker delivering meals to those in need. When the pandemic hit and the classes went online, he and daughter Jay adjusted. It's like, now we got to do stuff in the living room, you know what I mean? Just to try to, you know, stay together. And, and now that we, you know, do the Zoom meetings and things like this, we can kind of still stay connected. And we're going to bring it up over our heads. And during these uncertain times, instructor Tamisha Anderson is helping these families make new memories. By having my dad there, he is right next to me, and he helps me, and he is doing the dances with me. What's fun about it? Because uh, my daddy spin me around. 
How was your dad as a ballet dancer? He is a little bit good. <laughs> Still dancing despite the distance, but hoping for the day when they can all be in class together again. This is something that we'll never lose. Those daddy-daughter moments where, you know, she'll grow up and she's like, yeah, my dad did yoga with me. As I get older, I'll look back like, hey, you remember this? Our thanks to Kate for that report. And I can't wait for the recital where you see with the, yes. all the outfits that they're going to wear. It'll be the start of many father-daughter dances, oh. the wedding, the first father-daughter dance at the wedding, and then after that, the so first perfect. man these girls will ever love. Always be their hearts. Mm, love it. Wonderful. All right, sports and Hollywood celebs teed up in Lake Tahoe for a good cause. Among them, Patrick Mahomes, Steph Curry, Charles Barkley, Tony Romo, Jerry Rice, and Ray Romano. This year, former tennis pro Marty Fish took home the title. Proceeds will benefit social justice. COVID-19 and regional charities. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Among the chaos, I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. When you need brutal honesty. This isn't about Donald Trump. This is about 400 years of racism. When you need answers first thing in the morning. What needs to be done to make ballots ready to go for the presidential election in November? When you need to go deep inside the story. What's a policy change in policing that you would like to see enacted? And hear from someone who's been there. Who's telling the truth and who's lying every day. That's the news story Americans want to hear. You need your morning Joe only on MSNBC. We'd like to think that we live in some sort of post-racial America. We are reminded time and time again that we do not. Now I reached out to you after I watched the mayor of Atlanta act as a mom trying to raise her son. And I think about you and your kids. I remember her coming home saying, why don't I have a ponytail like the white girls? It's okay to notice that you're different. You just have to not feel less than. That's my thing. I cherish the fact that we can have these discussions. I feel safe talking about this with you guys. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Well, we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. A virus that knows no borders. A real catastrophe happening here in Brazil before our very eyes. Our global fight against it unites us. Here in Mexico City, the people I spoke to said if they don't work, they're not going to be able to feed their families. Our NBC News and Sky teams are on the ground learning from where it's been. The South Korean government is bringing students back over the next couple of weeks in stages. So that you can better understand how it will impact us here. Life across Italy is back to normal. It just doesn't look like the same normal as before. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. These are the United States, a united people with a united purpose. The future doesn't belong to the faint-hearted. It belongs to the brave. A great people has been moved to defend a great nation. All of us can extend a hand to those in need. What do you think needs to be fixed and what would count as justice in this case? Do you have clarity on what the president has actually ordered? I have to ask whether the Democratic Party can turn this around so that this is an engine for progressive political change. People are not six feet apart from one another for the most part. Are you worried that these two crises may dovetail in terms of the risk of transmission at these ongoing protests? Breaking overnight, Kelly Preston, wife of actor John Travolta, has died after a two-year battle with breast cancer. Details just ahead. The Sunshine State overtakes New York by the thousands as Florida records the largest new number of cases for a single day, topping 15,000. And with those staggering numbers, the death toll is also on the rise. An explosion and massive fire on board a Navy ship in California. Sailors injured, smoke visible for miles. New details this morning on dangers at one of our most important bases.
And the end of an era as Washington's NFL franchise will reportedly announce the end of the team's historic name and logo later today. A busy Monday ahead. Early today starts right now. Glad you're starting your week off with us. I'm Francis Rivera. And I'm Corey Coffin. We begin with some heartbreaking news out of Hollywood where actress Kelly Preston, also mother of two and wife of John Travolta, has died of breast cancer. She was known for roles in movies including Jerry Maguire, Jack Frost, and Battlefield Earth, and most recently opposite her husband in 2018's Gotti. Travolta delivered the devastating news in an Instagram post with a single photo of Kelly writing in part, quote, it is with a very heavy heart that I inform you that my beautiful wife Kelly has lost her two-year battle with breast cancer. She fought a courageous fight with the love and support of so many. Kelly's love and life will always be remembered. Travolta also said he'll be taking some time off to be with the couple's two children, daughter Ella, who is 20, and nine-year-old son Benjamin. In September 2019, Travolta and Preston celebrated their 28th wedding anniversary. According to a family representative who spoke to People magazine, Kelly chose to keep her fight private and had been undergoing medical treatment for some time, supported by her closest friends and family. Kelly Preston dead at the age of 57. At least 21 people are waking up in a California hospital this morning after they were injured in a fire aboard a military ship in San Diego. Officials say fire crews were called to the scene early Sunday morning after an apparent explosion at a three-alarm fire broke out on the USS Bonham Richard. NBC's Dan Shetterman has the latest on the investigation. It was before 9 a.m. when firefighters received the first of three alarms at Naval Base San Diego. We have an awful, there's a large amount of smoke. This is not going to be a good spot up here. An explosion and a fire on board the USS Bonhomme Richard sent clouds of smoke into the sky. Um, the fire was initially engaged by ship's company, and Naval Base San Diego activated their emergency operations center to alert level three. The Navy says 17 sailors and four civilians were sent to a local hospital with minor injuries. Hope for the best and uh, hope that they're okay. 160 sailors were on board the USS Bonhomme Richard. The Navy says all are safe and accounted for. An 1,800-foot perimeter has been established around the USS Bonhomme Richard and the surrounding buildings uh, on, on the base and been evacuated to ensure safety of personnel. The vessel is based in San Diego and was undergoing routine maintenance. The cause of the fire is not known. Dan Shenneman, NBC News. As the coronavirus continues spreading around much of the country, the U.S. has now recorded more than 3 million confirmed cases. Florida reported 15,300 new cases in just one day. It is the largest daily increase both for that state and for any state throughout this outbreak. Meanwhile, the former epicenter of the virus, New York City, reportedly zero deaths yesterday, a first in four months. But as infections rise in the South and West, our Aaron McLaughlin takes a look at what officials fear could be a rising death toll. Corey, across the country, we're seeing surging cases and a climbing death toll. Experts are worried this situation could get out of control. More than a thousand American lives reported lost this weekend and a grim warning from the White House task force. We do expect deaths to go up. If you have more cases, more hospitalizations, we do expect to see that over the next two or three weeks before this turns around. With at least 3.2 million cases and 135,000 dead, the White House testing czar insists America does not need to shut down again if 90 percent of people in hotspots wear masks. If we don't have that, we will not get control of the virus. But with no nationwide mask mandate, in some places, wearing one is still left up to individuals. People aren't taking it serious. I'm walking out and I see at least 10 people going in and they don't have masks on. In Texas, confirmed cases continue to climb. Nearly 6,000 reported. It is serious. It's not a hoax. It could drop on anyone at any time. And in Arizona, an alarming positivity rate, more than 120,000 confirmed cases. We are setting records of the type you don't want to set for the use of ventilators by COVID patients, acute care beds. Back in April, there was hope of a summer break from the virus. It dies very quickly with the sun. Now a distant memory as a heat wave hits some of the country's hot spots with temperatures forecasted to be as high as 115 degrees. I think the summer temperatures have actually made things worse in a lot of places because they've created uh, opportunities for people to be spending a lot of time indoors together. 
Hard hit Michigan now seeing an uptick in cases after hundreds attended July 4th lake parties. Several partygoers have since tested positive for the virus. Health officials say the parties were so packed, contact tracing's impossible. Meanwhile, at a nursing home in San Diego, an infectious disease control strike team tries to contain a massive outbreak. 11 residents have died, more than 100 others infected. As the virus spreads, so too does concern things will only get worse. We're heading towards large shutdowns. About half the country is either in deep trouble or going to be there soon unless they really ratchet things back. Experts say some states open too soon and too aggressively, opening restaurants and bars despite evidence that it wasn't safe. Corey? Okay, Erin, thank you. Six months into the coronavirus pandemic and President Trump finally wore a mask for the first time in public. He did so while visiting Walter Reed Medical Center this weekend. This is reports that the Trump administration is actively trying to discredit Dr. Anthony Fauci. For more, we go to NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Tracy Potts. Tracy, good morning. Hi, Francis. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. What we are seeing is a disconnect between what President Trump has been saying and what Dr. Fauci is saying about the spread of this virus. It's been happening for a while, and now members of the Trump team are trying to discredit Dr. Fauci, the nation's top infectious disease expert, as a result of this disconnect. They're now saying that he's been simply wrong on some things and using some of his own words against him early on in the pandemic. Pandemic. In fact, even before the pandemic hit the United States, when Fauci said that coronavirus was not a major threat to the United States and people didn't need to be walking around wearing masks. That was actually before the first case was reported in the United States when the president was actually saying some similar things. But now because of this disconnect that's going on, uh, they're highlighting and downplaying uh, Dr. Fauci. As far as we know, he is still part of the coronavirus task force, but Fauci has said he he saw the president a few weeks ago, but has not personally briefed him in two months. Francis? All right, Tracy, thank you. Police in Allentown, Pennsylvania, are speaking out after a video has surfaced of an officer kneeling on a man as they were trying to arrest him. We want to warn you, this video may be disturbing. It shows three Allentown police officers hold down a man outside of a hospital. One officer uses his elbow on the man's neck. Well, he then uses his knee. While well, the police chief says during the incident that the individual began to yell, scream, and spit at the officers. As police attempted to restrain the individual, all parties fell to the ground round where he continued to be non-compliant which required officers to restrain the individual this video here has sparked an investigation from the lehigh county district attorney and the allentown police department all right let's get a check now of our weather and how we're starting off the work week here's meteorologist michelle grossman great to see you michelle so good to see you. And we are talking about heat all week long. We're seeing extreme temperatures in the south once again. A humongous area of high pressure. It's sort of like a heat pump just pumping in that heat from the south. Also the moisture from the ocean. So you factor that in. It's going to feel worse uh, than what it actually is. Right now we're looking at temperatures warm this morning. And as we go throughout the day, we're going to see temperatures right around 100 degrees in Houston. It's going to feel like 109. It's going to feel like 102 in Charleston and in Orlando, 94. Now with that heat. Also the trigger of a cold front. We're looking at the potential for some severe, even strong storms in the central and northern plains and into the upper Midwest. We're looking at damaging winds. Could see winds over 60 miles per hour, hail up to an inch, and also the risk for a few tornadoes. Otherwise, we're looking pretty good in the northeast, 86 degrees in New York. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. All right, my goodness, look at this pink on the map. We are looking at extreme and dangerous temperatures in the south, in the northeast. The story in New England will be some showers and also some thunderstorms. Not looking too bad in the mid-Atlantic. All right, that July heat is in full force. We're going to talk about that expanding to the east later on this week. Back to you guys. Mm -hmm. We're going to want to hear about that, Michelle. We'll check in with you later. Time now for today's quick hits. LeBron James has decided to forego the option of wearing a social justice-related statement on his jersey during the NBA restart. The Lakers star said, quote, it didn't really seriously resonate with my mission, my goal. 
After 110 years of aviation, the U.S. Navy has its first black female tactical jet pilot. Lieutenant Junior Grade Madeline Swingle is set to receive her Wings of Gold in a ceremony July 31st. Victoria Beckham's son, Brooklyn, announced his engagement to actress Nicola Peltz. The 21-year-old model shared the happy news on Instagram, saying, I'm the luckiest man in the world. Leading the news, Washington's NFL franchise reportedly plans to announce later this morning that they will change its team's name. The anticipated announcement comes after mounting pressure from sponsors and fans. The organization previously released a statement saying it would be undertaking a thorough review of the nickname due to its racial stereotypes. According to the Sports Business Journal, the team is not expected to reveal a new name until a later date. Meanwhile, the Atlanta Braves will not be following the same path. The organization said in an email to season ticket holders they will not be changing their nickname, but will also take a further look at the future of the Tomahawk Chop Cheer that's often done at games. The letter read in part, quote, through our conversations, changing the name of the Braves is not under consideration or deemed necessary. Now to a Telemundo exclusive. Our own Jose diaz Balart sat down with President Trump to talk about the COVID crisis and DACA and his pledge to help dreamers become U.S. citizens. So that's as an executive order, not as a congressional If bill. you look at the Supreme Court ruling, they gave the president tremendous powers when they said that you could take in, in this case, 700,000 or so people. Right. So they gave powers. Based on the powers that they gave, I'm going to be doing an immigration bill, one of the aspects of the bill that you'll be very happy with and that a lot of people will be, including me and a lot of Republicans, by the way, will be DACA. We'll give them a road to citizenship. When is this going to be? Uh, I would say over the next four weeks. After our interview aired, the White House put out a statement saying they were, quote, working on an executive order to establish a merit-based immigration system to further protect U.S. workers that would not include amnesty. I also asked him about the coronavirus surge in the South and West. You have called yourself a wartime president. Is the United States losing the war against COVID? No, we're winning the war, and we have areas that flamed up, and they're going to be uh, fine over a period of time. But unfortunately, we had this plague sent in from China, and it's a disgrace that they didn't stop it in China. They should have stopped it. I put the ban up. If we didn't put the ban, it would have been much worse. If we didn't do a closure, we would have had millions of deaths instead of where we are right now. But it's far too many. One is far too many. But our testing is far superior to anybody. So we've now tested almost 45 million people, and that's helping greatly. But it flared up in areas where they thought it was ending, and that would be Florida, Texas, a couple of other places. And uh, they're going to have it under control very quickly. Mr. President, Vanessa Guillen, Army soldier, immigrant, have you heard of her? I, I have, yes. Yes, I have. She was killed. That's right. She Very was safe. in an Army base in, in Texas. Yeah. Is there uh, something that you could do to, to have more transparency in the way the armed forces investigate sexual harassment and sexual abuse? Well, we're going to look at that very, I saw that on the news the other day, and I thought it was terrible, and I gave specifically orders. I want to know everything about it. They're going to be reporting to me on Monday about it, and uh, I'll be able to release something to you at that time. I thought it was horrible. I thought it was absolutely horrible. And the president also says that executive order on immigration will come in the next few weeks. Our thanks to Jose diaz Blair for that report. Because we were Actress Jada Pinkett Smith confirmed that she dated singer August Alsina during a temporary split from her husband, Will Smith. She used her Red Table Talk platform on Facebook Watch to explain that a romance with Alsina happened during a difficult time in her marriage and that she and Smith were separated at the time. Smith also spoke up, saying, quote, to make mistakes without the fear of losing your family is critical. Will and Jada Pinkett Smith are married in 1997 and have two children together. During these trying times of COVID-19, people all over the world have found creative ways to spread joy to others. A man in New York has been using the power of laughter to lift spirits in his community by posting cringe-worthy dad jokes outside of his home. Reporter Mac Paddock from our affiliate at WETM has more. The sound of scissors gliding through paper. A stroke of the pen. These are the sounds Woody Latour hears every morning. It's the fun thing, and we've had so many responses. For the past 100 days, Woody's been lifting spirits on this Heverly Street in Bath. 
and across the country through the power of laughter. I her down in South Carolina and had this idea. She drove by this house in South Carolina and she saw people have a joke of the day. She says, well, that's good, pretty cool. So she sent it to me, so I said, well, we can do that here. Woody's daily dad jokes reaching as far as Arizona through his Facebook page. We just need some positive stuff. It's just everything's negative. I just we need a positive, uplifting theme or something like that, and this just does it. So. But I wanted to put Woody's dad joke skills to the test. How did the hamburger introduce his girlfriend? Meet Patty. Call a monster that likes to dance. I don't know, man. The boogeyman. <laughs> Our glass coffin's gonna be a success. Remains to be seen. Uh, knock, knock. Who's there? Boo. Boo who? Woody, don't get upset I'm beating you in the dad <laughs> show contest, man. <laughs> you both did a great job, but I gotta give it to Matt. <laughs> Woody, I'm... <laughs> you don't look happy about that, Woody. What's going through your head right now? No, jeez. A uh, hundred days I've done this, and this is what I get. <laughs> Uh, hang in there, Woody. We've got to check out all of those jokes on that Facebook page. That is so, so great. great to see. And classic, classic dad jokes. Oh, right yeah. Now, right? We need that in our life yes. right now. <laughs> we do. All right. Thanks to Matt from our affiliate for that report. All right, welcome back. Let's talk about the week ahead. We're talking about that extreme and dangerous, even record-breaking heat in the south. To the north, uh, the northern and central plains, we're looking at strong storms. The Storm Prediction Center has that area into the upper Midwest under the uh, threat for severe weather. In the east, we're looking pretty good in the mid-Atlantic. We're looking at the possibility for some showers and thunderstorms in New England. And of course, that Texas heat hangs on through midweek. That expands to the west. Back to you guys. All right, nice, Michelle. Thank you. That is the time of year when families normally hit the road for a summer vacation, but as the pandemic rages, many Americans are staying put, which has been devastating to resort communities. Here's NBC's Kevin Tibbles. In a typical summer, the Tommy Bartlett Show draws several hundred thousand tourists to its Wisconsin Dells Arena to bear witness to perilous water skiing feats. That was last season. This is now. Facing social distancing restrictions, owner Tom Deal made the difficult decision to close this summer for the first time in the show's nearly 70 year history. Could you possibly open safely given the fact that our business model is based upon having 2,500 people in this amphitheater every single day for 110 straight days? And the answer was no, there was no way we could do it. Deal is one of several business owners in the Wisconsin Dells feeling pandemic pain this summer. The Dells is officially Wisconsin's top tourist destination and unofficially the nation's water park capital, attracting four million tourists last year who brought in nearly two billion dollars. This year, the pandemic forced attractions to close for two months and tourists have been slow to return. At the original Duck Boat Tour, ticket sales are down 40 percent. Noah's Ark, the nation's largest water park, reporting the same. For generations, tourism has been the city of Dell's lifeblood. Either you work in a resort or you own a resort. You know, everything we do here is tourism related. The city's put on hold plans to purchase two new police cars, a filter for the public pool, a generator for the community storm shelter, even new windows for the police station. To have a business and to watch that erode with something like COVID-19, boy, those are, those are just tough things to swallow. When the pandemic hit, Mike Kaminsky, owner of Chula Vista Resort, was forced to furlough more than 400 employees. Since reopening, weekday business is down more than 60 percent and convention and wedding bookings have plummeted. We're north of $15 million of lost revenue. Business owners worry a COVID spike or second wave could force more closures and put this water park capital underwater. I don't want to end this way, so we're going to give it everything we have to get open next year. For now, in this community known for rough waters, high hopes for smoother sailing in the months to come. Kevin Tibbles, NBC News, Wisconsin Dells, Wisconsin. It is said there's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. Perhaps the time has come to fully realize the dream upon which this great country was founded. Equal justice under the law. 
You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. But we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Introducing Peacock. What's Peacock? This is Peacock. Let's go! It's streaming, launching, premiering. It's TV, movies, exclusive originals, original characters. Duh. It's sports. Breaking news. Socks. Tunes. Wait, there's more. More? Yes, yes, more. more. Tons. It's quick stuff, binge stuff, tough stuff, love stuff. It's trending, mind-bending. It's late night, early morning. Good morning. It's You See This? You remember that? You watched every single one of those? It's for you, for ew, for aw. It's Chrisley, Pawnee, Monkey, E.T., O, and it's free. Free, 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 free. Who's with me? That's Peacock. That's who. That's what. That's why. Come on. Boom, mic drop. You can't not watch. We'd like to think that we live in some sort of post-racial America, we are reminded time and time again that we do not. Snell, I reached out to you after I watched the mayor of Atlanta act as a mom trying to raise her son, and I think about you and your kids. I remember her coming home saying, why don't I have a ponytail like the white girls? It's okay to notice that you're different. You just have to not feel less than. That's my thing. I cherish the fact that we can have these discussions. I feel safe talking about this with you guys. Breaking news overnight, John Travolta's wife of almost 30 years, Kelly Preston, has died after a battle with breast cancer at the age of 57. We've got the latest details, including a statement from Travolta. An explosion and massive fire on board a Navy ship in California. Sailors injured. Smoke visible for miles. New details this morning on the dangers at one of our most important bases. The Sunshine State overtakes New York by the thousands as Florida records the largest number of cases for a single day, topping 15,000. And with those staggering numbers, the death toll is also on the rise. A massive show of support to honor Fort Hood soldier Vanessa Guillen, found murdered after her family says she complained of sexual harassment. Will justice be served? And we'll introduce you to the sanitation worker who dared to make his dream come true. A busy Monday ahead. Early today starts right now. And good morning to you. I'm Corey Coffin. Nice being with you. I'm Francis Rivera. We begin with breaking news. Hollywood has lost a star. Actress Kelly Preston and wife of John Travolta has lost her two-year private battle with breast cancer. She kept that fight private. Travolta, her husband of 28 years, broke the news on Instagram in a heartbreaking post, writing in part, it is with a very heavy heart that I inform you that my beautiful wife Kelly has lost her two-year battle with breast cancer. She fought a courageous fight with the love and support of so many. Kelly's love and life will always be remembered. Travolta also said he will be taking some time off to be with a couple's two children, daughter Ella, who is 20, and nine-year-old son Benjamin. In September of 2019, Travolta and Preston celebrated their 28th wedding anniversary. According to a family representative who spoke to People magazine, Kelly chose to keep her fight private and had been undergoing medical treatment for some time, supported by her closest family and friends. Kelly Preston, dead at the age of 57. We turn now to San Diego, where emergency crews are investigating a fire aboard a military ship that left at least 21 people injured. Officials say firefighters were called out to the scene about 9 a.m. Sunday morning after an apparent explosion on the USS Bonham Richard. The three-alarm fire sent plumes of smoke pouring from the ship and into the sky as firefighters battled the flames. At a press conference, the commander of the Expeditionary Strike Group hinted at what may have caused the incident. There was a report of uh, an internal explosion. Um, What we cannot ascertain is exactly what that explosion was caused from. Uh, Initial reports is sort of a backdraft of of an overpressurization um, as the compartment started heating up. Um, That caused a pressurization and that was sort of uh, what caused that explosion. 
About 160 sailors were on board that ship at the time of the fire. The entire crew was able to disembark and each sailor accounted for. 17 sailors and four civilians are being treated at local hospitals for non-life-threatening injuries, including smoke inhalation and heat exhaustion. The official cause is still under investigation. As the coronavirus pandemic spikes around the world, here in the States, Florida shatters a new record. The Sunshine State had the highest number of cases in a single day with more than 15,000 infections. Our Sam Brock is in Orlando with the latest. Francis, good morning. Florida didn't just smash its own record with those 15,300 cases. It smashed the record of any state in the country since the pandemic started with a single day of new COVID cases. Nonetheless, not a word so far in this state of the possibility of a lockdown or even a mandatory mask mandate throughout Florida. For a state already smashing COVID records, Florida soared into a new stratosphere, 15,300 cases. That's a lot of new cases? Wow, that's a lot. Of that number, I, it's a little bit ridiculous. Physicians sounding the alarm. People are dying. They're not just getting sick, they're dying. Our loved ones are dying. And you should care about those people that you're interacting with. Florida's fatalities this week, over 500. In Miami-Dade, hospitals are at 94% ICU capacity, with the mayor confirming six are now full. It's our ICU capacity that's uh, causing us concern. Mm. But again, like I said, we can crank up another 500. If the Sunshine State were its own country, it would rank fourth highest in the world for new COVID cases, behind the United States, Brazil, and India. Despite the explosion of infections, many rules remain unchanged. Masks are not required statewide, and Florida's beaches and businesses remain open. As you can see, they are doing temperature screenings as soon as you load off the boat dock. Even Disney World, back this weekend, the Evans family from California says conditions are not what you might expect. The capacity is very, very reduced. I mean, you can walk anywhere in the park and not bump into anybody. Signs of social distancing and cautious behavior, key to keeping this already spiraling crisis from deepening. What you're seeing across the state right now, on a scale of 1 to 10, how worried are you? On a scale of 10, I have to admit that I am on that 8 to 9 scale of worry. There isn't an infinite supply of physicians that can take care of COVID patients. As you digest the record numbers, it is important to point out that testing is part of the story here. Florida performing 140,000 tests, easily the most so far. Four days ago, the rate of those coming back positive was over 20 percent. Now, 13 and a half percent. Nonetheless, concerns that our hospitals and ERs could be overwhelmed. Francis, back to you. Sam, thank you. Six months into the coronavirus pandemic and President Trump finally wore a mask in public for the first time. He did so while visiting Walter Reed Medical Center this weekend. This is reports surface that the Trump administration is actively trying to discredit Dr. Anthony Fauci. For more on this, we head to NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Tracy Potts. Tracy, good morning. The dire warnings. Uh, they don't like these dire warnings that uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci has been giving. Uh, the White House uh, spokeswoman saying that Fauci has made mistakes. Another member of the coronavirus task force says uh, that he's gotten some things wrong. There has been a big disconnect between uh, some of those warnings from Dr. Fauci and President Trump uh, saying that we're doing great dealing with this virus. Fauci instead saying we could get to the point where we see 100,000 new cases a day. He has criticized some states for reopening too soon. And now the administration is trying to use some of its very early words against him before the first case was even uh, reported here in the United States when Fauci said coronavirus was not going to be a major threat. He is still, as far as we know, on the coronavirus task force, but he stayed in the background. In fact, uh, he's not commenting about this latest, uh, these latest efforts to discredit him. But Fauci did say that uh, last week that he had not briefed the president personally personally in the last two months. They're keeping him in the background. Back to you. Okay, Tracy, thank you. The horrific killing of Army Specialist Vanessa Guillen has swept the country. In an interview with Telemundo, President Trump called it absolutely horrible. He'll be briefed on her case today. Her death sparked renewed calls for a closer look at how the military handles claims of abuse and harassment. NBC's Kathy Park has the latest. A convoy of cars in San Antonio traveled 13 miles in honor of Army Specialist Vanessa Guillen. Her disappearance gaining national attention with protesters demanding justice. 
And now the Army Secretary is ordering an independent review of the command climate and culture at Fort Hood, adding we are saddened and deeply troubled by the loss of one of our own. Guillen was last seen on base April 22nd, setting off a surge with local law enforcement, fellow soldiers and military police. Investigators found the 20-year-old's remains in late June, not far from Fort Hood. According to a criminal complaint filed in federal court, Army Specialist Aaron Robinson, a suspect in her killing, died by suicide when confronted by police. Cecily Aguilar, a civilian, is accused of helping Robinson dispose of Guillen's body. The soldier's grieving family wants answers and accountability. My sister deserves justice. An attorney representing the family says Guillen told them before she vanished that she had been sexually harassed by a supervisor. The Army's criminal investigative organization said they had no credible report this happened. President Trump weighed in on the case during a one-on-one -on -one with Jose diaz Ballard. Is there uh, something that you could do to, to have more transparency in the way the armed forces investigate sexual harassment? and sexual abuse. They're going to be reporting to me on Monday about it. I thought it was horrible. Loved ones are fighting to keep Guillen's story alive. My family does not deserve this. Vanessa Guillen did not deserve this. Kathy Park, NBC News. All right, time to get a check of your Monday weather with meteorologist Michelle Grossman. Good morning, Michelle. Happy Monday. Good morning, Corey. Happy Monday to you. And it's going to be a hot one in the South. We've had that extreme heat in place last week. We're going to see it all this week, too, that area of high pressure fully in place. And it's really just like a heat pump that's going to pump that heat in. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of the temperatures, temperatures that you can expect today. We're looking at temperatures near 100 degrees, a lot of temperatures over 100 degrees in many spots. So Lubbock 108, Del Rio 111, Phoenix 113. You can look at the map, see those reds, uh, pinks, and let you know just how hot it's going to be. And you factor in the humidity, it's going to feel a lot hotter than that. So the extreme heat stays in place. Roswell 104 on Wednesday, Thursday 102. To. Even Tulsa, we're looking at temperatures in the upper 90s. You factor in the humidity, it's going to feel a lot hotter than that. Austin 103, Wednesday 100 degrees, 98 degrees um, there on Thursday. So in addition to the heat, we have that heat in place. We have the moisture in place. We're going to have a cold front. That will be the trigger for some storms in the upper Midwest, also northern and central plains. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. All right, look at those temperatures. Oh my goodness, it's extreme. We're going to see a lot of kitties in the pool today. Temperatures over 100 degrees in many spots. The Mid-Atlantic not looking bad today. Temperatures good, but some storms in the northeast. All right, that heat uh, expands to the east, including parts of New York, Mid-Atlantic, New England. So we'll talk more about that coming up. Okay, we'll want to hear about it. Thank you, Michelle. Crossing guards in one Florida county are ditching their classic whistles for a new device. Since guards have to now wear masks, the traditional blowing of a whistle to signal safe crossing is changing. Instead, they'll use a handheld device that makes a similar sound at the press of a button. The new tradition is supposed to prevent the spread of COVID-19 when it's time for kids to return to school. Very smart. I love that idea. Leading the news, the search for missing Glee actress Naya Rivera is expected to resume in Southern California this morning. On Sunday, authorities searched cabins in the area while boat crews continued to scan the murky waters of Lake Piru, where she disappeared last Wednesday. Investigators say Rivera likely drowned during a boating trip with her four-year-old son, who was found sleeping in his life jacket on the boat. Leading the news, Washington's NFL franchise reportedly plans to announce later this morning that they will change their team name. The anticipated announcement comes after mounting pressure from sponsors and fans. The organization previously released a statement saying it would be undertaking a thorough review of the nickname due to its racial stereotypes. According to the Sports Business Journal, the team is not expected to reveal a new name until a later date. Meanwhile, the Atlanta Braves will not be following the same path. The organization said in an email to season ticket holders they will not be changing their nickname but will take a further look at the future of the tomahawk chop cheer that's often done at games. The letter read in part, quote, through our conversations, changing the name of the Braves is not under consideration or deemed necessary.
A 23-year-old Brazilian model has made history as the first openly transgender model to be featured in the high-profile Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition. Her name is Valentina Sampaio, and she was crowned the 2020 Rookie of the Year for the upcoming issue, which hits stands July 21st. She also made history last year when she was hired by Victoria's Secret as, a la as the lingerie brand's first openly trans model. In today's quick hits, LeBron James has decided to forego the option of wearing a social justice related statement on his jersey during the NBA restart. The Lakers star said, quote, it didn't really seriously resonate with my mission, with my goal. After 110 years of aviation, the U.S. Navy has its first black female tactical jet pilot. Lieutenant Junior Grade Madeline Swegel is set to receive her wings of gold in a ceremony on July 31st. Congratulations to her and Victoria Beckham's son Brooklyn is engaged to actress Nicola Peltz. The 21-year-old model shared the happy news on Instagram writing, quote, I am the luckiest man in the world. Well, we have been talking a lot about the financial impact of COVID in our economy and retail has taken a huge hit. And along with that, malls. Once a mainstay of the American shopping experience, they are now on the brink of extinction. Here's NBC News and business and technology correspondent Jolene Kent. Lots of space in this mall. It's been a part of American culture and the economy for generations. But the future of the traditional mall more uncertain than ever, with the COVID crisis closing stores for months on end, and in some cases closing up for good. That's what happened at Metro Center Mall in Phoenix, going out of business last month after almost 50 years. We're really sad about it. I have a lot of childhood memories here. Came here every Saturday with my mom. Metro Center is the latest casualty in the retail apocalypse. Brick and mortar stores shutting permanently as online shopping becomes an even bigger part of the new normal. What has coronavirus done to the demise of malls? We could be talking about 400 malls that may not make it as a result of COVID because tenants don't have the ability. It's not that they don't want to pay their rent. They don't have the financial means. That's what ultimately forced legendary names like Brooks Brothers, J.C. Penney, Neiman Marcus and J. Crew to file for bankruptcy in the pandemic. And now experts say in this economic and health crisis, shoppers are spending more carefully than ever and avoiding malls and crowds. Coronavirus has also devastated multiplex movie theaters that are attached to malls. So many of them still closed or selling fewer tickets to maintain that social distancing, cutting off an important source of foot traffic for the mall. How does the movie theater factor change what happens for malls and their ability to survive? Well, that is the $10 million question. I think that the future of the movie theaters are going to be actually the biggest change in the mall. We've spoken to some landlords who are already thinking about how to reuse that space, but we have to think about it in a different way. If we don't, we're just kidding ourselves. That reinvention is already underway in Houston. This former Sears will soon become a new home for startups, academic research, apartments, and yes, some retail stores. Other ideas? Turn the sprawling spaces vacated by department stores into mini fulfillment centers, grocery stores, gyms, and dividing up the real estate for smaller stores that got their start online. Perhaps a new circle of life for retail as we know it. Jolene Kent, NBC News, Los Angeles. All right, welcome back on this Monday morning where we're going to talk about the heat that is still in place in the South. Dangerous, extreme heat, even record-breaking heat in parts of Texas. Now, with that heat in place, also the trigger of a cold front, we're going to see the potential for strong storms, even severe storms in the northern plains, the central plains, into the upper Midwest. As far as the East Coast goes, the mid-Atlantic looks good. It looks so that we're going to see showers and thunderstorms uh, in New England and also the trailing parts of Virginia and also the Carolinas. That storm risk moves to the east by Wednesday. So the Ohio Valley, you are in the uh, mix now and that will move to uh, the east to mid-Atlantic on Friday. Back to you guys. All right, Michelle, thank you. We are back with an inspiring story about never giving up. A former Maryland garbage collector reaching for a dream so many said couldn't be achieved and how he proved them all wrong. Here's NBC's Jose diaz Balart. I'm like really nervous about this one. It's the nail biting moment going viral. Can you click it? The minute just before 24 year old Rahan Staten found out whether or not he got into law school. All right, all right, I'm clicking it. 
Not just any law school, but his dream, Harvard. Congratulations! Tell me a little bit about that moment. It was just the greatest moment in my life. The greatest moment in a life marked by hardship. A mother gone when Rehan was just eight. Long bouts of illness for himself and his dad and his family's financial struggles. There were times where we just didn't have electricity. We didn't have food in, in the fridge. And concentrating in school was just the hardest thing to do. I mean, I didn't even see a place for me at school. Well, none of the colleges you, you applied to said yes to you. All of them said nope. But he never gave up, working for years collecting trash to help support his ailing father, even after finally getting accepted to college in Maryland. Sometimes you didn't even have time to kind of tidy up to go to school. Yes. The, that, was, that was pretty, more so embarrassing than anything else. Rahan's loved ones never gave up on him either. Cousin Dominic urging him to aim high. I've always wanted to see him succeed. Big brother Reggie putting his own college studies on hold, working in the waste industry, stepping up to help the family make ends meet. It, it wasn't about me. It was about making sure my brother made it to where he needed to be. And he's on path for that. Now, a mentor even setting up a GoFundMe site to help cover Rehan's tuition costs. Let's go! Everyone's hard work leading up to that fateful moment. When you see Harvard, what do you see? I, I literally just see my family... And like all of my accomplishments are an extension of their sacrifices. And that's just what comes to my mind. Like It's not like I'm going to Harvard. It's like we're going to Harvard. Like We, we are here. We finally did it. Thanks to Jose Diaz Villar for that story and the selflessness right across the board right there saying it's yeah. our victory. In the meantime, Rehan is helping other aspiring law students by offering free and low cost tutoring for them. Another example, he's like, this is for everybody else to benefit from, not just me. Incredible. Yeah, not just my family. I want to spread the love out. Yeah. What a bright future. How about this next one? Divers in the Florida Keys partied at an underwater music festival. The four hour long event featured mermaids on guitars, water centric songs. Of course, they had to include the theme song, The Little mermaid one person even had a sign that said wear a mask reminding partiers that they can go with the flow and stay safe among the chaos that i found a father trying to teach his son about peace we don't have to retaliate with anger we retaliate with love that's why we're down here there's always another way so that's all i want him to see when you need brutal honesty. This isn't about Donald Trump. This is about 400 years of racism. When you need answers first thing in the morning. What needs to be done to make ballots ready to go for the presidential election in November? When you need to go deep inside the story. What's a policy change in policing that you would like to see enacted? And hear from someone who's been there. Who's telling the truth and who's lying every day. That's the news story Americans want to hear. You need your morning Joe only on MSNBC. We'd like to think that we live in some sort of post-racial America. We're reminded time and time again that we do not. Now I reached out to you after I watched the mayor of Atlanta act as a mom trying to raise her son. And I think about you and your kids. I remember her coming home saying, why don't I have a ponytail like the white girls? It's okay to notice that you're different. You just have to not feel less than. That's my thing. I cherish the fact that we can have these discussions. I feel safe talking about this with you guys. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. But we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. A virus that knows no borders. A real catastrophe happening here in Brazil before our very eyes. Our global fight against it unites us. Here in Mexico City, the people I spoke to said if they don't work, they're not going to be able to feed their families. Our NBC News and Sky teams are on the ground learning from where it's been. The South Korean government is bringing students back over the next couple of weeks in stages. So that you can better understand how it will impact us here. Life across Italy is back to normal. It just doesn't look like the same normal as before. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. These are the United States, a united people with a united purpose. The future doesn't belong to the faint-hearted. It belongs to the brave. A great people has been moved to defend a great nation. All of us can extend a hand to those in need.
what do you think needs to be fixed and what would count as justice in this case? Do you have clarity on what the president has actually ordered? I have to ask whether the Democratic Party can turn this around so that this is an engine for progressive political change. People are not six feet apart from one another for the most part. Are you worried that these two crises may dovetail in terms of the risk of transmission at these ongoing protests? Breaking news overnight, Kelly Preston, wife of actor John Travolta, has died after a two-year battle with breast cancer. Late details just ahead. And developing overnight, new details surrounding the massive military ship fire in San Diego that left 21 injured. Florida setting a staggering new single-day record for COVID cases, topping 15,000. Hospitals overwhelmed and the White House continues its feud with Anthony Fauci. A massive show of support to honor Fort Hood soldier Vanessa Guillen, found murdered after her family says she complained of sexual harassment. Will justice be served? Plus, we'll take you to the daddy-daughter class that's helping these pairs build stronger bonds. It's Monday, July 13th. Early today starts right now. Good morning, I'm Corey Coffin. And I'm Francis Rivera. We begin with some breaking news out of Hollywood. Kelly Preston, actress and wife of actor John Travolta, has died of breast cancer, according to her husband, who announced the late news on Sunday on Instagram. In a heartbreaking post, Travolta wrote, in part, it is with a very heavy heart that I inform you that my beautiful wife, Kelly, has lost her two-year battle with breast cancer. She fought a courageous fight with the love and support of so many. Kelly's love and life will always be remembered. Travolta also said he will be taking some time off to be with the couple's two children, daughter Ella, who is 20, and nine-year-old son, Benjamin. According to a family representative who spoke to People magazine, Kelly chose to keep her fight private and had been undergoing medical treatment for some time, supported by her closest family and friends. Kelly starred in such movies as Jerry Maguire, Jack Frost, Battlefield Earth, and most recently, opposite husband John Travolta in 2018's Gotti. Kelly Preston, dead at the age of 57. We turn now to San Diego where emergency crews are investigating a fire aboard a military ship that left at least 21 people injured. Officials say firefighters were called out to the scene about nine Sunday morning after an apparent explosion on the USS Bottom Richard. The three alarm fire sent plumes of smoke pouring from the ship and into the sky as firefighters battled those flames. At a press conference, the commander of the expeditionary strike group hinted at what may have caused the incident. There was a report of uh, an internal explosion. Um, what we cannot ascertain is exactly what that explosion was caused from. Uh, initial reports is sort of a backdraft of, of an overpressurization um, as the compartment started heating up. Um, that caused a pressurization and that was sort of uh, what caused that explosion. 160 sailors were on board that ship at the time of the fire. The entire crew was able to disembark and each sailor accounted for. 17 sailors and four civilians are being treated at local hospitals for non-life-threatening injuries, including smoke inhalation and heat exhaustion. The official cause still under investigation. As the coronavirus pandemic spikes around the world, here in the States, Florida shatters a new record. The Sunshine State had the highest number of cases in a single day with more than 15,000 infections. Our Sam Brock is in Orlando with the latest. Francis, good morning. Florida didn't just smash its own record with those 15,300 cases. It smashed the record of any state in the country since the pandemic started with a single day of new COVID cases. Nonetheless, not a word so far in this state of the possibility of a lockdown or even a mandatory mask mandate throughout Florida. For a state already smashing COVID records, Florida soared into a new stratosphere, 15,300 cases. That's a lot of new cases? Wow, that's a lot. Of that number, I, it's a little bit ridiculous. Physicians sounding the alarm. People are dying. They're not just getting sick, they're dying. Our loved ones are dying. And you should care about those people that you're interacting with. Florida's fatalities this week, over 500. In Miami-Dade, hospitals are at 94% ICU capacity, with the mayor confirming six are now full. It's our ICU capacity that's uh, causing us concern. Mm. But again, like I said, we can crank up another 500. If the Sunshine State were its own country, it would rank fourth highest in the world for new COVID cases. 
behind the United States, Brazil, and India. Despite the explosion of infections, many rules remain unchanged. Masks are not required statewide, and Florida's beaches and businesses remain open. As you can see, they are doing temperature screenings as soon as you load off the boat dock. Even Disney World, back this weekend. The Evans family from California says conditions are not what you might expect. The capacity is very, very reduced. I mean, you can walk anywhere in the park and not bump into anybody. Signs of social distancing and cautious behavior, key to keeping this already spiraling crisis from deepening. What you're seeing across the state right now, on a scale of 1 to 10, how worried are you? On a scale of 10, I have to admit that I am on that 8 to 9 scale of worry. There isn't an infinite supply of physicians that can take care of COVID patients. As you digest the record numbers, it is important to point out that testing is part of the story here. Florida performing 140,000 tests, easily the most so far. Four days ago, the rate of those coming back positive was over 20 percent. Now, 13 and a half percent. Nonetheless, concerns that our hospitals and ERs could be overwhelmed. Francis, back to you. Okay, Sam, thank you. Now to another battle in this country over face masks as retail employees are forced to deal with growing verbal and even physical abuse from customers who refuse to follow the rules. Here's Ann Thompson. At Black and Brew Cafe in Lakeland, Florida, employees know how to make the perfect latte and now how to cool down the percolating issue of a local mask mandate. But what does it mean to be kind? When we're approaching a situation like this, what does it mean? Smiling face. Empathy. How do they see your smile? Smiling eyes. Smiling, smiling eyes. Owner Chris MacArthur teaching his 50 employees at two locations conflict resolution. Now get to work. To avoid scenes like this. Anyone harassing me to wear a mask, you guys are violating federal law. As mask requirements push patients past the boiling point. Back off! Dance. Threaten me again! with retail and other workers taking leave? fire. Please leave. They're the ones that, that have to enforce this thing. They're the, going to be the ones that are, are having those tough conversations. Conversations MacArthur's employees say are easier with a strategy. One person came in, they said, hey, you know, my mask in my car, can I just order a cup of coffee? We say, hey, we'd love to give you that coffee as soon as you grab that mask. Already working long hours and constantly exposed to the public, some argue frontline workers shouldn't have to be the mask police as well. Enforcement really belongs with local law enforcement. It, it is just simply unacceptable and unreasonable for that to fall to a retailer. There are plenty of signs at the Black and Brew and gentle reminders. There's always going to be like difficult customers and that's just how the service industry is, you know. And when those customers step out of line, just like the no shoes, no shirt, no service requirement, legal experts say the law sides with the business. And if a customer becomes violent, then the customer can be prosecuted for assault or other crimes, regardless of whether there's a mask mandate in place. But before it gets that far, this business hoping a smile and a kind word will make covering up easier to swallow. Ann Thompson, NBC News, New York. After being front and center with the White House Coronavirus Task Force, Dr. Anthony Fauci is being sidelined. Our Kelly O'Donnell has more. The White House writing its own new prescription for managing the pandemic crisis, a strategy to sideline the nation's top infectious disease expert, Dr. Anthony Fauci, reducing his public visibility. We are still knee deep in the first wave of this. Officials are quietly providing a list of Fauci's public comments and advice dating back several months to undermine his credibility. The White House pointed to Fauci's January predictions that coronavirus was not a major threat and likely had no asymptomatic spread. Officials offered this February right TV appearance. Moment. There is no need to change anything that you're doing on a day-by-day -day basis. Officials failed to note that Fauci's views were considered accurate at the time, but the science evolves. The effort to diminish him starts at the top. I disagree with him. You know, Dr. Fauci said don't wear masks, and so now he says wear them. The president's head of coronavirus testing also undercut his colleague. I respect Dr. Fauci a lot, but Dr. Fauci is not 100 percent right. Dr. Fauci has served six presidents and was awarded the Medal of Freedom. His approval rating was 67 percent last month. The president in that same poll lagged behind at 26 percent approval. Their assessments about the crisis now often diverge. 
We have the greatest testing program in the world. I don't think you can say we're doing great. Dr. Fauci declined comment. This weekend, the president ultimately followed that mask advice, donning one for the first time in public Saturday. Of course, this White House strategy did not point out the many instances where the president has said false or misleading things about coronavirus over these many months. The document about Dr. Fauci had the appearance of opposition research that would be used in a political campaign against an opponent. Dr. Fauci remains a part of the coronavirus task force, and he's still on the job. Francis? Kelly, thank you. Some pretty big sports news this morning. Washington's NFL franchise plans to announce later this morning that they will make changes to their team name. The anticipated announcement comes after mounting pressure from sponsors and fans. The organization previously released a statement saying it would be undertaking a thorough review of the nickname due to its racial stereotypes. According to the Sports Business Journal, the team is not expected to reveal a new name until a later date. Meanwhile, the Atlanta Braves will not be following the same path. The organization said in an email to season ticket holders they will not be changing their nickname, but will take a further look at the future of the Tomahawk Chop, cheer often done at games. The letter read in part, quote, through our conversations, changing the name of the Braves is not under consideration or deemed necessary. Formula One star Lewis Hamilton took a dramatic stand after winning the Styrian Grand Prix. After clinching his first win of the season, the British racer raised his right fist in the black power salute as he got out of his car and also while standing in the podium. Hamilton also wore a Black Lives Matter t-shirt and then raced with a helmet printed with the BLM logo. All right, let's get a first check of your forecast this morning with Michelle Grossman. Good morning, Michelle. Good morning, guys. I'm so, so happy to be with you this morning. And we are talking all about the heat once again this morning. A huge high dome of high pressure in place, and that is pumping in that hot air today. So we are looking at another dangerous day of heat, an extreme heat, even record-breaking heat as we go throughout this Monday. Let's take a look at some of these temperatures. They are warm. We're over 100 degrees in many spots. You factor in that humidity that humidity though, that's where it gets real dangerous. We're looking at 109. That's what it's going to feel like in uh, Houston and 102 in Charleston. That's what it feels like temperature. And that's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. All right, we're looking at very hot temperatures in the south. Temperature at 107 in Lubbock, 106 to the north. Uh, the northeast, we're not looking too bad in terms of temperatures. We have a cold front that's going to bring some showers and storms to New England. All right, you guys, I know it's July. It's going to be hot, but it's going to get even hotter in the east, and we'll talk about more storms later on this week. Boy, well, we better enjoy it now. We got it. All right, Michelle, thank you. Walking for justice, an Alabama man has completed a 1,000-mile, 40-day trek from, from his home state of Minnesota, and it was all in the name of racial quality. 35-year-old business owner Terry Willis finished the trip on Sunday. He says he embarked on the journey to march for racial quality following the police killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and other African Americans. Leading the news, the search for missing Glee actress Naya Rivera is expected to resume in Southern California this morning. On Sunday, authorities searched cabins in the area, while boat crews continued to scan the murky waters of Lake Piru, where she disappeared last Wednesday. Investigators say Rivera likely drowned during a boating trip with her four-year-old son, who was found sleeping in his life jacket on the boat. Police in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania are speaking out after a video surfaced of an officer kneeling on a man as they were trying to arrest him. And a warning, the video may be disturbing. It shows three Allentown police officers holding down a man outside of a hospital. One officer uses his elbow on the man's neck and then he uses his knee, but it is unclear if the knee is on the man's head or neck. The police chief says during the incident, the individual began to yell, scream and spit at the officers. As officers attempted to restrain the individual, all parties fell to the ground where he, quote, continued to be noncompliant, which required officers to restrain the individual. The video has sparked an investigation from the Lehigh County District Attorney and the Allentown Police Department. The horrific killing of Army Specialist Vanessa Guillen has swept the country. In an interview with Telemundo, President Trump called it absolutely horrible. He will be briefed on her case today. NBC's Morgan Burrell was at Fort Hood where a massive memorial was held. As hundreds of cars, trucks, and motorcycles piled into a massive football stadium parking lot. We want her to get the justice that she deserves. Nina Ramos, the event organizer, couldn't help but reflect on Vanessa Guillen's story. 
The 20 year old Fort Hood soldier murdered on base by a fellow soldier. Family attorneys say her remains discovered not far away two months after she was reported missing. To see her mom standing there begging to bring her daughter home on American soil was just something that I couldn't imagine. It's a story that touched the lives of many here in Military City USA, including Manuel and Frank Arevlo. We felt it was a tragedy and we felt compelled to be here to support. As the parking spaces filled up, everyone raised their flags and held up signs demanding justice for Guillen, who allegedly confided to her family shortly before she disappeared she'd been sexually harassed on base. We're here in mass to support the military changing their policies to protect women a lot more. And as this convoy made its 13 mile journey from the city's west side to this memorial for Guillen on the south side, many thought about what they might say if Vanessa's family were here. We are behind their family, that we support them 100% and that the community in San Antonio is with them. And thanks to Morgan for that report. One way to strike back into theaters, Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back was the number one movie of the weekend. And the last time it topped the weekend box office charts was in 1997. Without new movies hitting the big screen, drive-in theaters are resorting to classic films. From 1980 to now, sequels and prequels to Star Wars A New Hope have topped the weekend box office more than 40 times. If there's a time to rehash and go back and watch those, and especially That's for the kids right. who have never seen it, now's the time to do it with these classics. Great way to introduce yeah. it to them. There you go. What's old is new again. Speaking of, a sealed copy of the Super Mario Brothers became the highest selling video game ever at auction on Friday with a winning bid of $114,000. Cartridge from 1985. Ah, that sound. Hear it? So oh, just, it brings back memories. Well, it was in its original ceiling and it went to an anonymous bidder at the Heritage Auctions event. It beat the previous auction record of $100,000 for a single video game, earning its spot as the most expensive game ever sold. You're so right. Once you hear that sound, it automatically <laughs> right? takes you there. A 23-year-old Brazilian model is making history as the first openly transgender model to be featured in Sports Illustrated, their swimsuit edition. Her name is Valentina Sampaio and she was crowned the 2020 Rookie of the Year for the upcoming issue, which hit stands on July 21st. She also made history last year when she was hired by Victoria's Secret as the lingerie brand's first openly trans model. We'll be right back. We're back with a unique way some dads are bonding with their daughters. It is a chance to become a better role model, even if it means leaving their comfort zone a little bit. Here's NBC's Kate Snow. Get up to the middle. It's the beauty of ballet reimagined in an unconventional class combining dance with yoga, creating a special connection between dads and daughters. Lifelong dancer Aaron Lee founded the e Pei Dance Arts Studio seven years ago in Philadelphia, but started this class just last year. Back then, it was a class in a studio, a special place for fathers and their little girls to bond and build character. Go to the front of dad. It's to really change the narrative of of fatherhood, of black fatherhood. Lift up and swirl around. And um, the role that they have in their daughter's lives. Here we go. Ready, Noah? Up to your toes. Julian Myers goes with his six-year-old, Nola. Tell me what's different about this class, Julian. And it's all about just showing them that we're here to support you, we love you, real men do ballet. Especially dads. James Jackson is an essential worker delivering meals to those in need. When the pandemic hit and the classes went online, he and daughter Jay adjusted. It's like, now we got to do stuff in the living room, you know what I mean? Just to try to, you know, stay together. And, and now that we, you know, do the Zoom meetings and things like this, we can kind of still stay connected. And we're going to bring it up over our heads. And Good during job. these uncertain times, instructor Tamisha Anderson is helping these families make new memories. By having my dad there, he is right next to me, and he helps me, and he is doing the dances with me. What's fun about it? Because uh, my dad used to spin me around. How is your dad as a ballet dancer? He is a little bit good. 
Still dancing despite the distance, but hoping for the day when they can all be in class together again. This is something that we'll never lose. Those daddy-daughter moments where, you know, she'll grow up and she's like, yeah, my dad did yoga with me. As I get older, I'll look back like, hey, you remember this? Our thanks to Kate for that report. And I can't wait for the recital where you see with the, yes. all the outfits that they're going to wear. It'll be the start of many father-daughter dances, oh. the wedding, the first father-daughter dance at the wedding, and then after that, the so first perfect. man these girls will ever love. Always be their hearts. Mm. Love it. Wonderful. All right, sports and Hollywood celebs teed up in Lake Tahoe for a good cause. Among them, Patrick Mahomes, Steph Curry, Charles Barkley, Tony Romo, Jerry Rice, and Ray Romano. This year, former tennis pro Marty Fish took home the title. Proceeds will benefit social justice. COVID-19 and regional charities. It is said there's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. Perhaps the time has come to fully realize the dream upon which this great country was founded. Equal justice under the law. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. But we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Introducing Peacock. What's Peacock? This is Peacock. Let's go! It's streaming, launching, premiering. It's TV, movies, exclusive originals, original characters. Duh. It's sports. Breaking news. Socks, tunes. Wait, there's more. More? Yes, yes, more. more. Tons. It's quick stuff, binge stuff, tough stuff, love stuff. It's trending, mind-bending. It's late night, early morning. Good morning. It's You See This? You remember that? You watched every single one of those? It's for you, for ew, for aw. It's Chrisley, Pawnee, Monkey, E.T., O, and it's free. Free, free, free. 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 Who's with me? That's Peacock. That's who. That's what. That's why. Come on. Boom. Mic drop. You can't not watch. We'd like to think that we live in some sort of post-racial America. We're reminded time and time again that we do not. Now I reached out to you after I watched the mayor of Atlanta act as mom trying to raise her son. And I think about you and your kids. I remember her coming home saying, why don't I have a ponytail like the white girls? It's okay to notice that you're different. You just have to not feel less than. That's my thing. I cherish the fact that we can have these discussions. I feel safe talking about this with you guys. Breaking overnight, Kelly Preston, wife of actor John Travolta, has died after a two-year battle with breast cancer. Details just ahead. The Sunshine State overtakes New York by the thousands as Florida records the largest new number of cases for a single day, topping 15,000. And with those staggering numbers, the death toll is also on the rise. An explosion and massive fire on board a Navy ship in California. Sailors injured, smoke visible for miles. New details this morning on dangers at one of our most important bases. And the end of an era as Washington's NFL franchise will reportedly announce the end of the team's historic name and logo later today. A busy Monday ahead. Early today starts right now. Glad you're starting your week off with us. I'm Francis Rivera. And I'm Corey Coffin. We begin with some heartbreaking news out of Hollywood where actress Kelly Preston, also mother of two and wife of John Travolta, has died of breast cancer. She was known for roles in movies including Jerry Maguire, Jack Frost, and Battlefield Earth, and most recently opposite her husband in 2018's Gotti. Travolta delivered the devastating news in an Instagram post with a single photo of Kelly writing in part, quote, it is with a very heavy heart that I inform you that my beautiful wife Kelly has lost her two-year battle with breast cancer. She fought a courageous fight with the love and support of so many. Kelly's love and life will always be remembered. Travolta also said he'll be taking some time off to be with the couple's two children, daughter Ella, who is 20, and nine-year-old son Benjamin. In September 2019, Travolta and Preston celebrated their 28th wedding anniversary. According to a family representative who spoke to People magazine, Kelly chose to keep her fight private and had been undergoing medical treatment for some time, supported by her closest friends and family. Kelly Preston dead at the age of 57. 
At least 21 people are waking up in a California hospital this morning after they were injured in a fire aboard a military ship in San Diego. Officials say fire crews were called to the scene early Sunday morning after an apparent explosion at a three-alarm fire broke out on the USS Bonham Richard. NBC's Dan Shetterman has the latest on the investigation. It was before 9 a.m. when firefighters received the first of three alarms at Naval Base San Diego. We have an awful, there's a large amount of smoke. This is not going to be a good spot up here. An explosion and a fire on board the USS Bonhomme Richard sent clouds of smoke into the sky. Um, the fire was initially engaged by ship's company and Naval Base San Diego activated their emergency operations center to alert level three. The Navy says 17 sailors and four civilians were sent to a local hospital with minor injuries. Hope for the best and uh, hope that they're okay. 160 sailors were on board the USS Bonhomme Richard. The Navy says all are safe and accounted for. An 1,800-foot perimeter has been established around the USS Bonhomme Richard and the surrounding buildings uh, on, on the base and been evacuated to ensure safety of uh, personnel. The vessel is based in San Diego and was undergoing routine maintenance. The cause of the fire is not known. Dan Shenneman, NBC News. As the coronavirus continues spreading around much of the country, the U.S. has now recorded more than 3 million confirmed cases. Florida reported 15,300 new cases in just one day. It is the largest daily increase both for that state and for any state throughout this outbreak. Meanwhile, the former epicenter of the virus, New York City, reportedly zero deaths yesterday, a first in four months. But as infections rise in the South and West, our Aaron McLaughlin takes a look at what officials fear could be a rising death toll. Corey, across the country, we're seeing surging cases and a climbing death toll. Experts are worried this situation could get out of control. More than a thousand American lives reported lost this weekend and a grim warning from the White House task force. We do expect deaths to go up. If you have more cases, more hospitalizations, we do expect to see that over the next two or three weeks before this turns around. With at least 3.2 million cases and 135,000 dead, the White House testing czar insists America does not need to shut down again if 90 percent of people in hotspots wear masks. If we don't have that, we will not get control of the virus. But with no nationwide mask mandate, in some places, wearing one is still left up to individuals. People aren't taking it serious. I'm walking out and I see at least 10 people going in and they don't have masks on. In Texas, confirmed cases continue to climb. Nearly 6,000 reported. It is serious. It's not a hoax. It could drop on anyone at any time. And in Arizona, an alarming positivity rate, more than 120,000 confirmed cases. We are setting records of the type you don't want to set for the use of ventilators by COVID patients, acute care beds. Back in April, there was hope of a summer break from the virus. It dies very quickly with the sun. Now a distant memory as a heat wave hits some of the country's hot spots with temperatures forecasted to be as high as 115 degrees. I think the summer temperatures have actually made things worse in a lot of places because they've created uh, opportunities for people to be spending a lot of time indoors together. Hard hit Michigan now seeing an uptick in cases after hundreds attended July 4th lake parties. Several partygoers have since tested positive for the virus. Health officials say the parties were so packed, contact tracing's impossible. Meanwhile, at a nursing home in San Diego, an infectious disease control strike team tries to contain a massive outbreak. 11 residents have died, more than 100 others infected. As the virus spreads, so too does concern things will only get worse. We're heading towards large shutdowns. About half the country is either in deep trouble or going to be there soon unless they really ratchet things back. Experts say some states open too soon and too aggressively, opening restaurants and bars despite evidence that it wasn't safe. Corey? Okay, Aaron, thank you. Six months into the coronavirus pandemic and President Trump finally wore a mask for the first time in public. 
He did so while visiting Walter Reed Medical Center this weekend. This is reports that the Trump administration is actively trying to discredit Dr. Anthony Fauci. For more, we go to NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Tracy Potts. Tracy, good morning. Hi, Francis. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. What we are seeing is a disconnect between what President Trump has been saying and what Dr. Fauci is saying about the spread of this virus. It's been happening for a while, and now members of the Trump team are trying to discredit Dr. Fauci, the nation's top infectious disease expert, as a result of this disconnect. They're now saying that he's been simply wrong on some things and using some of his own words against him early on in the pandemic. Pandemic. In fact, even before the pandemic hit the United States, when Fauci said that coronavirus was not a major threat to the United States and people didn't need to be walking around wearing masks. That was actually before the first case was reported in the United States when the president was actually saying some similar things. But now because of this disconnect that's going on, uh, they're highlighting and downplaying uh, Dr. Fauci. As far as we know, he is still part of the coronavirus task force, but Fauci has said he saw the president a few weeks ago, but has not personally briefed him in two months. Francis? All right, Tracy, thank you. Police in Allentown, Pennsylvania, are speaking out after a video has surfaced of an officer kneeling on a man as they were trying to arrest him. We want to warn you, this video may be disturbing. It shows three Allentown police officers hold down a man outside of a hospital. One officer uses his elbow on the man's neck. Well, he then uses his knee. Well, the police chief says during the incident that the individual began to yell, scream, and spit at the officers. As police attempted to restrain the individual, all parties fell to the ground ground where he continued to be non-compliant which required officers to restrain the individual this video here has sparked an investigation from the lehigh county district attorney and the allentown police department all right let's get a check now of our weather and how we're starting off the work week here's meteorologist michelle grossman great to see you michelle so good to see you. And we are talking about heat all week long. We're seeing extreme temperatures in the south once again. A humongous area of high pressure. It's sort of like a heat pump just pumping in that heat from the south. Also the moisture from the ocean. So you factor that in. It's going to feel worse uh, than what it actually is. Right now we're looking at temperatures warm this morning. And as we go throughout the day, we're going to see temperatures right around 100 degrees in Houston. It's going to feel like 109. It's going to feel like 102 in Charleston and in Orlando, 94. Now with that heat. Also the trigger of a cold front. We're looking at the potential for some severe, even strong storms in the central and northern plains and into the upper Midwest. We're looking at damaging winds. Could see winds over 60 miles per hour, hail up to an inch, and also the risk for a few tornadoes. Otherwise, we're looking pretty good in the northeast, 86 degrees in New York. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. All right, my goodness, look at this pink on the map. We are looking at extreme and dangerous temperatures in the south, in the northeast. The story in New England will be some showers and also some thunderstorms. Not looking too bad in the mid-Atlantic. All right, that July heat is in full force. We're going to talk about that expanding to the east later on this week. Back to you guys. Mm -hmm. We're going to want to hear about that, Michelle. We'll check in with you later. Time now for today's quick hits. LeBron James has decided to forego the option of wearing a social justice related statement on his jersey during the NBA restart. The Lakers star said, quote, it didn't really seriously resonate with my mission, my goal. After 110 years of aviation, the U.S. Navy has its first black female tactical jet pilot. Lieutenant junior grade Madeline Swiegel is set to receive her wings of gold in a ceremony July 31st. Victoria Beckham's son, Brooklyn, announced his engagement to actress Nicola Peltz. The 21-year-old model shared the happy news on Instagram, saying, I'm the luckiest man in the world. Leading the news, Washington's NFL franchise reportedly plans to announce later this morning that they will change its team's name. The anticipated announcement comes after mounting pressure from sponsors and fans. The organization previously released a statement saying it would be undertaking a thorough review of the nickname due to its racial stereotypes. According to the Sports Business Journal, the team is not expected to reveal a new name until a later date. Meanwhile, the Atlanta Braves will not be following the same path. The organization said in an email to season ticket holders they will not be changing their nickname, but will also take a further look at the future of the Tomahawk Chop Cheer that's often done at games. 
The letter read in part, quote, through our conversations, changing the name of the Braves is not under consideration or deemed necessary. Now to a Telemundo exclusive, our own Jose diaz Balart sat down with President Trump to talk about the COVID crisis and DACA and his pledge to help dreamers become U.S. citizens. So that's as an executive order, not as a congressional If bill. you look at the Supreme Court ruling, they gave the president tremendous powers when they said that you could take in, in this case, 700,000 or so people. Right. So they gave powers based on the powers that they gave. I'm going to be doing an immigration bill, one of the aspects of the bill that you'll be very happy with and that a lot of people will be, including me and a lot of Republicans, by the way, will be DACA. We'll give them a road to citizenship. When is this going to be? Uh, I would say over the next four weeks. After our interview aired, the White House put out a statement saying they were, quote, working on an executive order to establish a merit-based immigration system to further protect U.S. workers that would not include amnesty. I also asked him about the coronavirus surge in the South and West. You have called yourself a wartime president. Is the United States losing the war against COVID? No, we're winning the war, and we have areas that flamed up, and they're going to be uh, fine over a period of time. But unfortunately, we had this plague sent in from China, and it's a disgrace that they didn't stop it in China. They should have stopped it. I put the ban up. If we didn't put the ban, it would have been much worse. If we didn't do a closure, we would have had millions of deaths instead of where we are right now. But it's far too many. One is far too many. But our testing is far superior to anybody. So we've now tested almost 45 million people, and that's helping greatly. But it flared up in areas where they thought it was ending, and that would be Florida, Texas, a couple of other places. And uh, they're going to have it under control very quickly. Mr. President, Vanessa Guillen, Army soldier, immigrant, have you heard of her? I, I have, yes. Yes, I have. She was killed. That's right. She was in the Army base in, in Texas. Yeah. Is there uh, something that you could do to to have more transparency in the way the armed forces investigate sexual harassment and sexual abuse? Well, we're going to look at that very, I saw that on the news the other day and I thought it was terrible and I gave specifically orders. I want to know everything about it. They're going to be reporting to me on Monday about it and uh, I'll be able to release something to you at that time. I thought it was horrible. I thought it was absolutely horrible. And the president also says that executive order on immigration will come in the next few weeks. Our thanks to Jose diaz Blart for that report. Receive it as permission because we were... Actress Jada Pinkett Smith confirmed that she dated singer August Alsina during a temporary split from her husband, Will Smith. She used her Red Table Talk platform on Facebook Watch to explain that a romance with Alsina happened during a difficult time in her marriage and that she and Smith were separated at the time. Smith also spoke up saying, quote, to make mistakes without the fear of losing your family is critical. Will and Jada Pickett Smith are married in 1997 and have two children together. During these trying times of COVID-19, people all over the world have found creative ways to spread joy to others. A man in New York has been using the power of laughter to lift spirits in his community by posting cringe-worthy dad jokes outside of his home. Reporter Mac Paddock from our affiliate at WETM has more. The sound of scissors gliding through paper. A stroke of the pen. These are the sounds Woody Latour hears every morning. It's the fun thing and we've had so many responses. For the past 100 days, Woody's been lifting spirits on this heavenly street in Bath and across the country through the power of laughter. Honor down in South Carolina had this idea. She drove by this house in South Carolina and she saw people have a joke of the day. She says, well, that's good, pretty cool. So she sent it to me, so I said, well, we can do that here. Woody's daily dad jokes reaching as far as Arizona through his Facebook page. We just need some positive stuff. It's just everything's negative. I just we need a positive, uplifting theme or something like that, and this just does it. So. But I wanted to put Woody's dad joke skills to the test. How did the hamburger introduce his girlfriend? Meet Patty. Call a monster that likes to dance. I don't know, man. The boogeyman. Oh. <laughs> Our glass coffin's going to be a success. Remains to be seen. Uh, knock, knock. Who's there? Boo. Boo who? What, you don't get upset I'm beating you in the dad <laughs> show contest, man. <laughs> uh, you both did a great job, but I got to give it to Matt. <laughs> Woody, I'm. <laughs> you don't look happy about that, Woody. What's going through your head right now? No, jeez. A oh, hundred days I've done this, and this is what I get. <laughs> 
Uh, hang in there, Woody. We've got to check out all of those jokes on that Facebook page. That is so, so great. great to see. And classic, classic dad jokes. Oh, right yeah. Right? We need that in our life yes. right now. <laughs> we do. All right. Thanks to Matt from our affiliate for that report. All right, welcome back. Let's talk about the week ahead. We're talking about that extreme and dangerous, even record-breaking heat in the south. To the north, uh, the northern and central plains, we're looking at strong storms. The Storm Prediction Center has that area into the upper Midwest under the uh, threat for severe weather. In the east, we're looking pretty good in the mid-Atlantic. We're looking at the possibility for some showers and thunderstorms in New England. And of course, that Texas heat hangs on through midweek. That expands to the west. Back to you guys. All right, nice, Michelle. Thank you. That is the time of year when families normally hit the road for a summer vacation, but as the pandemic rages, many Americans are staying put, which has been devastating to resort communities. Here's NBC's Kevin Tibbles. In a typical summer, the Tommy Bartlett Show draws several hundred thousand tourists to its Wisconsin Dells Arena to bear witness to perilous water skiing feats. That was last season. This is now. Facing social distancing restrictions, owner Tom Deal made the difficult decision to close this summer for the first time in the show's nearly 70 year history. Could you possibly open safely given the fact that our business model is based upon having 2,500 people in this amphitheater every single day for 110 straight days? And the answer was no, there was no way we could do it. Deal is one of several business owners in the Wisconsin Dells feeling pandemic pain this summer. The Dells is officially Wisconsin's top tourist destination and unofficially the nation's water park capital, attracting 4 million tourists last year who brought in nearly $2 billion. This year, the pandemic forced attractions to close for two months and tourists have been slow to return. At the original duck boat tour, ticket sales are down 40%. Noah's Ark, the nation's largest water park, reporting the same. For generations, tourism has been the city of Dell's lifeblood. Either you work in a resort or you own a resort. You know, everything we do here is tourism related. The city's put on hold plans to purchase two new police cars, a filter for the public pool, a generator for the community storm shelter, even new windows for the police station. To have a business and to have watch that erode with something like COVID-19, boy, those are, those are just tough things to swallow. When the pandemic hit, Mike Kaminsky, owner of Chula Vista Resort, was forced to furlough more than 400 employees. Since reopening, weekday business is down more than 60% and convention and wedding bookings have plummeted. We're north of $15 million of lost revenue. Business owners worry a COVID spike or second wave could force more closures and put this water park capital underwater. I don't want to end this way, so we're going to give it everything we have to get open next year. For now, in this community known for rough waters, high hopes for smoother sailing in the months to come. Kevin Tibbles, NBC News, Wisconsin Dells, Wisconsin. Among the chaos, that I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. It's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. When you need brutal honesty. This isn't about Donald Trump. This is about 400 years of racism. When you need answers first thing in the morning. What needs to be done to make ballots ready to go for the presidential election in November? When you need to go deep inside the story. What's a policy change in policing that you would like to see enacted? And hear from someone who's been there. Who's telling the truth and who's lying every day. That's the news story Americans want to hear. You need your morning Joe only on MSNBC. We'd like to think that we live in some sort of post-racial America, we are reminded time and time again that we do not. Now I reached out to you after I watched the mayor of Atlanta act as a mom trying to raise her son, and I think about you and your kids. I remember her coming home saying, why don't I have a ponytail like the white girls? It's okay to notice that you're different. You just have to not feel less than. That's my thing. I cherish the fact that we can have these discussions. I feel safe talking about this with you guys. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. But we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. 
live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. A virus that knows no borders. A real catastrophe happening here in Brazil before our very eyes. Our global fight against it unites us. Here in Mexico City, the people I spoke to said if they don't work, they're not going to be able to feed their families. Our NBC News and Sky teams are on the ground learning from where it's been. The South Korean government is bringing students back over the next couple of weeks in stages. So that you can better understand how it will impact us here. Life across Italy is back to normal. It just doesn't look like the same normal as before. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. These are the United States, a united people with a united purpose. The future doesn't belong to the faint-hearted. It belongs to the brave. A great people has been moved to defend a great nation. All of us can extend a hand to those in need. What do you think needs to be fixed and what would count as justice in this case? Do you have clarity on what the president has actually ordered? I have to ask whether the Democratic Party can turn this around so that this is an engine for progressive political change. People are not six feet apart from one another for the most part. Are you worried that these two crises may dovetail in terms of the risk of transmission at these ongoing protests? As the debate over reopening schools heats up, Education Secretary Betsy DeVos hit the airwaves to push the president's message. It's not a matter of, how, uh, of if, it's a matter of how we reopen schools and how kids get back to learning full time. DeVos says schools must open for in-person classes this fall and insists it can be done safely, despite a surge in new coronavirus cases in many states. But she did not offer a plan for how to do it. The key is that kids have to get back to school, and we know there are going to be hot spots, and those need to be dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis. But the rule should be that kids go back to school this fall. She also downplayed the potential health risks. There's nothing in the data that suggests that kids being in school is in any way dangerous. But internal CDC documents obtained by the New York Times warn that fully reopening schools and universities would create the highest risk for the spread of the coronavirus. Public health experts worry children could serve as carriers who pass the virus to others. Adding to the uncertainty, during last week's White House Coronavirus Task Force briefing, Dr. Deborah Burks told me there isn't enough testing data to draw conclusions about the infection and transmission rates among children. If you look across all of the tests that we've done and whether we, when we have the age, the portion that is in the lowest tested portion is the under 10-year-olds. On Sunday, DeVos also doubled down on the administration's threat to withhold federal funding from schools that refuse to open. If schools aren't going to reopen and not fulfill that promise, they shouldn't get the funds. Condemnation from House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Oh, this is appalling. They're messing. They're messing. The president and his administration are messing with the health of our children. Meantime, the White House is taking aim at the nation's top infectious disease expert, Dr. Anthony Fauci. In a statement over the weekend, an administration official tell, told NBC News that several White House officials are concerned about the number of times Dr. Fauci has been wrong on things. This official also provided a lengthy length of, uh, of examples. They failed to note that Fauci's views were considered accurate at the time, but that the science had evolved. And of course, this whole effort comes as Fauci has been openly critical of shortcomings in the country's coronavirus response, as President Trump has publicly disagreed with him, and with opinion polls showing the American public trusts Fauci's advice over the president's. Savannah? Uh, Jeff, back to schools for a moment. Uh, the administration reportedly planning on releasing its own set of guidelines for schools. What do you know about that? Yeah, well, a senior administration official tells us the White House plans to issue its own guidelines for the reopening of schools, which could be released as early as this week. We're told the White House recommendations will include some of those issued by the CDC and other ones from the American Academy of Pediatrics, but it risks creating even more confusion with state and local officials left to figure out which to follow. 
This morning, as coronavirus cases surge nationwide, many hospitals and hotspots are dealing with a pandemic showing no signs of slowing down. In Hidalgo County, Texas, which hit a record 1,274 new cases on Thursday, hospitals are inundated with patients. You see these warehouses of people on life support machines. Uh, it's dire. When you're counting how many ventilators you have left, uh, do you have two left, do you have six left? That's dire. In South Carolina, where new cases have now surpassed 56,000, NBC News was given an exclusive look inside a COVID ICU in West Columbia, the floor quickly approaching capacity. What we decided, um, if you're okay with it, is to give you the best chance possible and to put that breathing tube in you, okay? Dr. Carol Cho making the difficult choice to put another patient on a ventilator. Her third intubation in one day. Working in the COVID unit has been very emotionally and mentally taxing. In hard-hit Arizona, many hospitals in Phoenix are also grappling with an influx of new patients. We're at over 100% capacity if that's possible, but every place there's a potential bed, we have a person. Dr. Michelle Isayak has been on the front lines of the pandemic in California for months. The state reaching an alarming positivity rate and more than 322,000 confirmed cases. It's intense. It's busy. There are sick people. We're you know, constantly on the go and constantly on our feet, making quick decisions, acting, uh, trying to act in the best interests of our patients and being safe. In Florida, the center of the country's new surge in cases, Tallahassee Memorial Healthcare has been forced to reopen its COVID units. Not only do I come to work and worry about the safety of my patients, but I also worry about taking COVID home to my family. Doctors and nurses in a life and death fight to save patients, a battle with no end in sight. Here in Southern California last week, some hospitals did reach capacity, having to send patients seven hours away for treatment. Today, there is room inside ICUs, but if the infection rate continues, there could also... You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Folks began lining up here to get coronavirus tests at 1 a.m. And they may end up waiting eight days or more to get the results. Health officials say one of the big problems is that people go about their lives as they're waiting for those test results, potentially spreading coronavirus. How bad is the problem? Well, if Florida were its own country, it would rank number four in the world. First, the entire United States, then followed by Brazil and India. This morning, Sunbelt hotspots are spiking. Florida setting a national record, reporting more than 15,000 new cases of COVID-19 in a single day. At its worst, New York reported slightly more than 11,500 in a single day. I think something needs to be done and something needs to be done now. The unwanted surge comes after the state received over 140,000 test results in just one day. On Saturday, Florida's governor repeated his claim that people trying to escape the heat by going indoors may be to blame. When it's hot, people would rather be you know, inside and enclosed air conditioned spaces. It is going to be a better vector for transmission. This morning, some Florida communities are rolling back reopenings, closing indoor dining at restaurants, and in Miami-Dade County, a renewed 10 p.m. curfew. Despite the rise in positive tests, Walt Disney World welcoming tourists. Temperature checks and face masks required. But outside the park, Florida's Governor DeSantis is steadfast in his decision that he will not mandate masks. A stark contrast to Texas, where Governor Abbott ordered mask wearing statewide. I made this tough decision for one reason. It was our last best effort to slow the spread of COVID-19. If we do not slow the spread of COVID-19, the next step would have to be a lockdown. One person who did wear a mask for the first time in public, President Trump. 
He donned a mask with a presidential seal when he visited the Walter Reed Medical Center Saturday to meet with wounded service members and health care workers. The president has been reluctant to wear masks, even though the administration's top health experts have been recommending them for months. When you're in a hospital, especially in that particular setting where you're talking to a lot of soldiers and people that in some cases just got off the operating tables, I think it's a great thing to wear a mask. And in San Antonio, a 30-year-old hospitalized after attending a so-called COVID party where people intentionally try to get sick has died. Just before the patient died, uh, they looked at their nurse and they said, I think I made a mistake. I thought this was a hoax, but it's not. Florida breaking another record in the last 70 day, or last seven days. 73 people a day dying from coronavirus three weeks ago. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Dr. Ashish Jha is a professor of global health at Harvard School of Public Health, and he joins us now. Dr. Jha, good morning to you. Uh, you see what's happening in Florida. How do you explain it? What do you make of this record daily surge of cases there? Yeah, so good morning, and thank you for having me on. You know, um, the situation in Florida is pretty worrisome. There were more cases yesterday in Florida than in all of Europe yesterday, and this is uh, obviously a situation that's getting worse. Um, I think we know how we got here, right? We, uh, Florida, along with other states, uh, opened up too early when they weren't quite ready. They didn't meet the White House's own guidelines. Uh, and they opened up too aggressively. They had bars and restaurants and, and other things open when they weren't ready to do it. And then I think the biggest problem recently is they've been too slow to react. Still don't have a statewide mandate for masks. Uh, there are a lot of other things that I think they still should be doing. And, and I don't think Florida has been as aggressive as it needs to be. What about the those who say, look, it's a function of more testing. There has been a surge in testing in Florida as well. And the governor there points out that many, many of these cases are actually among young people. Does that mitigate it in all, at all in your mind, make it any less worrisome? Well, I, look, there has been a surge in testing. But what we've seen in Florida is a big increase in hospitalizations. That can't be explained by testing. And now we're seeing a big increase in deaths. And obviously, that can't be explained by um, by testing. So uh, the fact that it is among a slightly younger population is helpful, but we are still seeing many of them get sick uh, and many of them die. And then more recently, we've started just in the last couple of days seeing data that, in, at least in Texas and in other places, older people are starting to get infected again, partly because young people and old people mingle. They live with each other. And so the idea that it could stay just among young people is probably unrealistic. Now, we've seen, obviously, surges in Arizona and Texas, Florida, we've discussed at length. You also see it in California, where the perception was that they reopened uh, at a more measured pace. How do you explain that they, too, California, too, is seeing this, this increase in cases? Yeah, so California is a state that did a lockdown early, had had a very aggressive policy. Um, when they relaxed their regulations, they really left it up to local counties. I think a lot of states did that. And a lot of counties, especially in Southern California, I think, again, made a lot of the same mistakes, pulled back too early. And then I think the state was slow to react to it. So when I look at parts of Southern California, um, it looks the same as, as Arizona and Texas, in real trouble. And I'm hoping in the days and weeks ahead, we're going to see a very aggressive response from the government, uh, from the governor of California. I do want to talk about the issue of schools, which we just covered. The education secretary, Betsy DeVos, said on a show yesterday, there's nothing in the data that suggests that kids being in school is in any way dangerous. What do you think of that? Do you agree? I think that's a little more cavalier than I would be willing to be. Uh, there's no question in my mind that kids are less likely to get sick. And there's pretty good evidence that they're less likely to spread the disease in adults. But that's really not the question. The question is, in a hot spot like Arizona or Texas or Florida or you know, probably about a dozen states, if you open up and have large numbers of people, kids and adults, in, a, in buildings inside all day, can you do that safely? And I think most experts would say not really, not if you are in a hot spot. So in places where things are really bad, I think it's going to be very hard to open schools and keep them open. All right, Dr. Jha, always good to talk to you. Thanks for your time. 
You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Live music now back in action, but with a twist. Instead of making your way to a seat or fighting your way through a crowd, music fans are pulling into a parking spot for drive-in concerts. Live Nation organizing a weekend of shows in St. Louis, Nashville, and Indianapolis. Thousands pulling up to see some of their favorite artists live, like Darius Rucker, who told us he couldn't wait to get back on stage. The response has been great. People, you know, just with the social distancing and everything and, and actually getting to see live music, I think people are excited. Brad Paisley hitting the stage in all three cities, bringing in Carrie Underwood for a virtual duet in Nashville. Paisley posting these photos on Instagram with the caption, live music will live on, we will beat this virus. Organizers offering fans lots of room with nine feet of personal tailgate space next to your parking spot, plus another nine feet of buffer space between you and the next group. Concert goers not required to wear masks outside their cars unless mandated by local laws or the individual venues. Encore Live planning an all new virtual performance with Blake Shelton, Gwen Stefani and Trace Atkins. After a virtual Garth Brooks concert in June drew astonishing numbers with an estimated 350,000 people going to more than 300 drive in theaters to watch the country megastar. For now, it's at least some kind of return to normalcy, you know, for the music industry and for the live music industry, which, I mean, has just seen, you know, its revenue go to zero. And it's not just concerts folks are going to see. The classic drive-in movie is seeing a resurgence too. Walmart partnering with Tribeca Films to transform 160 of its store parking lots into contact-free drive-in theaters this summer. As Suffolk Downs Racetrack in Boston plans to start showing drive-in movies again for the first time in 50 years. A little dose of the past as summer fun gets reimagined. Now, if you're wondering about safety, staff at both the Live Nation and Encore Live events are required to wear masks and submit to temperature checks. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning, family, friends, and fans are mourning the loss of actress Kelly Preston, who died Sunday at age 57. Her husband, actor John Travolta, confirming the news overnight, writing, It is with a very heavy heart that I inform you that my beautiful wife, Kelly, has lost her two-year battle with breast cancer. She fought a courageous fight with the love and support of so many. Choosing to keep her illness private, Preston had been undergoing medical treatment for some time, Travolta thanking the doctors and nurses, friends and loved ones who have been by her side. Born in Honolulu, Hawaii, Preston studied acting at the University of Southern California. She and Travolta met while filming 1989's The Experts. The pair got engaged in 1991, marrying later that year, going on to become one of Hollywood's beloved power couples. On screen, Preston had a lengthy acting career in television and movies, starring opposite a number of Hollywood's heavyweights. She played Tom Cruise's fiery fiancé and Jerry Maguire. I don't cry at movies. I don't gush over babies. I don't start celebrating Christmas five months early. And I don't tell a man who just screwed up both our lives. Oh, poor baby. That's me, for better or worse. Appearing with Kevin Costner in For Love of the Game. I missed my plane. I had to stay at the airport hotel. Miss your plane? There was this ball game on. Both practicing Scientologists, she and Travolta had three children together, Ella, 20, Benjamin, 9, and son, Jet, who died back in 2009 at age 16 after suffering from a seizure during a family vacation in the Bahamas. Preston said the public support following the birth of son, Benjamin, was something that had helped ease the family's heartache over losing Jet. She spoke to Today in 2011. It's been wonderfully healing. Of course, you know, we still, it's still every day, but uh, it's been, I think, a really nice gift. 
Daughter Ella posting a heartwarming tribute to her mother on Sunday, writing, Anyone who is lucky enough to have known you or to have ever been in your presence will agree that you have a glow and a light that never ceases to shine, and that makes anyone around you feel instantly happy. Hmm. It's just the saddest story. Joe, tributes I know, though, are pouring in from all over Hollywood. How are they remembering her? Well, take Russell Crowe, for example. He recalls meeting Preston in 1992 and says she was such a lovely person, adding, I haven't seen her much, but when I did, she was always the same sparkly-eyed gem from actor Josh Gad. What a beautiful and amazing actress in person. My heart goes out to John Travolta and the entire family. What a loss, a sentiment echoed by many across Hollywood and really across the world. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. It's strange to think of the NBA season starting again without Steph Curry, the superstar point guard for the Golden State Warriors. But these are strange times. Curry's Warriors are not among the 22 teams to qualify to gather in Orlando inside what some are calling the NBA bubble. They're playing in a bubble. They're living in this bubble in Orlando. You and your Warriors, uh, not one of the 22. What's it like being outside the bubble looking in? From what I hear in the bubble, obviously they're playing. They're they're making it work. Uh, It's going to be a a huge sacrifice for all the guys to uh, stick with the protocols, be safe, but play basketball. So hopefully it works. Hopefully we get through October. There's, there's a finals and, and uh, see who comes out on top. We caught up with Curry as he played in the American Century Golf Championship at Lake Tahoe over the weekend. While there, he and Charles Barkley and other big names from pro sports took part in a roundtable special for NBC Sports called Race and Sports in America, Conversations. As a young father with a seven-year-old and a five-year-old, the questions that they're asking because they're being shown these images, she can't and you shouldn't really shield them from this. What do you want people to take away from the special? What did you take away from that conversation? Anytime we have the opportunity to speak on it, to share our experience, to have people listen um, and keep applying pressure, I think that's, that's important. That's why we all wanted to talk on it. And, um, you know, hopefully people get something from it and continue the conversation themselves. You spent some time talking about something that, that, that I don't think gets a lot of attention. You talked about subtle racism. What is subtle racism to you and how, how have you experienced it? As a black man in this, in this society, sometimes as when you have a little bit of polish, a little, you're articulate, you're intelligent, um, you might be accepted, but there's still kind of that subtle remark around Oh, you know, oh, you're so well-spoken, or those kind of just subtle jabs. During the golf tournament, Curry wore custom cleats honoring Breonna Taylor, the young woman shot and killed by police in Louisville during a controversial raid on her home. Of the three officers involved, one has been fired, while the other two are on administrative leave. You said her name, if you will, by wearing those um, customized golf cleats this weekend honoring Breonna Taylor. Why, why her story? There's no reason why uh, there shouldn't be, you know, those, those, indiv- those cops that were uh, responsible that shouldn't be brought to justice for, for how everything went down. And um, that say her name thing is, is huge in terms of continuing to, again, apply pressure to that conversation. Social justice phrases are uh, going to be allowed on team jerseys uh, when they do start here in a few weeks. Are you at all concerned about alienating fans? No, not sensitive to that at all. I I applaud every single player that's going to take that opportunity. We're human first, and if you can't accept what we want to talk about or what we want to highlight or what we want to change in our our society, then don't accept us as basketball players either. Fellow panelist Charles Barkley caused a stir on Friday with comments during an interview with CNBC. The fans are at such a disadvantage because they're going through the pandemic and they don't want to see a bunch of rich people uh, talking about stuff all the time. Was he talking to you? Was he talking about you? Was he talking about the effort that you're a part of? Yeah, obviously, like you say, sports brings everybody together in a sense. Um, but there's a double-edged sword to it. And 
You know, we have a microphone in front of our face all the time. And if we're knowledgeable about what we're talking about, passionate about what we're talking about, then we should speak on it because there's a lot of people that can't speak for themselves in this country. As a father, not a basketball player for a moment, but as a father, as you have watched and, and listened to all that's, uh, that's been happening in our country over the, the past few months now, what do you make of it? I think it's a great time to, to be alive to see, you know, the participation of protests. You know, I, I got to bring my, you know, seven-year-old daughter and she was asking questions about why we were out there and what we were trying to, to accomplish and, and by the end, you know, leading chance herself. So, uh, again, this is a generation that can use all the resources that we have available to really make meaningful impact. And I think at the end of the day, we have to continue to do it even if we don't see those changes right away. Well, Steph, Steph went on to say, if you can't accept me as yeah. an activist, if you can't accept the things I want to talk about, you can't accept me as an athlete either. Right. He said the two, are, the two go hand in hand. And you'll appreciate this. That golf tournament over the weekend, by the way, okay. he actually started pretty slowly. Where'd he end up? Uh, number four. He oh, finished four so uh, in that American Century Golf Tournament. Played with his dad. Started with his dad. Mm. Then he played with Jerry Rice and some other guys. Uh, and at the end, they do this thing, you know, where yeah. they jump in the lake. They do? Yeah. Lake oh, Tahoe, yeah. yeah. There it is right oh, there. That's fun. Yeah. yeah. They all jump in the, in all the right. Tahoe. Okay. Um, that conversation, <laughs> by the way, that roundtable conversation, the discussion, race mm. and sports in America conversations, it's on Golf Channel, NBC Sports, and NBC Sports Regional Networks. It starts at 8 o'clock Eastern tonight. Should be a fascinating cool. conversation. Should be great. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. It is said there's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. Perhaps the time has come to fully realize the dream upon which this great country was founded. Equal justice under the law. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. But we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Introducing Peacock. What's Peacock? This is Peacock. Let's go! It's streaming, launching, Woo! premiering. It's TV, yeah! movies, exclusive originals, original characters. Duh. It's sports. Breaking news. Socks, tunes. Wait, there's more. More? Yes, yes, more. more. Tons. It's quick stuff, binge stuff, tough stuff, love stuff. It's trending, mind-bending. It's late night, early morning. Good morning. It's You See This? You remember that? You watched every single one of those? It's for you, for ew, for aw. It's Chrisley, Pawnee, Monkey, E.T. Oh, oh. and it's free. Free, free. 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 Who's with me? That's Peacock. Yes, sir. That's who. Free? That's what. That's why. Come on. Boom. Mic drop. You can't not watch. We'd like to think that we live in some sort of post-racial America. We are reminded time and time again that we do not. Now I reached out to you after I watched the mayor of Atlanta act as a mom trying to raise her son. And I think about you and your kids. I remember her coming home saying, why don't I have a ponytail like the white girls? It's okay to notice that you're different. You just have to not feel less than. That's my thing. I cherish the fact that we can have these discussions. I feel safe talking about this with you guys. As the debate over reopening schools heats up, Education Secretary Betsy DeVos hit the airwaves to push the president's message. It's not a matter of, how, uh, of if, it's a matter of how we reopen schools and how kids get back to learning full time. DeVos says schools must open for in-person classes this fall and insists it can be done safely, despite a surge in new coronavirus cases in many states. But she did not offer a plan for how to do it. The key is that kids have to get back to school, and we know there are going to be hot spots, and those need to be dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis. But the rule should be that kids go back to school this fall. She also downplayed the potential health risks. There's nothing in the data that suggests that kids being in school is in any way dangerous. But internal CDC documents obtained by the New York Times 
warned that fully reopening schools and universities would create the highest risk for the spread of the coronavirus. Public health experts worry children could serve as carriers who pass the virus to others. Adding to the uncertainty, during last week's White House Coronavirus Task Force briefing, Dr. Deborah Burks told me there isn't enough testing data to draw conclusions about the infection and transmission rates among children. If you look across all of the tests that we've done and whether we, when we have the age, the portion that is then the lowest tested portion is the under 10-year-olds. On Sunday, DeVos also doubled down on the administration's threat to withhold federal funding from schools that refuse to open. If schools aren't going to reopen and not fulfill that promise, they shouldn't get the funds. Condemnation from House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Oh, this is appalling. They're messing. They're messing. The president and his administration are messing with the health of our children. Meantime, the White House is taking aim at the nation's top infectious disease expert, Dr. Anthony Fauci. In a statement over the weekend, an administration official tell, told NBC News that several White House officials are concerned about the number of times Dr. Fauci has been wrong on things. This official also provided a lengthy length of, uh, of examples. They failed to note that Fauci's views were considered accurate at the time, but that the science had evolved. And of course, this whole effort comes as Fauci has been openly critical of shortcomings in the country's coronavirus response, as President Trump has publicly disagreed with him, and with opinion polls showing the American public trusts Fauci's advice over the president's. Savannah? All right, Jeff, back to schools for a moment. Uh, the administration reportedly planning on releasing its own set of guidelines for schools. What do you know about that? Yeah, well, a senior administration official tells us the White House plans to issue its own guidelines for the reopening of schools, which could be released as early as this week. We're told the White House recommendations will include some of those issued by the CDC and other ones from the American Academy of Pediatrics, but it risks creating even more confusion with state and local officials left to figure out which to follow. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning, as coronavirus cases surge nationwide, many hospitals and hotspots are dealing with a pandemic showing no signs of slowing down. In Hidalgo County, Texas, which hit a record 1,274 new cases on Thursday, hospitals are inundated with patients. You see these warehouses of people on life support machines. Uh, it's dire. When you're counting how many ventilators you have left, uh, do you have two left, do you have six left? That's dire. In South Carolina, where new cases have now surpassed 56,000, NBC News was given an exclusive look inside a COVID ICU in West Columbia, the floor quickly approaching capacity. What we decided, um, if you're okay with it, is to give you the best chance possible and to put that breathing tube in you, okay? Dr. Carol Cho making the difficult choice to put another patient on a ventilator her third intubation in one day. Working in the COVID unit has been very emotionally and mentally taxing. In hard hit Arizona, many hospitals in Phoenix are also grappling with an influx of new patients. We're at over 100% capacity if that's possible, but every place there's a potential bed, we have a person. Dr. Michelle Isayak has been on the front lines of the pandemic in California for months. The state reaching an alarming positivity rate and more than 322,000 confirmed cases. It's intense. It's busy. There are sick people. We're you know, constantly on the go and constantly on our feet, making quick decisions, acting, uh, trying to act in the best interests of our patients and being safe. In Florida, the center of the country's new surge in cases, Tallahassee Memorial Healthcare has been forced to reopen its COVID units. Not only do I come to work and worry about the safety of my patients, but I also worry about taking COVID home to my family. Doctors and nurses in a life and death fight to save patients, a battle with no end in sight. Here in Southern California last week, some hospitals did reach capacity, having to send patients seven hours away for treatment. Today, there is room inside ICUs, but if the infection rate continues, there could also be... 
watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Folks began lining up here to get coronavirus tests at 1 a.m. And they may end up waiting eight days or more to get the results. Health officials say one of the big problems is that people go about their lives as they're waiting for those test results, potentially spreading coronavirus. How bad is the problem? Well, if Florida were its own country, it would rank number four in the world. First, the entire United States, then followed by Brazil and India. This morning, Sunbelt hotspots are spiking. Florida setting a national record, reporting more than 15,000 new cases of COVID-19 in a single day. At its worst, New York reported slightly more than 11,500 in a single day. I think something needs to be done and something needs to be done now. The unwanted surge comes after the state received over 140,000 test results in just one day. On Saturday, Florida's governor repeated his claim that people trying to escape the heat by going indoors may be to blame. When it's hot, people would rather be you know, inside and in enclosed air conditioned spaces. It is going to be a better vector for transmission. This morning, some Florida communities are rolling back reopenings closing indoor dining at restaurants, and in Miami-Dade County, a renewed 10 p.m. curfew. Despite the rise in positive tests, Walt Disney World welcoming tourists. Temperature checks and face masks required. But outside the park, Florida's Governor DeSantis is steadfast in his decision that he will not mandate masks. A stark contrast to Texas, where Governor Abbott ordered mask wearing statewide. I made this tough decision for one reason. It was our last best effort to slow the spread of COVID-19. If we do not slow the spread of COVID-19, the next step would have to be a lockdown. One person who did wear a mask for the first time in public, President Trump. He donned a mask with a presidential seal when he visited the Walter Reed Medical Center Saturday to meet with wounded service members and health care workers. The president has been reluctant to wear masks, even though the administration's top health experts have been recommending them for months. When you're in a hospital, especially in that particular setting where you're talking to a lot of soldiers and people that in some cases just got off the operating tables, I think it's a great thing to wear a mask. And in San Antonio, a 30-year-old hospitalized after attending a so-called COVID party where people intentionally try to get sick has died. Just before the patient died, uh, they looked at their nurse and they said, I think I made a mistake. I thought this was a hoax, but it's not. Florida breaking another record in the last 70 day, or last seven days, 73 people a day dying from coronavirus three weeks ago. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Dr. Ashish Jha is a professor of global health at Harvard School of Public Health, and he joins us now. Dr. Jha, good morning to you. Uh, you see what's happening in Florida. How do you explain it? What do you make of this record daily surge of cases there? Yes, yeah, so good morning, and thank you for having me on. You know, um, the situation in Florida is pretty worrisome. There were more cases yesterday in Florida than in all of Europe yesterday, and this is uh, obviously a situation that's getting worse. Um, I think we know how we got here, right? We, uh, Florida, along with other states, uh, opened up too early when they weren't quite ready. They didn't meet the White House's own guidelines. Uh, and they opened up too aggressively. They had bars and restaurants and, and other things open when they weren't ready to do it. And then I think the biggest problem recently is they've been too slow to react. Still don't have a statewide mandate for masks. Uh, there are a lot of other things that I think they still should be doing. And, and I don't think Florida has been as aggressive as it needs to be. What about the those who say, look, it's a function of more testing. There has been a surge in testing in Florida as well. And the governor there points out that many, many of these cases are actually among young people. Does that mitigate it in all, at all in your mind, make it any less worrisome? Well, I, look, there has been a surge in testing, but what we've seen in Florida is a big increase in hospitalizations. That can't be explained by testing. And now we're seeing a big increase in deaths. 
And obviously that can't be explained by, um, by testing. So uh, the fact that it is among a slightly younger population is helpful, but we are still seeing many of them get sick uh, and many of them die. And then more recently, we've started just in the last couple of days seeing data that, in, at least in Texas and in other places, older people are starting to get infected again, partly because young people and old people mingle. They live with each other. And so the idea that it could stay just among young people is probably unrealistic. Now, we've seen, obviously, surges in Arizona and Texas, Florida. We've discussed at length. You also see it in California, where the perception was that they reopened uh, at a more measured pace. How do you explain that they, too, California, too, is seeing this, this increase in cases? Yeah, so California is a state that did a lockdown early, had had a very aggressive policy. Um, when they relaxed their regulations, they really left it up to local counties. I think a lot of states did that. And a lot of counties, especially in Southern California, I think, again, made a lot of the same mistakes, pulled back too early. And then I think the state was slow to react to it. So when I look at parts of Southern California, um, it looks the same as, as Arizona and Texas, in real trouble. And I'm hoping in the days and weeks ahead, we're going to see a very aggressive response from the government, uh, from the governor of California. I do want to talk about the issue of schools, which we just covered. The education secretary, Betsy DeVos, said on a show yesterday, there's nothing in the data that suggests that kids being in school is in any way dangerous. What do you think of that? Do you agree? I think that's a little more cavalier than I would be willing to be. Uh, there's no question in my mind that kids are less likely to get sick. And there's pretty good evidence that they're less likely to spread the disease in adults. But that's really not the question. The question is, in a hot spot like Arizona or Texas or Florida or, you know, probably about a dozen states, if you open up and have large numbers of people, kids and adults, in, a, in buildings inside all day, can you do that safely? And I think most experts would say not really, not if you are in a hot spot. So in places where things are really bad, I think it's going to be very hard to open schools and keep them open. All right, Dr. Jha, always good to talk to you. Thanks for your time. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Live music now back in action, but with a twist. Instead of making your way to a seat or fighting your way through a crowd, music fans are pulling into a parking spot for drive-in concerts. Live Nation organizing a weekend of shows in St. Louis, Nashville, and Indianapolis. Thousands pulling up to see some of their favorite artists live, like Darius Rucker, who told us he couldn't wait to get back on stage. The response has been great. People, you know, just with the social distancing and everything and, and actually getting to see live music, I think people are excited. Brad Paisley hitting the stage in all three cities, bringing in Carrie Underwood for a virtual duet in Nashville. Paisley posting these photos on Instagram with the caption, live music will live on, we will beat this virus. Organizers offering fans lots of room with nine feet of personal tailgate space next to your parking spot, plus another nine feet of buffer space between you and the next group. Concert goers not required to wear masks outside their cars unless mandated by local laws or the individual venues. Encore Live planning an all new virtual performance with Blake Shelton, Gwen Stefani, and Trace Atkins. After a virtual Garth Brooks concert in June drew astonishing numbers, with an estimated 350,000 people going to more than 300 drive in theaters to watch the country megastar. For now, it's at least some kind of return to normalcy, you know, for the music industry and for the live music industry, which, I mean, has just seen, you know, its revenue go to zero. And it's not just concerts folks are going to see. The classic drive-in movie is seeing a resurgence too. Walmart partnering with Tribeca Films to transform 160 of its store parking lots into contact-free drive-in theaters this summer. As Suffolk Downs Racetrack in Boston plans to start showing drive-in movies again for the first time in 50 years. A little dose of the past as summer fun gets reimagined. Now, if you're wondering about safety, staff at both the Live Nation and Encore Live events are required to wear masks and submit to temperature checks.
You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning, family, friends, and fans are mourning the loss of actress Kelly Preston, who died Sunday at age 57. Her husband, actor John Travolta, confirming the news overnight, writing, It is with a very heavy heart that I inform you that my beautiful wife, Kelly, has lost her two-year battle with breast cancer. She fought a courageous fight with the love and support of so many. Choosing to keep her illness private, Preston had been undergoing medical treatment for some time, Travolta thanking the doctors and nurses, friends and loved ones who have been by her side. Born in Honolulu, Hawaii, Preston studied acting at the University of Southern California. She and Travolta met while filming 1989's The Experts. The pair got engaged in 1991, marrying later that year, going on to become one of Hollywood's beloved power couples. On screen, Preston had a lengthy acting career in television and movies, starring opposite a number of Hollywood's heavyweights. She played Tom Cruise's fiery fiancé and Jerry Maguire. I don't cry at movies. I don't gush over babies. I don't start celebrating Christmas five months early. And I don't tell a man who just screwed up both our lives. Oh, poor baby. That's me, for better or worse. Appearing with Kevin Costner in For Love of the Game. I missed my plane. I had to stay at the airport hotel. Miss your plane? There was this ball game on. Both practicing Scientologists, she and Travolta had three children together, Ella, 20, Benjamin, 9, and son, Jet, who died back in 2009 at age 16 after suffering from a seizure during a family vacation in the Bahamas. Preston said the public support following the birth of son, Benjamin, was something that had helped ease the family's heartache over losing Jet. She spoke to Today in 2011. It's been wonderfully healing. Of course, you know, we still, it's still every day, but uh, it's been, I think, a really nice gift. Daughter Ella posting a heartwarming tribute to her mother on Sunday, writing, Anyone who is lucky enough to have known you or to have ever been in your presence will agree that you have a glow and a light that never ceases to shine, and that makes anyone around you feel instantly happy. Hmm. It's just the saddest story. Joe tributes, I know, though, are pouring in from all over Hollywood. How are they remembering her? Well, take Russell Crowe, for example. He recalls meeting Preston in 1992 and says she was such a lovely person, adding, I haven't seen her much, but when I did, she was always the same sparkly-eyed gem from actor Josh Gad. What a beautiful and amazing actress in person. My heart goes out to John Travolta and the entire family. What a loss, a sentiment echoed by many across Hollywood and really across the world. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. It's strange to think of the NBA season starting again without Steph Curry, the superstar point guard for the Golden State Warriors. But these are strange times. Curry's Warriors are not among the 22 teams to qualify to gather in Orlando inside what some are calling the NBA bubble. They're playing in a bubble. They're living in this bubble in Orlando. You and your Warriors, uh, not one of the 22. What's it like being outside the bubble looking in? From what I hear in the bubble, obviously they're playing. They're, they're making it work. Uh, it's going to be a, a huge sacrifice for all the guys to uh, stick with the protocols, be safe, but play basketball. So hopefully it works. Hopefully we get through October. There's, there's a finals and and uh, see who comes out on top. We caught up with Curry as he played in the American Century Golf Championship at Lake Tahoe over the weekend. While there, he and Charles Barkley and other big names from pro sports took part in a roundtable special for NBC Sports called Race and Sports in America, Conversations. As a young father with a seven-year-old and a five-year-old, the questions that they're asking because they're being shown these images she can't and you shouldn't really shield him from this. What do you want people to take away from the special? What did you take away from that conversation? Anytime we have the opportunity to speak on it, to share our experience, to have people listen um, and keep applying pressure. I think that's that's important. That's why we all wanted to talk on it. And, um, you know, hopefully people 
get something from it and continue the conversation themselves. You spent some time talking about something that, that, that I don't think gets a lot of attention. You talked about subtle racism. What is subtle racism to you and how, how have you experienced it? As a black man in this, in this society, sometimes as when you have a little bit of polish, a little, you're articulate, you're intelligent, um, you might be accepted, but there's still kind of that subtle remark around, oh, you know, oh, you're so well-spoken or those kind of just subtle jabs. During the golf tournament, Curry wore custom cleats honoring Breonna Taylor, the young woman shot and killed by police in Louisville during a controversial raid on her home. Of the three officers involved, one has been fired while the other two are on administrative leave. You said her name, if you will, by wearing those uh, customized golf cleats this weekend, honoring Breonna Taylor. Why, why her story? There's no reason why uh, there shouldn't be, you know, those, those, indiv- those cops that were uh, responsible that shouldn't be brought to justice for, for how everything went down. And um, that say her name thing is, is huge in terms of continuing to, again, apply pressure to that conversation. Social justice phrases are uh, going to be allowed on team jerseys uh, when they do start here in a few weeks. Are you at all concerned about alienating fans? No, I'm not sensitive to that at all. I, I applaud every single player that's going to take that opportunity. We're human first, and if you can't accept what we, what we want to talk about or what we want to highlight or what we want to change in our, in our society, then don't accept us as basketball players either. Fellow panelist Charles Barkley caused a stir on Friday with comments during an interview with CNBC. The fans are at such a disadvantage because they're going through the pandemic and they don't want to see a bunch of rich people uh, talking about stuff all the time. Was he talking to you? Was he talking about you? Was he talking about the effort that you're a part of? Yeah, obviously, like you say, sports brings everybody together in a sense. Um, but there's a double-edged sword to it. And, you know, we have a microphone in front of our face all the time. And if we're knowledgeable about what we're talking about, passionate about what we're talking about, then we should speak on it because there's a lot of people that can't speak for themselves in this country. As a father... Not a basketball player for a moment, but as a father, as you have watched and and listened to all that's uh, that's been happening in our country over the the past few months now, what, what do you make of it? I think it's a great time to to be alive to see you know the participation of protests. You know, I, I got to bring my you know seven year old daughter, and she was asking questions about why we were out there and what we were trying to to accomplish and and by the end you know leading chance herself so uh again this is a generation that can use all the resources that we have available to really make meaningful impact and i think at the end of the day we have to continue to do it even if we don't see those changes right away Mm-hmm. Steph, Steph went on to say, if you can't accept me as yeah. an activist, if you can't accept the things I want to talk about, you can't accept me as an athlete either. Right. He said the two are the two go hand in hand. And you'll appreciate this. That golf tournament over the weekend, by the way, yeah. he actually started pretty slowly. Where'd he end up? Uh, number four. He oh, finished fourth so good. Uh, in that American Century Golf Tournament. Played with his dad. Started with his dad. Mm. Then he played with Jerry Rice and some other guys. Uh, and at the end, they do this thing, you know, where yeah. they jump in the lake. They do? Uh, Lake oh, Tahoe, yeah. yeah. There it is right oh, there. That's fun. Yeah, yeah. they all jump in the right. Tahoe. Okay. Um, that conversation, <laughs> by the way, that roundtable conversation, the discussion, race mm-hmm. and sports in America conversations, it's on Golf Channel, NBC Sports, and NBC Sports Regional Networks. It starts <clears> at 8 o'clock Eastern tonight. Should be a fascinating cool. Should be great. Folks began lining up here to get coronavirus tests at 1 a.m. And they may end up waiting eight days or more to get the results. Health officials say one of the big problems is that people go about their lives as they're waiting for those test results, potentially spreading coronavirus. How bad is the problem? Well, if Florida were its own country, it would rank number four in the world. First, the entire United States, then followed by Brazil and India. This morning, Sunbelt hotspots are spiking. Florida setting a national record, reporting more than 15,000 new cases of COVID-19 in a single day. At its worst, New York reported slightly more than 11,500 in a single day. 
I think something needs to be done and something needs to be done now. The unwanted surge comes after the state received over 140,000 test results in just one day. On Saturday, Florida's governor repeated his claim that people trying to escape the heat by going indoors may be to blame. When it's hot, people would rather be you know, inside and enclosed air conditioned spaces. It is going to be a better vector for transmission. This morning, some Florida communities are rolling back reopenings, closing indoor dining at restaurants, and in Miami-Dade County, a renewed 10 p.m. curfew. Despite the rise in positive tests, Walt Disney World welcoming tourists. Temperature checks and face masks required. But outside the park, Florida's Governor DeSantis is steadfast in his decision that he will not mandate masks. A stark contrast to Texas, where Governor Abbott ordered mask wearing statewide. I made this tough decision for one reason. It was our last best effort to slow the spread of COVID-19. If we do not slow the spread of COVID-19, the next step would have to be a lockdown. One person who did wear a mask for the first time in public, President Trump. He donned a mask with a presidential seal when he visited the Walter Reed Medical Center Saturday to meet with wounded service members and health care workers. The president has been reluctant to wear masks, even though the administration's top health experts have been recommending them for months. When you're in a hospital, especially in that particular setting where you're talking to a lot of soldiers and people that in some cases just got off the operating tables, I think it's a great thing to wear a mask. And in San Antonio, a 30-year-old hospitalized after attending a so-called COVID party where people intentionally try to get sick has died. Just before the patient died, uh, they looked at their nurse and they said, I think I made a mistake. I thought this was a hoax, but it's not. Florida breaking another record in the last 70 day, or last seven days, 73 people a day dying from coronavirus three weeks ago. This morning, as coronavirus cases surge nationwide, many hospitals and hotspots are dealing with a pandemic showing no signs of slowing down. In Hidalgo County, Texas, which hit a record 1,274 new cases on Thursday, hospitals are inundated with patients. You see these warehouses of people on life support machines. Uh, it's dire. When you're counting how many ventilators you have left, uh, do you have two left, do you have six left? That's dire. In South Carolina, where new cases have now surpassed 56,000, NBC News was given an exclusive look inside a COVID ICU in West Columbia, the floor quickly approaching capacity. What we decided, um, if you're okay with it, is to give you the best chance possible and to put that breathing tube in you, okay? Dr. Carol Cho making the difficult choice to put another patient on a ventilator. Her third intubation in one day. Working in the COVID unit has been very emotionally and mentally taxing. In hard hit Arizona, many hospitals in Phoenix are also grappling with an influx of new patients. We're at over 100% capacity if that's possible. But Every place there's a potential bed, we have a person. Dr. Michelle Isayak has been on the front lines of the pandemic in California for months. The state reaching an alarming positivity rate and more than 322,000 confirmed cases. It's intense. It's busy. There are sick people. We're you know, constantly on the go and constantly on our feet, making quick decisions, acting, uh, trying to act in the best interests of our patients and being safe. In Florida, the center of the country's new surge in cases, Tallahassee Memorial Healthcare has been forced to reopen its COVID units. Not only do I come to work and worry about the safety of my patients, but I also worry about taking COVID home to my family. Doctors and nurses in a life and death fight to save patients, a battle with no end in sight. Here in Southern California last week, some hospitals did reach capacity, having to send patients seven hours away for treatment. Today, there is room inside ICUs, but if the infection rate continues, there could also be...
As the debate over reopening schools heats up, Education Secretary Betsy DeVos hit the airwaves to push the president's message. It's not a matter of, how, of if, it's a matter of how we reopen schools and how kids get back to learning full time. DeVos says schools must open for in-person classes this fall and insists it can be done safely, despite a surge in new coronavirus cases in many states. But she did not offer a plan for how to do it. The key is that kids have to get back to school, and we know there are going to be hot spots, and those need to be dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis. But the rule should be that kids go back to school this fall. She also downplayed the potential health risks. There's nothing in the data that suggests that kids being in school is in any way dangerous. But internal CDC documents obtained by the New York Times warn that fully reopening schools and universities would create the highest risk for the spread of the coronavirus. Public health experts worry children could serve as carriers who pass the virus to others. Adding to the uncertainty, during last week's White House Coronavirus Task Force briefing, Dr. Deborah Burks told me there isn't enough testing data to draw conclusions about the infection and transmission rates among children. If you look across all of the tests that we've done and whether we, when we have the age, the portion that is then the lowest tested portion is the under 10 year olds. On Sunday, DeVos also doubled down on the administration's threat to withhold federal funding from schools that refuse to open. If schools aren't going to reopen and not fulfill that promise, they shouldn't get the funds. Condemnation from House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Oh, this is appalling. They're messing. They're messing. The president and his administration are messing with the health of our children. Meantime, the White House is taking aim at the nation's top infectious disease expert, Dr. Anthony Fauci. In a statement over the weekend, an administration official tell, told NBC News that several White House officials are concerned about the number of times Dr. Fauci has been wrong on things. This official also provided a lengthy length of, uh, of examples. They failed to note that Fauci's views were considered accurate at the time, but that the science had evolved. And of course, this whole effort comes as Fauci has been openly critical of shortcomings in the country's coronavirus response, as President Trump has publicly disagreed with him, and with opinion polls showing the American public trusts Fauci's advice over the president's. Savannah? All right, Jeff, back to schools for a moment. Uh, the administration reportedly planning on releasing its own set of guidelines for schools. What do you know about that? Yeah, well, a senior administration official tells us the White House plans to issue its own guidelines for the reopening of schools, which could be released as early as this week. We're told the White House recommendations will include some of those issued by the CDC and other ones from the American Academy of Pediatrics, but it risks creating even more confusion with state and local officials Dr. Ashish Jha is a professor of global health at Harvard School of Public Health, and he joins us now. Dr. Jha, good morning to you. Uh, you see what's happening in Florida. How do you explain it? What do you make of this record daily surge of cases there? Yes, yeah, so good morning, and thank you for having me on. You know, um, the situation in Florida is pretty worrisome. There were more cases yesterday in Florida than in all of Europe yesterday, and this is uh, obviously a situation that's getting worse. Um, I think we know how we got here, right? We, uh, Florida, along with other states, uh, opened up too early when they weren't quite ready. They didn't meet the White House's own guidelines. Uh, and they opened up too aggressively. They had bars and restaurants and, and other things open when they weren't ready to do it. And then I think the biggest problem recently is they've been too slow to react. Still don't have a statewide mandate for masks. Uh, there are a lot of other things that I think they still should be doing. And, and I don't think Florida has been as aggressive as it needs to be. What about the those who say, look, it's a function of more testing. There has been a surge in testing in Florida as well. And the governor there points out that many, many of these cases are actually among young people. Does that mitigate it in all, at all in your mind, make it any less worrisome? Well, I, look, there has been a surge in testing, but what we've seen in Florida is a big increase in hospitalizations. That can't be explained by testing. And now we're seeing a big increase in deaths. And obviously, that can't be explained by um, by testing. So uh, the fact that it is among a slightly younger population is helpful, but we are still seeing many of them get sick uh, and many of them die. And then more recently, we've started, just in the last couple of days, seeing data that, in, at least in Texas and in other places, 
older people are starting to get infected again, partly because young people and old people mingle. They live with each other. And so the idea that it could stay just among young people is probably unrealistic. You know, we've seen, obviously, surges in Arizona and Texas, Florida. We've discussed at length. You also see it in California, where the perception was that they reopened uh, at a more measured pace. How do you explain that they, too, California, too, is seeing this, this increase in cases? Yeah, so California is a state that did a lockdown early, had had a very aggressive policy. Um, when they relaxed their regulations, they really left it up to local counties. I think a lot of states did that. And a lot of counties, especially in Southern California, I think, again, made a lot of the same mistakes, pulled back too early. And then I think the state was slow to react to it. So when I look at parts of Southern California, um, it looks the same as, as Arizona and Texas in real trouble. And I'm hoping in the days and weeks ahead, we're going to see a very aggressive response from the government, uh, from the governor of California. I do want to talk about the issue of schools, which we just covered. The education secretary, Betsy DeVos, said on a show yesterday, there's nothing in the data that suggests that kids being in school is in any way dangerous. What do you think of that? Do you agree? I think that's a little more cavalier than I would be willing to be. Uh, there's no question in my mind that kids are less likely to get sick. And there's pretty good evidence that they're less likely to spread the disease in adults. But that's really not the question. The question is, in a hot spot like Arizona or Texas or Florida or, you know, probably about a dozen states, if you open up and have large numbers of people, kids and adults, in, a, in buildings inside all day, can you do that safely? And I think most experts would say not really, not if you are in a hot spot. So in places where things are really bad, I think it's going to be very hard to open schools and keep them open. All right, Dr. Jha, always good to talk to you. Thanks for your time. This morning, Disney fans are experiencing the magic once again. Oh my God, I'm gonna cry. <laughs> the sight of the beloved theme park returning, bringing some to tears. <laughs> As visitors get their first taste of rides and lines in a socially distanced environment. Disney is not only limiting the number of guests allowed in the park each day, they've also implemented a new ticketless reservation system. They're checking visitors' temperatures when they enter the park and requiring them to wear face masks too. They're doing sanitizing, masks, we have a face shield on the cast members. I mean, it is a very different park than when it was closed down in March. Has that changed your kids' experience at all? Brooke, has it changed your experience? Um, no, not at all. The Evans family from California booked their trip to Disney World back in March. The magic is still here. You know, it feels a little different with the masks. It's hot, we're sweating, but, um, but we can do it. But not everyone is pleased about Mickey's return. Taking to social media, I love you, Disney, but reopening Walt Disney World at this time is a big mistake. Hashtag profits before people. New infections in this state, passing a quarter million over the weekend and 15,000 in a single day. How worried are you? I'm worried because not only are we seeing spikes in the virus, we're seeing spikes in hospitalizations. Disney World isn't the only theme park to reopen after a COVID-related closure. SeaWorld. Legoland and Universal Orlando, part of our parent company NBC Universal, all reopened in June. Universal Orlando and SeaWorld requiring employees and guests to wear face masks, with Legoland encouraging its guests to wear them. All of the parks have temperature checks, cashless payments, and social distancing on the lines for rides. But as COVID-19 cases in Florida continue to rise, Families like the Evans are forced to make some tough choices. We're trying to put some sort of normalcy in our kids' lives at the same time as weighing the cost and potential risk of doing this. Now, Disney didn't provide any numbers as to how many people actually visited over the weekend or respond to our request for comments on these criticisms. The company did, however, release a video, 30 seconds on social media, called Welcome Home, featuring employees with masks on, that was widely panned online, with one user dubbing the words to say, stay at home. This is Borough Park, Brooklyn. As we were walking over here, you said to me, in some ways, it's like going back 100 years. Mm -hmm. The largest group of Orthodox Jewish people outside Israel live here in greater New York. Here, it's an old world way of life. Some don't have televisions or computers, says Dr. Israel Ziskin, 
who is Orthodox himself. Most of the community are, grand, are grandchildren and children of Holocaust survivors. Dr. Ziskin spent part of his childhood here, where he now practices pediatrics. What would you say the average number of children in any given family is? Probably within a six to eight uh, child range. Large families in small apartments was part of why this community was one of the first places COVID-19 struck and struck hard. We must have gotten one day between three and 4,000 calls. Rabbi Yehuda Kazira runs what he calls a kosher Ronald McDonald house here in Lakewood, New Jersey, providing Orthodox Jews with medical support free of charge. We're the same like everybody else, but uh, many of our religious needs that we practice sometimes can be, um, you know, sometimes misinterpreted or misunderstood. In fact, it was the celebration of a religious holiday, Purim, in early March that he believes catapulted the virus into their community. When Purim was around, we didn't know anything about social distancing, about mask wearing. Nobody wore masks. Because I think the impression a lot of people have is that the Orthodox community was just ignoring advice. You're telling me that really this all got started before the advice was there to accept or ignore. 100%. They were not ignoring advice. They were not. Uh, the community by far are law-abiding citizens. But seems like this rabbi's funeral in late April, during the height of the pandemic in New York, led many to feel the Orthodox community was not taking social distancing seriously. Some in the Orthodox community made headlines again last month by breaking into this closed city playground. We are going to keep this back up for all of our children. With few masks and no distancing, which is what we saw on our recent tour of Borough Park. Is the feeling that it's passed by here now? Yes. Yeah, I think and that, do you feel confident in that? I feel confident in that. While public health officials would disagree, there is no question the community has tried to turn their high infection rate into something positive. In early April, when Dr. Michael Joyner at the Mayo Clinic told the rabbi that the blood of those who had survived COVID-19 was needed for the national convalescent plasma effort, people quickly stepped forward. The first hurdle, testing their blood to see if they had the antibodies to fight COVID-19. Literally within a matter of three, four hours, we collected a thousand vials. The blood put in coolers, taken to a private jet, and flown to the Mayo Clinic. What did it feel like to be on that plane? It felt like being on a, a godly mission. As it turned out, a very successful one. Of those first thousand, uh, approximately 60 percent had antibodies. And this was like, we have that golden ticket in our hand. That's... So like 600 people. Wow. I love your saying it felt like a golden ticket. <laughs> Since April, Orthodox Jews have become the largest group of plasma donors, donating roughly half of the convalescent plasma supply in the nation. So literally in this room is where that seed started to sprout. We used to call ourselves a mom and pop organization, and all of a sudden we found ourselves taking on a national responsibility. From something ugly, something beautiful. What you're saying is, you're trying to give something back. We live in a closed world. That's the way of life. But wherever we can give a hand, be a beacon of light, it's our, it's our mitzvah. The rabbi and his colleagues have set up drives now across the country. Now, the plasma isn't just being used to help patients, not just for transfusions, but also to be studied. In fact, 8,000 vials have been sent to 10 institutions around the world as they try to study why the virus is so deadly for some people and barely affects others. A storied football franchise may be on the cusp of dropping its controversial name. Overnight, multiple media outlets, including ESPN and The Washington Post, reporting Washington's NFL team could retire its name today. The potential change first reported by the Sports Business Journal. In recent weeks, the team has been facing significant corporate and political pushback to change the moniker, widely viewed as a racial slur against Native Americans. One of the league's original franchises, the name dates back 87 years. 
Earlier this month, delivery giant FedEx, which owns the naming rights for the team stadium in Landover, Maryland, issued a one-sentence statement. We have communicated to the team in Washington our request that they change the team name. This, as Adweek magazine reported, the investment firms and shareholders worth $620 billion asked FedEx, along with Nike and Pepsi, to terminate their ties to the franchise, unless team owner Dan Snyder made the change. Like FedEx, Nike and PepsiCo have announced they support a new name. Meanwhile, multiple lawmakers told the Washington Post the team would only be allowed to relocate from Maryland back to D.C. if the name was gone. And like Nike, Amazon, Target and Dick's Sporting Goods also pulled Washington's merchandise. Ten days ago, the organization released a statement saying it was conducting a thorough review of the name. A major reversal for Snyder, who bought the team in 1999, had previously said he'd never make the change, claiming the name honors Native American heritage. We are people, not mascots. A citizen of the Pawnee Nation, Crystal Echo Hawk, recently telling NBC News... The R word is the N word, and we can no longer tolerate this kind of hate speech in our society. This is what democracy looks like. And now, as the movement to confront racial inequality pushes forward, an NFL franchise could take the field this fall with a new identity. So what will the new name be? We simply don't know yet. There's a lot of online discussion about the Warriors, the Red Tails, the Red Hawks. No official word yet from the team. However, we are told that the team would like to honor veterans as well as uh, Native Americans and that right now any new name is tied up in trademark discussions. We'll have to play it by ear and see what happens. Yeah. Guys, back to you. Mm -hmm. Announcement expected to come in a few hours. It's hard to understate, though, how big of a deal mm -hmm. this is. And quite frankly, Tom, it's a little surprising the speed with which they moved as well. I think this all came about because of the immense pressure out of the Black Lives Matter movement and then all of the pressure that's been coming to bear over the last few months on all of these racial equality issues. But make no mistake, if you've been living here in Washington, as you know, Craig, this has been an issue month after month after month for mm -hmm. years now. The pressure. It's strange to think of the NBA season starting again without Steph Curry, the superstar point guard for the Golden State Warriors. But these are strange times. Curry's Warriors are not among the 22 teams to qualify to gather in Orlando inside what some are calling the NBA bubble. They're playing in a bubble. They're living in this bubble in Orlando. You and your Warriors, uh, not one of the 22. What's it like being outside the bubble looking in? From what I hear in the bubble, obviously they're playing. They're, they're making it work. Uh, it's going to be a, a huge sacrifice for all the guys to uh, stick with the protocols, be safe, but play basketball. So hopefully it works. Hopefully we get through October. There's, there's a finals and, and uh, see who comes out on top. We caught up with Curry as he played in the American Century Golf Championship at Lake Tahoe over the weekend. While there, he and Charles Barkley and other big names from pro sports took part in a roundtable special for NBC Sports called Race and Sports in America, Conversations. As a young father with a seven-year-old and a five-year-old, the questions that they're asking because they're being shown these images she can't and you shouldn't really shield him from this. What do you want people to take away from the special? What did you take away from that conversation? Anytime we have the opportunity to speak on it, to share our experience, to have people listen um, and keep applying pressure. I think that's that's important. That's why we all wanted to talk on it. And, um, you know, hopefully people get something from it and continue the conversation themselves. You spent some time talking about something that, that, that I don't think gets a lot of attention. You talked about subtle racism. What is subtle racism to you, and how, how have you experienced it? As a black man in this, in this society, sometimes as when you have a little bit of polish, a little, you're articulate, you're intelligent, um, you might be accepted, but there's still kind of that subtle remark around, oh, you know, oh, you're so well-spoken, or those kind of just subtle jabs. During the golf tournament, Curry wore custom cleats honoring Breonna Taylor, the young woman shot and killed by police in Louisville, during a controversial raid on her home. Of the three officers involved, one has been fired while the other two are on administrative leave. You said her name, if you will, by wearing those uh, customized golf cleats this weekend honoring Breonna Taylor. 
Why, why her story? There's no reason why uh, there shouldn't be, you know, those, those, indiv- those cops that were uh, responsible that shouldn't be brought to justice for, for how everything went down. And um, that say her name thing is, is huge in terms of continuing to, again, apply pressure to that conversation. Social justice phrases are uh, going to be allowed on team jerseys uh, when they do start here in a few weeks. Are you at all concerned about alienating fans? No, I'm not sensitive to that at all. I, I applaud every single player that's gonna take that opportunity. We're human first, and if you can't accept what we, what we wanna talk about or what we wanna highlight or what we wanna change in our, in our society, then don't accept us as basketball players either. Fellow panelist Charles Barkley caused a stir on Friday with comments during an interview with CNBC. The fans are at such a disadvantage because they're going through the pandemic and they don't want to see a bunch of rich people uh, talking about stuff all the time. Was he talking to you? Was he talking about you? Was he talking about the effort that you're a part of? Yeah, obviously, like you say, sports brings everybody together in a sense. Um, but there's a double-edged sword to it. And, you know, we have a microphone in front of our face all the time. And if we're knowledgeable about what we're talking about, passionate about what we're talking about, and we should speak on it because there's a lot of people that can't speak for themselves in this country. As a father, not a basketball player for a moment, but as a father, as you have watched and, and listened to all that's, uh, that's been happening in our country over the, the past few months now, what, what do you make of it? I think it's a great time to, to be alive to see, you know, the participation of protests. You know, I, I got to bring my, you know, seven-year-old daughter, and she was asking questions about why we were out there and what we were trying to, to accomplish, and, and by the end, you know, leading chance herself. So, uh, again, this is a generation that can use all the resources that we have available to really make meaningful impact. And I think at the end of the day, we have to continue to do it even if we don't see those changes right away. Well, Steph, Steph went on to say, if you can't accept me as yeah. an activist, if you can't accept the things I want to talk about, you can't accept me as an athlete. I, right. He said the two are the two go hand in hand. And you'll appreciate this. That golf tournament over the weekend, by the way, okay. he actually started pretty slowly. Where'd he end up? Uh, number four. He oh, finished four so uh, in that American Century Golf Tournament. Played with his dad. Started with his dad. Mm. Then he played with Jerry Rice and some other guys. Uh, and at the end, they do this thing, you know, where yeah. they jump in the lake. They yeah. do? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There it is right oh, there. that's fun. Yeah. yeah, they all jump into in the right. Tahoe. Okay. Um, that conversation, <laughs> by the way, that roundtable conversation, the discussion, race mm-hmm. and sports in America conversations, it's on Golf Channel, NBC Sports, and NBC Sports Regional Networks. It starts at 8 o'clock Eastern tonight. Should be a fascinating cool. conversation. Should be great. For a state already smashing COVID records, Florida soared into a new stratosphere Sunday, 15,300 cases. That's a lot of new cases? Wow, that's a lot. Of that number, I, it's a little bit ridiculous. Physicians sounding the alarm. People are dying. They're not just getting sick, they're dying. Our loved ones are dying. And you should care about those people that you're interacting with. Florida's fatalities this week, over 500. In Miami-Dade, hospitals are at 94% ICU capacity, with the mayor confirming six are now full. It's our ICU capacity that's uh, causing us concern. Mm. But again, like I said, we can crank up another 500. If the Sunshine State were its own country, it would rank fourth highest in the world for new COVID cases behind the United States, Brazil, and India. Despite the explosion of infections, many rules remain unchanged. Masks are not required statewide, and Florida's beaches and businesses remain open. As you can see, they are doing temperature screenings as soon as you load off the boat dock. Even Disney World, back this weekend, the Evans family from California says conditions are not what you might expect. The capacity is very, very reduced. I mean, you can walk anywhere in the park and not bump into anybody. Signs of social distancing and cautious behavior, key to keeping this already spiraling crisis from deepening. What you're seeing across the state right now, on a scale of one to 10, how worried are you? On a scale of 10, I have to admit that I am on that eight to nine scale of worry. There isn't an infinite supply of physicians that can take care of COVID patients. Sam joins us now from Orlando. Sam, part of the increase in cases is due to more testing, right? 
testing definitely part of the story, Kate. 140,000 tests performed by Florida. That is easily the most so far. The rate of those coming back positive went from over 20% four days ago to 13.5% tonight, but still concern about hospitals and ERs being overwhelmed. Tonight, more than a thousand American lives reported lost this weekend and a grim warning from the White House task force. We do expect deaths to go up. If you have more cases, more hospitalizations, we do expect to see that over the next two or three weeks before this turns around. With at least 3.2 million cases and 135,000 dead, the White House testing czar insists America does not need to shut down again if 90 percent of people in hotspots wear masks. If we don't have that, we will not get control of the virus. But with no nationwide mask mandate, in some places, wearing one is still left up to individuals. People aren't taking it serious. I'm walking out and I see at least 10 people going in and they don't have masks on. In Texas, confirmed cases continue to climb. Nearly 6,000 reported today. It is serious. It's not a hoax. It could drop on anyone at any time. And in Arizona, an alarming positivity rate, more than 120,000 confirmed cases. We are setting records of the type you don't want to set for the use of ventilators by COVID patients, acute care beds. Back in April, there was hope of a summer break from the virus. It dies very quickly with the sun. Now a distant memory as a heat wave hits some of the country's hot spots with temperatures forecasted to be as high as 115 degrees. I think the summer temperatures have actually made things worse in a lot of places because they've created uh, opportunities for people to be spending a lot of time indoors together. Hard hit Michigan now seeing an uptick in cases after hundreds attended July 4th lake parties. Several partygoers have since tested positive for the virus. Health officials say the parties were so packed, contact tracing's impossible. Meanwhile, at a nursing home in San Diego, an infectious disease control strike team tries to contain a massive outbreak. 11 residents have died, more than 100 others infected. As the virus spreads, so too does concern things will only get worse. We're heading towards large shutdowns. About half the country is either in deep trouble or going to be there soon unless they really ratchet things back. And Aaron's with me now. Aaron, is there a concern that states reopened too quickly? Kate, experts say they believe that some states opened too soon and too aggressively, opening restaurants and bars despite evidence that it wasn't safe. The White House writing its own new prescription for managing the pandemic crisis, a strategy to sideline the nation's top infectious disease expert, Dr. Anthony Fauci, reducing his public visibility. We are still knee deep in the first wave of this. Officials are quietly providing a list of Fauci's public comments and advice dating back several months to undermine his credibility. The White House pointed to Fauci's January predictions that coronavirus was not a major threat and likely had no asymptomatic spread. Officials offered this February right TV appearance. Moment, there is no need to change anything that you're doing on a day-by-day -day basis. Officials failed to note that Fauci's views were considered accurate at the time, but the science evolves. The effort to diminish him starts at the top. I disagree with him. You know, Dr. Fauci said don't wear masks, and now he says wear them. Today, the president's head of coronavirus testing also undercut his colleague. I respect Dr. Fauci a lot, but Dr. Fauci is not 100 percent right. Dr. Fauci has served six presidents and was awarded the Medal of Freedom. His approval rating was 67 percent last month. The president in that same poll lagged behind at 26 percent approval. Their assessments about the crisis now often diverge. We have the greatest testing program in the world. I don't think you can say we're doing great. Dr. Fauci declined comment. This weekend, the president ultimately followed that mask advice, donning one for the first time in public Saturday. And Kelly, in a separate development, can we talk about the former special counsel speaking out after the president granted Roger Stone clemency? This is a rare, unexpected return of Robert Mueller, Kate. The former special counsel has written an opinion piece to defend the integrity of the Russia investigation and the jury that found Roger Stone guilty of lying and obstructing. Mueller writes that although the prison sentence has been set aside and, and commuted, he remains a convicted felon, and rightly so. 
have an awful, there's a large amount of smoke. This is not going to be a good spot up here. Tonight, seen from the air, smoke still streaming out of the USS Bonhomme Richard and on the ground, visible for miles. You see people jumping off. All the shit's on fire. A massive three alarm fire. Fire, fire, fire! The San Diego Fire Department got the first call about 9 a.m. Sunday morning, the second, 909, and the third, 951. Well, I don't think the whole ship is going to go up in flames. The Navy confirming 21 people, 17 sailors and four civilians were hospitalized for non-life-threatening injuries. 160 were on board and the entire crew now off the ship and accounted for. This could very well go on for days. More than likely this will probably just burn down to the waterline. The reason for the explosion, a 55-gallon drum of oil. The good news was it was not an ordinance and that's what, that was our concern and that we may see subsequent explosions after that. But right now, there is still a lot of fuel on that ship. That starts becoming uh, part of the combustibles there, then this will go on. And that's the danger. All that fuel potentially threatening the other ships at the base. Molly Hunter, NBC News. A convoy of cars in San Antonio traveled 13 miles in honor of Army Specialist Vanessa Guillen. Her disappearance gaining national attention with protesters demanding justice. And now the Army Secretary is ordering an independent review of the command climate and culture at Fort Hood, adding we are saddened and deeply troubled by the loss of one of our own. Guillen was last seen on base April 22nd, setting off a surge with local law enforcement, fellow soldiers and military police. Investigators found the 20 year old's remains in late June, not far from Fort Hood. According to a criminal complaint filed in federal court, Army Specialist Aaron Robinson, a suspect in her killing, died by suicide when confronted by police. Cecily Aguilar, a civilian, is accused of helping Robinson dispose of Guillen's body. The soldier's grieving family wants answers and accountability. My sister deserves justice. We believe An attorney representing the family says Guillen told them before she vanished that she had been sexually harassed by a supervisor. The Army's criminal investigative organization said they had no credible report this happened. President Trump weighed in on the case during a one-on-one -on -one with Jose diaz Ballard. Is there uh, something that you could do to, to have more transparency in the way the armed forces investigate sexual harassment and sexual abuse? They're going to be reporting to me on Monday about it. I thought it was horrible. Tonight, loved ones are fighting to keep Guillen's story alive. My family does not deserve this. Vanessa Guillen did not deserve this. Kathy Park, NBC News. Tonight, as schools struggle with reopening safely, NBC News reached out to five top pediatricians across the country, a random sampling of doctors to find out just how dangerous the coronavirus is for kids. Our experts agree most children don't get as sick as adults and that serious complications are rare. This has been a strange pandemic. Good morning, everyone. It's our pleasure to be here this morning. Beautiful New York City. To my left, we have Dr. James Malatras, who's been working on, among other things, the school reopening plan. Uh, and he's here to talk to us about that today. To my right, Melissa DeRosa, Secretary to the Governor. To her right, Rick Cotton, who is the head of the Port Authority, who has been doing an extraordinary job overall. Uh, building LaGuardia Airport, the first new airport in the United States in 25 years, uh, redoing John F. Kennedy Airport. And then if that wasn't enough, uh, he had to deal with something called uh, COVID, which uh, obviously impacted the airports. And he's, we are so lucky to have him. Uh, and I want to thank him very much for everything he's been doing. Uh, this morning, we're going to be joined by Mayor Bottoms, mayor of Atlanta. Uh, and she's going to join us this morning. Good morning. How are you, Mayor? Good to be with you. I don't know if the audio is working, so I will buy some time. Uh, Mayor Bottoms, uh, we've been watching you. We're your neighbors to the north, uh, and we've been watching you and what you've been going through. And uh, first, I hope you're feeling well, and I hope your feel family is feeling well. On top of everything, you have to be dealing with the COVID virus yourself. 
Uh, then you have your hands more than full there. You have not only the COVID virus, but the other virus of uh, racism and division uh, and what was going on with Mr. Brooks. But uh, we just want to tell you on behalf of New Yorkers after what we've gone through that uh, you are exactly right, Mayor, what you are saying and what you are advocating. You know, it's no longer a question of uh, theory or a question of politics. We have facts. We have data. Uh, we went through it here in New York. We went through it uh, in a worst case scenario. Uh, and uh, it is about following the data and following the science and taking the precautions and doing what's right. Uh, it is about masks. Masks work. We can tell you that here in New York. We had the worst spike uh, per capita on the globe, and we brought it down. And now you see these other states are going higher than New York. So those masks work. We were the first state to start mandatory masks April 15th. Uh, and all the science now says uh, for sure masks make a, a big difference. One of the models last week the IHME model, it's the Gates-funded model that the White House uses, actually projected 40,000 more Americans will die if we don't have a national mask policy. So uh, it's clear. But uh, we just wanted to tell you that we feel for you. Uh, we are all one. We're one community. Uh, I applaud your leadership. You really get to see what an elected official is made of when the, when the pressure is on. Uh, and you have more than risen to the occasion. You've been inspiring. Uh, they refer to you as a rising star, and they are all correct. Uh, and we are with you. Anything we can do for you or the city, uh, we stand ready. We remember how good the people across this country were to us. When we were in the midst of it, I asked for volunteers from across the United States, nurses, doctors, to come help in our hospitals. 30,000 people uh, volunteered to come to New York in the midst of it and work in our hospitals. It was such an act of generosity and love uh, that it was really touching. So uh, we're here for you, and the concept of pay forward. Uh, whatever we can do on any level, uh, we have people who've been through this and actually know, uh, and we stand ready. But you're right. Keep going. Stay strong. Uh, the facts will bear out. It's about saving lives, and you're doing exactly the right thing. And the numbers are going to show that. So thank you for taking some time to be with us today. Mayor. the country and at the beginning of this pandemic my charge to my team was simple god bless the child who's got its own and i had no idea that we would have to go it alone in so many ways i thought that it was more geared towards the lack of leadership we had at the federal level but it has proven to be equally challenging at the statewide level and my family is an example of what's happening across this country we had an asymptomatic child in our home for eight days before we knew uh, that that child was asymptomatic. And by that time, my husband and I had contracted COVID unnecessarily, I would imagine, because we would have taken precautions to protect ourselves. Thankfully, by the grace of God, we don't have underlying health conditions and we are all on the men. My husband is feeling a lot better, but for so many people across this country, that is not their story and their outcome is so very different. So in Atlanta, uh, when we saw that we were in a very different place than the governor's leadership was taking us, we convened an advisory committee in our city comprised of health experts, small business owners, Fortune 500 representatives, colleges and universities, just really a representation of our community. And they made some very clear recommendations on where we needed to go with reopening, a, a phased approach. We had made it into the second phase. 
But given where we are, um, our ICU bed capacity is maxed out in some hospitals by the day. We're getting closer to maxing out in others. Our numbers are ticking up. I look at the numbers daily. I am seeing numbers that I have not seen since April. Um, as of yesterday afternoon, we were up almost 23% over a week's uh, period of time. We're headed in the wrong direction. So as a city, we've recommended that we go back to phase one, which is essentially a stay at home order. Also, we've instituted a mask mandate. Uh, the benefit of that is, is one, us taking a very clear position as a city that we recognize that mask, wearing mask help save lives, but also even in the world's busiest airport, Hartsville Jackson Atlanta International Airport, one of our largest job centers, we can also mandate mask there as well. And it's very simple. Unless we have a coordinated approach across this country, we are going to continue to unnecessarily watch people die. And what makes it even more frustrating and, and even more disappointing, we didn't have to look to Italy. We could look to New York and you told us very clearly that if we didn't do things differently in our cities and states, we would find ourselves in the same situation that New York was facing. And unfortunately, you were correct because throughout the South, especially, uh, we are we are getting there in rapid order. And so I, I thank you for your leadership. I know that as a city in the same way New York was able to get to the other side, I know that we will get to the other side, but it is going to take us taking responsibility for ourselves and, and taking actions that look at data and science and not just our opinions. Right. Thank, thank you very much, Mayor. And you're right. The unfortunate uh, and really frustrating point here is uh, why did other states have to go through this? I mean, we knew what we were dealing with. New York w went down the path before. Uh, we lived exactly this. Just learn from what New York did. Learn from the numbers, learn from the data. And we, we knew that if you reopen recklessly, the virus was going to take off again. If you're not doing precautions, the virus was going to take off. Uh, now, New York's problem is we have the infection coming from other states back to New York. We're worried about our infection rate going up uh, because of people coming from other states where the infection rate is higher. We have a, a cluster of cases in an upstate county called uh, Rensselaer. People came up from Georgia, they had the virus, and they infected people uh, in New York, and then it, it took off. So you are, you are on exactly the right uh, track. Anything we can do to help, we're at a stable period now. We have the virus way down low. We went from the worst infection rate in the country to the best infection rate, the lowest. So uh, we have a little breathing space here. Anything we can do for you that you need, any uh, uh, help on the uh, testing, setting up the taste testing and the tracing, that is so, so important. Uh, and we've been through that. So you have an open offer, whatever you need, but uh, we're also 100% behind you uh, and we wish you Godspeed in your health recovering. Uh, and we hope that Atlanta under your guidance comes back quickly and anything we can do, we stand ready. Thank you, Governor. And that's exactly what we need assistance with. Uh, testing, uh, testing that gets people's results very quickly and also the contact tracing, because we know that's extremely important for us to help slow the spread. So I appreciate your offer to help, and, and we certainly um, would be appreciative of that assistance. Well, we can do that. We have, uh, I'll, I'll arrange it uh, with, your, with your team, but we'll put together uh, people who've done the testing for us and the contact tracing. We actually worked with uh, Mike Bloomberg, former mayor of New York City. Uh, and because nobody knew what a contact tracing program was. And, and we worked with the former mayor who stepped up and brought Johns Hopkins to the table and we came up with a training program and a whole software program. Uh, so I'll send the team down to Atlanta uh, and they can work with 
uh, your people and whatever we know and whatever we can share, uh, we will do. In the meantime, send my uh, regards to uh, the former mayor there who uh, I worked with. Send my regards to uh, all the people at uh, Cent Centennial Park. When I was HUD secretary, I did a lot of work uh, in Atlanta, a lot of good work. I have a lot of fond memories. So send my regards to everyone. I'll get that team together, and they'll come down uh, to Atlanta as soon as it works for you. Thank you for being with Thank us, Mayor. I appreciate it. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks. Okay. Godspeed to the mayor. Where are we? Today is day 135. Let's talk about some facts first. Where are we? 792 hospitalizations today. That is very good news. Lowest since March 18th. You look at our rate of transmission all across the board every region we see good numbers uh, and again we have more data than any state in the country so uh, we live and die by the data and all the numbers are good you look across new york city the county numbers uh, they are all good and they are all consistent uh, you have a little deviation from day to day that's statistically irrelevant but uh, there's all good news in the numbers across the state and across the city. Uh, death toll for uh, yesterday is uh, 10 people. Again, we'd love to see that number at zero, but compared to where we have been, uh, that is a very good place to be. You look at the three-day average, and you see there the whole slope of what we've gone through. You see the descent and uh, the experts say to me, you'll never really get to zero on the number of deaths uh, because people die. This is a condition like pneumonia. It attacks the respiratory system. Uh, so people who are very ill can uh, contract COVID and it can be the cause of death. But uh, that's where we are now. We did 51,000 tests yesterday and it was just over 1%. So it is all good news on where uh, we are as a state. And uh, the numbers show that what we have done in terms of our reopening strategy and our plan has worked. We have been reopening for weeks now. Over one month we started uh, reopening. And we expected, after the reopening, we expected the numbers to tick up. They haven't ticked up. They've actually gone down. So the reopening strategy has worked. New York State SMART has worked. And it shows that this nation can defeat COVID. There was no reason to have these states on the increase. New York inherited a spike. Remember where we started. We were handed this high infection rate because nobody knew the virus had come from Europe. So we started with a high spike. We had to get that spike down. The other states didn't start with a spike. They just had to stop it from increasing. Uh, and with all we did in New York and all we knew, they were just blind to the reality. And again, I want to congratulate New Yorkers who really stepped up to, to the plate and they did what they had to do. And it was hard. Social distancing, closed businesses, closed schools, stay at home. It was hard. But they did it. We now get to the question of reopening schools. There is a state formula that will determine if it is safe to reopen schools, okay? So open schools or not, there's a state formula that determines it. There are then state guidelines as to, as to how that school reopens, right? State formula determines if it reopens. If it reopens, the second question is how, and that will be done by state guidelines. Uh, but the question of school opening is like the question of reopening the economy, reopening the schools, reopening the economy. It's the same conversation. And by the way, it's the exact same conversation with the President of the United States. 
We talked about reopening the economy. And he said, just reopen. Just reopen the economy. There's no reason for any of this stuff, phases, data, masks. It's all baloney. Just reopen. Yeah, we saw how well that worked. Go ask Florida and Texas and Arizona how well that worked. On schools, what does he say? Reopen the schools. Just open them up. Don't worry. Yeah. He was wrong on the economic reopening. He's wrong on the schools reopening. Everybody wants to reopen the schools. I want to reopen the schools. Everybody wants to reopen the schools. It's not do we reopen or not. You reopen if it is safe to reopen. How do you know if it's safe? You look at the data. You don't hold your finger up and feel the wind. You don't have an inspiration. You don't have a dream. You don't have an emotion. Look at the data. We test more. We have more data than any state. Look at the data. If you have the virus under control, reopen. If you don't have the virus under control, then you can't reopen. Right? We're not going to use our children uh, as a litmus test, and we're not going to, going to put our children in a place where their health is endangered. It's that simple. Common sense and intelligence can still determine what we do, even in this crazy environment. Uh, we're not going to use our children as guinea pigs. I say to the experts, it's very simple. If I'm making the determination as to whether or not I would send my daughter to school. If it's safe, I'll send her. If it's not safe, I'm not going to send her. And you can determine that by science. So the formula is this. Schools will reopen if that region is in phase four and the daily infection rate remains 5% or lower over a 14-day average, okay? You're in phase four, and you're under 5% infection rate. That means the virus is under control. That means it's safe to reopen. And then the schools can proceed to reopening in that region exactly how you look at the state guidelines. This determination will be made the first week in August. Second question is, what happens if between the first week in August and the day school opens, the virus spikes? I don't want to be in a position where we made a determination August 7th and then the virus spikes but we already said the schools are going to reopen. So the safety valve, there's a floor. Schools will close if the regional infection rate is above 9% on a seven-day average. Okay? So you get a green light, reopen in a region if you're in phase four and the infection rate is 5% or lower. If the infection rate goes over 9% on a seven-day average, that means the virus is uh, moving rapidly and it is not intelligent to open. That's the green light and that's the red light and it's the way we've done the economic reopening, it's purely on the numbers, purely on the numbers. It's on the science. We'll make the first decision. We'll look at the numbers the week of August uh, 1 to 7, the week because it's a rolling 14-day average. Different regions are in different positions uh, on the 14-day average. Between August 1st, you get a green light on August 1st. Between August 1st and the day the school opens, we continue to monitor every day. And if the infection rate goes over 9, then uh, we hit an emergency stop button, okay? Uh, it's very simple, it's clear. Once you get a green light to reopen, then how you reopen, you follow the guidelines. 
and we leave it to the 700 school districts across the state to come up with the specific plan pursuant to those guidelines. We have done state health guidelines. Uh, the State Department of Education is doing state education guidelines, which will incorporate our health guidelines. We had a great uh, Reimagine Education Advisory Council that did a lot of work to come up with the guidelines. Uh, Jim Malatras ran it for me. I want to thank them all very much for the good work they did, their education officials from all across the state. Uh, they came up with guidelines that will say the districts have to have flexible plans, they have to be safeguards, they're prioritizing safety, maximizing available space, focusing on arts, career, technical education. They have to be innovative. Uh, how do you use remote learning? How do you use innovative models, best practices? Uh, and all the guidelines will be up today. We want masks and PPE whenever students or staff cannot maintain social distancing. Masks work. They work for children, they work for teachers, they work for everyone. Uh, we have social distancing, six feet separations, we have cohort structures in the guidelines, uh, guidelines on transportation, food service, aftercare, extracurricular activities. Uh, every child and person entering will be screened. Uh, tracing has to work in the schools, cleaning and closure procedures. Uh, that's all in the guidelines. And again, we've done the health guidelines, uh, State Department of Education, uh, which I do not run, it's a separate agency, they'll do the education guidelines incorporating ours. Well then what's the bad news? All our numbers are good. All our numbers are good. Bad news is uh, we have to keep them that way. Uh, and there are challenges. There are two threats. First is lack of compliance by New Yorkers. We get arrogant, we get cocky, weather's warm, the numbers are good. I heard the governor, he said everything was good, there's nothing to worry about. I never said there's nothing to worry about. I never said that. I said the numbers are good. Uh, I worry every day. Well, you just worry a lot. No, I'm not really a worrier by nature. The circumstances cause me to worry. We have to remain compliant. And the local governments have to do their job and enforce compliance. Well, it's hard with younger people. I understand. Well, some people don't like to wear a mask. I understand. Well, socially distancing is difficult. I understand. We have to do it. If you don't do it, the virus will increase. Period. Period. I mean, this is, I'm not, this is not my opinion. I'm not guessing. We know it as a scientific fact. That's uh, the first threat. Second is the virus comes to New York. And this is a very real threat. Uh, and it is deja vu all over again. The first federal debacle was losing track of the virus that was supposed to be in China and not knowing it left China and it went to Europe and then it came here from Europe. And the federal government has now admitted this. It was one of the great federal blunders in history, cost thousands of lives in New York and billions of dollars. They just missed it. Yeah. It was a terrible miss and a terrible mistake. And it's what created the spike in New York. The second federal mistake is even after everything we went through, they allowed and pushed the other states to reopen recklessly, and you now have the virus out of control in other states, and it's going to fly back to New York. The first mistake brought it from Europe to New York. The second mistake will bring it from Georgia to New York, and Texas to New York, and Arizona to New York, and the 38 states that see the virus going up. Both times, New York did nothing wrong. It was the federal government that caused our problem. And then, frankly, 
wanted to have nothing to do with the solution. They caused the problem, and then they said, you're on your own. Literally, you have 39 states that are now seeing the virus increase and come to New York. So we talk about the valve. I talk about the valve. The reopening valve. And we talked about monitoring it all along. You now have to add two additional measures or dials to the valve. One is now you have to watch the effect of noncompliance and make sure the local governments are doing their job. The second dial is now the effect of the national outbreak and people coming here to New York with the virus. Those are the two new complications that have been added to the mix. And look, it is the federal government because it is the federal government. Sometimes it is what it is. And this has been gross negligence. They have been denying the reality of the situation from the beginning. It doesn't exist. It's going to go away. By Easter, we'll reopen. When it gets warm, it will go away like it's a miracle. It didn't go away. There was no miracle. You denied reality. This is their political agenda over public health policy. That's what this is. This is politically inconvenient in an election year. So deny it. Yeah. Except you are jeopardizing public health and you're losing lives by your denial and your political agenda. And then when the federal government didn't step up and handle this, this was a federal crisis. Why is New York State or the state of Georgia, or the state of California, or any of these states handling the COVID virus. It's a national issue. The president did a federal emergency declaration. You know what a federal emergency declaration means? It means a federal emergency. You know who's in charge of federal emergencies? The federal government. That's why they use the word federal in all of those expressions. I was in the federal government. When there's a federal emergency, it's the responsibility of the federal government. They just abandoned their post and said it's up to the states. And by the way, they got offended when the states asked for any resources or help from the federal government. If they're not going to step up and address a problem that, helps every, that hurts every state in the United States, then what is the point of the federal government? I mean, if you don't see that as your role, what is the role? And now the president is attacking science. What a surprise. No surprise. He's been attacking science from day one. The denial of reality was to deny science. And he's done that from day one. At the end of the day, science trumps politics. Politics does not trump science. You don't defeat a virus with politics. You defeat a virus by using science and medicine. That was true from day one. The president now says his own health officials are lying about the virus. His own CDC health officials are lying about the virus. Well, if the president is telling the truth, you know what he should do? He should fire them. He should fire them. You know what I would do if I believed my health commissioner was lying, I would fire him. If I said in this room, my health commissioner is lying about the coronavirus, you know what your first question would be? Governor, if he, you say he's lying, how do you not fire him? How do you keep him in charge of health policy if you say the person is lying? Because 
someone is clearly lying to the American people. And people are dying because of it. Trump's COVID scandal makes what Nixon did at Watergate look innocent. Nobody died in the Watergate scandal. Thousands of people are going to die in this COVID scandal. And that is all the difference in the world. You look at the facts, the facts clearly demonstrate Trump was wrong from day one. And New Yorkers have been right from day one. There's no argument. There's nothing to tweet about. The facts are in. The numbers are in. Look at the number of bodies. Look at the infection rate. New York's numbers have declined while the nation is going up. New York is down 70%. These other states, up over 800%. Florida, up 1,300%. Who's right, who's wrong? What's there to argue about? Those are the numbers. Tell me the numbers are wrong. It's all across the country. And it is undeniable. And it's now a threat to the state of New York. We have done a quarantine for the highest risk infection states. We know there have been instances of noncompliance. Noncompliance can lead to outbreaks. We're seeing it in Rensselaer County now where people came up from Georgia. We're going to have the Department of Health issue an emergency health order today that will mandate that out-of-state travelers from the states that are quarantined must provide uh, a location form before they leave the airport. The airlines will hand it out on the plane. It will also be available on the web. You can fill, fill it out electronically or you have to fill out the piece of paper on the airplane. You must give officials at the airport your form as to where you came from and where you're going before you leave the airport. It will be enforced in every airport in the state of New York. Downstate, the Port Authority will enforce it. If you leave the airport without providing the information, you will receive a summons immediately with a $2,000 fine. If you leave the airport, without filling out uh, the information. Not only can you have a $2,000 fine, you can then be brought to a hearing and ordered to comp complete mandatory quarantine, okay? None of this is pleasant, but we've gone through this before. We went through this when Rick Cotton and people at the Port Authority watched Three million Europeans, people from Europe, come into this state and bringing the virus. Fool me once. We can't be in a situation where we have people coming from other states in the country bringing the virus again. Uh, it is that simple. Again, Port Authority will do the enforcement in downstate New York. The other airports will do it in upstate New York. The general point is we have to stay diligent. New Yorkers have been truly amazing. And what they did was historic. They tamed the beast because they are New York tough, which means smart, united, disciplined, and loving. Those were the facts. I now want to give you an opinion. In this case, it's a very personal opinion. Personal opinion, but very personal. There's personal, then there's like very personal, which is even more personal than just personal. We went through 11 days of hell. Uh, everybody processed it their own way. I saw it as climbing a mountain 
and you had to climb that mountain every day and every day was hard and every day climbing the mountain you didn't even know how high the mountain was and at the same time you were designing the mountain because our behavior was going to design the mountain and design the plateau and the peak when will the virus stop when you stop the virus is what the experts would say to me it was like a cruel riddle every day when do the deaths stop when does the infection rate stop when you stop it what does that mean when the socially the social distancing works when the closed down policies work when the masks work so you're climbing a mountain and you are designing the curve of the mountain. It ends when you say it ends, right? This was traumatizing for people. And uh, on a personal level, economic level, it was frightening, it was isolating. Uh, everyone had their own demons they were dealing with. I had my own demons and my own fears. I'm afraid for my mother, afraid for my kids, afraid for my brother. Everyone had their own pain and their own trauma to deal with. But what we went through and what we did was historic. Because we did tame the beast. We did turn the corner. We did plateau that mountain and then we came down the other side. And they will be talking about what we did for decades to come. It really was an historic moment. Personally traumatic, socially uh, traumatic, and historic. So, I love history. I love uh, Poster art. Poster art is something they did uh, in the early 1900s, late 1800s, when they had to communicate their whole platform candidacy on one piece of paper, right? Uh, you wanted to run a campaign. They didn't have the TV commercials. They didn't have mail. They didn't have any of these things. So they got their whole message on one piece of paper. And it always fascinated me. I used so many words. What if somebody said, okay, no words. Paint me a picture that tells the story of what you're trying to say. That's poster art. And it's helped me because it's been like a relief valve. Uh, not that I don't have joy every day dealing with you guys, but I could go and just use a different side of my brain. Uh, and this was the m most famous, the uh, William Jennings Bryan with the octopus. He's fighting the octopus, and the octopus is corporate trusts that are taking over the economy, right? You could almost do that again today. So over the past few years, I've done my own uh, posters on that capture that feeling. I did this one for the state of the state, ship of state that was sailing in this sea of division, right, uh, back in January. Well, in any event, so I did a new one for uh, what we went through with COVID. And I think the general shape is familiar to, to you. We went up the mountain, we curved the mountain, we came down the other side. Uh, and these are little telltale signs that uh, to me represent what was going on that big arrow that goes right up through it, that was the economic models, right? We needed 120,000 beds, we needed 140,000 beds, and those models shot straight up. We had to bend the curve despite those models. We needed 30,000 ventilators, that model said. We almost get to the top of the mountain, economy falls, Get it? Economy falls like Niagara Falls, but then, then the economy drops, the economy falls, and uh, the economy comes running down. Timeline on the bottom from day one to day 111. Uh, it's roughly scaled. And then little visuals of what was going on. Starts on day one. 
little octopuses to tell, back to the William Jennings Bryan poster. Zach got that right away. First comes on a cruise ship, the COVID virus, right? We start the daily briefings. It's Jim Malatris and Stephanie Benton. Hand sanitizer. We have the winds of fear are blowing. Everybody's afraid. We have the plane bringing 3 million people from Europe, and that's how COVID came through the clouds of the federal government, CDC, et cetera. Testing, hospital surge, Javits Center. We're pulling down the curve together, right? 111 days of hell. The New Rochelle hotspot, first hotspot cluster. Testing, tracing, nasal swab, cute little button nose. I'm driving once again. One of the few benefits of this. I get to drive myself now. Subway disinfection. We've turned the corner, mask up, social distancing. The sun is on the other side of the mountain. We just had to make it to the other side of the mountain. There's the man in the moon. It's just the flu. Phase one, we're now coming down the other side. Boyfriend Cliff is there. Tell the people the truth. They will do the right thing. They made the boyfriend look like uh, Zach Fink. I'm not sure why. <laughs> Who's pulling down the curve? New Yorkers? Healthcare workers? The essential workers? Out-of-state volunteers, 30,000 people from out-of-state volunteer to come help us. I have my three daughters there. That's Captain. They have him a little paunchy. He's on a diet. He's not that bad, but he's on his way. Stock market reopens. We come down the other side. There's the briefing table. Out-of-state ban. Follow the facts. It's Arizona, Texas, Florida going up. Last little sign, caution ahead, caution ahead. We climb the mountain, we're down the mountain. Be cautious, what we're talking about today. Do compliance, watch people from other states. And we're still in the sea of division, which I talked about in January. Uh, even worse, George Floyd murder, racial tension, protests even worse than it was. So, New York tough, smart, united, disciplined, loving, in case you haven't heard that before, because love wins at the end of the day. Love is the rainbow. Timeline on the bottom, we forged community, and community wins. And you were part of it. And I'm going to give you a poster, because you were a part of it. Andrew. No, essential workers don't have to self-quarantine when they come back. I'm an essential worker. Second question has to do with the threshold. I think I'm an essential worker. Some people would say I'm not that essential, but. The threshold for schools, you talked about the percentage testing positive with the floor being 5% and the ceiling being 10%. Do you think that that threshold is going to be reached? Given that New York is somewhere around 1% right now, if you are below it, but up to somewhere around 4% at the time you're making the decision, and maybe Jim wants to be might that be an alarm bell right there? Yeah, well, look, yes. You can follow the number. That's what's nice about this. There's no politics. There's no personal opinion. There's no vagary. Look at the number. You're at 1%. Okay, as long as you don't go over 5, you have a green light. If you see 2, 3, if it's a consistent basis, then yeah, start to worry. Because if the number's going up, the number goes up. And if the number goes over five, you hit the red emergency button. So if you see two, three, four, yeah, you're probably headed for five, unless you do something very dramatic very quickly.
with the Fred, I think experts would say that that's really not the case, at least in terms of shootings. I'm wondering, number one, your reaction to that. Is that the kind of comment that ends up filling the void when there's a lack of explanation from city officials, including the mayor? Well, look, the uh, an incorrect, I don't know what she said, uh, so I have no comment on what she said, but uh, people have theories. An incorrect theory doesn't wind up being correct because there's a void. Uh, and I think we have been talking about what's going on. I don't think there is one answer, but I think you uh, raised a good point last week. I think there are a number of contributing factors. Uh, and you put all those factors together, uh, and that's what you're seeing going on. There's no one factor, and that's why it's a little more complicated. You know, in politics, they want to be able to say it's just this. It's not just this. There are a number of factors. Uh, but I don't think, uh, you know, you have violent crime, which is murder, et cetera, uh, more than robbery, you know. I think if the, the violent crimes have been... Uh, uh, more uh, drug-related, et cetera, on the facts. Yeah. On the rent issue specifically, though, um, as I'm sure you all remember, the governor did an executive order back in March that said there couldn't be any evictions on commercial or residential rent through June. We then extended that for anyone who was COVID hardship related through the end of August. In the interim, the legislature passed legislation that said that you can't um, be up for any rent evictions during this crisis, which is a bill that we signed, I think, a week and a half ago. And so I'm not sure how it could square that it's people that are concerned, like not able to pay the rent when right now there are no evictions on the table legally. So. Yeah, it is factually impossible that somebody committed a crime so they could pay their rent. If you can't pay your rent, you cannot be evicted right now. And if I could just ask about the uh, nursing home report, I want to get um, your response to criticism that the Logan Independent, maybe Jim can weigh in on this also. Specifically, one of the issues they raised was that it did not include deaths in hospitals from people who were nursing home residents. Does that make bad data going into the report? They use the publicly reported data, and the curve shows what the curves. The data, the facts are the facts. So I think it didn't material impact the overall outcome, which was the timing of the fatalities happened well before any of the admission policy. That the workforce itself was a driving factor because that's when the infections came in early on. So those material facts would not be changed one way or another. But we were basing it on the public. The Department of Health was basing it on the public data that everybody has. You know, it's where you count the death, Zach. If the person goes into the hospital, passes away in the hospital, we call that a hospitalization death, uh, as opposed to trying to trace every from a, how long did the person have to be from the nursing home into the hospital, uh, or you'd have to do it the other way, back it out of the hospital deaths, increase the nursing home, and reduce the hospitalization. But, you know, you add the two numbers together, it's the number. There's a test, testing supplies and PPE are increasingly in short supply nationwide. How much progress has New York ho, ho, New York hospitals made towards uh, realizing that 90-day goal that you set in early May to stockpile PPE? And how does that seven-state consortium you also announced about that time play into that? The consortium is more of a longer-term production mode. Uh, if you put those states together, can we manufacture our own? Uh, and is, does one state have the capacity to manufacture masks, and one state have the capacity to manufacture gowns, and one state have the capacity to manufacture the reagents for the testing, et cetera. Uh, the 90-day PPE is going to be a firm regulation. They must have 90 days of PPE in supply, period. There's no wiggle room on that. We gave them a period of time to ramp up. Uh, there's a cash flow issue, storage issue, et cetera. But everybody has to have 90 days of PPE in their own stockpile. Lesson learned. Uh, and that's a state rec. Any idea how many days they would, an average hospital in New York or New York City would have on hand at this point? They should have 90 days on hand now, or they would have had to get a waiver from the Department of Health 
because they didn't have the cash flow or something like that. But uh, I have not heard of anyone getting a waiver. And just in, to the governor's point, and it's the 90 days at the highest burn rate, which is the requirement at the, so sort of like at the peak of a new wave or something like that. And we're tracking this, many of the hospitals, we track it regionally as well, have more than 90 days. They've actually gone extra cautious. Some have 120 days worth of materials. So we're tracking all of that. I don't know of any waivers either. Um, but we'll check on that. That did not apply, Zach, to testing equipment. That was only hospital PPE. Yeah, what was the second question? Yeah, I don't think the state funding formula is goes by legislation now. It's a set formula for every school district uh, in the uh, in the state, 700 school districts. I don't think there's any variance in the law that would allow you to shift funds from one school district to another. Uh, on the uh, death rate across the state, look, it's, it is very, very good news. That's why I literally say congratulations to New Yorkers. Uh, we followed the data. We have a model that worked. It worked all across the state. It is working. We are reopening. The other regions outside of New York are even further down the road on reopening. And the numbers are all good. Yes, we have compliance issues, especially downstate New York uh, and Long Island. But it's been great news. I want to look ahead. You know, if it was just today, I'd say great, all great. But we've all learned the hard way, look ahead, what's the next shoe that could drop? I'm worried about people coming to New York. You are not a hermetically sealed bubble, right? Somebody lands in New York, they come through Rick's Airport, they come through JFK, LaGuardia, uh, Newark Airport, I remember the first positive we had was a health worker coming back through the airport. And I remember what that started. First case, uh, what Uber did she get into? What did, who, who at the gate did she say hello to? Where did she pick up her bag? What Uber driver? Who did she ha shake hands with in her hotel lobby? You know, it just, it came in through the airports. It will come in through the airports once again. Concerning the newly introduced air ventilation rules and protocols, people who apply to offices and retail locations, do you believe this might eventually pave the way towards an extension of the 50% 50, 50 capacity limits? It could. Look, the air filtration to me you know when we talk about being smart, right? What have we done in New York? We've been smart. Why? Because we're, we're smart. Uh, and common sense. Look at everything you can. This air filtration is a major function. It's not the most sexy of functions. And you won't hear many governors talking about air filtration. But you have a filter that can filter out the COVID virus? Wow, why aren't you using it? We then ran into all sorts of complications. This HVAC system fits it, this doesn't, et cetera. Uh, but we put out guidance. The HEPA filter is the best for those systems that can take it. Otherwise, you have to have a MERV 13 for a large congregate setting is the best, or down to a MERV 11. That's the floor and the ceiling, if you will. Uh, but I'm excited about the possibility, and we'll see how it goes. If, if the infection rate stays down, then you're going to see us continue to increase the capacity. 
And if the air filtration is one of those devices that keeps the infection rate down, great. Where are you going to fly to the... Sorry? Where are you going to, where are you going to go to these other states? Yeah, we're talking to a few states, and uh, we're seeing what they need and the best way to get it to them. Yeah, I don't know what you're listening to, what they're saying, or what it actually means. So we'll see what guidance they put out at the end of the day, and then we'll take it from there. Sir? What is the uh, certain fact that there is enough ticket gun violence in the city? Um, during his press conference this morning, the mayor tied largely to um, widespread availability of the legal gun stock. So you you just said that the don't tie the up in one single cause. Do you agree with that? I have not heard that there was an uptick in the availability of illegal guns. Is there? That's what the mayor pointed fingers at when he uh, was talking about the reason. I haven't heard of that. Have you heard of that? No, and I would just caution that last week it was bail reform and it was the chokehold ban and it was Rikers and then it's rent and now it's this. I think that this is a really complex issue that is really incredibly important to the safety of the people of New York and that people should refrain from tossing around theories with no facts behind them. Governor. Yeah, let's someone who didn't answer. Yes. Oh boy, I would ask Governor Cuomo, did you really design that poster or did somebody else design that poster? Was that really you or did somebody else do that? I would say, if the answering is me, I would say yes, I designed it. I resent that question. I don't like the implication of it. I think it was personally derogatory uh, and hostile. So yes, I said I designed it because I designed it. Uh, what would I ask Andrew Cuomo, uh, separating him from Governor Cuomo? I would ask Andrew Cuomo, uh, how are you doing through all of this? And uh, when you look back, what do you think? on a personal level? I would say that's a personal question, and I think it's inappropriate to ask me at this venue. Uh, and I'd get a little defensive. And then I would say, I think at the end of the day, we will actually be stronger as a society for what we went through. I think my family is stronger as a family for what we went through. I would say it was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Uh, I think it was the hardest thing a lot of New Yorkers did. But uh, I think I am stronger for it. I think my family is stronger for it. I think we're stronger for it as a society uh, on the theory that that which doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I just hope we never have to go through it again and I hope this nation gets the message and those other states get the message so we save lives in this country and if they follow what New York did we will save lives and nothing is more important than that thank you guys thank you very much thoughts on using convention centers or other, uh, thank other you. spaces for schools as I mentioned in the any panel. school district yes, that wants to propose you're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. 
lots of space in this mall. It's been a part of American culture and the economy for generations. But the future of the traditional mall more uncertain than ever, with the COVID crisis closing stores for months on end, and in some cases, closing up for good. That's what happened at Metro Center Mall in Phoenix, going out of business last month after almost 50 years. We're really sad about it. I have a lot of childhood memories here. came here every Saturday with my mom. Metro Center is the latest casualty in the retail apocalypse. Brick and mortar stores shutting permanently as online shopping becomes an even bigger part of the new normal. What has coronavirus done to the demise of malls? We could be talking about 400 malls that may not make it as a result of COVID because tenants don't have the ability. It's not that they don't want to pay their rent. They don't have the financial means. That's what ultimately forced legendary names like Brooks Brothers, J.C. Penney, Neiman Marcus, and J. Crew to file for bankruptcy in the pandemic. And now experts say in this economic and health crisis, shoppers are spending more carefully than ever and avoiding malls and crowds. Coronavirus has also devastated multiplex movie theaters that are attached to malls. So many of them still closed or selling fewer tickets to maintain that social distance cutting off an important source of foot traffic for them all. How does the movie theater factor change what happens for malls and their ability to survive? Well, that is the $10 million question. I think that the future of the movie theaters are going to be actually the biggest change in the mall. We've spoken to some landlords who are already thinking about how to reuse that space, but we have to think about it in a different way. If we don't, we're just kidding ourselves. That reinvention is already underway in Houston. This former Sears will soon become a new home for startups, academic research, apartments, and yes, some retail stores. Other ideas? Turn the sprawling spaces vacated by department stores into mini fulfillment centers, grocery stores, gyms, and dividing up the real estate for smaller stores that got their start online. Perhaps a new circle of life for retail as we know it. Jolene Kent, NBC News, Los Angeles. Let's stay in Texas now, where, like other states, the virus is spreading rapidly among young people. Ella Leopold is an otherwise healthy 26-year-old. In fact, she's a fitness instructor, but she tested positive for COVID-19 last month and has been documenting her journey on social media. Ella is with us now this morning from her home in Dallas, and also joining us this morning is NBC News medical contributor, Dr. Kavita Patel. Uh, good morning to both of you. Good morning. Good, good morning, um, Ella, let me start with you. I know, good morning. I know you tested positive about 17 days ago. Tell us mm -hmm. how you're feeling right now. Um, today, physically, I feel great. Um, I would say I'm a little bit fatigued, um, but most of my symptoms have cleared up. Um, so I'm still testing positive right now. So I'm just hoping for a negative test today. I'll hope for that, too. So, Ella, I know you've been documenting your journey uh, by posting videos on Instagram. Talk about why you decided to share uh, your story in such a public way and how has the response been for you? Yeah, um, it was kind of a no brainer for me because I feel like this is this huge virus that um, we're all hiding from, but it wasn't very humanized and you don't really get the, a look on what people's journey are like. Um, so. My reaction really has been, oh my gosh, overwhelming. Um, I think a lot of people were living in shame with the virus. And so I just wanted to put a face to the virus and show that um, it's real. And the virus doesn't discriminate how young you are, or how active you are. Um, the virus can really take over anyone's body. Um, yeah. Well, you're only 26 years old. You were seemingly, you know, in perfect health before COVID. Uh, and with statistics yeah. showing, frankly, that younger people are at a, lar a large number of the newly infected uh, cases, what would you say to your peers who may not be taking this seriously? And I have to say, you know, we're looking at some of these videos. You know, you've got this beautiful smile. You know, how challenging was it at its worst? The worst I've ever experienced. Um, it was completely crippling. Um, I would make sure everyone is wearing a mask this virus it lasts a while too um like i'm on day 18 and i will not be teaching for a while um it gets into every single part of your body um from your lungs to your heart and it's just not worth it um 
the pros versus cons of wearing a mask is a no-brainer. Put your mask on and wash your hands because I would not wish this upon anyone, even if your body is healthy and able and capable. Let me bring in Dr. Patel here. Uh, I know you have not treated Ella, but why do you think it is that we're seeing such a rise in young people becoming infected? And from a medical standpoint, uh, what are the concerns as we see the number of cases grow? Yeah, absolutely. And Ella, I'm so glad you're doing well and on and recovering. But as mm -hmm. she eloquently stated, Chanel, um, it's it's pretty serious. And we're seeing a rise in young people for several reasons. Number one, we've had people staying indoors for months and younger mm -hmm. people, 18 to 40, especially are more likely to go into places like bars, restaurants, clubs. They end up being the people that work in those places, Chanel. So mm -hmm. they are themselves mm -hmm. at a higher risk of being in around other people in close contact. And that's what's driving a greater proportion of the new cases in the United States. And Dr. Patel, what about so-called super spreaders? How do you define that? And generally speaking, is there evidence that shows that younger people might be more likely to be these super spreaders, if you will? Yeah, so super spreaders are basically people who can infect, instead of infecting potentially one other person, a super spreader or a super spreader event, which is what a lot of young people are attending, are places where one person could have the potential to infect anywhere from three, five, ten or more people. And it's really the events that they're at. So yes, younger people tend to be in weddings, small gatherings in the home, bars, restaurants, clubs. And as we've reopened the country, these super spreader events have become one of the driving factors for these hot spots, especially in some of the larger states, California, Texas, Florida, but also in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and many other places around the country. And finally, I know Ella just talked about the importance of wearing masks. Dr. Patel, I'll end with you. We've been hearing a lot uh, lately about the importance of wearing a mask. What do you think the message should be? I'm in a hot spot here. I'm in South Carolina. I had to make a rent, rent an errand this weekend. And people are still not wearing masks. They say they're hot. They say they're uncomfortable. It's, you know, it's turned into a political issue as opposed to science. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, Chanel. And, and Ella said it better than I could, but just uh, some brief facts. Up to 80% of people who are positive had no symptoms when they were positive. And we now know that people who are asymptomatic could be the most contagious. That's reason number one to wear a mask. It protects others from you. We also now have proof and growing evidence that this could be airborne or stick around in the air, Chanel. So wearing a mask could also protect you from getting COVID. It is pure science. If it's uncomfortable, I beg people, try to find something that's comfortable for you. It just mm -hmm. has to be some sort of fabric covering over your nose and mouth. And remember, it can protect yourself and the people around you. Yes. Well, Ella, thank you mask. so much for talking with us. I hope you feel better soon and you get that positive you. Uh, result thank that you, you need. Or actually, you would need a negative result. <laughs> yes, <laughs> All right, Dr. Negative. Patel, we thank you for negative. talking with us as well. You want the negative. It is said there's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. Perhaps the time has come to fully realize the dream upon which this great country was founded. Equal justice under the law. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Well, we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Introducing Peacock. What's Peacock? This is Peacock. Let's go! It's streaming, launching, Woo! premiering. It's TV, yeah! movies, exclusive originals, original characters. Duh. It's sports. Breaking news. Docs, tunes. Wait, there's more. More? Yes, yes, more. more. Tons. It's quick stuff, binge stuff, tough stuff, love stuff. It's trending. Mind bending. It's late night, early morning. Good morning. It's you see this? You remember that? You watched every single one of those? It's for you, for ew, for aw. It's Chrisley, Pawnee, Monkey, ET. Oh, oh. and it's free. Free, 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 free. Who's with me? That's Peacock. Yes, That's who. Free? That's what. That's why. Come on. Boom. Oh, mic drop. You can't not watch.
We'd like to think that we live in some sort of post-racial America. We are reminded time and time again that we do not. Chanel, I reached out to you after I watched the mayor of Atlanta act as a mom trying to raise her son. And I think about you and your kids. I remember her coming home saying, why don't I have a ponytail like the white girls? It's okay to notice that you're different. You just have to not feel less than. That's my thing. I cherish the fact that we can have these discussions. I feel safe talking about this with you guys. Live music now back in action, but with a twist. Instead of making your way to a seat or fighting your way through a crowd, music fans are pulling into a parking spot for drive-in concerts. Live Nation organizing a weekend of shows in St. Louis, Nashville, and Indianapolis. Thousands pulling up to see some of their favorite artists live, like Darius Rucker, who told us he couldn't wait to get back on stage. The response has been great. People, you know, just with the social distancing and everything and, and actually getting to see live music, I think people are excited. Brad Paisley hitting the stage in all three cities, bringing in Carrie Underwood for a virtual duet in Nashville. Paisley posting these photos on Instagram with the caption, live music will live on, we will beat this virus. Organizers offering fans lots of room with nine feet of personal tailgate space next to your parking spot, plus another nine feet of buffer space between you and the next group. Concert goers not required to wear masks outside their cars unless mandated by local laws or the individual venues. Encore Live planning an all new virtual performance with Blake Shelton, Gwen Stefani and Trace Adkins after a virtual Garth Brooks concert in June drew astonishing numbers with an estimated 350,000 people going to more than 300 drive in theaters to watch the country megastar. For now, it's at least some kind of return to normalcy, you know, for the music industry and for the live music industry, which I mean, has just seen, you know, its revenue go to zero. And it's not just concerts folks are going to see. The classic drive-in movie is seeing a resurgence too. Walmart partnering with Tribeca Films to transform 160 of its store parking lots into contact-free drive-in theaters this summer. As Suffolk Downs Racetrack in Boston plans to start showing drive-in movies again for the first time in 50 years. A little dose of the past as summer fun gets reimagined. Now, if you're wondering about safety, staff at both the Live Nation and Encore Live events are required to wear masks. There's good news tonight about a unique way that some dads are building stronger bonds with their young daughters. It's their chance to become better role models, even if it means going way out of their comfort zone. Bring it up to the middle. It's the beauty of ballet reimagined in an unconventional class combining dance with yoga, creating a special connection between dads and daughters. Lifelong dancer Aaron Lee founded the Isha Pei Dance Arts Studio seven years ago in Philadelphia, but started this class just last year. Back then, it was a class in a studio, a special place for fathers and their little girls to bond and build character. Go to the front of that. It's to really change the narrative of a fatherhood, a black fatherhood. Lift up and swim And um, the role that they have in their daughter's lives. Here we go. You ready, Noah? Up to your time. Julian Myers goes with his six-year-old Nola. Tell me what's different about this class, Julian. And it's all about just showing them that we're here to support you, we love you, real men do ballet. Especially dads. James Jackson is an essential worker delivering meals to those in need. When the pandemic hit and the classes went online, he and daughter Jay adjusted. It's like, now we gotta do stuff in the living room, you know what I mean? Just to try to, you know, stay together and, and now that we, you know, do the Zoom meetings and things like this, we can kind of still stay connected. And we're gonna bring it up over our heads. Good and during job. these uncertain times, Before instructor Tamisha area. Anderson like, is helping yeah, like these families nice make new people. memories. By having my dad there, he is right next to me and he helps me and he is doing the dances with me. What's fun about it? Um, uh, cause my daddy spin me around. How is your dad as a ballet dancer? He is a little bit good. 
Still dancing despite the distance, but hoping for the day when they can all be in class together again. This is something that we'll never lose. Those daddy-daughter moments where, you know, she'll grow up and she's like, yeah, my dad did yoga with me. As I get older, I'll look back like, hey, you remember this? It's about a lot more than just dance. I'm like really nervous about this one. An Ivy League dream. Congratulations! Now a reality for 24-year-old Rahan Staten. But his path to Harvard Law School was paved with challenges. His mother left their family when he was just eight years old. His father worked three jobs to provide for Rahan and his brother Reggie. There were times where we just didn't have electricity. We didn't have food in, in the fridge. Their struggles at home took a toll on Rahan's schoolwork. Initially rejected from every Every college he applied to after high school, he got a job collecting trash and cleaning dumpsters with his brother. Rahan was later accepted to the University of Maryland, but when his father had a stroke, he started working as a trash collector again. His days would start at 4 a.m. so he could work before school. If you put in the effort and the work and you stay committed, things will fall into place. And they did. Rahan went on to be the student speaker at his graduation. And as Turks, we are champions because we pick each other up. Now he's grateful for his family and friends who picked him up as he looks ahead to attending one of the top law schools in the country. Rahan, Rahan joins us from his home in Maryland. Wow. That was awesome, Rahan. All right, look, when you graduated high school, not one college would let you in. And here we are today. You were pushing that button and you and you got the okay from Harvard. Just take us for a second inside that moment when you clicked the button and you saw that you were accepted into Harvard. It was probably the most surreal moment of my life. I mean, after going through everything that we did as a family, I just felt that, you know, we got into Harvard. And I I just can't even explain it. It was we. Hmm. Beautiful. We should also point out, I mean, Harvard, obviously, you know, blue chip school. But you got into Pepperdine, (laughs) Penn, Columbia, (laughs) USC. (laughs) And you struggled academically in, in high school, Rahan, as we understand it. How'd you turn things around? Well, I actually just had a support system the second time around. In high school, didn't have the just I just didn't have the support. And when I got to the, um, undergrad, I had teachers, other students, you know, leaders. Like holistically, I just couldn't fail at that point. Too much support. Rahan, it's Carson. Congratulations, man. We're excited for you. It's a great story. I know you had a lot of support from your family. What was the support like from your fellow uh, coworkers when you were working uh, on the trash collection? It was the, like the first time in my life a group of individuals who, like that weren't my father or my brother hmm. that just came around me and supported me. You know, I always people always say, you know, you look to the role model society, teachers and, you know, people of that standard. But despite that, it was the first time in my life a group of people really just empowered me, up, uplifted me, told me that I was intelligent. So I was just, you know, I believed in the hype and I was ready to go to school. (laughs) That is so awesome. And I think what accentuates what you've what you've done now is that you had a tough go of it. Your mom left when you were a little kid. There were times when it got so bad that you were talking about there wasn't even food on the table at times. How do you think you endured those years? Well, watching my father work anywhere between like one to three jobs, giving up his entire social life just to give my brother and I the basic needs. And I, just, I was hungry, if that makes sense. You know, I was, I was literally hungry, but also at the same time, I just really wanted to, um, to succeed. And at that time, I was really involved in sports, and I thought sports would be a way out of poverty. But watching my fa- father being supportive of my brother, if it wasn't for those two, it would, just, it would have been impossible. Rahan, we are Congrats. super proud of you. Yes, Keep us posted on your life. I know Send us can... some Harvard gear. Yeah. You wear it well. <laughs> All right. Way to go, Rahan. <laughs> Thank you, babe. This is just the beginning oh. of Rahan's story. Folks began lining up here to get coronavirus tests at 1 a.m., and they may end up waiting eight days or more to get the results. Health officials say one of the big problems is that people go about their lives as they're waiting for those test results, potentially spreading coronavirus. How bad is the problem? Well, if Florida were its own country, it would rank number four in the world. First, the entire United States, then followed by Brazil and India. 
This morning, Sunbelt hotspots are spiking. Florida setting a national record, reporting more than 15,000 new cases of COVID-19 in a single day. At its worst, New York reported slightly more than 11,500 in a single day. I think something needs to be done and something needs to be done now. The unwanted surge comes after the state received over 140,000 test results in just one day. On Saturday, Florida's governor repeated his claim that people trying to escape the heat by going indoors may be to blame. When it's hot, people would rather be you know, inside and enclosed air conditioned spaces. It is going to be a better vector for transmission. This morning, some Florida communities are rolling back reopenings, closing indoor dining at restaurants, and in Miami-Dade County, a renewed 10 p.m. curfew. Despite the rise in positive tests, Walt Disney World welcoming tourists. Temperature checks and face masks required. But outside the park, Florida's Governor DeSantis is steadfast in his decision that he will not mandate masks. A stark contrast to Texas, where Governor Abbott ordered mask wearing statewide. I made this tough decision for one reason. It was our last best effort to slow the spread of COVID-19. If we do not slow the spread of COVID-19, the next step would have to be a lockdown. One person who did wear a mask for the first time in public, President Trump. He donned a mask with a presidential seal when he visited the Walter Reed Medical Center Saturday to meet with wounded service members and health care workers. The president has been reluctant to wear masks, even though the administration's top health experts have been recommending them for months. When you're in a hospital, especially in that particular setting where you're talking to a lot of soldiers and people that in some cases just got off the operating tables, I think it's a great thing to wear a mask. And in San Antonio, a 30-year-old hospitalized after attending a so-called COVID party where people intentionally try to get sick has died. Just before the patient died, uh, they looked at their nurse and they said, I think I made a mistake. I thought this was a hoax, but it's not. Florida breaking another record in the last 70 day, or last seven days, 73 people a day dying from coronavirus three weeks ago. This morning, as coronavirus cases surge nationwide, many hospitals and hotspots are dealing with a pandemic showing no signs of slowing down. In Hidalgo County, Texas, which hit a record 1,274 new cases on Thursday, hospitals are inundated with patients. You see these warehouses of people on life support machines. Uh, it's dire. When you're counting how many ventilators you have left, uh, do you have two left, do you have six left? That's dire. In South Carolina, where new cases have now surpassed 56,000, NBC News was given an exclusive look inside a COVID ICU in West Columbia, the floor quickly approaching capacity. What we decided, um, if you're okay with it, is to give you the best chance possible and to put that breathing tube in you, okay? Dr. Carol Cho making the difficult choice to put another patient on a ventilator. Her third intubation in one day. Working in the COVID unit has been very emotionally and mentally taxing. In hard hit Arizona, many hospitals in Phoenix are also grappling with an influx of new patients. We're at over 100% capacity if that's possible. But Every place there's a potential bed, we have a person. Dr. Michelle Isayak has been on the front lines of the pandemic in California for months. The state reaching an alarming positivity rate and more than 322,000 confirmed cases. It's intense. It's busy. There are sick people. We're you know, constantly on the go and constantly on our feet, making quick decisions, acting, uh, trying to act in the best interests of our patients and being safe. In Florida, the center of the country's new surge in cases, Tallahassee Memorial Healthcare has been forced to reopen its COVID units. Not only do I come to work and worry about the safety of my patients, but I also worry about taking COVID home to my family. Doctors and nurses in a life and death fight to save patients, a battle with no end in sight. Here in Southern California last week, some hospitals did reach capacity, having to send patients seven hours away for treatment. Today, there is room inside ICUs, but if the infection rate continues, there could also be... 
As the debate over reopening schools heats up, Education Secretary Betsy DeVos hit the airwaves to push the president's message. It's not a matter of, how, of if, it's a matter of how we reopen schools and how kids get back to learning full time. DeVos says schools must open for in-person classes this fall and insists it can be done safely, despite a surge in new coronavirus cases in many states. But she did not offer a plan for how to do it. The key is that kids have to get back to school, and we know there are going to be hot spots, and those need to be dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis. But the rule should be that kids go back to school this fall. She also downplayed the potential health risks. There's nothing in the data that suggests that kids being in school is in any way dangerous. But internal CDC documents obtained by the New York Times warned that fully reopening schools and universities would create the highest risk for the spread of the coronavirus. Public health experts worry children could serve as carriers who pass the virus to others. Adding to the uncertainty, during last week's White House Coronavirus Task Force briefing, Dr. Deborah Burks told me there isn't enough testing data to draw conclusions about the infection and transmission rates among children. If you look across all of the tests that we've done and whether we, when we have the age, the portion that is then the lowest tested portion is the under 10 year olds. On Sunday, DeVos also doubled down on the administration's threat to withhold federal funding from schools that refuse to open. If schools aren't going to reopen and not fulfill that promise, they shouldn't get the funds. Condemnation from House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Oh, this is appalling. They're messing. They're messing the president and his administration are messing with the health of our children. Meantime, the White House is taking aim at the nation's top infectious disease expert, Dr. Anthony Fauci. In a statement over the weekend, an administration official told, told NBC News that several White House officials are concerned about the number of times Dr. Fauci has been wrong on things. This official also provided a lengthy length of, uh, of examples. They failed to note that Fauci's views were considered accurate at the time, but that the science had evolved. And of course, this whole effort comes as Fauci has been openly critical of shortcomings in the country's coronavirus response, as President Trump has publicly disagreed with him, and with opinion polls showing the American public trusts Fauci's advice over the president's. Savannah? All right, Jeff, back to schools for a moment. Uh, the administration reportedly planning on releasing its own set of guidelines for schools. What do you know about that? Yeah, well, a senior administration official tells us the White House plans to issue its own guidelines for the reopening of schools, which could be released as early as this week. We're told the White House recommendations will include some of those issued by the CDC and other ones from the American Academy of Pediatrics, but it risks creating even more confusion with state and local officials Dr. Ashish Jha is a professor of global health at Harvard School of Public Health, and he joins us now. Dr. Jha, good morning to you. Uh, you see what's happening in Florida. How do you explain it? What do you make of this record daily surge of cases there? Yeah, so good morning, and thank you for having me on. You know, um, the situation in Florida is pretty worrisome. There were more cases yesterday in Florida than in all of Europe yesterday, and this is uh, obviously a situation that's getting worse. Um, I think we know how we got here, right? We, uh, Florida, along with other states, uh, opened up too early when they weren't quite ready. They didn't meet the White House's own guidelines. Uh, and they opened up too aggressively. They had bars and restaurants and, and other things open when they weren't ready to do it. And then I think the biggest problem recently is they've been too slow to react. Still don't have a statewide mandate for masks. Uh, there are a lot of other things that I think they still should be doing. And, and I don't think Florida has been as aggressive as it needs to be. What about the those who say, look, it's a function of more testing. There has been a surge in testing in Florida as well. And the governor there points out that many, many of these cases are actually among young people. Does that mitigate it in all, at all in your mind, make it any less worrisome? Well, I, look, there has been a surge in testing, but what we've seen in Florida is a big increase in hospitalizations. That can't be explained by testing. And now we're seeing a big increase in deaths. 
And obviously that can't be explained by um, by testing. So uh, the fact that it is among a slightly younger population is helpful, but we are still seeing many of them get sick uh, and many of them die. And then more recently, we've started just in the last couple of days seeing data that, in at least in Texas and in other places, older people are starting to get infected again, partly because young people and old people mingle. They live with each other. And so the idea that it could stay just among young people is probably unrealistic. You know, we've seen obviously surges in Arizona and Texas, Florida, we've discussed at length. You also see it in California where the perception was that they reopened uh, at a more measured pace. How do you explain that they too, California too, is seeing this, this increase in cases? Yeah, so California is a state that did a lockdown early, had had a very aggressive policy. Um, when they relaxed their regulations, they really left it up to local counties. I think a lot of states did that. And a lot of counties, especially in Southern California, I think, again, made a lot of the same mistakes, pulled back too early. And then I think the state was slow to react to it. So when I look at parts of Southern California, um, it looks the same as, as Arizona and Texas, in real trouble. And I'm hoping in the days and weeks ahead, we're going to see a very aggressive response from the government, uh, from the governor of California. I do want to talk about the issue of schools, which we just covered. The education secretary, Betsy DeVos, said on a show yesterday, there's nothing in the data that suggests that kids being in school is in any way dangerous. What do you think of that? Do you agree? I think that's a little more cavalier than I would be willing to be. Uh, there's no question in my mind that kids are less likely to get sick. And there's pretty good evidence that they're less likely to spread the disease in adults. But that's really not the question. The question is, in a hot spot like Arizona or Texas or Florida or, you know, probably about a dozen states, if you open up and have large numbers of people, kids and adults, in, a, in buildings inside all day, can you do that safely? And I think most experts would say not really, not if you are in a hot spot. So in places where things are really bad, I think it's going to be very hard to open schools and keep them open. All right, Dr. Jha, always good to talk to you. Thanks for your time. This morning, Disney fans are experiencing the magic once again. Oh my God, I'm gonna cry. <laughs> the sight of the beloved theme park returning, bringing some to tears. <laughs> As visitors get their first taste of rides and lines in a socially distanced environment. Disney is not only limiting the number of guests allowed in the park each day, they've also implemented a new ticketless reservation system. They're checking visitors' temperatures when they enter the park and requiring them to wear face masks too. They're doing sanitizing, masks, we have a face shields on the cast members. I mean, it is a very different park than when it was closed down in March. Has that changed your kids' experience at all? Brooke, has it changed your experience? Um, no, not at all. The Evans family from California booked their trip to Disney World back in March. The magic is still here. You know, it feels a little different with the masks. It's hot, we're sweating, but, um, but we can do it. But not everyone is pleased about Mickey's return. Taking to social media, I love you, Disney, but reopening Walt Disney World at this time is a big mistake. Hashtag profits before people. New infections in this state, passing a quarter million over the weekend and 15,000 in a single day. How worried are you? I'm worried because not only are we seeing spikes in the virus, we're seeing spikes in hospitalizations. Disney World isn't the only theme park to reopen after a COVID-related closure. SeaWorld. Legoland and Universal Orlando, part of our parent company NBC Universal, all reopened in June. Universal Orlando and SeaWorld requiring employees and guests to wear face masks, with Legoland encouraging its guests to wear them. All of the parks have temperature checks, cashless payments, and social distancing on the lines for rides. But as COVID-19 cases in Florida continue to rise, Families like the Evans are forced to make some tough choices. We're trying to put some sort of normalcy in our kids' lives at the same time as weighing the cost and potential risk of doing this. Now, Disney didn't provide any numbers as to how many people actually visited over the weekend or respond to our request for comments on these criticisms. The company did, however, release a video 30 seconds on social media called Welcome Home featuring employees with masks on. That was widely panned online, with one user dubbing the words to say, stay at home. This is Borough Park, Brooklyn. As we were walking over here, 
you said to me, in some ways, it's like going back 100 years. Mm -hmm. The largest group of Orthodox Jewish people outside Israel live here in Greater New York. Here, it's an old world way of life. Some don't have televisions or computers, says Dr. Israel Ziskin, who is Orthodox himself. Most of the community are, grand, are grandchildren and children of Holocaust survivors. Dr. Ziskin spent part of his childhood here, where he now practices pediatrics. What would you say the average number of children in any given family is? Probably within the six to eight uh, child range. Large families in small apartments was part of why this community was one of the first places COVID-19 struck and struck hard. Must have gotten one day between three and 4,000 calls. Rabbi Yehuda Kazira runs what he calls a kosher Ronald McDonald house here in Lakewood, New Jersey, providing Orthodox Jews with medical support free of charge. We're the same like everybody else, but uh, many of our religious needs that we practice sometimes can be, um, you know, sometimes misinterpreted or misunderstood. In fact, it was the celebration of a religious holiday, Purim, in early March that he believes catapulted the virus into their community. When Purim was around, we didn't know anything about social distancing, about mask wearing. Nobody wore masks. Because I think the impression a lot of people have is that the Orthodox community was just ignoring advice. You're telling me that really this all got started before the advice was there to accept 100%, or ignore. 100%. They were not ignoring advice. They were not. Uh, the community by far are law-abiding citizens. But scenes like this rabbi's funeral in late April, during the height of the pandemic in New York, led many to feel the Orthodox community was not taking social distancing seriously. Some in the Orthodox community made headlines again last month by breaking into this closed city playground. We are going to keep this back open for all of our children. With few masks and no distancing, which is what we saw on our recent tour of Borough Park. Is the feeling that it's passed by here now? Yes. Yeah, I think and do you feel confident in that? I feel confident in that. While public health officials would disagree, there is no question the community has tried to turn their high infection rate into something positive. In early April, when Dr. Michael Joyner at the Mayo Clinic told the rabbi that the blood of those who had survived COVID-19 was needed for the national convalescent plasma effort, people quickly stepped forward. The first hurdle, testing their blood to see if they have the antibodies to fight COVID-19. Literally within a matter of three, four hours, we collected a thousand vials. The blood put in coolers, taken to a private jet, and flown to the Mayo Clinic. What did it feel like to be on that plane? It felt like being on a, a godly mission. As it turned out, a very successful one. Of those first thousand, about approximately 60 percent had antibodies. And this was like, we have that golden ticket in our hand. That's... So like 600 people. Wow. I love you saying it felt like a golden ticket. <laughs> Since April, Orthodox Jews have become the largest group of plasma donors, donating roughly half of the convalescent plasma supply in the nation. So literally in this room is where that seed started to sprout. We used to call ourselves a mom and pop organization and all of a sudden we found ourselves taking on a national responsibility. From something ugly, something beautiful. What you're saying is you're trying to give something back. We live in a closed world, that's the way of life, but wherever we can Give a hand, be a beacon of light. It's our, it's our mitzvah. The rabbi and his colleagues have set up drives now across the country. Now, the plasma isn't just being used to help patients, not just for transfusions, but also to be studied. In fact, 8,000 vials have been sent to 10 institutions around the world as they try to study why the virus is so deadly for some people and barely affects others. A storied football franchise may be on the cusp of dropping its controversial name.
Overnight, multiple media outlets, including ESPN and the Washington Post, reporting Washington's NFL team could retire its name today. The potential change first reported by the Sports Business Journal. In recent weeks, the team has been facing significant corporate and political pushback to change the moniker, widely viewed as a racial slur against Native Americans. One of the league's original franchises, the name dates back 87 years. Earlier this month, delivery giant FedEx, which owns the naming rights for the team stadium in Landover, Maryland, issued a one-sentence statement. We have communicated to the team in Washington our request that they change the team name. This, as Adweek magazine reported, the investment firms and shareholders worth $620 billion asked FedEx, along with Nike and Pepsi, to terminate their ties to the franchise, unless team owner Dan Snyder made the change. Like FedEx, Nike and PepsiCo have announced they support a new name. Meanwhile, multiple lawmakers told the Washington Post the team would only be allowed to relocate from Maryland back to D.C. if the name was gone. And like Nike, Amazon, Target and Dick's Sporting Goods also pulled Washington's merchandise. Ten days ago, the organization released a statement saying it was conducting a thorough review of the name. A major reversal for Snyder, who bought the team in 1999, had previously said he'd never make the change, claiming the name honors Native American heritage. We are people, not mascots. A citizen of the Pawnee Nation, Crystal Echo Hawk, recently telling NBC News. The R word is the N word, and we can no longer tolerate this kind of hate speech in our society. This is what democracy looks like. And now, as the movement to confront racial inequality pushes forward, an NFL franchise could take the field this fall with a new identity. So what will the new name be? We simply don't know yet. There's a lot of online discussion about the Warriors, the Red Tails, the Red Hawks. No official word yet from the team. However, we are told that the team would like to honor veterans as well as uh, Native Americans and that right now any new name is tied up in trademark discussions. We'll have to play it by ear and see what happens. Yeah. Guys, back to you. Mm -hmm. Announcement expected to come in a few hours. It's hard to understate, though, how big of a deal mm -hmm. this is. And quite frankly, Tom, it's a little surprising the speed with which they moved as well. I think this all came about because of the immense pressure out of the Black Lives Matter movement and then all of the pressure that's been coming to bear over the last few months on all of these racial equality issues. But make no mistake, if you've been living here in Washington, as you know, Craig, this has been an issue month after month after month for mm -hmm. years now. The pressure. It's strange to think of the NBA season starting again without Steph Curry, the superstar point guard for the Golden State Warriors. But these are strange times. Curry's Warriors are not among the 22 teams to qualify to gather in Orlando inside what some are calling the NBA bubble. They're playing in a bubble. They're living in this bubble in Orlando. You and your Warriors, uh, not one of the 22. What's it like being outside the bubble looking in? From what I hear in the bubble, obviously they're playing, they're, they're making it work. Uh, it's going to be a, a huge sacrifice for all the guys to uh, stick with the protocols, be safe, but play basketball. So hopefully it works. Hopefully we get through October, there's, there's a finals, and, and uh, see who comes out on top. We caught up with Curry as he played in the American Century Golf Championship at Lake Tahoe over the weekend. While there, he and Charles Barkley and other big names from pro sports took part in a roundtable special for NBC Sports called Race and Sports in America, Conversations. As a young father with a seven-year-old and a five-year-old, the questions that they're asking because they're being shown these images, you can't and you shouldn't really shield them from this. What do you want people to take away from the special? What did you take away from that conversation? Anytime we have the opportunity to speak on it, to share our experience, to have people listen, um, and keep applying pressure. I think that's that's important. That's why we all wanted to talk on it, and um, you know, hopefully, people get something from it and continue the conversation themselves. You spent some time talking about something that that, that I don't think gets a lot of attention. You talked about subtle racism. What is subtle racism to you, and how how have you experienced it? As a black man in this in this society, sometimes as when you have a little bit of polish, a little you're articulate, you're intelligent. Um, you might be accepted, but there's still kind of that subtle remark around, oh, you know, oh, you're so well-spoken, or those kind of just subtle jabs. 
During the golf tournament, Curry wore custom cleats honoring Breonna Taylor, the young woman shot and killed by police in Louisville during a controversial raid on her home. Of the three officers involved, one has been fired while the other two are on administrative leave. You said her name, if you will, by wearing those um, customized golf cleats this weekend honoring Breonna Taylor. Why, why her story? There's no reason why uh, there shouldn't be, you know, those, those, indiv- those cops that were uh, responsible that shouldn't be brought to justice for, for how everything went down. And um, that say her name thing is, is huge in terms of continuing to, again, apply pressure to that conversation. Social justice phrases are uh, going to be allowed on team jerseys uh, when they do start here in a few weeks. Are you at all concerned about alienating fans? No, not sensitive to that at all. I I applaud every single player that's going to take that opportunity. We're human first, and if you can't accept what we we want to talk about or what we want to highlight or what we want to change in our our society, then don't accept us as basketball players either. Fellow panelist Charles Barkley caused a stir on Friday with comments during an interview with CNBC. The fans are at such a disadvantage because they're going through the pandemic and they don't want to see a bunch of rich people uh, talking about stuff all the time. Was he talking to you? Was he talking about you? Was he talking about the effort that you're a part of? Yeah, obviously, like you say, sports brings everybody together in a sense. Um... Hello, everyone. President Trump will participate in a roundtable to hear stories of families positively impacted by law enforcement that will be taking place shortly after this briefing concludes. The president stands with our police officers, our men and women across this country who valiantly patrol our streets and protect our citizenry. This president stands on the side of law and order to secure peace in our streets. That has has always been his priority and remains so today. Tragically, this weekend, we saw a devastating ambush attack against brave law enforcement officers in McAllen, Texas. Officer Edelmiro Garza Jr., who was 45 years old, and Officer Ismael Chavez, who was 39 years old. And while responding to a domestic disturbance call, officers Garza and Chavez arrived on scene to protect the people that they serve. They were met with gunfire. They were ambushed by a violent and dangerous suspect who horrifically shot before they even drew their weapon or had a chance to call for backup. We honor the lives and the service of Officer Garza and Officer Chavez. This president will always stand on the side of law enforcement and the heroes who protect and serve. And with that, I'll take questions. Hey, Kaylee, thanks so much. No problem. Um, As the number of cases and fatalities continues to break records, in the most recent interview President Trump did, he said, we are going to be in really good shape in the next two to four weeks. Can you share what evidence he's using to draw that conclusion? And what is the administration going to do differently in the next two to four weeks to stop the spread? So the one thing I would note is that um, when you look at the mortality rate, um, we're seeing that our efforts here at the federal government have been working. And to give you an example of that, um, when you look at New York and New Jersey, uh, there were 21 deaths for every thousand cases, um, 20 deaths for every thousand cases in the case of New Jersey. Those were the ratios we were seeing just a few months ago. Uh, Now New York and New Jersey are down 1.7 per 1,000 and 1.8 per 1,000 respectively. And moving beyond New York and New Jersey, we're seeing in Florida, for example, uh, though they have 12 cases for every 1,000, it is 0.2 mortality for every thousand cases. Uh, In Arizona, 0.3 deaths for every thousand cases. So we are seeing that our therapeutics are working, that dexamethasone and convalescent plasma and remdesivir are working, uh, and that's something good and something that the president takes note of. But two to four weeks is such a short time period. I mean, what specifically are you doing to stop the spread? There's a lot, and um, I'm very glad that you asked that because it is worth highlighting uh, the work that we're doing each and every day. Uh, For one, we're surging personnel to Arizona, Texas, California. Uh, We already have people working in Florida, surging remdesivir to states that are seeing rising case numbers. Uh, We're also surging testing supplies to decrease turnaround time. These are several action items that Dr. Burks briefed me on before coming out here. Um, The White House will be going 
uh, to several states this week, Dr. Burks in particular to Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina. We've sent 19 HHS teams to Metroplexes, eight more coming this week. Um, so we are aggressively on the ground reacting to this virus, and we're encouraged to see the declining mortality compared to a few months ago. Jim, I haven't seen you in a few weeks. Yeah. Glad you're back. Thanks. Uh, Kaylee, why is the White House trashing Dr. Fauci and sending out opposition research like memos to reporters? Uh, the president has uh, gone off on anonymous sources in the past. Why not have the guts to uh, trash Dr. Fauci with your own names? So uh, President Trump, um, I'll refer you back. There's no opposition research being dumped to reporters. We were asked a very specific question by The Washington Post, and that question was President Trump uh, noted that Dr. Fauci had made some mistakes, and we provided a direct answer to what was a direct question. Has the president made mistakes? He suggested at one point that Americans inject themselves with disinfectants, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, why not uh, send out these notes to reporters about what Dr. Fauci said in the past with your names on it. Um, I, we were sent out by a White House official. The president has said he doesn't trust anonymous sources, and yet you were sending out these notes to reporters anonymously. Look, I would note that um, in terms of the president and his record on coronavirus, um, he stands by the actions and the steps he's taken in this historic response. You have Dr. Fauci, uh, who said that the record of this president is impressive. I can't imagine that under any circumstance that anybody could be doing more, and those are the words of Dr. Fauci. We provided a direct response to a direct question, um, and that's about it. And to the notion that there's opposition research and that there's Fauci versus the president couldn't be further from the truth. Dr. Fauci and the president have always had a very good working relationship. Yeah, just a separate subject very quickly. Uh, does the president or the administration plan to make it very clear to the Russian Federation that there should not be bounties placed on the heads of American soldiers serving in Afghanistan? We make that clear each and every day to every country around the world that this president will always stand by our law enforcement. No, no one's been tougher on Russia. Not, not what law you're I'm talking about military what you're soldiers, talking, U.S. Yes, forces overseas. Yes, of course, overseas. that's what I'm saying, our, our U.S. Not, forces. Not just any country, the Russians. Will you, will you tell the Kremlin country, and President what you're Putin getting at, not to put bounties on the heads of American soldiers? What you're soldiers? getting at, of course, we tell each and every country that, but what you're getting at is uncorroborated intelligence, and you're treating it as if it were true. Uh, to this day, there are varying views on the Russian bounty intelligence, um, DOD, NSC, and the ODNI all pointing that out. You know, I'm not going to answer a question based on unverified intelligence, but rest assured, Every country in this world is put on notice that bounties on the heads of U.S. troops is unacceptable, and this president will stand for U.S. troops at home and abroad. Yes. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Kaylee. Uh, another, you mentioned a, a quote from Dr. Fauci, another quote from him. When you compare us to other countries, I don't think you can say we're doing great. Is there any reaction to that from the White House? No, when you compare us to other countries, we have the most testing in the world. When you compare us to other countries on case fatality rate, other industrialized nations, um, we're very low and beating most countries, um, if not all, in Europe. So uh, we're doing a lot on the world stage, a lot right. Um, noted that we were supposed to have a ventilator shortage, and as it turned out, the U.S. actually sent ventilators all around the world. So the U.S. response has been historic. Um, and by several metrics, including the three I just mentioned, we're beating uh, the rest of the world. Anthony Fauci. Yes. Yes. Thank you, uh, Kaylee. Could you, uh, could you just clarify the scope of Roger Stone's clemency? A federal judge is asking for this. Does it only apply to prison time, or does it also include the two-year period of supervised release? I don't um, have the exact details for you on that, but I can follow up. Um, what I will say is that uh, the Roger Stone clemency um, was a very important moment for justice in this country. You had a um, completely bogus Russia witch hunt uh, that found nothing. And in order to justify the waste of taxpayer dollars, you had Robert Mueller um, charging people with process crimes. And it's really curious to me that with Roger Stone, you know, he's charged of false statements, but uh, McCabe was charged of false statements lying to federal investigators. Um, Brennan, false statements to Congress. Clapper, false statements to Congress. But last time I checked, they didn't have 29 FBI agents wearing tactical gear, showing up their, at their house in a pre-dawn raid, wielding M4 rifles sweeping across their lawn, as happened to Roger Stone. They didn't have four agents using battering rams, breaking down their front door over false statements. Uh, and they didn't have helicopters hovering over their houses and two police, police boats that roared up. Instead, uh, McCabe, and Clapper and Brennan and these guys are given lucrative contracts, um, books, contributorships. So there are really two standards of justice in this country, as Adam Schiff noted. Fortunately, he doesn't have the facts to back up the
the way he meant that term. Uh, Mario, one more, one more question yes, if I could. Um, the president retweeted something this morning implying that he believes that he retweeted something saying that the CDC is lying uh, about the coronavirus in order to hurt his chances of getting reelected. Does the president believe that the CDC is lying about COVID-19? The president, with his intent in that retweet, um, expresses displeasure with the CDC, some rogue individuals leaking guidelines prematurely. You had a 63 page plan that was leaked prematurely. He believes that that misleads the American public when there are planning materials released uh, that are not in their fullest form and their best form. So that's what he was getting at. But overall, the notion of the tweet was to point out the fact that when we use science, we have to uh, use it in a way that is not political. When you had 1,300 health experts sign a letter not to condemn large crowds of protesters, um, but some same health experts say churches need to stay shut down or lockdown protests somehow don't get the same first First Amendment rights as the protest uh, that we saw in our streets. We need to use science, lean into science, um, but not use it and cherry pick it to fit whatever our particular particular political persuasion is. So he has confidence yes, in the CDC? He does. Mario. Thank you, Kaylee. Given what we're seeing in Florida with the cases rising, uh, is the president anticipating a scaled down version of the, uh, the convention next month? And if so, is that something that he would be content with? That would be a question for the campaign, but we still plan to move forward with the convention here at the White House. But for particularities, I would point you to the RNC and to the campaign. Yes, just, just to close the loop on Dr. Fauci, does the president still appreciate the advice that he gets from him? Certainly. Uh, Dr. Fauci is one of many on the task force who provides advice. And I would note, you know, Dr. Fauci is an epidemiologist, an infectious disease expert, and he provides his um, his opinion there. You also have other experts like Dr. McCann's cats who are behavior behavioral health experts who provide um, opinions about the holistic health of the child, and she's been a voice for reopening schools um, and the damage long-term long lockdowns can do. You have Dr. Mansef Salawi, who's working on the vaccines. So there are a number of scientists who are experts in uh, various issues um, and various specialties, but the president takes the full opinions of the task force and the varying opinions sometimes and moves forward in a way he thinks is best for this country, like he did with the China travel ban. Secondly, Kaylee, the travel ban with Canada expires in about a week. Is that going to be extended? Are you talking about talking with Canada about that? So no announcements now for our plans with Canada. Yes. yes. Uh, Arizona has more new cases of coronavirus than any country in the world, more than the European Union as a whole. So isn't by that metric the United States not doing as well as other countries in handling this? No, because when you lead the world in testing, uh, that means that you identify more cases. Um, when you are up, uh, deaths are starting to and rise. And I would note, well, you talk about deaths. Um, I can give you that particular information, which Dr. Burks gave to me. Uh, before running out here, which is in Arizona, um, you have 17 cases per 1,000 population and 0.3 deaths per population, which means our therapeutics are working and we're in a better place today than we were before. Early Bird, a school Catherine. teacher in Arizona died, however, when she was following all the rules. She wore a mask, she wore gloves, she was teaching summer school, she got it, died. Two other teachers got it uh, and are ill. Her family, her husband, her daughter. I mean, how do you tell parents of school children that it's safe to send their kids back to school when something like that happens? Well, I would point you to the words of the CDC director who said children are not very affected by this and uh, typically are not spreaders in this. But I would also point to the consequences of staying closed. We have to look at the holistic health of the child. And when you have, according to HHS, one fifth of all child abuse cases being reported by teachers and educational staff, we cannot stay closed. Um, when you have D.C. Family Child uh, Agency talking about a 62 percent decrease in abuse cases being reported, you cannot stay closed. When even the AAP, uh, American Academy of Pediatrics, talked about morbidity and mortality if schools stay shut down, and 70 to 80 percent of mental children with uh, mental health diagnoses receive their care in schools, the consequences are grave if we stay shut down. And there's a way for essential workers to go back to work just as our meatpacking facilities did, just as you all in the media are essential workers, we believe our teachers are as well. Yes. Catherine. Thanks. Thanks, Kaylee. The administration has said that the goal of maximum pressure is to force Iran back to the negotiating table so we can get a better deal. Is that still the goal of maximum pressure? And in light of the reported new trade and military partnership between Iran and China, what evidence is there that the policy is succeeding? 
I have uh, no information today to update you on our um, Iran relationship, which uh, stays the same today as it has been. Yes, Daniel. Thank you. I have two quick questions. Uh, President Trump's former chief of staff, Mick Mulvaney, who still has a role in this administration, he said in an op-ed today that we still have a testing problem in this country and that he and his son had to wait for five to seven days for results. If even President Trump's former chief of staff levels this criticism, doesn't that indicate we do have a problem with testing? Do you have a reaction to stop it? Yeah, our reaction is that we've tested. Um, we lead the world in testing. We've done more than 40 million tests. That's an extraordinary number. Admiral Joie gave us an update yesterday that on Friday we did over 800,000 tests. Uh, we tripled, quadrupled the number of tests. This is his exact quote. We have, and we also have 12,000 retail test sites um, that are there, and we're surging testing in basically every specific county that's having a problem. Um, and Dr. Burks was just walking me through pooled testing, which will be a way to process tests at an even faster rate. Um, so leading the world in testing, I would say, means we're doing a pretty good job. Does the president have a, a reaction to the uh, Washington Redskins dropping their name today? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, he made, I haven't talked to him since the specific announcement's been made. I have talked to him, but not specifically on that. Uh, but last week, his tweet made it clear uh, that these teams, these um, teams name their teams out of strength, not weakness. Um, and he talked about the Washington Redskins and Cleveland Indians um, looking at changing their names. Um, and he uh, says that he believes that um, the Native American community would be very angry at this. And he does have polling to back him up. There was a Washington Post poll um, from a few years ago that 90 percent of Native Americans say they're not offended uh, by the name. It, it is uh, reflective of a 2004 poll. And uh, the Washington Post notes that many of these Native Americans voiced admiration for the team name, like Barbara Bruce, who said, I'm proud of being Native American and of the Redskins. I'm not ashamed of that at all. I like that name. G Gabriel Nez, another 29-year-old from the Navajo community, I really don't mind it. I like it. Um, and there are several other comments like this in the Washington Post. Kayla, Deborah. Thank you, thank you Kayla. Um, I have a question myself, and then as a principal, I'd like to ask a question from a news organization that can't be here because of social distancing. My question. In February, when he was in Las Vegas, speaking to Hope for Prisoners, the president said he didn't want to use his pardon power on Roger Stone because he thought he could be exonerated. That didn't happen, and the president uh, committed a sentence. During the same event, the president said that he might give a full pardon to John Ponder, a convicted bank robber who served his time, turned his life around, and started Hope for Prisoners. Is there going to be a pardon for John Ponder? And what about the more than 1,300 pardon applications sitting in the pardon attorney's office? Because there's talk now that people don't go to the pardon attorney's office, they go through the White House. Is that a good thing, or does it mean that only politically connected people can get pardons? So I have no update on John Ponder. It's absolutely not the case that only those who are politically connected get a pardon. Um, this president is the president of criminal justice reform. This president did the First Step Act. This president has fought for um, those who are given unduly harsh sentences more than any Democrat who liked to talk about it but never actually did it. And in fact, when you compare the pardoning record of this president um, with past presidents, it's quite striking that this president's given 36 pardons and commutations. President Obama gave 1,927. And when you look at the nature of some of the pardons given, let's say, under President Clinton, Clinton, you talk about politically connected pardons. Uh, we can't get more politically connected with pardons than pardoning your brother, Roger Clinton, as President Clinton did. Susan McDougall, one of your associates who was pardoned for her role in Whitewater. Uh, Mark Rich, who gave $450,000 to the Clinton Library, or at least his wife did, donated $1 million to Democrat campaigns. Uh, and then he gets a pardon from President Clinton. And notably, a lot of these pardons were when he was going out the door. So this president's used it sparingly and instead focused on criminal justice reform, helping those, um, helping to rectify racial disparities in our sentencing. And Clinton and Obama, uh, Pierce did a whole lot of pardoning and, pardoning, and in some cases politically motivated, it seems, uh, but didn't do a whole lot to help the innocent people um, who have served their time and been given unduly harsh sentences. I have, I have a follow-up for someone who's, who asked yes. me to ask a question because of social distancing. This is from Jackson Richmond at the Jewish News Syndicate. What's the president's stance on Israel planning to apply sovereignty to parts of the West Bank and to Democrats? From Nancy Pelosi to AOC, who warned that such a move would undermine U.S. national security and the U.S.-Israel alliance. So I have no update today on uh, the current status, but just other than the president has been a strong supporter of Israel. 
Chris. Thanks, Kaylee. Well, coming up on the three-year anniversary of the president tweeting he banned transgender people from the military in any capacity, which led to the policy currently in place. Last week, a group of 116 lawmakers led by Congresswoman Del Bene wrote the administration urging them to lift the policy. Would the president reconsider the policy? I haven't talked to him about that specific policy, but um, this president is proud that in 2019, we uh, launched a global initiative to end the criminalization of homosexuality throughout the world. Um, he has a great record when it comes uh, to the LGBT community. Uh, the Trump administration eased a ban on blood donations from gay and bisexual men, uh, and he launched a plan to end the AIDS epidemic by 2030. But so we're very but proud but of our achievements. But nonetheless, uh, the ban on John. transgender people in the military is still in place. What, John. I mean, we Thank have a Supreme Court ruling that um, anti-trans discrimination is a form of sex discrimination. We have an estimated 14,700 people in the uh, military who identify as transgender. We have uh, a poll showing upwards of 70% of Americans support transgender service. And we have major medical and psychological groups saying there's no problem with transgender uh, people in the military. So okay. what is the reason for having the policy currently I have, I have no updates for you, but several of the events that you cited, um, like the Supreme Court ruling, I would refer you back to Justice Kavanaugh, who said we are judges, we're not members of Congress, instead of a hard-earned victory won through the democratic process. Today's victory is brought about by judicial dictates, so we'll always stand on the side of correct statutory interpretation. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Katie, thank you very much. Oh, can, you really, can you really say that the rise in testing accounts for the rise in the number of cases? Because the percentage of those testing positive has risen sharply. Yes, so I would say to this, as we've always said, that there would be embers, there would be fires. So we we readily acknowledge the embers and the fires that are around the country, but we also note that it's logic basic common sense when you're testing more than any country in the world, you're going to identify more cases. We've tested more than 40 million. It means we will identify more cases. But when you see the fact that mortality has come down uh, per thousand population in, in a way that it was it was not months ago in New York and New Jersey, it means that we have become very adept at our therapeutics and our ways of uh, finding people in communities rather than in hospitals, catching things early and moving forward in a way that we know how to aggressively attack this virus and keep the American up with the travel ban. No. Just can I ask you on the travel ban? Sure. Um, what is the rationale now for keeping people from Europe, Ireland and the UK from the United States when they have a fraction of the number of cases that you do in the US? The argument is we will always put America first. Chanel. Thank you, Kelly. Um, if you will expand on the difference between this time last month and now when it comes to framing the discussion about law enforcement. Last month, the president hosted a law enforcement uh, roundtable, and at that roundtable, he said that he would not support defunding police. And yet, one month later, we still have Democrat cities doing so, disbanding their police, defunding their police. Um, how does the White House feel it should frame the debate now with regards to defunding the police so that the, a reasonable discussion can be had with these Democrat cities who are trying to do so? Yeah, it's a very good question. We know that in Los Angeles, when they announced that they would be defunding their police department by $150 million, they uh, basically immediately after saw a 250 percent increase in homicides. Um, when you have people out there like Representative Ilhan Omar saying we have to completely dismantle the police and police are a cancer, this is not how we should be talking about our heroes. Um, you have, um, most egregious of all, really, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez saying defund the police means defund the police. She criticized, of course, the announcement of $1.5 billion being taken down from NYPD. Um, and this weekend, you know, when faced with there were 28 shootings in New York, 600 percent increase from this time last year. You have uh, Representative Ocasio-Cortez saying this is just because people are trying to get food with their families. That is preposterous. The reality is 63 percent of Americans in this country fear that criticism of our police departments will lead to uh, no public safety in their streets. And 69 percent of black Americans, this is a real issue when you call our police cancer, when you talk about dismantling them. And then this weekend in New York, you see a one-year-old killed in his stroller. His name was Devel Gardner Jr. And uh, that one-year-old will be in our prayers. Not only that, you see officers Garza and Chavez. And to your question about how we should talk about the police and defund the police, a movement the president stands against, um, the two officers 
officers ambushed this weekend. One of them, Officer Chavez's daughter, wrote a very touching tribute online. She said, words cannot describe the pain I'm in, but I'm glad my dad is at peace. You are an amazing man, and anyone who ever came across you knew that. I'm going to miss you so much. You died doing what you love most. You died a hero. And those touching words were written by Savannah Chavez. Uh, and I know she received vile and outrageous comments online that were absolutely atrocious for a touching sentiment to her dad. Um, I want Savannah to know your dad is a hero. Uh, his police department should never be defunded because most of our police officers are good, hardworking men and women and heroes, uh, much like Savannah's dad. We'll be praying for you, Savannah. Thank Kaylee. you, guys. Kaylee, what is the administration hoping to do about those shootings in New York that you just mentioned? You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Welcome back. This week will mark six years since the death of Eric Garner after an encounter with the NYPD. Like George Floyd, Garner's death, of course, sparked outrage and protests. But unlike Floyd, no one ever faced charges, including Daniel Pantaleo, the officer uh, who the NYPD says used an illegal chokehold on Garner. Now, a new film imagines what may have happened if he had been forced to stand trial. Joined now by Esau Snipes Garner, Eric Garner's widow, and Emerald Garner, Eric and Esau's daughter. Um, good, good morning to both of you. Thank you so much for your time. Esau, we should point out that, that the film, it's, it's not a documentary. It's an unscripted courtroom drama. Real-life prosecutors and defense attorneys conducting this mock trial using actual evidence from the case. The only actor in the film is the guy who plays Daniel Pantaleo. You take the witness stand. Um, and, and I'm just curious, how hard, how hard was that for you? It was very hard. Um, knowing that, you know, it's not real to you guys, but it was my life in actuality. What I went through, you know, finding out, first of all, on national television that my husband had been killed and that it was filmed. And it was just horrible. I don't even know what words to say, but my, my heart sank. And the anger came out, and I had to get off the stand. Even though it was a film, it felt real to me. The, the film's director said that he talked to uh, Pantaleo's attorney to help represent his side in the film. Did, did hearing that in the film, did that give you any sense of closure? Um... Nothing would make me have any closure, but it did help in the healing process to where I'm able to talk about him and remember him in a good light and our memories of being married 26 years um, kind of gave me like a healing process, not so much closure. Emerald, why, why is it important for you that people see this film about your father's story? For me, it's important because we didn't get justice. It's, um, it's super important for people to understand um, the justice system is corrupt and it's our job to change those things. Right now, we have the Eric Garner Law in New York City, and I'm pushing really, pushing really hard to have it go national so that it can be a, not only a national law, but it'll also be a federal, federal law. Because you know, people need to know that the, the injustice that we suffer. My family will never have closure. My family will never get justice. And, you know, to have a little piece of legislation that says Eric Garner chokehold bill, um, you know, and, you know, have officers prosecuted under the Eric Garner chokehold bill, that's a, that's a little um, coin towards justice. You know, we've we've seen a number of police departments across the country um, take these steps to ban chokeholds. You made it, as you just pointed out, that you made it your mission to, to have this happen on a federal level. What other things, Emerald, do you think that police departments around the country need to be doing to create real and lasting change? I mean, the first thing is to stop killing black and brown people, of course. 
Um, in a perfect perfect world, it would just it would just end. But you know, like, you know, uh, we have to do cultural sensitivity training. We have to, um, you know, have police officers who are from um, like neighborhoods police those neighborhoods. You can't have an officer from upstate New York come down to Brooklyn and you know say that he feared for his life. For his life, of course, you're gonna fear for your life because every movie depicts New York as the slums and like you know that everybody is just you know, you know the bottom of bottom of the barrel so you know we need to have more police officers that look like us we need police officers who want to come to our community to help our community and not just come and say oh well i'm the i'm the boss i'm the boss i'm the boss and it's like you know the, the nypd is like a gang so we need to dismantle the gang they need to be, re, be retrained and police reform needs to happen and it needs to happen now we should point out that we reached out to the nypd for a comment on on the on the film, uh, and then they told us that they don't comment on um, on pending litigation. Um, but but thank you, Emerald. Thank you, Esau. Thank you for your time. This morning. There's no pending litigation. <laughs> thank you so much. Well, I, yes, I'm just telling you. Thank what you for having me. Told me. I know. Uh, thank you. And, and by the way, for information <laughs> on how to watch it, you can go to thirdhourtoday.com. Hey, yo, all right, yo. On June 6th, 17-year-old Eric Lucas led a Black Lives Matter demonstration in Shorewood, Wisconsin. But the peaceful protest took a turn when a white woman spat in Eric's face. Injustice anywhere is a detriment to justice everywhere. Day in and day out, my hope diminishes. The hope that my people and me, a young black man living in a white America, can one day be equal. Eric grew up in an abusive home and eventually landed in foster care. At a young age, I've seen a lot. I had to adapt to a lot. I had to learn from a lot. I had to grow up and be more mature at a younger age. So I could adapt and continue to move forward. At age 13, he was placed with the McCorkle family, who later became his guardians, moving him to the suburb of Shorewood, Wisconsin. Everything changed. My world flipped upside down. I'm coming from poverty, and I'm coming from the, the poor parts of Milwaukee. So I'm in a predominantly white neighborhood with folks that I feel like don't understand me. Immediately, Eric says he felt out of place in his new school. The first month of me going to school at Shorewood Intermediate School, a white kid uh, that lived in Shorewood as well told me to get on the bus and ride, like catch the city bus back to where I'm from. In the streets, where is that? We gon' take our feelings back. But soon he would find his footing with a group of friends who shared his views. Some of my best friends that I'm still cool with today, they introduced me to an organization called Urban Underground. And Urban Underground taught me a lot about systemic oppression and how to point out systemic oppression, how to fight systemic oppression. Through that education, Eric felt compelled to speak out against racial injustice for himself and his community. I'm tired of feeling like this. I'm tired of seeing other folks that look like me being tired of this and I'm tired of hearing about it. I'm tired of talking about it. I'm tired of seeing it on the news. I'm tired of growing up and watching it happen all my life and me still sitting here and not doing anything. I'm tired of being scared. I'm tired of feeling like I have to be the voice for my people. And as Eric watched the killing of George Floyd, he knew he needed to stand up. I just thought, okay, what can I do to create a symbol, not a symbol of peace, not a symbol of equality, but a symbol of tiredness and a symbol of affirmative action, a symbol of fighting back. And I came to the conclusion that it's time to march. And march he did. On June 6th, Eric organized a peaceful Black Lives Matter protest in Shorewood. My parents were there as well. I felt empowered. It was exhilarating seeing the crowd, seeing the people, seeing how we control the crowd and how the crowd listen and just stepping up to the plate and leading with with the folks that I love and that love me back. But it was overshadowed by this incident that went viral of Eric being spat on by Stephanie Rapkin. She was later arrested and charged with disorderly conduct with a hate crime modified. She has pled not guilty. I feel like I got a small piece of the point across. I feel like more often than not, the movement is lost in the assault because more people tend to focus on how I was assaulted and they don't really focus on the great work that we was putting putting forward. Despite the setback, Eric is determined to continue on his path. I'm going to start off by saying, hey, I love y'all. So I think right now, 
I'm feeling empowered by my people coming here to show out and show in support of me and people that look like us and people that, that, that's not of my color to come out and support and show love to us as well. So just revolutionary, angry, motivated. I'm not tired, I'm energized. That young man is using his voice, Chanel Jones. Mm. Started at 15. Unbelievable. You know, it's so interesting when we started these stories, you know, once we started to see all of these protests, I was talking to our executive producer and we were thinking, you know, who are some of these young people who are out there on the front lines? Black, white, you name it. Um, and can you imagine someone spitting in your kid's yeah. face um, and he's handling it so gracefully? Um, and one thing this proves is that every person out there has a story. We should point out that we reached out to Stephanie Rapkin's attorney and, and he said that she deeply regrets her actions and would like to apologize mm -hmm. to Eric in person as of today um, that has not happened just yet. Whitley. Whitley, when her vest is on, is calm, cool, professional. When we're home, it's a completely different story. Hey, come here. For 19-year-old Clay Runk, his Labrador Whitley takes Watchdog to the next level. It's scientifically proven that she can pick up on the smell and the sweat and in my breath. Uh, that my blood sugar is dropping. The Northern California native is a type 1 diabetic, which means his blood sugar levels need to be constantly monitored. Whitley's nose lets him know if his levels get too low. When Clay was seven years old, he went to the doctor feeling sick and found out he was diabetic. We get a phone call and the person on the other end of the phone says his blood sugar is 870, he needs to go to the emergency room right now. Doctors said it was life or death, and Clay was flown to San Francisco for treatment. Immediately after we got out of the hospital, it was injections, poking my finger 10 plus times a day to check my blood sugar, and constantly monitoring that and dealing with that. Clay's family read about Dogs for Diabetics, an organization that trains dogs to smell blood sugar highs or lows before they become life-threatening. Clay was accepted into the program and learned how to work with a service dog. He says the training was difficult, but it was worth it. You realize at the end you're getting a dog that's going to save your life every day. When Clay was 14 years old, he was matched with Whitley, a calm pup who can alert Clay to an issue at any time, even during this interview. She's alerting right now. Whitley's alert starts with a lick to get Clay's attention, and then she is trained to grab the pink brinsel that hangs from her collar. My blood sugar's been at a pretty steady decline since about an hour ago, so she's catching a good drop. Whitley gets some yummy treats for her job well done, and Clay drinks some juice to help stabilize his sugar levels. I think we're just beginning to realize the capabilities of dogs by their noses. Clay was interviewed by author Maria Goodovich for her book, Dr. Dogs. These bonds are so beautiful and so deep between the people whose lives depend on these dogs and the dogs who love these people and want to keep them healthy. And it's not just for diabetics. There are dogs that can detect some cancers, Parkinson's disease, and even some superbugs. Clay credits Whitley with giving him the independence to have an active life, including going to Butte College, where he's taking the prerequisite classes for nursing. I was flown out when I was diagnosed, and right now, my career goal would be to be a flight nurse on a helicopter. These life-saving partnerships are giving new meaning to man's best friend. These medical dogs are heroes. They're on the battlefields against disease, and I'm really excited to see how they're going to continue to work to protect us while having a good time themselves. And we're both dog people, yes. but it, it's fascinating to see what you can train these dogs to do and how, how they've changed lives all across the board. That's right. Using their own natural scent mm -hmm. and sense of smell. That's incredible. It's incredible. To learn more about the work medical alert dogs are doing around the world, Dr. Dogs, How Our Best Friends Are Becoming Our Best Medicine is out right now. It is said there's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. Perhaps the time has come to fully realize the dream upon which this great country was founded. Equal justice under the law. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Well, we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Introducing Peacock. What's Peacock? 
This is Peacock. Let's go! It's streaming, launching, premiering. It's TV, movies, exclusive originals, original characters. Duh. It's sports, breaking news, socks, tunes. Wait, there's more. More? Yes, yes, more. more. Tons. It's quick stuff, binge stuff, tough stuff, love stuff. It's trending, mind bending. It's late night, early morning. Good morning. It's you see this? You remember that? You watched every single one of those? It's for you, for ew, for aw. It's Chrisley, Pawnee, Monkey, E.T. Oh, oh. and it's free. Free, 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 free. Who's with me? That's Peacock. Yes, sir. That's who. Me? That's what. That's why. Come on. Boom. Mic drop. You can't not watch. We'd like to think that we live in some sort of post-racial America. We are reminded time and time again that we do not. Chanel, I reached out to you after I watched the mayor of Atlanta act as a mom trying to raise her son. And I think about you and your kids. I remember her coming home saying, why don't I have a ponytail like the white girls? It's okay to notice that you're different. You just have to not feel less than. That's my thing. I cherish the fact that we can have these discussions. I feel safe talking about this with you guys. Across the state of Texas, the calls for help just keep coming. I've never seen anything like this before. Fear is the biggest part of this disease. Paramedics in Fort Worth stretched to their limits. So to us, everybody that we come in contact with, we automatically treat as if they're um, COVID positive. I just think that sounds exhausting. It is. The days are longer. The weeks are longer. Texas recording 105 COVID-19 deaths on Thursday, the state's deadliest day so far. More than 9,600 people are hospitalized with the virus statewide. The coronavirus is spreading so rapidly across the state of Texas. Governor Greg Abbott warning next week's numbers will be worse, ordering the suspension of elective surgeries in dozens of counties and reminding Texans to follow his statewide mask order or risk another shutdown. The only way we can prevent Texas from being shut down is for everybody to adopt this practice of wearing a face mask. The surge in cases could also delay the reopening of schools in August by at least a month. Well, initially that was a backup plan that I had, but now that backup plan is becoming more of a reality. For those on the front lines, fighting the virus comes at a personal cost. Paramedic Jason Reed spends his own money to stay at a hotel, so he won't infect his teenage son. And even when I'm home, me and my son used to be really close. We'd always sit real close to each other. And since this whole COVID thing's been going on, I make sure that we stay decent amount of distance from each other just because I, I'm afraid that I would potentially give it to him if I bring it home with me. He's got to be so proud of what you're doing. I, I'd like to think so. <laughs> I imagine when you go on these calls, these people must be incredibly afraid. They are. Uh, fear seems to be one of the largest things I'm finding in my patients. Um, and I'm having to sit them down and explain to them what to expect, what's going on with their body. Um, they're scared. I mean, they really are. And sometimes the only thing they want to do is to go and talk to somebody about it and, ma and make, have somebody tell them that they're, they're okay right now. Uh, and these are the things to watch out for. They just, they want knowledge. They want information. Some of these people I understand don't want to be taken to the hospital because that's where the sick people are. That, yes, a lot of our patients are scared to go into the hospital. Uh, they're scared that's where COVID is and that's where, uh, that's where they're gonna catch it if they don't already have it. As the summer goes on, do you worry about just the fatigue of it, of wearing down? I mean, there's just no signs of stopping anytime soon. I, I do worry about it. I worry about the fatigue of the crews, of uh, everybody in EMS, law enforcement, fire department, because we're all in this together. But we're trained and we're bred that no matter what, we're going to see this to the end. We're going to be here no matter what until this thing's over with. Garrett joins me now from Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, Garrett, we just heard from a paramedic who says he's staying at a hotel to protect his family, his son. Uh, these guys uh, upending their lives to help people. Uh, after spending time with some of these first responders, what are they telling you? What are their biggest concerns? Well, you heard some of it. I mean, part of it is protecting the people who are closest to them. That one paramedic talking about protecting his son. 
One of the other paramedics I interviewed told me that two of her sisters had been diagnosed with coronavirus and that even in her own family before they had gotten sick, there had been doubts about whether this was really as serious as it was being made out to be. I mean, these paramedics are on the front line of this every day. They know how serious this is. They're trying to make sure the people in their orbits take it as seriously as they do. And then I think the other interesting part of it is they don't know when they go out on a call most of the time exactly what they're dealing with. I mean, they'll get calls that are COVID calls, somebody who either knows they're positive or thinks they're positive, and that's why they dial 911. But even if they're responding to a car accident or a gunshot or a construction accident, when they show up, they have to treat those people who they are treating uh, as though they are COVID positive. I mean, that's just, imagine being operating at that level of stress and fear all day long, every day, for months now, and only getting worse as Texas gets further into this surge. Yeah. Uh, Garrett, I also want to ask you about Governor Abbott's warning there about a possible shutdown if people don't start following the guidelines. Any word from officials on any new restrictions? No new restrictions yet, but the governor's tone has been kind of changing over the last couple of days, and it's been interesting to watch. He does lots of interviews every day, usually with local television stations. And just over the last couple of days, mm -hmm. as the spikes have been getting worse in Texas, he's been talking more and more, almost threatening the idea that a statewide lockdown like what we experienced here in April could be coming back if the numbers don't get under control. He said he thinks next week's numbers will be worse than this week's. But now that there's this statewide mask order in place, he's really banging this drum, trying to make sure people follow the mask order and warning them that the masks are essentially the only protection the state has uh, against the economic ruin that could come with another shutdown, much less uh, the protection they provide against physical illness from everyone across the state who's now keenly aware of the, the spikes that we're seeing here. Such great reporting today. Uh, Garrett Hake, thank you so very much. Thanks, Allison. He pulled out a bottle, like a small water bottle. Uh, the bottle was filled with brown fluid. And my mind started to race and I was just trying to put the pieces together at that point. And I knew that I wasn't safe and I knew that it wasn't <clears throat> water. Military life is all Katie Blanchard knows. She grew up in a military family, served as a nurse at Fort Leavenworth in Kansas, and her husband, Troy, a father of three, also serves in the military. The service gave her a life but it also nearly killed her three years ago in an attack she may not be able to seek justice for. I was put in charge of a civilian employee in 2015. And so I was working on some issues that he had, um, meeting performance standards, meeting behavioral standards. At first it was just when we were together without people around and he would yell at me. He would tell me that, you know, it was his office or his files. He would um, swear at me and tell me to go away. She warned her colleagues for months he was a danger until the day she was proven right. It was after hours and I had noticed that my attacker was still in his office and he had done this before where he would stay late out of duty hours and so at that point I grabbed a doctor and I had asked him to escort me just in case anything would happen because at that point I wasn't thinking is he going to attack me it's when when is he going to attack me and um, went back to my office and at that point um, I took off my vocera, which is our intercommunication device through the hospital. And that device in the past is what I had used to call if I needed help. So I put that down, turned it off, closed up everything on my computer. And just as I was texting my husband that, you know, I was leaving work, I had turned because I had seen him in the corner of my eye. But instead of continuing to walk past, he had stopped in my doorway. He pulled out a bottle, like a small water bottle. Uh, the bottle was filled with brown fluid. And my mind started to race and I was just trying to put the pieces together at that point. And I knew that I wasn't safe and I knew that it wasn't <clears throat> water. 
and um, he started to splash the fluid on me and right away I could smell I could smell the gasoline I just I, I couldn't even that fathom what was going on I couldn't put the pieces together but I knew that he was going to try to kill me and just as fast as he had splashed all the gasoline on my face as I was sitting there he lit two matches and I didn't see him throw the matches I just felt the flame Great to have you here. Nice group, some familiar faces. So thank you all very much for being at the White House. Very special house, very special place. I'm grateful to be joined by citizens whose lives have been saved by law enforcement heroes, and that's what they are, they're heroes. And they're being very unfairly treated over the last long period of time, but over the last few years, it's terrible what's happening. We're also joined by two amazing officers, South Carolina Deputy Sheriff William Kimbrough. Where's William? 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 What happened to William? Okay. Oh, okay. That's a good excuse. That's good. <laughs> and Palm Beach County Deputy Sheriff Corey Reese. Hi, Corey. Good. Uh, in recent weeks, our country's police officers have been really under siege. I want to thank, uh, first of all, I do want to thank Vice President Pence for all the work he's done on this, and in particular, Attorney General uh, Bill Barr, because the job he's done has been amazing. It's been, uh, it's been uh, 24 hours a day. I guess I could say 28 hours a day, right? It never ends, but it's uh, been a great job that you've both done. We appreciate it. Mike, we appreciate it very much. But our officers have been under vicious assault, and hundreds of police have been injured and several murdered. You've been reading about it just like I've been seeing it. Reckless politicians have defamed our law enforcement heroes as the enemy. They call them the enemy. They actually go and say they're the enemy and even call them an invading army. These radical politicians want to defund and abolish the police from our nation. At first, when I first heard it, I said, well, uh, that's just something that they're saying that doesn't, but they actually are trying to do it. You look at what's going on in Minneapolis, you look at what's going in uh, many, many Democrat-run areas. Uh, but they want to defund and they want to abolish. Far-left mayors are escalating the anti-cop crusade and violent crime is spiraling in their cities. It's all far-left cities where they have no understanding of what has to be done. They don't have a clue. And I will say that we put on a very powerful uh, rule and law that uh, you get 10 years, you knock down a monument. If it's a federal monument, you go to jail for 10 years. And if it's uh, anything else, we tell them we work with the states to help them. But if, it's, if you do anything where it's a federal monument, and there are a lot of them up there, and nobody's been attacked, nothing's been attacked since we did. Ten years in jail, monument or statue. In one recent week in New York City, this is hard to believe, shootings were up 358 percent, and yet uh, they spend all their time, they want to do Black Lives Matter, uh, Matter signs outside of Trump Tower. They ought to spend their time doing something else, because I'll tell you what, 358 percent increase in shootings in New York. Last month, over 300 people were shot. NYPD retirements have quadrupled, and they're going up even further. And New York City is out of control, unfortunately. My place, I love it, but it's out of control. It was doing so well. And Rudy Giuliani, whether you like Rudy or not, he did a great job. He was the greatest mayor in the history of New York. Murders in Atlanta are up 133 percent compared to the same period last year. And one of the victims was an eight-year-old girl, and we've had younger than that in Chicago last weekend. In the last two weeks, 105 Americans were shot in Philadelphia and Minneapolis. The city voted to disband the police department and cut it way down, but disbanded ultimately. The radical politicians are waging war on innocent Americans. That's what you're doing when you play with the police. 
My administration is pro-safety, pro-police, and anti-crime. And I will say, I just see a new number came in from Chicago. This weekend was a scourge. This weekend was, I guess, 20 people killed and many, many shootings. Many, many shootings. Far worse than the last week. So things are happening that nobody's ever seen happening happen in uh, cities that are liberally run. I call them radical lip. And yet, uh, they'll go and uh, march on areas and rip everything down in front of them. If that's what you want for a country, uh, you probably have to vote for sleepy Joe Biden, because he doesn't know what's happening. But uh, you're not going to have it with me. So we've uh, been very strong on law enforcement. We'll be doing things uh, that you'll be, I think, very impressed with. Numbers are going to be coming down, even if we have to go in and take over cities, because we can't let that happen. When you have 20 people killed, 22 people killed in one weekend in Chicago, and you have 88 shootings. It's not even conceivable. That's worse than Afghanistan, I hate to say it. That's worse than any war zone that we're in uh, by a lot. It makes them look like tame places by comparison, so we're not going to let it go on. We're not supposed to uh, — supposed to wait for them to call, but they don't call. We've asked uh, Chicago, would you like us to go in and help? And they don't want to say anything. And we've called many of the cities. Would you like us to go and help? We've done a great job in Portland. Portland was totally out of control. And uh, they went in. And I guess we have many people right now in jail. And we've very much quelled it. And if it starts again, we'll quell it again very easily. It's not hard to do if you know what you're doing. So I just want to thank everybody for being here. I'd maybe ask uh, Vice President Pence to say a couple of words, and then uh, I'd like Bill Barr to say something, and we'll go around the room. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mr. President. It's um, it's a real privilege to be here uh, with the law enforcement officers who are gathered here and families um, whose lives have been impacted so profoundly by the courageous efforts of men and women in law enforcement. Uh, I can assure you uh, that while some are talking about defunding the police uh, under this president and this administration, we're going to defend the police. And we're going to back the blue. Because we understand that while tragedies happen, and we'll always look for ways that we can improve public safety, and the president's taken steps and taken executive action to provide new resources to improve public safety and law enforcement around the country. I want to assure you that you have a president who knows what the people gathered around this table know, is that most of the men and women who put on the uniform of law enforcement every day are the best people in this country. Uh, they risk their lives every day to make, to make a difference in our communities, just like they've made a difference in all of your lives. And so uh, I want to thank you all. I want to thank you for being here at this, uh, for this conversation, because the American people will greatly benefit by being reminded of the incredible contributions that our law enforcement community makes each and every day. And, and uh, I appreciate your willingness to tell that story. Thank you, Mr. Bill. Yes. Thank you, Mr. President. First, let me say uh, what an honor it is for me to serve under a president who is such a strong supporter of law enforcement. I've said repeatedly that, to my mind, there is no more noble profession in our country than serving as a law enforcement officer. The police put their lives and well-being on the line every day for us. And their jobs have never been more difficult than it is today. Today, we, are, we suffer many unprecedented social ills. Kids growing up without fathers, alienated young angry men, Gangs engaged in the most brutal kinds of violence, increasing mental illness and homelessness, <clears throat> and a drug epidemic inflicting casualties beyond anything that we've experienced in a war major war, and an increase in sexual assaults and child exploitation. You name it. <clears throat> and who is expected to deal with all of this? As other institutions fail and abdicate their responsibility, who is, res who is expected to stand their ground and pick up the pieces? The police are. And that's why I say their job, the job we ask them to do today, has never been more challenging. 
I believe it's important to, to understand that just like any other institution, there's always room for improvement. And over the past several decades, there's unquestionably been a lot of progress and reforms in policing that's improved policing and life for the officers, their families, and their communities. We have the most professional police in the world. Now, obviously, the event in Minneapolis was ghastly, and I haven't heard anyone attempt to defend it. And it has rightly brought about an urge to make sure we continue reforming and we finish the job. And I think that law enforcement understands and agrees that the concerns of the African-American community regarding excessive use of force must be addressed. But we also have to be care careful and not throw the baby out with the bathwater. And so extremist reactions like defund the police are trying to pull us in exactly the opposite direction of where we have to go. We have to give law enforcement more support, more training, and resources. And I think the executive order that the President signed last month strikes exactly the right balance. It's supportive of the police, and it also addresses legitimate concerns about excessive force. So our nation needs to gain a renewed appreciation of the noble work done by our police officers in protecting our communities. And I thank the President for convening this roundtable to highlight the good work done by our men and women in blue. Thank you, Mr. President. Maybe what we'll do is we'll go around the room, and maybe you could introduce yourself and explain exactly what's going on. You have an incredible story. Please. Hi, my name is Kamira Boyd. I'm from Charleston, South Carolina. Well, on June 11th, um, 2019, um, my baby started choking on breast milk, and I start, the first thing I started to do was just run out the house and jump in the car. While leaving out of my neighborhood, Officer Kimbrough came. He was coming into the neighborhood, and he immediately pulled me over, and we immediately jumped out, and he just took her from my arms and proceeded helping her. And, yeah, thank S you. <laughs> saved her? Saved, yeah, saved her. Really? Wow. <laughs> You don't hear those stories. That's why I think it's important to have a meeting like this, a little different. And it's, uh, it's the meeting that we should have about 100 times out of almost 100. This is the one because uh, the police do such a great job. And there's an example. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. And uh, do you know the gentleman on your left? Uh -huh. Come on, let's go. Let's, let's tell that story, please. What yes. do you mean, like? Uh, no, you know, uh, you know, do you want to go ahead? Please, uh -oh. yes, go ahead. Mr. President, Vice President, Attorney General Barr, thank you for having us here, other distinguished guests. My name is William Kimbrough. I'm from Charleston, South Carolina. I work for the Berkeley County Sheriff's Office. Um, as Kamir was saying, on July 10th of 2019, while I was patrolling the unincorporated district of Somerville, South Carolina, um, I came across uh, Kamira and her grandmother speeding in a car. I, conducted a traffic stop on that vehicle. And as soon as those vehicles stopped, a uh, lady later identified it. Was it your grandmother, Kamara? It was my stepmom. Oh, your stepmom had jumped out of the vehicle and was frantic and said, my baby, my baby, she can't breathe. And I, I kind of stepped back and I said, what? And, you know, the rest was captured on my body cam video that's since gone viral. But uh, as soon as I made entrance, over, uh, stepped up to uh, Kamara, I, I instantly asked her for the baby, my, who is now my goddaughter, and uh, oh, wow. godmom over there, Noni. Hi, Noni. Say hi, Noni. And uh, so, yeah, we've we've been blessed, and uh, me, just it's it's been a it's been a wonderful experience. Wonderful. Great job. Thank you. Well, that's what I meant when I kiddingly said. That's what I meant when I kiddingly said, you know the gentleman on your left, because you really know him. Oh, yes. okay. <laughs> That's what I meant. And uh, great job you've done. Thank you very much on behalf of all of us. And Kamira, congratulations. Thank That's you. Great. Thank, Thank you, you for being here. Kamira. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Please, go ahead. It was about two weeks ago. Um, I was laying in bed with my other three kids. Um, and, well, I forgot to introduce myself, sorry. Um, Sarah Bohan, we have four kids and we're from Roanoke, Virginia. 
Um, I was laying in bed and my sister happened to be home and my husband ended up calling her and asking her to count how many kids were home. And she got up and uh, looked inside of my, my boy Spencer's room and he was not there um, and his window was open. And so we instantly saw that he was missing. And he is autistic, nonverbal, and doesn't really have sense of um, danger. So when he goes missing, it's like life or death. You got to find him as fast as you possibly can. Um, so we call, instantly called the police, and um, my husband rushed home from work. And they called the search dogs out. Um, and within 12 minutes, they found him. He had ran up into the woods. Um, someone had spotted him sitting in the middle of the road and he pulled over and they tried to get him to come to him but of course he bolted and ran up into the woods and um, following behind the dog going in and out of the trees it was actually really cool because I could imagine him doing that exact thing of going in and out of the trees and sliding down the creeks and I'm sure he was having the time of his life because he was free um, but we were able to find him and the dog's ears perked up right when he was within 15 feet. And I yelled his name and he sat down and I instantly ran over to him and we were able to carry him back and he was safe. And the only thing he had on him was four ticks. So he was good. That's great. So again, uh, the police did a great job and the group did a great job. And so Spencer has no sense of danger. So you would say basically he's very brave, okay? <laughs> view, it, view it that way. Good. Thank you very much for being here. We appreciate it. Thank you. Brooke, please. Mr. President, thank you. I got to meet almost everyone. My name is Brooke Rollins. I have the extraordinary honor of serving this president as his domestic policy chief every day in this White House. And I will say there's a lot of brave people in the room, uh, probably no one more so than our two officers. But this mom not only has, Mr. President, her nine-year-old here, but she has her four-year-old, her three-year-old, and her 10-month-old here. And her husband, Spencer, just took them into the other room. So this is bravery at its finest for all the moms in the room who've sort of manhandled lots of children. Children. So thank you for being here, and certainly you too, and that beautiful baby girl. Um, what an honor to have you and all of you with us today. Mr. President, you mentioned New York City, Atlanta, Chicago, Philadelphia. The lack of leadership, I think, happening in some of our most ravaged cities around this country is really astonishing. But I think it's really important to note that that failure is a choice. And it is a choice, Mr. President, that I know you would never make. I have seen you now more than two and a half years stand with law enforcement, stand with the mothers and the fathers in this country who are fighting for a chance at the American dream. That dream is not possible without a law enforcement that stands for the rule of law and for safe and secure communities. So thank you so much for your leadership. Everyone here today, thank you for coming. What an honor it is to have you in your house here at the White House on this day, and special thanks to the moms who are brave enough to bring the little ones in uh, to tell their story on behalf of these amazing men and women serving in blue. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, Brooke. What's more astonishing to me is that we'll call. Bill will call. Vice President will call. I'll call. You'll call leaders of these cities, Democrat leaders. And we don't care if they're Democrat or not. They happen to be in every case. But we'll call them and we'll say, do you need help? And they'll say no. I said, but you just had 40 people shot and many people killed this weekend. And they'll say, no, we're okay. And I'll say, what's that all about? And we're tired of those answers. We're tired of those answers. So thank you. To me, that's astonishing. Thank you very much, bro. Please. My name is Kenneth Bearden. I'm from Louisville, Kentucky. And um, I'm here today um, because uh, I'm a man re in recovery. Um, at the age of 11 years old, I um, used substances for the first time. And uh, by the end of that summer, I had overdosed seven times already. I'm one of them people that um, once I put a minor mood altering substance in my body, I cannot stop. Um, mm. I did not stop using alcohol or drugs until the age of 24. And um, through that time at the age of 11 to 24, I have overdosed 
over 30 times. And at least a dozen of them times I've had police officers there on site administering Narcan, saving my life. And my son would not have his father today if it wasn't for the police officers, the men and the women who administer that Narcan. Um, and just that, um, my son gets to have his dad today because of that. And um, I get to help others along the way um, because of police officers, because of the people who have helped me along the way. And I'm truly grateful to be here. And how are you doing now then? So that's, been, that's a lot of times that you had yes. difficulty. So, uh, how are you so doing? I've got six years sober now, and uh, I am one semester. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you. I'm, I'm one semester away from having my bachelor's degree in social work. Um, oh. I have yeah. a house. I, I have full custody of my son. Um, I work for addiction recovery care as a community liaison, helping other alcoholics and addicts get into recovery and providing support for them. Um, I'm, I'm living my purpose and my passion. Today. That's fantastic, Joe. Thank you very much. That's, a, that's an equally incredible statement. You understand what you're doing now, so that's great. Six years, almost six years, that's fantastic. Sorry. Good luck. We'll see you. Uh, in, let's say, celebrate in 10, okay? We'll see you in 10. Yes, sir. So we'll see you in another four years, all right? That's yes, fantastic news. Thank you very much. Appreciate sir. it. Please. Good afternoon, Mr. President. Thank you so much for having me here today. Thank you. My name is Rhonda Norris. My um, story started when I was coming home from school one day. I teach. Um, and uh, I was broadsided in an intersection by a truck who ran a red light. Um, I have no recollection of the accident. Um, my first memory was a policeman reaching through the shattered window um, and checking for a pulse. And um, I was in and out of consciousness and he continuously um, urged me to stay awake and stay with him. Um, very soothing, very calm, and um, was calling on his radio for an ambulance and um, first responders, which um, his, his being there sped up the process dramatically. Um, he's the one who told me we're going to put a sheet over you to cut you out of the vehicle. Um, I, I couldn't move. I was trapped in the vehicle and also my injuries um, made me incapable of movement. Um, he also followed the ambulance to the hospital. He gathered up all my personal belongings um, that he could find at the accident and brought them to my husband at the hospital and explained to him that I had regained consciousness. Um, stayed with my husband until the um, tests were done and they said she's going to be okay. The most amazing thing to me about this state trooper is that he was off duty. He didn't have to do any of that. Right. Um, he was just happened to be at the scene of the accident and immediately responded and sped up um, my rescue. And I'm eternally grateful to him for doing that. Well, that's great. Thank you very much. It's an incredible story. So how seriously, uh, how long did it take to recover? How bad was it? I was, um, I missed five weeks of work. I um, still have some injuries that will never go away, but I am very, very thankful to okay. be here. That's a great job. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Please. Mr. President, I'm Perry Cleek, pastor of Lighthouse Baptist Church in Jonesboro, Tennessee. Good. And our church uh, watched over the last few weeks as the way that our police officers were treated all over the country. And it was all over the news about how they are such, you know, they've been demonized and disgraced and dishonored. And we got our heads together and thought, what can we do as a small church in a small town to honor our police and to let our voice be known? Their voice is loud that blame all this on police officers. The voice of small town America is seldom heard. So we just set up a little ceremony. We went through the chief of police and the public safety director, and we asked them if we could hold a public ceremony on the steps of the courthouse on Main Street in Jonesboro on July 4th at 11 o'clock in the morning and present each member of the Jonesboro Police Department with a check for $1,000. And we did that, and it shouldn't have, but it made national news. I think small towns all over America feel like we do, that we want our voice to be heard, that we love law enforcement, our local police officers, 
And if we can do something to support them and encourage them, then that's what we want to do. And we feel very good about what we did. Well, that's a great story. I thought you were going to tell me that they wanted to arrest you for giving them uh, a couple of bucks, and uh, they deserve it very much. But, you know, I've, I've heard the other end of those stories also. You're not allowed to do anything. And uh, you're right about it. They've been uh, — what, what the police have been going through over the last number of years, in all fairness, it's been starting. And, but it's never been like this, has it? It's never been like this. It's, uh, it's crazy. It's crazy. And they'll find out. It'll go the opposite direction, unfortunately, at some point. It'll go absolutely opposite when they see — and you're going to have some defunding and abolishing, and you'll see uh, numbers like nobody would ever believe. And they're going to say, let's get our police back as soon as we can, right? But that's great what you just uh, — that's a fantastic thing. Yes, sir. We, we were thankful that it's a small town and a small police department. It was only 23 employees. So it wasn't that big a hit. That's a lot. It was a blessing to That's them. That's a lot. That's a good job. Thank you very Mr. much. Mr. President, I've already heard I got a note written to the church that didn't identify the officer, but said I'm an 83-year-old widower. And one of the officers brought by a sum of money and gave to me to put back to pay my utility bills this mm -hmm. winter and told me it was a gift from Lighthouse Baptist Church. Mm -hmm. That's what one officer — and it's just a week ago, but that's what one officer did with that gift that we gave. That's great. Great stories. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. President Thank you. and Mr. Vice President, for having us. My name is Debbie Wisner. I'm local. I live in Maryland. And my story's not very dramatic. It's just one that my purse was stolen. My purse. People have it happen to them. My credit cards were canceled. And my cell phone, we put a special note on it that said, if found, please call this number. Nothing came of it. A couple nights later, in the middle of the night at midnight, the phone rings. And it's a gentleman says, I found your phone. I have your phone. Would you offer a reward for it? And I said, of course. My husband said, are you nuts? And he said, I'll bring it to you. I gave him my address and hung up the phone and called our police department, because that's who we turn to when there's a situation. Right. My husband had another idea. He wanted to do something else. But I said, no, we're going to let the police do this. There's no shooting tonight. So he, uh, the, the police came. They gave us their cell phone number. They went away around the corner, and they said, when he pulls up, give us a ring. We'll be there. Sure enough, he pulled up, he comes out of the car. It's 2 o'clock in the morning now. And the police, two squad cars were there immediately, which is what we need in our communities. Right. And they checked him out. He did, in fact, find the phone. And I gave him a reward and thanked my police officers. And I'm grateful that we have community policemen that are willing to come at 2 in the morning and do this yeah. silly thing. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Two in the morning. Why did he? Uh, that's a strange time. So you found him to be okay, even though he came at two in the morning. He came at two in the morning, but so were our policemen. Yeah, now they were there. And that's the only reason that's we were great. okay with it. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Really nice. Please, Mr. President. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. Uh, I, like many others, we support you in supporting our law enforcement officers and providing safe communities. Thank you, Mr. Vice President, for being here as well and your hard work. And obviously to the Attorney General, Attorney General Barr, thank you. And to the law enforcement officers that are here and their families and to your staff, Mr. President. Um, although it shouldn't matter, Mr. President, I'm kind of a unique bird, if you will. Um, I'm a Democrat. I'm an elected official. I'm African-American. I have eight years or 12 years of experience in the Georgia House of Representatives, eight years as county exec. And as county exec, I've had to manage a very large, probably one of the largest police departments in the state of Georgia. But I've also had the unfortunate experience of having to meet with family members who lost a loved one from a police shooting. That was a very, probably the most difficult part of my job. But I've also had to deal on the other side where I lost two police officers in one night, among several others I lost, but I lost two in one night. By the way, they happened to, be an, to have been African-American. 
and going to meet with their family members as well, young wives with young babies, and having to experience seeing them um, lose a loved one is, is nothing um, anybody would want to do. But I can tell you this, Mr. President, by and large, most law enforcement officers, those men and women who honorably wear their uniforms each and every day to go out, when they're running towards a situation, others are running from it. So we have to stand with them. And I'll, I'll say this, um, I have two words. Um, we need more funding for police officers, not less funding. And here's why I say that. When you look at law enforcement and the equipment, that's important for them because it's protect and save their lives as well as saving others' lives. But clearly more money is needed to buy less lethal uh, enforcement types of tools like the uh, bowler, what they call the bowler wrap. Right. We also need resources for them. Officers usually, almost always, only get the psychological exam prior of being hired, as part of the examination of getting hired. But afterwards, they're not given those type of psychological exams or assessments. And when you look at them, they've been on, a, let's say, the beat four or five years nonstop, and the number of calls they're getting, the number of situations. That's the way we can detect, are they burned out? Do we need to put them somewhere else? That's important. And, and, and finally, Mr. President, um, community policing is important, that relationship, that trust being fair but enforcing the law. And most people, including black people, they want law enforcement to be out there enforcing the law. I think people just want it to be, they want them to be fair. They want them to be swift in justice. And we lost a baby girl too in Atlanta, eight years old, and it wasn't to a police officer. More people have died from the protests of Black Lives Matter than prior to that. And so sometimes it's hypocritical, it's almost as if some black lives matter, but all black lives should matter and all lives should matter. So I thank you, Mr. President, for what you're doing. Thank you. And I stand solidly with you. Thank you very much. Appreciate yes. it. Beautiful. Please. Good afternoon, uh, President Trump, Vice President Pence, and Mr. Barr, and distinguished guests. I thank you for this opportunity to share our family's uh, story. Eight years ago, our 15-year-old daughter was trafficked by MS-13 gang members. Um, she was trafficked over a year and a half time period uh, throughout the DMV area. Law enforcement played a fundamental role in the rescue and the recovery of our daughter and were also vital in the protection and safety of our family, both then and now. Initially, the officers handling our case, albeit well-intentioned, were not trauma-informed and not able to differentiate a runaway teen from a victim of human trafficking. Once we came in contact with trained personnel, former uh, detective Bill Wolf, our situation improved. We need to provide resources and training to law enforcement to properly address only, not only the offenders, but also to the victims and to their families. Because of Mr. Wolf's expertise in this area, we were able to relocate our family to a safe location. We were able to get our daughter the proper resources and help so that she could heal and move on for her life. Um, the law enforcement is crucial to the rescue, uh, to the victims of human trafficking, and I believe we should support them with everything we have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great story. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mr. President, for convening this listening session. And uh, thank you for all the, the passion and, you know, being able to share your stories here um, on national TV and with the president, because it's really important. Um, there's so many people who don't get a chance to have their voice lifted. And having this opportunity to tell your story um, to a president that's not only going to listen to it, but take action is extremely important to the work that we do. Um, and I want you all to know that um, as you go back home, we're, we're still there with you and we're willing to come and do all we can to help create safer communities. Um, since day one, this president's been really focused on that in a unique way. Um, I've spent some time on the road um, and uh, with my colleague Scott Turner, uh, trying to get local leadership to work with us um, to not only change those communities, but empower people. Um, but 
having these sessions here is, is extremely important because most people don't know, some people don't know the pain that you all go through. Um, and so having that story be told um, to millions of people is extremely important. But I think what's most important is that um, we take this session here and create action, work with our police department, empower our police department, empower our families so that we can change what's happened over the last 20 years. There's, there's it's no reason for places um, across the country in America to have more deaths than a war over in Iraq or Afghanistan. You know, that's, that's not the country that we're about. And uh, this president won't stand for it. And so thank you so much for your thank president, you. Mr. President, for your leadership. Thank you very much. You're doing a great job, too. Please. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm basically here in support of my daughter-in-law and my grandchildren. But um, I would like to say a personal thank you to Officer Reese here for saving my grandson. I will never forget it, and I will always be grateful. And I would also like to add that I'm a state employee. I work in the city of Atlanta. And I have seen a drastic change in law enforcement coverage in that area. And I see the difference when law enforcement is not visible on the streets. So we've had our challenges there, and it's, it's peaceful now. But when there is a lack of law enforcement in, within a community, civility breaks down and crime increases. And I don't have any answers to any solutions, but I can just speak on the fact that I have experienced it over the past three or four months. And I thank you for your invitation here and for your time. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, first of all, Mr. President, Vice President, Attorney General, thank you very much for uh, inviting me here today. It's truly an honor to be here. Um, I'm Deputy Corey Reese with Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office. I have uh, been a deputy there for going on three years now. Uh, last month in June, I was uh, staying with my wife at a uh, Hampton Inn in uh, Tampa, off, off duty of course, I work in Palm Beach County, this is Tampa. Um, we were in the room relaxing and um, I could hear a, uh, a lady in the hallway screaming for help. And so I went outside to see what was going on. And uh, the young lady to my left here was on the floor clutching the child in her arms. She was screaming for help. The child was crying. And there was a man standing above them grabbing at her and the child. Now, my first thought was it was a domestic situation, but clearly there was something going, something wasn't right with the situation. So I separated him. And she said that she doesn't know him and he was trying to take her child. And more and more people came pouring out of their rooms and were saying the same thing. So I immediately got him separated. I had him sit down in the hallway and I had someone else call uh, Tampa PD and they arrived. And I, at that point, I just was keeping the peace between everybody because there were some people getting quite aggressive you know, with, with him. You know, it's not, you know, the right time. You know, you have to let law enforcement handle it. You know, it's not a time to take matters in your own hands. So at that point, it was mostly peacekeeping. But, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't think it would be as, as big of a deal as it ended up being until, you know, the next day some people in the hallway were like, the video's gone viral. It's like a million views. And, and then I'm getting a call saying I'm invited to the White House. I mean, it just it was <laughs> completely unexpected. Um, you know, I just just doing what, you know, what I was trained to do, what I was told to do, you know, just being there at right time, right place, and that's it. Um, again, thank you for having me here. It's called natural instinct, right? More than anything else. Thank you very much. Great job. Appreciate it.
Yeah. 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 Yeah.
the biggest, by far the biggest testing program anywhere in the world. If you tested China or Russia or any of the larger countries, if you just tested uh, India as an example, the way we test, you'd see numbers that would be uh, very surprising. Brazil, too. You know, Brazil's going through a big problem. But they don't do testing like we do. So we uh, do the testing, and uh, by doing the testing, we have tremendous numbers of cases. If we didn't do the — as an example, we've done 45 million tests. If we did half that number, you'd have half the cases, probably, around that number. If we did — if we did another half of that, you'd have half the numbers. Everyone would be saying, oh, we're doing so well on cases. But when I see it reported in the night, you can check me out on this. I mean, they always talk about — they're always talking about uh, cases, the number of cases. Well. It is a big factor that we do. We have a lot of cases because we have a lot of testing, far more than any other country in the world. And it's also the best testing. Yeah, please. Yeah, the federal government is set to resume federal executions for the first time in more than a decade, potentially as soon as a couple of hours from now. Are you monitoring the last-minute appeals on that case? Well, and I think what I'm going to do is allow that to uh, be answered by our Attorney General. Do you mind, Bill? Yes, sir. We, we obviously monitor uh, the appellate process. And, Mr. President, have you given any consideration to using your clemency powers to stop these executions and commute them to life sentences? Well, I've, I've looked at it very strongly. And in this particular case, I'm dealing with uh, Bill and all of the people at Justice. And it's always tough. You're talking about the death penalty. But when you talk about people that did what this particular person did, that's tough also. Uh, so we're going to see what happens. Right now, they have a stay, I believe, right? They have a stay. And we'll let the courts determine the final outcome. And that's what's going to happen, OK? Um, you're asking Americans to have full faith in law enforcement. How do you respond to critics who say you undermined your own federal law enforcement agency, the DOJ, when you commuted the sentence of Roger Stone? Well, if you look uh, back on it, uh, this was an investigation that should have never taken place. Uh, you have guys like Comey, you have uh, McCabe, you have Strook, you have uh, his lover, Lisa Page. You have all of these people running around. You have Brennan and Clapper, who lied to Congress. You have uh, many, many people. You have people that change documents going into the FISA courts. And uh, it's a terrible thing. And this is an investigation that they said should have ended before it started. It shouldn't have started. And if it did, it should have ended immediately, because they found, as you know as well as I do, they found nothing initially, but it went on for two years or longer. And uh, no, I did. I'm getting rave reviews for what I did for Roger Stone. And he, frankly, is going to go and now appeal his case. He had a jury for a woman who hated Roger Stone and uh, who hated probably me. But she went on a false pretense. And he wasn't given a fair trial. He wasn't — it's not a fair trial. He wasn't given another trial. He should have been given another trial. Uh, I won't say more. I won't talk about the judge. I'm not going to — why would I ever talk about a judge? But. Uh, this was a judge that gave, I believe, solitary confinement to Paul Manafort. Al Capone didn't have solitary confinement. So these are things that happened. And uh, if you look at President Bush, President Clinton, President Obama, take a look at what they did. Uh, frankly, it's a very unfair. Roger Stone was treated very unfairly, in my opinion. And so were many others on this side. In the meantime, you have the other ones who are admitted lying before — they admitted they lied before Congress. They leaked — they leaked classified information, which is something you just can't do. And what are they doing? So we'll see what happens. But, no, we're, we're getting rave reviews for what I did. OK. Are you, are you going to be able to hold the convention in Jacksonville with, with all this virus spread? Well, we're going to see it built up a little bit, but we're going to do something that will be great. We think we're doing very well. We had some poll numbers a little while ago that are great. You know, it's the same story. It's uh, suppression polls that we had in 2016, phony polls. Uh, fake news, phony polls, same thing. And we're doing very well. We're doing well in Georgia. We're doing well in Texas. I've read uh, where I was one point up in Texas. I'm not one point up in Texas. We're many points up. I saved the oil industry. Two months ago, I saved the oil industry. They would have been — I created it. We became number one. We have millions of jobs. And we saved it, so Texas is not going to have to let go of millions and millions of people. Oklahoma, uh, North Dakota, many states. Uh, 
we have — we're at $40 a barrel, and yet you can buy gasoline for under $2. Nobody's ever seen like that. So we have the biggest energy in the world. We're number one in oil, as you know, oil and gas, by far. We're now number one in the world. And we would have had millions of people out of work. I saved it. And then they say, I'm leading by one point in Texas. They said it last time, too. They said, Texas is too close to call. This was like three months before the election. And then I won Texas in a blowout. They called it the minute the polls closed. They said that about Utah. They said that about Georgia. They said the same thing. That Georgia's, oh, we can't figure It's too close. They'll never be able to determine. We'll have to wait till election night. On election night, uh, two seconds after the poll closed, they called Georgia. So, you know, it's the same thing. We have the same thing. They're phony polls. They're suppression polls. But to think that uh, after saving the oil and gas business, and millions and millions of jobs. I'm leading Texas by one point. I don't think so. Go ahead. Is the China uh, phase one deal still intact, or is it uh, — do you see it in jeopardy? It's intact. Intact? it's intact. But I'm uh, — I'm, uh, I think what China has done to the world with what took place, the China plague, you can go at the China virus, you can call it whatever you want to call it. It's about 20 different names. Uh, what they did to the world, should not be forgotten, but it's intact. They're buying. Whether they buy or not, that's up to them. They're buying. Yes, President, uh, Los Angeles just announced that they are delaying the opening of their schools. New York already said they were going to delay them. Other school districts are giving parents the choice whether to send their kids to school or not. What do you tell parents who look at this, who look at Arizona, where a school teacher recently died teaching summer school, parents who are worried about uh, the safety of their children in public yeah, schools? The schools should be opened. Schools should be opened. If these kids want to go to school. You're losing a lot of lives by keeping things closed. We did the right thing. We saved millions of lives. We saved millions of lives when we did the initial closure. Had we not done what we did, we would have had two to — Mike and I were talking about it before — two to three million lives lost. Uh, but we did that. So we're at about 135,000, and we'll be at somewhat higher than that by the time it it ends. Uh, and again, the vaccines are happening and the therapeutics are happening, but I'm not even talking about that. So we'll be at a somewhat higher. But we would have lost 2 million, 3 million lives had we not done it. Uh, now we understand it also. We understand there are certain vulnerabilities. Young children. I was with uh, — talking to Governor Murphy, and uh, they have thousands of lives. I won't even say how many. Just thousands of lives. Hard to believe in New Jersey. And he said there was only one life that was 18 or younger. One person died, and that was a person, a young man, that had some medical difficulty. Uh, so when you think of that with thousands of lives, and you have one person that was under 18, uh, that's something that tells you, for some reason, I guess the immune system is much stronger with young people uh, than it is for others. So we have to watch uh, the group that does have the difficulty, does have the problem. We all know what that is. We all know who they are, especially if they have a medical problem. If they have a medical problem, diabetes or heart or anything, uh, it's, a, it's a big problem. But we're being very careful. But we have to open the schools. Would you agree with that? Do you agree? Yeah. We have to open the schools. We have to get them open. And uh, I think there's a lot of politics going along. I think they think they'll do better if they can keep the schools closed in the election. I don't think it's going to help them, frankly. But I think they feel that by keeping schools closed, that's a bad thing for the country, and therefore, that's a uh, good thing for them. But uh, they're the ones whose city's burning. I mean, can you imagine if the country was run like Chicago and like New York and like some of these other Democrat, super radical left cities are run? Uh, you wouldn't have a country for very long, and the economy would crash. So we. Just set a brand new record today on NASDAQ again. This is now, I think, the 18th time since, and this is since after the problem. So we have a new stock market high for NASDAQ, and the other ones are getting very close. When I came here, the stock market was up almost 500 points today. The economy is rebuilding. Jobs are being produced at a record pace. We've never had a pace like this. And I will tell you, if uh, Biden got in, this economy would be destroyed. You know, he was in. He was in office for 48 years, and what he did was not great. Almost every decision was a wrong decision. And now he's going to come in and try and help us. We didn't need any help. 
We built the greatest economy in history, greatest economy we've ever had, the greatest economy the world has ever seen. And then the plague came in from China, and we started all. We did the right thing. We had to close it down. Now we're opening it up. He can't do it. He doesn't have the capability to do it. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Good luck with everything. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Coronavirus hospitalizations in Texas hit a new high, and hospitals are now setting up temporary morgues. Texas Governor Greg Abbott warning the situation there could get even worse. NBC News reporter Priscilla Thompson joining us now from Houston. And Priscilla, tell us what's going on there in Houston. I see you're standing right outside an emergency room. Well, Allison, right now there is a medical task force here on the ground in Houston. It was sent from the Department of Defense, that team of around 85 clinicians and support staff. And they are speaking with hospital administrators about where those resources are going to be deployed in this region and how they can actually help support these hospitals as the cases and the hospitalizations here continue to spike. And we just learned, just received a release from Governor Abbott's office announcing that additional Department of Defense resources are going to be coming to Texas Four more of these task force teams are going to be deployed to various areas throughout the state. We haven't learned which ones yet, but that is really the case on the ground here in Texas. And, you know, the mayor of the city of Houston, we've heard him uh, just this weekend really ratcheting up the language calling for a citywide shutdown here. He essentially placed a lot of the blame for what's happening here on the shoulders of the governor saying that, yes, the state reopened too soon. And while he appreciates the mask order that is now in place, that is simply does not seem to be enough to contain the spread of the virus and what he's seeing. And this comes as just last week, Houston reported a number of days where there were more than a thousand positive cases here. And we are watching very closely. The mayor is going to be de delivering a press conference here in less than an hour to hear what he has to say about the numbers today, Allison. Priscilla, the federal government has extended funding for coronavirus testing sites in both Houston and Dallas. Is that making it any easier for people there to get tested? I know that has been a bit of a difficult thing to do. Well, that's an important question, Allison, because what that, uh, that extension does is it actually keeps the testing sites that were already here, the federal sites that were already operating here, open. But it doesn't actually add additional testing capacity. So what that means is that the stories that we've been hearing over the past couple of weeks in regards to the long lines and the delays and the results, that's not going to change because there's not actually any extra capacity being added. And, you know, in addition to what we've been hearing just about those long lines, we're also hearing other things that are complicating the situation further. My colleague Morgan Chesky in Dallas this morning reported on a testing site there that was actually broken into and a lot of their equipment and supplies were taken. And so that site was not able to open today. Hundreds of tests that normally would have been administered there not able to be done. And, you know, the other thing here, Houston today has a heat index forecasted at 110 degrees. So we are dealing with some very serious heat here. Oh and we have seen over the past couple of days sites across Texas actually having to close down because it's not safe to have people in those lines and healthcare workers uh, doing those tests, administering those tests in that kind of heat. And, you know, that's something that we're probably going to see continue here as we get into really the, the busy time of hurricane season. And so it remains to be seen what's going to happen with these testing sites and the weather issue that's at play here in Texas. Oh, Priscilla, the challenges that you are dealing with there from the heat to that uh, break in, uh, it's just a lot. Uh, let's talk about the temporary morgues. It is so hard uh, to, to hear that, to say that. Uh, talk to me about what's going on and what it has been like uh, for these hospitals and their staff. Yeah. Well, not only is it hard to hear, but it's a it's a 
sort of concerning sight to see that those trailers are being brought in uh, to certain hospitals in Houston and throughout the state because uh, some of the smaller facilities are really reaching capacity in their morgues. And, you know, that is something that we saw in New York City whenever there was a hot spot there. And, you know, for the most part, Texas has been praised for keeping the death rate fairly low. But we have seen those numbers tick up recently. Last week was the deadliest yet with a number of days with record breaking um, fatalities uh, related to COVID-19. And, you know, doctors that I spoke with here told me that, yes, as the cases tick up, it is very likely that the deaths will also tick up. Take a listen to what one doctor told me. We all knew in the scientific community that the deaths lag behind the cases. The, uh, there's usually a two, three week delay. And I, we, I, you know, we kept on saying the deaths are going to come. It's just a matter of time. And, and in fact, that's what we're seeing now. So the point is, Everything about this tragic epidemic right now we're facing in Texas and Houston was both predicted and predictable. And, you know, Governor Abbott, for his part, has signaled that he does expect things to get worse. There is a delay in those deaths. And so the spikes that we saw last week and the week before, we're still getting a count on the fatalities that will come from that. Um, and so, you know, hospitals are preparing in the event that they do need that extra space, Allison. Priscilla Thompson, uh, it is a tough job. It is difficult to stand out there and report on things like temporary morgues, especially in 110 degree heat. Can't thank you enough for all of your hard work. Thank you, Allison. Wichita, Kansas, becoming a new coronavirus hotspot. Health officials say hospitals there are packed, they are short on PPE, and there are problems with contact tracing. NBC News correspondent Cal Perry joining me now from Wichita. And Cal, walk me through this spike. How did Wichita get here? Yeah, so we can actually identify exactly how we got here. Take a look at the chart going back to April. From April to May, the curve was flattened. From May to June, we actually saw cases drop in the state of Kansas. It's June into mid-June when we see that curve heading the wrong way. Now, on May 22nd, the state legislator actually passed a law that the governor had to veto. She gave up some powers, specifically the power to open up things as she wanted. That control then went to the local counties. Many of them opened up right away. It was a very sort of ugly political moment here in Kansas, a political battle, a partisan battle. Uh, it has led many people to say that that was one of the problems, that now Kansas is opening up too fast. As you said, there's a major problem now with the tracing of the virus. Part of this is the testing. The testing here is now in a major delay. It takes six to eight days to get your test result, which makes it very, very difficult to track the disease. On top of that, as you said, hospitals filling up. If you have coronavirus and you go to a hospital here in Kansas, you will likely now have to wait in the emergency room before you can be transferred up to the COVID unit Basically, a bed has to open up on top of that to make matters worse. The ICUs are also oh, filling goodness. up, Allison. So definitely a dangerous situation here uh, in Wichita. Cal, it sure sounds like it. What are health officials saying? What are they advising people? Uh, what do you do in a situation like that? Well, masks. Masks is sort of the first step there. And to yeah. sort of give you an idea of how difficult the political situation is in the county. On the county level, they passed a mask ordinance that is unenforceable. It's written into the law that it's unenforceable. No penalties if you don't wear your mask. So the city passed their own legislation making masks mandatory, especially indoors. It has created confusion. Take a listen to what one local council member told me. It's been confusing for a lot of folks. And that's been part of the issue is folks think that it's not serious. Then you have other folks who see that there is a mandate, but then they see there's not a mandate. And then we do pass a mandate. It just goes back and forth. And honestly, it's politics. And that's the sad thing. You know, public health shouldn't be a partisan issue. It's not red or blue. It's how do we keep you alive? Now, the major hospitals here work regionally. They take patients from the region. One place they're taking patients from is Tulsa. We've seen an influx in the virus from Tulsa. Many people believe that was because of the president's rally three weeks ago. As I said, the hospitals are getting full. And what you heard there from Priscilla is likely going to happen here. We're likely going to see some outdoor tented areas to try to treat people if the trend continues, Allison. 
Cal, it's incredible what the, the councilman said there. It is not red or blue. It is how do we keep you alive? Yet somehow we just keep going in circles around this one. Uh, I know the coronavirus, we have talked about this. It's hitting black communities across the country, especially hard. But what are some of the particular challenges for the black community there in, in Wichita? You know, a lot of it is access to health care. A lot of it is a trust issue. And talking to community leaders, there's just a lack of trust between the authorities and the communities here. There's, of course, the issue of underlining conditions. You have that a lot more in these communities. It's really about reaching out to the community, doing so on the ground, and it's about testing. One local group here has tested 3,000 people in just 20 events using a mobile testing center. That has made a big difference. But when you talk to folks, They'll tell you beyond the testing, it's about that wraparound care. Once you find out that you've tested positive, how do you quarantine away from your family? How do you keep your job? How do you take care of your kids? How do you get the kids to school? All of these are questions that people are trying to answer locally and do so getting into the community. You add to that, again, access to health care. Very difficult, especially when the hospitals are full. But some good news here is that the testing is increasing. The number of people getting tested is increasing. It seems as though they've passed that threshold of trust. The initial trust issue, believe it or not, Allison, was here in Wichita. Many people believed that you could actually uh, yeah, contract the coronavirus through the test. So you saw people going out and trying to educate folks on uh, how that's not true, okay. trying to get them tested and to keep those tests confidential, Allison. Very important. Cal, glad to hear at least they're making some progress on that front. Cal Perry in Wichita, Kansas. Thank you so much. Thanks, Allison. Hospitalizations and ICU capacity hitting record highs in California, making it tougher than ever to care for patients there. Dr. Alex Hakeem joins me now. He's an ICU doctor at the Providence Little Company of Mary Medical Center in Torrance, California. Uh, Dr. Hakeem, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Uh, what is your ICU like right now? It's very hit or miss. I have a lot of colleagues and we are constantly communicating with each other. There are certain areas that are really near max capacity and, and certain areas that were hit hard during the first wave that are relatively spared. So I think we do have the inter-transferability to contain this second wave, but uh, it is, as you said, it can get very dicey and we need to get the message out as early as possible. How are the cases, and I guess I should ask, are the cases that you're seeing now different from what you were seeing back in April? Uh, and what are some of your biggest problems at the hospital right now? Yeah, that's one of the most interesting questions going on because uh, the first wave, we had some sporadic community transfer between people that wasn't as particularly deadly. One of the points of emphasis I wanted to make is uh, we had nursing homes, we had prisons, we had people in lockdown spreading it amongst their own relatives. And those tend to be the higher, higher viral load transfer. Those are the ones that really scare me. It's why, uh, you know, there are some realists that say, well, it's, the virus is going to get out there, but it's really about the amount of virus that's transferred between people. It's the, it's the, degree of transfer we're talking about in closed spaces. We're talking about oftentimes you could trace the spread of virus in people's homes, in bars, in closed areas. That's why the mask for me is a no-brainer. That's why the six-foot distance as much as possible and outdoor yeah. events as much as possible is a no-brainer. What kinds of treatments have been working for your patients and has that evolved uh, over time? Are you, are you doing different things that perhaps you weren't doing back in say March, April, May? Yeah. Uh, we ha have seen a uh, ubiquitous treatment with steroids, uh, resisting intubation as much as possible. Mm -hmm. They're antivirals, anti-IL-6, which are immune modulating drugs. Uh, we're even starting to be, even though we're ICU doctors, we have to be researchers. We have to put on a different hat and engage mm -hmm. with drug companies about novel treatment therapies. And that's been an exciting uh, change that has been taking place over the last few weeks. Dr. Hakeem, what advice do you have for people right now, both in California and, and just across the country? What can they do to help stop this virus from spreading? What would you advise them? Yeah, 
there's uh, an issue that I don't really see being expressed out there, and I alluded to it, to it earlier. If you talk to these patients who are in the ICU, so let's say that 7% of the population is carrying this virus right now based on our testing. Uh, it's ubiquitous in some sense. If you're out in public, there's a very good chance that somebody uh, in a, in a large, large group is going to be carrying that virus. And you have five days of pretty much no symptoms. Uh, but it's the people that you get really close to, and oftentimes they're the people that you care the most about. There are people in your own home. There are uh, close family members. And it's very hard. You know, this is a disease that really preys on our affection for each other. Uh, and it's that uh, a degree of transfer between close people, uh, uh, people who really know each other that can sometimes be the most deadly. And those are the sad stories that I hear from families right now. That, that is really heartbreaking. I know so many of us have said, uh, you know, I wish I could hug you. I wish I could come uh, close to you, to the people that we love. Uh, an important reminder from you that we, we still need to keep some distance uh, and need to think about that. Dr. Hakeem, I can't thank you enough for your time. I know you are so busy. We really appreciate it. Appreciate it. President Trump going against top health experts again today on Twitter, retweeting conservative game show host Chuck Woolery, accusing the CDC and doctors of lying about the coronavirus, saying it's all an effort to obstruct his reelection. And it's not just the president. His administration is also trying to discredit top health officials like Dr. Fauci. And I respect Dr. Fauci a lot, but Dr. Fauci is not 100 percent right, and he also doesn't necessarily, and he admits that, have the whole national interest in mind. He looks at it from a very narrow public health point of view. Admiral Zwa, I think, hit the nail on the head on this yesterday. He was making the point that Dr. Fauci represents one viewpoint in the administration, and he looks at things from a, a public health standpoint. So Dr. Fauci's one member of a team, but rest assured, his viewpoint is represented, and the information gets to the president. Um, through the task force. Shannon, Kaylee McEnany saying that Dr. Fauci's views do get to the president, but one White House official told NBC News, quote, several White House officials are concerned about the number of times Dr. Fauci has been wrong on things and gave NBC News a list. What is on that list? Well, it was nearly a dozen statements that the official claimed were made by Dr. Fauci and proved to be erroneous. Now, some of those were taken out of context and didn't show the full context of what Dr. Fauci was trying to say. Uh, but that was over the weekend. The White House, uh, as you could see, those clips that you showed there, Allison, um, you know, raising questions about you know, Fauci's accuracy, putting out this memo to reporters, a sort of opposition style uh, re uh, research memo, the type of thing you would see a political campaign put out on their opponent. Uh, today, they seem to backwalk that a little bit. And President Trump was asked just a few minutes ago what he thinks of Dr. Fauci. And here's his response to that. Well, I have a very good relationship with Dr. Fauci. I've had for a long time, right from the beginning. I find him to be a very nice person. I don't always agree with him. And shortly before that, Kaylee McEnany was asked a similar question about the relationship with Fauci. Uh, she denied that there was any effort by the White House to discredit Fauci, despite this memo that the White House was giving out to reporters of times they say he has uh, been wrong and predicting what was going to happen. So pushing back on that some, but still not an incredibly strong defense, Dr. Fauci coming from the White House. The bottom line is what they say is that he is one voice among many. Of course, he is leader uh, in the administration uh, in the country for infectious disease. He's head of the National Allergy and Infectious Disease. So while he is one voice, he is essentially the country's top infectious disease doctor as we are dealing with a major infectious disease. Yeah, for sure. Uh, has that top voice, Dr. Fauci, uh, responded to this? Have we heard anything from him about this? He has not. Uh, there is an event he is speaking at later today that will be webcast. He has not been one of the voices out there on TV. Uh, we have heard from Dr. Burks. We have heard from the Surgeon General, um, Admiral Giroir, uh, was you, you just played a clip of a moment ago. The White House has intentionally been trying to put out some of the medical experts to talk about the coronavirus, and rather than White House officials to uh, you know try and depoliticize the issue and get more medical expert voices out there. Dr. Fauci has not 
been one of those so far. A uh, White House official told me a couple weeks ago that they were anticipating putting him out on TV more. But so far, he has just been doing a lot of, um, you know, online webcast events, uh, you know, speaking to a group of doctors, medical events. Um, they're watched very closely by reporters. So oftentimes the thing he's things he says there are picked up by the wider press, but he has not been making the Sunday show rounds like many other people in the administration have. Shannon, the president today also retweeted uh, this message saying there is overwhelming evidence that schools should open this fall. Uh, meanwhile, we're getting mixed messages from his administration. Take a look. Well, we know that children get the, the virus at a far lower rate than any other part of the population. And again, there's, there is no, nothing in the data that would suggest that kids being back in school is, uh, is dangerous to them. We need to get the virus under control. Uh, when we get the virus more under control, then we can really think about how we put children back in the classroom. The government still hasn't provided a reopening plan. Do we have any idea when that might be coming and what might be in it? Well, we don't really have any specifics on either of those fronts, which, of course, to schools who are trying right now to plan for what's going to happen in the next month or so, uh, that is certainly a, a point of frustration. The uh, administration was planning to put out uh, some guidelines, then it appeared that they were walking that back because they don't want to be too restrictive to individual schools in certain areas. And of course, states have a lot of control about how schools are run, uh, as, in addition to, to communities and counties um, and, and you know at the local level. So you know the administration is still sort of struggling with this. They obviously want schools to reopen, but they have not given that clear guidance as to how they're going to reopen. Uh, and even many states and localities haven't been able to give their schools uh, that guidance yet. So, so many school districts right now are, are essentially trying to figure this out on their own. Shannon, the president hosted a roundtable today with people positively impacted by law enforcement. What do we know about that event? Well, this continues to be the president's uh, messaging as a strong uh, law and order president, uh, pushing back against the protests we have seen around this country. At least that's the aim, is to have this counter messaging uh, to the uh, protests following the death of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement. This is clearly something signaling to his base uh, that he is firmly behind law enforcement. Uh, and, you know, this was a, a rather unique event of having uh, victims of crime and law enforcement officials uh, giving the uh, message that police are important. So to counter that defund the police uh, message, which he thinks is going to be key to uh, his reelection. Of course, you know, this issue, this broader issue of coronavirus, we are talking about uh, the president, you know, doesn't have anything scheduled today, specifically talking about coronavirus. Um, and we haven't heard much from him on that other than a few remarks now. And of course, that tweet, that retweet you mentioned earlier, raising questions about what type of evidence is out there uh, around coronavirus. Oh, but Shannon, it is only Monday. We have so much more ahead, I'm sure. Uh, Shannon Petty Peace, thank you so much for getting us caught up on what's going on in the White at the White House today. Thank you. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Among the chaos, that I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. When you need brutal honesty. This isn't about Donald Trump. This is about 400 years of racism. When you need answers first thing in the morning. What needs to be done to make ballots ready to go for the presidential election in November? When you need to go deep inside the story. What's a policy change in policing that you would like to see enacted? And hear from someone who's been there. Who's telling the truth and who's lying every day. That's the new story Americans want to hear. You need your morning Joe only on MSNBC. We'd like to think that we live in some sort of post-racial 
America, we are reminded time and time again that we do not. Now I reached out to you after I watched the mayor of Atlanta act as a mom trying to raise her son. And I think about you and your kids. I remember her coming home saying, why don't I have a ponytail like the white girls? It's okay to notice that you're different. You just have to not feel less than. That's my thing. I cherish the fact that we can have these discussions. I feel safe talking about this with you guys. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Well, we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. A virus that knows no borders. A real catastrophe happening here in Brazil before our very eyes. Our global fight against it unites us. Here in Mexico City, the people I spoke to said if they don't work, they're not going to be able to feed their families. Our NBC News and Sky teams are on the ground learning from where it's been. The South Korean government is bringing students back over the next couple of weeks in stages. So that you can better understand how it will impact us here. Life across Italy is back to normal. It just doesn't look like the same normal as before. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. These are the United States, a united people with a united purpose. The future doesn't belong to the faint-hearted. It belongs to the brave. A great people has been moved to defend a great nation. All of us can extend a hand to those in need. What do you think needs to be fixed and what would count as justice in this case? Do you have clarity on what the president has actually ordered? I have to ask whether the Democratic Party can turn this around so that this is an engine for progressive political change. People are not six feet apart from one another for the most part. Are you worried that these two crises may dovetail in terms of the risk of transmission at these ongoing protests? It's one of the biggest questions of the summer. Is it safe for kids to go back to the classroom? NBC News medical correspondent Dr. John Torres got answers from doctors across the country. As schools struggle with reopening safely, <laughs> NBC News reached out to five top pediatricians across the country, a random sampling of doctors to find out just how dangerous the coronavirus is for kids. Our experts agree most children don't get as sick as adults and that serious complications are rare. This has been a strange pandemic because usually for respiratory viruses, children are the first and the most substantially affected. And this has really been a flip of that, where it's our adults and particularly our older adults that have been more affected. In fact, kids only account for 2% of all cases. Doctors say they don't expect that number to significantly increase when schools open because kids don't appear to be good at spreading the virus. Are kids as good at transmitting the virus as adults? The data that's come out now um, seems to show that most transmissions occur from adults to adults or adults to children. The younger you are, probably the less likely you are to be able to transmit the disease. While many teachers are concerned about reopening school so soon, the five doctors we spoke to agreed. The benefits of being in the classroom far outweigh the risk of disease. But the key is to reopen safely. We are... Uh, not seeing transmissions when we're following some simple guidelines. I think each school system is going to have to come up with their own guidelines because you can't just say that one city is just like the next. All agree guidelines should include rules for social distancing. Keep desks three to six feet apart and make sure desks aren't facing each other. Schools may want to consider holding gym classes outside. In your perfect world of sending kids back to school, what would you like seeing set up in those school systems? They should try to um, increase the airflow in the classrooms, um, try to distance as much as possible. I have been doing a lot of um, research looking into face masks. I don't think they're um, necessarily useful in elementary school children. They do um, provide protection, I think, for high school students. Would you let your kids go back to school? I will. My kids are looking forward to it. Yes. Period. Absolutely. Absolutely. As much as I can. <laughs> Without a hesitation. Without a hesitation, yes. I have no concerns about sending my child to school in the fall. I would let my kids go back to school. Dr. John Torres, NBC News. 
New York Governor Andrew Cuomo out with some new guidelines today to help decide whether schools will reopen in the fall. He says students will only be allowed back in parts of the state with an infection rate under 5 percent. There is a state formula that will determine if it is safe to reopen schools, okay? So open schools or not, there's a state formula that determines it. There are then state guidelines as to, as to how that school reopens. NBC News correspondent Kathy Park is outside a public school in New York City. Kathy, tell us more about this state formula. Well, Allison, schools will be able to reopen if the region is in phase four and the daily infection rate is uh, under 5% over a 14 day period. And ultimately, Governor Cuomo will make the call if schools will be reopening uh, this fall. And he said he'll be making that announcement the first week of August. Now, if for some reason there is a spike in cases, um, and the infection rate is above 9% when the, the time frame comes to that August uh, date, August 1st. Then he said he will have to hit the emergency button again and close schools once again. Allison? Yeah, Kathy, it sounds like then if a school meets the requirement but cases surge afterwards, that's recipe for a shutdown again? Correct. And right now, things are still kind of in the, the planning phase right now. So a lot of these school districts behind the scenes are coming up with these reopening plans here in New York City. Specifically, um, Mayor Bill de Blasio and the school's chancellor last week announced those guidelines. And essentially, it will be a blended learning model. So it will be a combination of in-person learning as well as remote learning. So essentially, kids will be in the classroom two to three times per week. However, families do have the option of all remote learning, and then they'll be able to opt into that blended learning environment um, at different points throughout the year. Kathy, do we know anything more about the restrictions for schools once they're allowed to reopen some of the, the rules, whether uh, on, on testing temperature checks, any things like that, or these are all things that are still in the works? Yeah, definitely. Those things are still in the works. They do have um, a deadline. Um, Governor Cuomo said that these school districts will have to come up with these plans and submit them by the end of the month. And then August 1st or that first week of August is when he'll make an announcement about whether schools can reopen. Kathy, I know you've been talking to parents in the community. What are they telling you? How do they feel about all of this? Well, Allison, they definitely have mixed feelings about this. Obviously, they want their kids back in a school environment because of that valuable interaction with teachers as well as fellow students. But they also worry about their children's health and the safety of the classroom. Right now, parents are juggling not only their own work, but schoolwork and then also troubleshooting any sort of glitch that they have to deal with as these students are in front of a computer for hours on end. We had a chance to talk to one mom who shared a little bit more about the challenges that are happening inside her own household. It's not easy because the parents have all the work, you know, and it's really hard on the parents. So I think they should just like work it out the best way that they can. Because you have to submit the work at a time frame and some parents are not home. They're depending on relatives to help to sign in. And it's not easy because doing that every morning frustrated other, you know, like I said, my 16 year old, she have her work cut out and she have to help the other two young ones to sign in, you know, and it's not easy. Certainly isn't easy. A lot of these parents deserve um, a gold star for the amount of work that they are having to do at home. Um, so what might the classroom experience look like come fall here, specifically in New York City? So according to Mayor Bill de Blasio and the school's chancellor, they will be utilizing larger spaces. So auditoriums and gyms will be used for spreading out those students and offering that in-class experience if, if families move forward and offer uh, that option for their students. Um, there will be cleaning throughout the day, overnight cleaning and hand sanitizers. Obviously, that will be uh, accessible. And then um, leading up to the fall, September, 
HVAC systems will be getting upgrades to improve the airflow inside these buildings, Allison. Kathy, you said it, a gold star, uh, if not 10, for all of those parents out there trying to yeah. juggle schoolwork and their own work and keeping their families healthy and safe. I know it's been a super stressful time for all of them, uh, especially as they don't know what's going on with their kids this fall. Yep, a lot of questions um, on so many levels, and they are having to deal with a lot. They've had to step into the role of teacher pretty much overnight, Allison. A gold star for those parents you said at Kathy Park. Thank you so much. You got it. Belgium joining other European nations reopening their schools this fall. NBC News global correspondent Tessa Arcilia is in Brussels to show us how they plan to do it. Well, Alison, school's out right now. It is quiet in front of this primary school, but Belgium is gearing up for the new school year in September. And what they have in place is a color-coded traffic light system. So green being the best case scenario and red the worst. So the plan right now is to reopen under the yellow color, which means that the virus is still present, but that the number of new infections is relatively low. I spoke to the Flemish uh, education minister, and he said that early on, they looked to Denmark as an example, one of the first ones to partially reopen schools and they saw that there wasn't really a significant impact on the number of new infections, so it gave them a point of reference. But he did say that the decision process was a difficult one because it was about striking a balance between several important factors. Take a listen. You have to make a choice between the, uh, the societal costs, for example, of the closure of schools, the cost for, for children, for your uh, education system, and on the other hand, the safety and it's a balance and sometimes you have to choose you you have to choose for the uh, for the education for the kids and for their well-being and that might have an impact on the safety well, most of Europe will be reopening their schools in September, albeit with strict hygiene guidelines and varying levels of social distancing rules in place. Italy, for example, one of the hardest hit countries in Europe, will be pumping in some $1 billion into their education system. They plan to do that and plan to hire 50,000 teachers to manage smaller socially distanced classes. Well, it seems like come September, schools like this one will be bustling again, but COVID-19 will be very much part of that new reality. What if we missed a significant number of coronavirus cases, especially early on? Medical experts around the country are reviewing autopsies to see if they can find cases that were overlooked. NBC News investigative reporter Emmanuel Saliba spoke with the doctors leading this search, and she joins us now. Uh, Emmanuel, tell us more about this. What are they finding? Well, Allison, for some of the medical experts that we spoke to, they're still sort of at the beginning stages of their investigation. Um, as you mentioned, they okay. have to go through autopsy files. So they've looked at, um, they're pulling up hundreds, if not thousands of cases, going through them and identifying those who, d who displayed symptoms of COVID-19. After that, they will start testing either blood samples or tissue samples. Um, but the reason they're doing this is to try and understand how early the virus landed in the U.S. and how prevalent the virus was in their own communities, but also across the United States. We spoke to a team in uh, New York at NYU's Langone Medical Center, and um, the, the pathologist there really insisted that he's convinced the virus was here before uh, the first officially declared case on March 1st wow. in New York. And um, that's why he's doing that, that work. He's uh, identified 150 cases that they're going to start testing now, and that could potentially change our timeline and our understanding of, of when the virus arrived in the United States. Yeah, I was going to ask if, in fact, that is true, if his hunch is correct, uh, what does that tell us about the coronavirus? And then what can they do with that kind of information? Um. I 
Yeah, as I said, it could potentially change uh, our timeline and, and uh, our current yeah. chronology of how we understand the virus right now. Um, for uh, Dr. Schnudel, uh, the pathologist at NYU, he thinks that gaining a better understanding of that early spread that potentially was a silent spread could help us better prepare for mm -hmm. the future. He's seeing that um, what New York experienced being replicated across different states right now, and that's why he's racing to find these earliest cases. Um, for an other pathologist, for a medical examiner in Ohio that we spoke to, he oversaw the investigation in, in one of Ohio's, um, the second largest uh, rate of infection. And for him, these types of offices, medical examiner's offices, really have the opportunity to catch a population that perhaps have been ignored. Because they investigate violent deaths, um, suicide, accidental deaths. They're catching people who perhaps didn't get tested for the coronavirus because they weren't displaying symptoms or maybe they couldn't afford to get tested. And that could potentially give local and national governments information on which communities they need to focus on. Emmanuel, it is such fascinating research. Uh, I I'm wondering, is the current surge of coronavirus cases, the spike that you mentioned, is that having an impact on the research that they're trying to do in any way? Absolutely, Allison. Um, my colleague, I did this okay. work with my colleague, Lisa Cavazzuti, and she focused largely on California. And um, many of the, uh, they're actually the only state that uh, have issued an official directive to all medical examiners to start retesting cases all the way back to December 2019. But a lot of them are just dealing with the day to day. The spokesperson for Imperial County, for example, um, one of the hardest hit counties right now, says it's just not possible to do this type of backtracking while they're dealing with this resurgence. So hopefully in the future, it's something they can look at doing. But right now, um, they need time. They also need funding and they need staffing. Yeah. Oh, Emmanuel Felipe, thank you so much for your reporting. It is so interesting. I'm so curious to see what they find. Thank you. Me too. Thanks, Allison. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. It is said there's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. Perhaps the time has come to fully realize the dream upon which this great country was founded. Equal justice under the law. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. But we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Introducing Peacock. What's Peacock? This is Peacock. Let's go! It's streaming, launching, Woo! premiering. It's TV, yeah. movies, <laughs> exclusive originals, original characters. Duh. It's sports. Breaking news. Socks. Tunes. Wait, there's more. More? Yes, yes, more, more. Tons. It's quick stuff. Binge stuff. Tough stuff. Love stuff. It's trending. Mind bending. It's late night. Early morning. Good morning. It's you see this? You remember that? You watched every single one of those? It's for you. For ew. For aw. It's Chrisley, Pawnee, Monkey, E.T. Oh. oh. And it's free. 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 Who's with me? That's Peacock. Yeah, that's who. Big that's what. That's why. Come on. Boom. Mic drop. You can't not watch. We'd like to think that we live in some sort of post-racial America, we're reminded time and time again that we do not. Now I reached out to you after I watched the mayor of Atlanta act as a mom trying to raise her son, and I think about you and your kids. I remember her coming home saying, why don't I have a ponytail like the white girls? It's okay to notice that you're different. You just have to not feel less than. That's my thing. I cherish the fact that we can have these discussions. I feel safe talking about this with you guys.
After nearly nine decades, the Washington Redskins are retiring their controversial name and logo. That name has long been seen by Native American groups as an ethnic slur. The NFL team said its owner and head coach are working on a new name and logo design. NBC News correspondent Tom Costello reports. Good day. Yeah, the Washington Redskins are no more. The team announced this morning it is dropping that name and that logo effective immediately. The three-time Super Bowl champs have been under pressure for years, decades really, to make this change, but all along the team refused. Now it's making the change amid this tidal wave of public opinion against racism and after big team sponsors, including FedEx, demanded the change or risk losing sponsorships. This morning, a storied football franchise is dropping its controversial name and logo. The Washington NFL team announcing its decision this morning with plans to, quote, develop a new name and design approach that will enhance the standing of our proud tradition, rich franchise, and inspire our sponsors, fans, and community for the next 100 years. The potential change first reported by the Sports Business Journal. In recent weeks, the team has been facing significant corporate and political pushback to change the moniker, widely viewed as a racial slur against Native Americans. One of the league's original franchises, the name dates back 87 years. Earlier this month, delivery giant FedEx, which owns the naming rights for the team stadium in Landover, Maryland, issued a one-sentence statement. We have communicated to the team in Washington our request that they change the team name. This, as Adweek magazine reported, the investment firms and shareholders worth $620 billion asked FedEx, along with Nike and Pepsi, to terminate their ties to the franchise, unless team owner Dan Snyder made the change. Like FedEx, Nike and PepsiCo have announced they support a new name. Meanwhile, multiple lawmakers told the Washington Post the team would only be allowed to relocate from Maryland back to D.C. if the name was gone. And like Nike, Amazon, Target and Dick's Sporting Goods also pulled Washington's merchandise. Ten days ago, the organization released a statement saying it was conducting a thorough review of the name. A major reversal for Snyder, who bought the team in 1999, had previously said he'd never make the change, claiming the name honors Native American heritage. We are people, not mascots. A citizen of the Pawnee Nation, Crystal Echo Hawk, recently telling NBC News. The R word is the N word, and we can no longer tolerate this kind of hate speech in our society. And now, as the movement to confront racial inequality pushes forward, an NFL franchise could take the field this fall with a new identity. So the team has not yet announced the new name, but among the names said to be under consideration are the Warriors, the Red Hawks, and the Red Tails. The team is reportedly working on trademark issues, and it's also said it wants to choose a name that honors both veterans and Native Americans. Washington has had this name for 87 years. Its merchandise is among the best-selling in the NFL. The team insisted that they were honoring Native Americans, but in the wake of George Floyd's death and the protests that followed, the crescendo of public opinion was simply too great to ignore, especially as Native Americans pushed for a name change. I'm Tom Costello in Washington. Back to you. Today, a federal judge in Washington, D.C., declined to rule on whether detained migrant families should be released with their children. Yesterday, lawyers representing detained families filed a complaint with the Department of Homeland Security, alleging that ICE denied them proper medical care, especially during the coronavirus pandemic. NBC News Justice correspondent Julia Ainsley joins me now. And Julia, what does this mean for the detained migrant families? Well, it means another day of not knowing what their future looks like and if they'll be waking up with each other, with parents and children in the same place come Friday. So Friday is the deadline that a judge in California put in place for the day that ICE needs to release children from these detention facilities. But that judge doesn't have jurisdiction over the parents. The judge that does is Judge Boesberg here in D.C. And just an hour ago, Allison, less than that, he said he will not be ruling today, not before that Friday deadline to say that the parents have to be released as well. In fact, he said he needs until the middle of next week. And it seemed that he may go in the direction of ruling that some should be released for those medical conditions that we detailed on our reporting, but not a widespread 
scale release like the lawyers for these families are asking for, saying that they need to be released together. Now, I just got off the phone with a lawyer who represents families in Dilly. That's a South Texas residential center for families. And she said that you would think that a lot of parents would say, no, if I'm given the choice, I want to stay with my child. But she says that if they are given the choice, and they may not, some of these parents that she's talking to now are so desperate, they may choose to release their child because they think that they're saving their life as the cases of COVID continue oh. to rise inside ICE facilities. Oh, Julia, those poor parents. Uh, we have heard uh, some horror stories uh, about the conditions in detention facilities. How are lawyers describing those conditions right now? Well, we're hearing lots of things from across many of these ICE detention facilities, and especially in the family detention centers. The rates are lower than we've seen in other facilities like we've seen in Arizona, like you and I were talking about last week. But we know of at least 35 cases in one facility. And like I said, those families in Dilly, there aren't positive cases now, but they said that they were all asked to self-test and they weren't given a real test that would determine whether or not they had COVID. So they're getting really afraid. The rates are rising in those regions. And as you know, staff, people come in and out of these buildings. So they're afraid. And they're also saying that they're not getting the medical care that they need, even for other conditions apart from COVID, that they're not being cared yeah. for for things like heart murmurs for their children, hypertension, um, breast cancer in one case. One woman had a tumor on the back of her head and no one would tell her whether or not it was malignant. I mean, these are some basic things that these people aren't getting the care for. So the lawyers are arguing that how could they possibly care for this family, especially the vulnerable population of these young children if they can't attend to those other medical needs, let alone during a pandemic. Julia, the Trump administration pushing back against releasing detained families because of the coronavirus. On what grounds? What are they saying? Well, they're saying that the, it's just as risky for these families to be outside in the world like you and me, Allison, because of the rates of COVID-19 in America, then they could have the exact same chance inside ICE facilities. They say if the judge is going to rule on anything, he should make these policies like PPE and social distancing more stringent inside the facilities, change the conditions there rather than ordering widespread release. They say this is a matter of determining law and order. Now, one thing the government, though, might be afraid of losing is having precedent over how judges can determine who gets released from ICE custody. We know it's a huge priority of President Trump's not to release immigrants. He vowed to end catch and release. But in the Bozberg case, that D.C. case I was just talking about, he's really only able able to rule on the parents currently in detention. So even if he rules that those are released, that doesn't have the long-term president. It doesn't uh, go to any other members except for people, the adults and the parents who are currently in detention now. Julia Ainsley, uh, it's a story we've talked with you about so many times before. Uh, you, your heart just breaks for those families uh, and they still don't have answers. Uh, thank you so much for your latest reporting. Thank you. Hey everyone, I'm Allison Morris. You're watching NBC News Now. It is Monday once again. Let's go to NBC News correspondent Savannah Sellers. She has all the latest headlines for us from NBCNews.com. Savannah, great to see you. What's going on today? Hi, Allison. Happy Monday. Thanks for having me. And let's start, of course, with an update on the coronavirus. Cases climbed to over the weekend with Florida clocking in more than 15,000 new cases. And that is a scary new record. No other state has reported a single day total that high. And it's making some officials question whether it's safe to reopen schools. Do you believe kids should go back to school in person next month? Well, I, I think they can't uh, go back today, that's for sure. Things would have to improve uh, pretty dramatically over the next six weeks uh, for that to happen. And I think uh, that's our hope. And that's our, uh, you know, in terms of hoping that things improve. Obviously, we're always hoping that things improve. Earlier today, the World Health Organization also cautioned against reopening schools too soon, especially in places that are hotspots for the virus. They also warned that scientists still don't know that much about the long-term side effects of COVID-19 in children. 
We can't move from let's deal with the schools and then we all deal with that for a week or two and then let's deal with the workplace or then let's deal with infection in hospitals or long-term care facilities. This is playing whack-a-mole. We can't turn schools into yet another political football in this game. Of course, these comments come just a few days after the Trump administration said they will push for schools to reopen this fall. Now, moving on to some sports news. Washington, D.C.'s NFL team announced today they will retire their name and logo. This follows years of criticism that the team's identity represented a racist slur. In a statement, the team said they are, quote, working closely to develop a new name and design approach, but it's TBD on what that new name will be. And now I want to show you some unsettling visuals out of San Diego, where dozens are injured following an apparent explosion aboard a military ship. A fire broke out Sunday, and firefighters were still fighting the flames as of this morning. Officials still aren't 100 percent sure how it began, but it might have stemmed from an issue with the ship's pressurization. And lastly, I'm sorry to say a sad note to end on. Actress Kelly Preston died yesterday after a two-year battle with breast cancer. Her husband, John Travolta, announced the tragic news overnight, thanking doctors for treating Preston throughout her previously undisclosed illness. She was 57 years old. And that wraps up our headlines for this hour, Allison. And we'll be back in just a little bit with some more. All right, Savannah, thank you so much. That was the first headline I saw when I woke up this morning. and I just thought it was such sad news. Mm. Thanks again. I know it was, and we didn't know. You got it. Florida set a new record yesterday, reporting more coronavirus cases in one day than any other state ever. 15,299. That easily beats New York during its peak. Meanwhile, Disney World reopened over the weekend, the Magic Kingdom and Animal Kingdom, welcoming visitors for the first time in three months. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock joining me now from Orlando. And Sam, we will get to Disney. But first, what are health officials saying about the numbers in Florida? The state reported more cases than all of Europe combined yesterday. It beat New York's worst day by 3,000 cases. That is just nuts. It's crazy. The numbers on their face boggled the mind. And I think the level of concern right now, Allison, definitely getting dialed up. Governor Ron DeSantis is expected to speak at 5 o'clock this afternoon. He has not talked since that 15,300 number from Sunday. So this is going to be the first time we're getting his initial reaction to record numbers. That being said, Governor DeSantis previously has talked about testing and how that is contributing to the spike here. That would be true in this case. The last two batches of numbers we've gotten from the state, both have been records. 112,000 tests today, 143,000 yesterday, Allison. So that is likely going to be part of the narrative. Other health officials and elected officials, though, talking out right now. Carlos Jimenez, who is the mayor of Miami-Dade County, came out yesterday and basically said, if this continues at this rate, our hospitals are going to be full. The ICU bed capacity right now in Miami-Dade, as of today, just updated, is 97.6 percent. They are teetering toward that brink of maximum capacity. And he said, look, we're going to be running out not just of space, but potentially of staffing as well. Major levels of concern right now. Sam, let's talk about Disney. Uh, Was it crowded there this weekend? And what is the park doing to keep visitors and its employees safe? As far as we can tell, Allison, it is not crowded. I say as far as we can tell, the main entrance is over my shoulder right now. Disney has not given us permission to get onto their campus, so we don't know for sure. We do know the videos that we're seeing and anecdotally what we're hearing, which is that they're having reduced capacity right now. There's an online reservation system. They're trying to intentionally cap the number of people that could be in the park at any given point in time for obvious reasons. Then there's the sanitization and what kind of protocols they're putting into place from checking temperatures from everybody that comes inside to making sure that lines, people are separated there and that seats are blocked off. You will not be seeing uh, multiple rows of people together unless they're in the same family. We did talk to a family from Marin County, California, about how they were preparing and what they're seeing once they got inside the park. Here's what they told us. They're doing sanitizing, masks. We have a face shields on the cast members. I mean, it is a very different park than when it was closed down in March. Has that changed your kids' experience at all? Brooke, has it changed your experience? Um, no, not at all. And Allison, it's important to keep in mind, it's important to keep in mind for many of these families, they plan these trips to Disney World months in advance, well before Florida saw this latest spike of cases. So it's a hard position to be putting families in. What do I do with my kids? In this case, the Evans said that they felt comfortable, provided that they were able to 
sanitize everything, keep their masks on the entire time, and understand it's just going to be a different kind of experience. Sam, they definitely get extra points for matching their masks to their uh, Mickey ears. That's that's uh, that's something you haven't seen before. Uh, let's talk about what happens if Florida keeps seeing more infections. I mean, is there a chance that Disney could shut down again? I think that's a realistic possibility, Allison. There's been no word yet out of yeah. Disney World down here. We do know this. In Hong Kong, where cases have spiked recently, Disneyland in Hong Kong is now going to close on July 15th. They're leaving their resorts open wow. with higher levels of attention toward cleanliness and sanitization. That's what Disney is saying there. But look what's going on. They're closing at, at that Chinese location in, in Hong Kong. It is entirely possible that here in Florida, we could see something similar. But again, we've reached out to Disney to ask about the numbers at the park, criticisms about opening at this point in time. We've heard nothing back. So I cannot tell you authorita authoritatively they are or are not going to do that. But again, they planned all this well before yeah. the most recent spike. Sam, ICU beds are filling up in Florida. What are doctors there saying about that and about Disney reopening while that's going on? So, so that's part of the level of concern as well, which is that across the state, Allison, yeah. they're now at 82% ICU bed capacity. That's not great, but it's not the dire situation that we're seeing in some parts of the state. Orlando area, where I am right now, Orange County, is doing okay, according to the state numbers anyway. Miami, we already talked about. I asked uh, Tallahassee Memorial Healthcare Director, the, the chief medical officer there, what she thinks about this idea of theme parks opening while cases are jumping through the roof. Here's what she had to say. And it does make you cringe in a sense of if everyone was doing the right thing, wearing their masks and being socially responsible for others, we could probably get around a little bit more and do things. I think, Allison, Dr. Friel's point there is not necessarily that it's wrong to be opening up these businesses, but you can't control what people are going to do. You can only take action for your own agency, your own responsibility, wearing a mask, standing far away from groups of people. But not everybody is approaching it with that level of vigilance. And that is a big reason why right. we find ourselves in the position that we are in right now. Absolutely. Sam Brock in Orlando, outside of Walt Disney World. Thank you so much. <laughs> Exactly right. Thank you, Allison. Coronavirus hospitalizations in Texas hit a new high, and hospitals are now setting up temporary morgues. Texas Governor Greg Abbott warning the situation there could get even worse. NBC News reporter Priscilla Thompson joining us now from Houston. And Priscilla, tell us what's going on there in Houston. I see you're standing right outside an emergency room. Well, Allison, right now there is a medical task force here on the ground in Houston. It was sent from the Department of Defense, that team of around 85 clinicians and support staff. And they are speaking with hospital administrators about where those resources are going to be deployed in this region and how they can actually help support these hospitals as the cases and the hospitalizations here continue to spike. And we just learned, just received a release from Governor Abbott's office announcing that additional Department of Defense resources are going to be coming to Texas. Four more of these task force teams are going to be deployed to various areas throughout the state. We haven't learned which ones yet, but that is really the case on the ground here in Texas. And, you know, the mayor of the city of Houston, we've heard him uh, just this weekend really ratcheting up the language calling for a citywide shutdown here. He essentially placed a lot of the blame for what's happening here on the shoulders of the governor, saying that, yes, the state reopened too soon. And while he appreciates the mask order that is now in place, that is simply does not seem to be enough to contain the spread of the virus and what he's seeing. And this comes as just last week, Houston reported a number of days where there were more than a thousand positive cases here. And we are watching very closely. The mayor is going to be de delivering a press conference here in less than an hour to hear what he has to say about the numbers today, Allison. Priscilla, the federal government has extended funding for coronavirus testing sites in both Houston and Dallas. Is that making it any easier for people there to get tested? I know that has been a bit of a difficult thing to do. 
Well, that's an important question, Allison, because what that uh, that extension does is it actually keeps the testing sites that were already here, the federal sites that were already operating here, open. But it doesn't actually add additional testing capacity. So what that means is that the stories that we've been hearing over the past couple of weeks in regards to the long lines and the delays and the results, that's not going to change because there's not actually any extra capacity being added. And, you know, in addition to what we've been hearing just about those long lines, we're also hearing other things that are complicating the situation further. My colleague Morgan Chesky in Dallas this morning reported on a testing site there that was actually broken into and a lot of their equipment and supplies were taken. And so that site was not able to open today. Hundreds of tests that normally would have been administered there not able to be done. And, you know, the other thing here, Houston today has a heat index forecasted at 110 degrees. So we are dealing with some very serious heat here. Oh and we have seen over the past couple of days sites across Texas actually having to close down because it's not safe to have people in those lines and healthcare workers uh, doing those tests, administering those tests in that kind of heat. And, you know, that's something that we're probably going to see continue here as we get into really the, the busy time of hurricane season. And so it remains to be seen what's going to happen with these testing sites and the weather issue that's at play here in Texas. Oh, Priscilla, the challenges that you are dealing with there from the heat to that uh, break in, uh, it's just a lot. Uh, let's talk about the temporary morgues. It is so hard uh, to, to hear that, to say that. Uh, talk to me about what's going on and what it has been like uh, for these hospitals and their staff. Yeah. Well, not only is it hard to hear, but it's a it's a sort of concerning sight to see that those trailers are being brought in uh, to certain hospitals in Houston and throughout the state because uh, some of the smaller facilities are really reaching capacity in their morgues. And, you know, that is something that we saw in New York City whenever there was a hot spot there. And, you know, for the most part, Texas has been praised for keeping the death rate fairly low. But we have seen those numbers tick up recently. Last week was the deadliest yet with a number of days with record breaking um, fatalities uh, related to COVID-19. And, you know, doctors that I spoke with here told me that, yes, as the cases tick up, it is very likely that the deaths will also tick up. Take a listen to what one doctor told me. We all knew in the scientific community that the deaths lag behind the cases. The, uh, there's usually a two, three week delay. And I, we, I, you know, we kept on saying the deaths are going to come. It's just a matter of time. And, and in fact, that's what we're seeing now. So the point is, everything about this tragic epidemic right now we're facing in Texas and Houston was both predicted and predictable. And, you know, Governor Abbott, for his part, has signaled that he does expect things to get worse. There is a delay in those deaths. And so the spikes that we saw last week and the week before, we're still getting a count on the fatalities that will come from that. Um, and so, you know, hospitals are preparing in the event that they do need that extra space, Allison. Priscilla Thompson, uh, it is a tough job. It is difficult to stand out there and report on things like temporary morgues, especially in 110 degree heat. Can't thank you enough for all of your hard work. Thank you, Allison. Wichita, Kansas, becoming a new coronavirus hotspot. Health officials say hospitals there are packed, they are short on PPE, and there are problems with contact tracing. NBC News correspondent Cal Perry joining me now from Wichita. And Cal, walk me through this spike. How did Wichita get here? Yeah, so we can actually identify exactly how we got here. Take a look at the chart going back to April. From April to May, the curve was flat. From May to June, we actually saw cases drop in the state of Kansas. It's June into mid-June when we see that curve heading the wrong way. Now, on May 22nd, the state legislator actually passed a law that the governor had to veto. She gave up some powers, specifically the power to open up things as she wanted. That control then went to the local counties. Many of them opened up right away. It was a very sort of ugly political moment here in Kansas, a political battle, a partisan battle. Uh, it has led many people to say that that was one of the problems, that now Kansas is opening up too fast. As you said, there's a major problem now with the tracing of the virus. Part of this is the testing. The testing here is now in a major delay. It takes six to eight days to get your test result, which makes it very, very difficult to track the disease. On top of that, as you said, 
Hospitals filling up. If you have coronavirus and you go to a hospital here in Kansas, you will likely now have to wait in the emergency room before you can be transferred up to the COVID unit. Basically, a bed has to open up on top of that to make matters worse. The ICUs are also oh, filling up, Allison. So definitely a dangerous situation here uh, in Wichita. Cal, it sure sounds like it. What are health officials saying? What are they advising people? Uh, what do you do in a situation like that? Well, masks. Masks is sort of the first step there. And to yeah. sort of give you an idea of how difficult the political situation is in the county, on the county level, they passed a mask ordinance that is unenforceable. It's written into the law that it's unenforceable. No penalties if you don't wear your mask. So the city passed their own legislation making masks mandatory, especially indoors. It has created confusion. Take a listen to what one local council member told me. It's been confusing for a lot of folks, and that's been part of the issue is folks think that it's not serious. Then you have other folks who see that there is a mandate, but then they see there's not a mandate. And then we do pass a mandate. It just goes back and forth. And honestly, it's politics. And that's the sad thing. You know, public health shouldn't be a partisan issue. It's not red or blue. It's how do we keep you alive? Now, the major hospitals here work regionally. They take patients from the region. One place they're taking patients from is Tulsa. We've seen an influx in the virus from Tulsa. Many people believe that was because of the president's rally three weeks ago. As I said, the hospitals are getting full. And what you heard there from Priscilla is likely going to happen here. We're likely going to see some outdoor tented areas to try to treat people if the trend continues, Allison. Cal, it's incredible what the, the councilman said there. It is not red or blue. It is how do we keep you alive? Yet somehow we just keep going in circles around this one. Uh, I know the coronavirus, we have talked about this. It's hitting black communities across the country, especially hard. But what are some of the particular challenges for the black community there in, in Wichita? You know, a lot of it is access to health care. A lot of it is a trust issue. And talking to community leaders, there's just a lack of trust between the authorities and the communities here. There's, of course, the issue of underlining conditions. You have that a lot more in these communities. It's really about reaching out to the community, doing so on the ground. And it's about testing. One local group here has tested 3,000 people in just 20 events using a mobile testing center. That has made a big difference. But when you talk to folks, They'll tell you beyond the testing, it's about that wraparound care. Once you find out that you've tested positive, how do you quarantine away from your family? How do you keep your job? How do you take care of your kids? How do you get the kids to school? All of these are questions that people are trying to answer locally and do so getting into the community. You add to that, again, access to health care. Very difficult, especially when the hospitals are full. But some good news here is that the testing is increasing. The number of people getting tested is increasing. It seems as though they've passed that threshold of trust. The initial trust issue, believe it or not, Allison, was here in Wichita. Many people believed that you could actually uh, you know, contract the coronavirus through the test. So you saw people going out and trying to educate folks on uh, how that's not true, okay. trying to get them tested and to keep those tests confidential, Allison. Very important. Cal, glad to hear at least they're making some progress on that front. Cal Perry in Wichita, Kansas. Thank you so much. Hospitalizations and ICU capacity hitting record highs in California, making it tougher than ever to care for patients there. Dr. Alex Akeem joins me now. He's an ICU doctor at the Providence Little Company of Mary Medical Center in Torrance, California. Uh, Dr. Hakeem, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Uh, what is your ICU like right now? It's very hit or miss. I have a lot of colleagues and we are constantly communicating with each other. There are certain areas that are really near max capacity and, and certain areas that were hit hard during the first wave that are relatively spared. So I think we do have the inter-transferability to contain this second wave, but uh, it is, as you said, it can get very dicey and we need to get the message out as early as possible. How are the cases, and I guess I should ask, are the cases that you're seeing now different from what you were seeing back in April? Uh, and what are some of your biggest problems at the hospital right now? Yeah, that's one of the most interesting questions going on because uh, the first wave, we had some sporadic community transfer between people that wasn't as particularly deadly. One of the points of emphasis I wanted to make is uh, we had nursing homes, we had prisons, we had people in lockdown spreading it amongst their own relatives. And those tend to be the higher, higher viral load transfer. Those are the ones that really scare me. It's why, uh, you know, there are some realists that say, well, it's, the virus is going to get out there, but it's really about the amount of virus that's transferred between people. It's the, it's the 
degree of transfer we're talking about in closed spaces. We're talking about oftentimes you could trace the spread of virus in people's homes, in bars, in closed areas. That's why the mask for me is a no-brainer. That's why the six-foot distance as much as possible and outdoor yeah. events as much as possible is a no-brainer. What kinds of treatments have been working for your patients and has that evolved uh, over time? Are you, are you doing different things that perhaps you weren't doing back in, say, March, April, May? Yeah, uh, we ha have seen a uh, ubiquitous treatment with steroids, uh, resisting intubation as much as possible. Mm -hmm. They're antivirals, anti-IL-6, which are immune modulating drugs. Uh, we're even starting to be, even though we're ICU doctors, we have to be researchers. We have to put on a different hat and engage mm -hmm. with drug companies about novel treatment therapies. And that's been an exciting uh, change that has been taking place over the last few weeks. Dr. Hakeem, what advice do you have for people right now, both in California and, and just across the country? What can they do to help stop this virus from spreading? What would you advise them? Yeah, there's uh, an issue that I don't really see being expressed out there, and I alluded to it, to it earlier. If you talk to these patients who are in the ICU, so let's say that 7% of the population is carrying this virus right now based on our testing. Uh, it's ubiquitous in some sense. If you're out in public, there's a very good chance that somebody uh, in a, in a large, large group is going to be carrying that virus. And you have five days of pretty much no symptoms. Uh, but it's the people that you get really close to. And oftentimes, they're the people that you care the most about. There are people in your own home. There are uh, close family members. And it's very hard. You know, this is a disease that really preys on our affection for each other. Uh, and it's that uh, a degree of transfer between close people, uh, uh, people who really know each other that can sometimes do the most deadly. And those are the sad stories that I hear from families right now. That, that is really heartbreaking. I know so many of us have said, uh, you know, I wish I could hug you. I wish I could come uh, close to you, to the people that we love. Uh, an important reminder from you that we, we still need to keep some distance uh, and need to think about that. Dr. Hakeem, I can't thank you enough for your time. I know you are so busy. We really appreciate it. Appreciate it. President Trump going against top health experts again today on Twitter, retweeting conservative game show host Chuck Woolery, accusing the CDC and doctors of lying about the coronavirus, saying it's all an effort to obstruct his reelection. And it's not just the president. His administration is also trying to discredit top health officials like Dr. Fauci. And I respect Dr. Fauci a lot, but Dr. Fauci is not 100 percent right, and he also doesn't necessarily, and he admits that, have the whole national interest in mind. He looks at it from a very narrow public health point of view. Admiral Zwa, I think, hit the nail on the head on this yesterday. He was making the point that Dr. Fauci represents one viewpoint in the administration, and he looks at things from a, a public health standpoint. So Dr. Fauci is one member of a team, but rest assured, his viewpoint is represented, and the information gets to the president. Um, through the task force. Shannon, Kaylee McEnany is saying that Dr. Fauci's views do get to the president, but one White House official told NBC News, quote, several White House officials are concerned about the number of times Dr. Fauci has been wrong on things and gave NBC News a list. What is on that list? Well, it was nearly a dozen statements that the official claimed were made by Dr. Fauci and proved to be erroneous. Now, some of those were taken out of context and didn't show the full context of what Dr. Fauci was trying to say. Uh, but that was over the weekend. The White House, uh, as you could see in those clips that you showed there, Allison, um, you know, raising questions about you know, Fauci's accuracy, putting out this memo to reporters, a sort of opposition style uh, re uh, research memo, the type of thing you would see a political campaign put out on their opponent. Uh, today, they seem to backwalk that a little bit. And President Trump was asked just a few minutes ago what he thinks of Dr. Fauci. And here's his response to that. Well, I have a very good relationship with Dr. Fauci. I've had for a long time, right from the beginning. I find him to be a very nice person. I don't always agree with him. And shortly before that, Kaylee McEnany was asked a similar question about the relationship with Fauci. Uh, he denied that there was any effort by the White House to discredit Fauci, despite this memo that the White House was giving out to reporters of times they say he has uh, been wrong at 
going to happen. So pushing back on that some, but still not an incredibly strong defense, Dr. Fauci coming to the White House. The bottom line is what they say is that he is one voice among many. Of course, he is the leader uh, in the administration uh, in the country for infectious disease. He's head of the National Allergy and Infectious Disease. So while he is one voice, he is essentially the country's top infectious disease doctor as we are dealing with a major infectious disease. Yeah, for sure. Uh, has that top voice, Dr. Fauci, uh, responded to this? Have we heard anything from him about this? He has not. Uh, there is an event he is speaking at later today that will be webcast. He has not been one of the voices out there on TV. Uh, we have heard from Dr. Burks. We have heard from the Surgeon General, um, Admiral Giroir, uh, was you, you just played a clip of a moment ago. The White House has intentionally been trying to put out some of the medical experts to talk about the coronavirus, and rather than White House officials to uh, you know try and depoliticize the issue and get more medical expert voices out there. Dr. Fauci has not been one of those so far. A uh, White House official told me a couple weeks ago that they were anticipating putting him out on TV more. But so far, he has just been doing a lot of, um, you know, online webcast events, uh, you know, speaking to a group of doctors, medical events. Um, they're watched very closely by reporters. So oftentimes the thing he thinks he says there are picked up by the wider press. But he has not been making the Sunday show rounds like many other people in the administration have. Shannon, the president today also retweeted uh, this message saying there is overwhelming evidence that schools should open this fall. Uh, meanwhile, we're getting mixed messages from his administration. Take a look. Well, we know that children get the, the virus at a far lower rate than any other part of the population. And again, there is there is no nothing in the data that would suggest that kids being back in school is, uh, is dangerous to them. We need to get the virus under control. Uh, when we get the virus more under control, then we can really think about how we put children back in the classroom. The government still hasn't provided a reopening plan. Do we have any idea when that might be coming and what might be in it? Well, we don't really have any specifics on either of those fronts, which, of course, to schools who are trying right now to plan for what's going to happen in the next month or so, uh, that is certainly a, a point of frustration. The uh, administration was planning to put out uh, some guidelines, then it appeared that they were walking that back because they don't want to be too restrictive to individual schools in certain areas. And, of course, states have a lot of control about how schools are run, uh, as, in addition to, to communities and counties. Um, and and, you know, at the local level. So, you know, the administration is still sort of struggling with this. They obviously want schools to reopen, but they have not given that clear guidance as to how they are going to reopen. Uh, and even many states and localities haven't been able to give their schools uh, that guidance yet. So, so many school districts right now are, are essentially trying to figure this out on their own. Shannon, the president hosted a roundtable today with people positively impacted by law enforcement. What do we know about that event? Well, this continues to be the president's uh, messaging as a strong uh, law and order president, uh, pushing back against the protests we have seen around this country. At least that's the aim, is to have this counter messaging uh, to the uh, protests following the death of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement. This is clearly something signaling to his base uh, that he is firmly behind law enforcement. Uh, and, you know, this was a, a rather unique event of having. Uh, victims of crime and law enforcement officials uh, giving the uh, message that police are important. So to counter that defund the police uh, message, which he thinks is going to be key to uh, his reelection. Of course, you know, this issue, this broader issue of coronavirus, we are talking about uh, the president, you know, doesn't have anything scheduled today, specifically talking about coronavirus. Um, and we haven't heard much from him on that other than a few remarks now. And of course, that tweet, that retweet you mentioned earlier, raising questions about what type of evidence is out there uh, around coronavirus. Oh, but Shannon, it is only Monday. We have so much more ahead, I'm sure. Uh, Shannon Petty Peace, thank you so much for getting us caught up on what's going on in the White at the White House today. Thank you.
You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Among the chaos that I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. It's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. When you need brutal honesty. This isn't about Donald Trump. This is about 400 years of racism. When you need answers first thing in the morning. What needs to be done to make ballots ready to go for the presidential election in November? When you need to go deep inside the story. What's a policy change in policing that you would like to see enacted? And hear from someone who's been there. Who's telling the truth and who's lying every day. That's the news story Americans want to hear. You need your morning Joe only on MSNBC. We'd like to think that we live in some sort of post-racial America. We're reminded time and time again that we do not. Now I reached out to you after I watched the mayor of Atlanta act as a mom trying to raise her son. And I think about you and your kids. I remember her coming home saying, why don't I have a ponytail like the white girls? It's okay to notice that you're different. You just have to not feel less than. That's my thing. I cherish the fact that we can have these discussions. I feel safe talking about this with you guys. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. But we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. A virus that knows no borders. A real catastrophe happening here in Brazil before our very eyes. Our global fight against it unites us. Here in Mexico City, the people I spoke to said if they don't work, they're not going to be able to feed their families. Our NBC News and Sky teams are on the ground learning from where it's been. The South Korean government is bringing students back over the next couple of weeks in stages. So that you can better understand how it will impact us here. Life across Italy is back to normal. It just doesn't look like the same normal as before. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. These are the United States, a united people with a united purpose. The future doesn't belong to the faint-hearted. It belongs to the brave. A great people has been moved to defend a great nation. All of us can extend a hand to those in need. What do you think needs to be fixed and what would count as justice in this case? Do you have clarity on what the president has actually ordered? I have to ask whether the Democratic Party can turn this around so that this is an engine for progressive political change. People are not six feet apart from one another for the most part. Are you worried that these two crises may dovetail in terms of the risk of transmission at these ongoing protests? It's one of the biggest questions of the summer. Is it safe for kids to go back to the classroom? NBC News medical correspondent Dr. John Torres got answers from doctors across the country. As schools struggle with reopening safely, NBC News reached out to five top pediatricians across the country, a random sampling of doctors to find out just how dangerous the coronavirus is for kids. Our experts agree most children don't get as sick as adults and that serious complications are rare. This has been a strange pandemic because usually for respiratory viruses, children are the first and the most substantially affected. And this has really been a flip of that, where it's our adults and particularly our older adults that have been more affected. In fact, kids only account for 2% of all cases. Doctors say they don't expect that number to significantly increase when schools open because kids don't appear to be good at spreading the virus. Are kids as good at transmitting the virus as adults? The data that's come out now um, seems to show that most transmissions occur from adults to adults or adults to children. The younger you are, probably the less likely you are to be able to transmit the disease. While many teachers are concerned about reopening school so soon, the five doctors we spoke to agreed. The benefits of being in the classroom far outweigh the risk of disease. But the key is to reopen safely. We are 
uh, not seeing transmissions when we're following some simple guidelines. I think each school system is going to have to come up with their own guidelines because you can't just say that one city is just like the next. All agree guidelines should include rules for social distancing. Keep desks three to six feet apart and make sure desks aren't facing each other. Schools may want to consider holding gym classes outside. In your perfect world of sending kids back to school, what would you like seeing set up in those school systems? They should try to um, increase the airflow in the classrooms, um, try to distance as much as possible. I have been doing a lot of um, research looking into face masks. I don't think they're um, necessarily useful in elementary school children. They do um, provide protection, I think, for high school students. Would you let your kids go back to school? I will. My kids are looking forward to it. Yes. Period. Absolutely. Absolutely. As much as I can. <laughs> Without a hesitation. Without a hesitation, yes. I have no concerns about sending my child to school in the fall. I would let my kids go back to school. Dr. John Torres, NBC News. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo out with some new guidelines today to help decide whether schools will reopen in the fall. He says students will only be allowed back in parts of the state with an infection rate under 5 percent. There is a state formula that will determine if it is safe to reopen schools. OK, so open schools or not, there's a state formula that determines it. There are then state guidelines as to as to how that school reopens. NBC News correspondent Kathy Park is outside a public school in New York City. Kathy, tell us more about this state formula. Well, Allison, schools will be able to reopen if the region is in phase four. And the daily infection rate is uh, under 5% over a 14-day period. And ultimately, Governor Cuomo will make the call if schools will be reopening uh, this fall. And he said he'll be making that announcement the first week of August. Now, if for some reason there is a spike in cases um, and the infection rate is above 9% when the, the time frame comes to that August uh, date, August 1st, then he said he will have to hit the emergency button again and close schools once again. Allison? Yeah, Kathy, it sounds like then if a school meets the requirement but cases surge afterwards, that's a recipe for a shutdown again? Correct. And right now, things are still kind of in the, the planning phase right now. So a lot of these school districts behind the scenes are coming up with these reopening plans here in New York City. Specifically, um, Mayor Bill de Blasio and the school's chancellor last week announced those guidelines. And essentially, it will be a blended learning model. So it'll be a combination of in-person learning as well as remote learning. So essentially, kids will be in the classroom two to three times per week. However, families do have the option of all remote learning, and then they'll be able to opt into that blended learning environment um, at different points throughout the year. Kathy, do we know anything more about the restrictions for schools once they're allowed to reopen some of the, the rules, whether uh, on, on testing temperature checks, any things like that, or these are all things that are still in the works? Yeah, definitely. Those things are still in the works. They do have um, a deadline. Um, Governor Cuomo said that these school districts will have to come up with these plans and submit them by the end of the month. And then August 1st or that first week of August is when he'll make an announcement about whether schools can reopen. Kathy, I know you've been talking to parents in the community. What are they telling you? How do they feel about all of this? Well, Allison, they definitely have mixed feelings about this. Obviously, they want their kids back in a school environment because of that valuable interaction with teachers as well as fellow students. But they also worry about their children's health and the safety of the classroom. Right now, parents are juggling not only their own work, but schoolwork and then also troubleshooting any sort of glitch that they have to deal with as these students are in front of a computer for hours on end. We had a chance to talk to one mom who shared a little bit more about the challenges that are happening inside her own household. It's not easy because the parents have all the work. 
you know, and it's really hard on the parents. So I think they should just like work it out the best way that they can. Because you have to submit the work at a time frame, and some parents are not home. They're depending on relatives to help to sign in. And it's not easy because doing that every morning frustrated other, you know, like I said, my 16-year-old, she have her work cut out and she have to help the other two young ones to sign in, you know, and it's not easy. Certainly isn't easy. A lot of these parents deserve um, a gold star for the amount of work that they are having to do at home. Um, so what might the classroom experience look like come fall here specifically in New York City? So according to Mayor Bill de Blasio and the school chancellor, they will be utilizing larger spaces. So auditoriums and gyms will be used for spreading out those students and offering that in-class experience if, if families move forward and offer uh, that option for their students. Um, there will be cleaning throughout the day, overnight cleaning and hand sanitizers. Obviously, that will be uh, accessible. And then um, leading up to the fall, September, HVAC systems will be getting upgrades to improve the airflow inside these buildings, Allison. Kathy, you said it, a gold star, uh, if not 10, for all of those parents out there trying to yeah. juggle schoolwork and their own work and keeping their families healthy and safe. I know it's been a super stressful time for all of them, uh, especially as they don't know what's going on with their kids this fall. Yep, a lot of questions um, on so many levels, and they are having to deal with a lot. They've had to step into the role of teacher pretty much overnight, Allison. A gold star for those parents, you said it. Kathy Park, thank you so much. You got it. Belgium joining other European nations reopening their schools this fall. NBC News global correspondent Tessa Arcilia is in Brussels to show us how they plan to do it. Well, Allison, school's out right now. It is quiet in front of this primary school, but Belgium is gearing up for the new school year in September. And what they have in place is a color-coded traffic light system. So green being the best case scenario and red the worst. So the plan right now is to reopen under the yellow color, which means that the virus is still present, but that the number of new infections is relatively low. I spoke to the Flemish uh, education minister, and he said that early on, they looked to Denmark as an example, one of the first ones to partially reopen schools and they saw that there wasn't really a significant impact on the number of new infections, so it gave them a point of reference. But he did say that the decision process was a difficult one because it was about striking a balance between several important factors. Take a listen. You have to make a choice between the, uh, the societal costs, for example, of the closure of schools, the cost for, for children, for your uh, education system, and on the other hand, the safety and it's a balance and sometimes you have to choose you you have to choose for the uh, for the education for the kids and for their well-being and that might have an impact on the safety well most of europe will be reopening their schools in september albeit with strict hygiene guidelines and varying levels of social distancing rules in place italy for example one of the hardest hit countries in europe will be pumping in some one billion dollars into their education system they plan to do that and plan to hire 50,000 teachers to manage smaller socially distanced classes well it seems like come september schools like this one will be bustling again but covid 19 will be very much part of that new reality what if we missed a significant number of coronavirus cases, especially early on? Medical experts around the country are reviewing autopsies to see if they can find cases that were overlooked. NBC News investigative reporter Emmanuel Saliba spoke with the doctors leading this search, and she joins us now. Uh, Emmanuel, tell us more about this. What are they finding? Well, Allison, for some of the medical experts that we spoke to, they're still sort of at the beginning stages of their investigation. Um, as you mentioned, they okay. have to go through autopsy files. So they've looked at, um, they're pulling up hundreds, if not thousands of cases, going through them and identifying those who, d who displayed symptoms of COVID-19. After that, they will start testing either blood samples or tissue samples. Um, but the reason they're doing 
this is to try and understand how early the virus landed in the U.S. and how prevalent the virus was in their own communities, but also across the United States. We spoke to a team in uh, New York at NYU's Langone Medical Center, and um, the, the pathologist there really insisted that he's convinced the virus was here before uh, the first officially declared case on March 1st wow. in New York. And um, that's why he's doing that, that work. He's uh, identified 150 cases that they're going to start testing now. And that could potentially change our timeline and our understanding of, of when the virus arrived in the United States. Yeah, I was going to ask if, in fact, that is true, if his hunch is correct, uh, what does that tell us about the coronavirus? And then what can they do with that kind of information? Um, as I said, it could potentially change uh, our timeline and, and uh, our current yeah. chronology of how we understand the virus right now. Um, for uh, Dr. Schnudel, uh, the pathologist at NYU, he thinks that gaining a better understanding of that early spread that potentially was a silent spread could help us better prepare for mm -hmm. the future. He's seeing that um, what New York experienced being replicated across different states right now, and that's why he's racing to find these earliest cases. Um, for an other pathologist, for a medical examiner in Ohio that we spoke to, he oversaw the investigation in, in one of Ohio's, um, the second largest uh, rate of infection. And for him, these types of offices, medical examiner's offices, really have the opportunity to catch a population that perhaps have been ignored. Because they investigate violent deaths, um, suicide, accidental deaths, they're catching people who perhaps didn't get tested for the coronavirus because they weren't displaying symptoms or maybe they couldn't afford to get tested. And that could potentially give local and national governments information on which communities they need to focus on. Emmanuel, it is such fascinating research. Uh, I I'm wondering, is the current surge of coronavirus cases, the spike that you mentioned, is that having an impact on the research that they're trying to do in any way? Absolutely, Allison. Um, my colleague, I did this okay. work with my colleague, Lisa Cavazzuti, and she focused largely on California. And um, many of the core, uh, they're actually the only state that uh, have issued an official directive to all medical examiners to start retesting cases all the way back to December 2019. But a lot of them are just dealing with the day to day. The spokesperson for Imperial County, for example, um, one of the hardest hit counties right now, says it's just not possible to do this. This type of backtracking while they're dealing with this resurgence. So hopefully in the future, it's something they can look at doing. But right now, um, they need time. They also need funding and they need staffing. Yeah. Oh, Emmanuel Felipe, thank you so much for your reporting. It is so interesting. I'm so curious to see what they find. Thank you. Me too. Thanks, Allison. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. It is said there's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. Perhaps the time has come to fully realize the dream upon which this great country was founded. Equal justice under the law. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Well, we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Introducing Peacock. What's Peacock? This is Peacock. Let's go! It's streaming, launching, Woo! premiering. It's TV, yeah. movies, <laughs> exclusive originals, original characters. Duh. It's sports. Breaking news. Socks. Tunes. Wait, there's more. More? Yes, yes, more, more. Tons. It's quick stuff. Binge stuff. Tough stuff. Love stuff. It's trending. Mind bending. It's late night. Early morning. Good morning. It's you see this? You remember that? You watched every single one of those? 
It's for you. For ew. For aw. It's Chrisley, Pawnee, Monkey, E.T. Oh, and it's free. 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 Who's with me? That's Peacock. That's who. Me? That's what. That's why. Come on. Boom. Mic drop. You can't not watch. We like to think that we live in some sort of post-racial America, we are reminded time and time again that we do not. Now I reached out to you after I watched the mayor of Atlanta act as a mom trying to raise her son. And I think about you and your kids. I remember her coming home saying, why don't I have a ponytail like the white girls? It's okay to notice that you're different. You just have to not feel less than. That's my thing. I cherish the fact that we can have these discussions. I feel safe talking about this with you guys. Today, a federal judge in Washington, D.C., declined to rule on whether detained migrant families should be released with their children. Yesterday, lawyers representing detained families filed a complaint with the Department of Homeland Security, alleging that ICE denied them proper medical care, especially during the coronavirus pandemic. NBC News Justice correspondent Julia Ainsley joins me now. And Julia, what does this mean for the detained migrant families? Well, it means another day of not knowing what their future looks like and if they'll be waking up with each other, with parents and children in the same place come Friday. So Friday is the deadline that a judge in California put in place for the day that ICE needs to release children from these detention facilities. But that judge doesn't have jurisdiction over the parents. The judge that does is Judge Boesberg here in D.C. And just an hour ago, Allison, less than that, he said he will not be ruling today, not before that Friday deadline to say that the parents have to be released as well. In fact, he said he needs until the middle of next week. And it seemed that he may go in the direction of ruling that some should be released for those medical conditions that we detailed in our reporting, but not a wide scale release like the lawyers for these families are asking for, saying that they need to be released together. Now, I just got off the phone with a lawyer who represents families in Dilly. That's a South Texas residential center for families. And she said that you would think that a lot of parents would say, no, if I'm given the choice, I want to stay with my child. But she says that if they are given the choice, and they may not, some of these parents that she's talking to now are so desperate, they may choose to release their child because they think that they're saving their life as the cases of COVID continue oh. to rise inside ICE facilities. Oh, Julia, those poor parents. Uh, we have heard uh, some horror stories uh, about the conditions in detention facilities. How are lawyers describing those conditions right now? Well, we're hearing lots of things from across many of these ICE detention facilities, and especially in the family detention centers. The rates are lower than we've seen in other facilities like we've seen in Arizona, like you and I were talking about last week. But we know of at least 35 cases in one facility. And like I said, those families in Dilly, there aren't positive cases now, but they said that they were all asked to self-test and they weren't given a real test that would determine whether or not they had COVID. So they're getting really afraid. The rates are rising in those regions. And as you know, staff, people come in and out of these buildings. So they're afraid. And they're also saying that they're not getting the medical care that they need, even for other conditions apart from COVID, that they're not being cared yeah. for for things like heart murmurs for their children, hypertension, um, breast cancer in one case. One woman had a tumor on the back of her head and no one would tell her whether or not it was malignant. I mean, these are some basic things that these people aren't getting the care for. So the lawyers are arguing that how could they possibly care for this family, especially the vulnerable population of these young children if they can't attend to those other medical needs, let alone during a pandemic. Julia, the Trump administration pushing back against releasing detained families because of the coronavirus. On what grounds? What are they saying? Well, they're saying that the, it's just as risky for these families to be outside in the world like you and me, Allison, because of the rates of COVID-19 in America, then they could have the exact same chance inside ICE facilities. They say if the judge is going to rule on anything, he should make these policies like PPE and social distancing more stringent inside the facilities, change the conditions there rather than ordering widespread release. They say this is a matter of determining law and order. Now, one thing the government, though, might be afraid of losing is having precedent over how 
judges can determine who gets released from ICE custody. We know it's a huge priority of President Trump's not to release immigrants. He vowed to end catch and release. But in the Bozberg case, that D.C. case I was just talking about, he's really only able to rule on the parents currently in detention. So even if he rules that those are released, that doesn't have the long-term president. It doesn't uh, go to any other members except for people, the adults and the parents who are currently in detention now. Julia Ainsley, uh, it's a story we've talked with you about so many times before. Uh, you, your heart just breaks for those families, uh, and they still don't have answers. Uh, thank you so much for your latest reporting. Thank you. You could call it monkey business. In Thailand, monkeys are a big tourist attraction and moneymaker. So how has the coronavirus impacted that? NBC's foreign correspondent Janice Mackey Freyer reports from the Lopburi province. In an ancient Thailand town, a tale of modern-day survival, of monkeys who roam among temples and shops, and locals who, for the most part, let them. These freewheeling macaque monkeys are a big attraction in Lapuri. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tourists come to feed them bananas and snap selfies. The local economy relies on it. And for a long time, generations even, this human monkey coexistence kind of worked for the town until the tourists stopped coming. This is what it looks like when gangs of monkeys go hungry. They're brawling over literally one scrap of food. This video went viral when it was filmed in March as an example of how the coronavirus has messed with everything. Without tourists coming to Lopburi to feed them, there hasn't been nearly enough food lying around for the mobs of monkeys to eat. For months, Thailand's borders have been closed because of the pandemic, and nobody's sure when that's going to change. During COVID-19, there are no people visiting, says this fruit vendor near the main temple. The monkeys all sat with me here, waiting for people. When the people didn't come, the monkeys started scrounging for anything. Now desperate and supercharged on junk food, they're literally overtaking the town. They steal, terrorize. They're loud and they fight. They're considered aggressive to begin with. And worse, locals say the monkeys are putting all that sugar energy into their sex lives. So the monkeys keep multiplying. So humans are trying to take back control. Snacks help. But more importantly, the authorities launched a sterilization campaign where they scoop up male and female monkeys, humanely knock them out, and then do the procedure. 300 now and another 200 in August to try to get the population under control. They're also doing a monkey census to keep track of the numbers. This sort of sterilization drive actually happens pretty regularly. It has to. The last one was three years ago, and the monkey numbers have since doubled. Dr. Supakarn Kachwat is the veterinarian overseeing it. Sterilization is the urgent solution for now, she says. I think if we don't do anything, it may become animal cruelty later for the monkeys that may get hurt by the fighting. The sterilized monkeys are released back to the streets the next day. Lopburi isn't locked down anymore. And the restrictions to keep coronavirus cases under control are easing. Tourism isn't exactly bouncing back, though. Patapan Patawong has always lived here and spends a lot of his income to feed the monkeys. There's kind of no choice, he says. And his wife likes them. She gives them names like Jude and Crooked Tail. If you learn to love them, then you're happy, he says. If you think they're troublemakers, you'll be stressed out living here. Ultimately, the problem is the lack of a real habitat. So the bigger plan for authorities is to create a monkey sanctuary somewhere down the road. That will ease the threat for people in town, and the monkeys can still get their bananas when the tourists come back.
everyone. I'm Allison Morris. You're watching NBC News Now. It is Monday, of course. Let's go to NBC News correspondent Savannah Sellers. She's got all the latest Monday headlines for us from NBCNews.com. I just keep saying Monday over and over again. Can you tell I'm having a little bit of an issue with it? <laughs> Yeah, I know. I'm sorry. And every time I arrive, you have to say what day it is again. And I feel bad because I'm like, oh, great. Here I am to kick off the week. We've got a long way to go to the weekend. <laughs> but thanks, Allison. And let's dive right in uh, with yet another update on the coronavirus. A CNBC analysis published today found that more than a third of U.S. states are reaching record highs of new COVID-19 cases. This, of course, includes those hotspots like Georgia, Texas and Florida, where more new cases were reported than any other state in the country. The nation's top infectious disease expert, Dr. Anthony Fauci, of course, gave his take on this staggering surge earlier today. We did not shut down entirely. And that's the reason why when we went up, we started to come down and then we plateaued at a level that was really quite high, about 20,000 infections a day. Then as we started to reopen, we're seeing the surges that we're seeing today as we speak. Now, over the last few weeks, we've seen a handful of states roll back reopening plans to combat this uptick in cases. That includes California, where I am. This afternoon, Governor Gavin Newsom announced indoor activities at bars, restaurants, and movie theaters must close across the state starting today. He also suspended indoor operations for gyms, salons, and places of worship for 30 counties with virus spikes. We're moving back into a modification mode of our original stay-at-home order, not on open economy or off shut down, but a dimmer switch looking at conditions throughout the nation's most populous state as they present themselves, as those trend lines become points of concern. And while this pandemic challenges reopening plans, it continues to hold college students in academic limbo, particularly international students. The Trump administration recently announced that foreign students cannot stay in the U.S. if their college goes fully online this fall. But today, 17 states and Washington, D.C. filed a lawsuit against this rule, calling it, quote, cruel, abrupt and unlawful. California filed a similar suit last week, along with Harvard and MIT. So we'll be monitoring what comes of those cases. Meanwhile, NBA star Russell Westbrook says he's tested positive for the coronavirus. In an Instagram post, the Rockets player said he got his results before his team left for Walt Disney World, where the NBA is planning to press restart on the season in that little bubble altogether. He also encouraged his followers to, quote, take this virus seriously and mask up. And lastly, some heartbreaking news about YouTuber Nicole Thea. The 24-year-old social media star was about eight months pregnant and documenting her journey on her channel, but her family announced she passed away over the weekend. They didn't mention how she died, but asked for privacy during this extraordinarily difficult time. And those are the latest headlines for you today, Allison. And I will actually see you again tomorrow. I'm so excited about that, Savannah. Even when the news is a little bit heavy, I'm always glad to hear you're coming back on Tuesday. Thank you so much. Thank you. ICUs in Arizona are so overwhelmed with patients that one emergency room in Phoenix is treating people in the hallways while refrigerated units are being brought in as makeshift morgues. NBC News reporter Vaughn Hillier joins me now from Phoenix. Uh, Vaughn, I know these refrigerated un units are just a precaution right now, but what are health officials saying about how just how packed these has hospitals are? It's actually this hospital here right behind us, one of the several Abrazo Hospital Health Centers here in the Valley that has ordered those uh, backup refrigerated uh, storage units because the state has enacted its emergency plans and encouraged these hospitals to take those necessary precautions. And I got to tell you, right now, they have not had to use any of those refrigerated units at this point. But just earlier this afternoon, Allison, I was talking with a nurse who works inside this very facility, and I'm just going to let you, read you a little bit of what she told me. She said, quote, they're not stuffed well today or any days. It's not safe in there. The ICUs are supposed to be two to one. That's two nurses to one patient. They've been putting up those nurses to three to one in the name of the pandemic. They're running out of staff. Staff is also getting sick. They never staff to allow for sickness. 
we were not prepared. And she wanted this message to get out to the state and others around the country saying, quote, whether people are afraid of the virus or not, think of the pressure and the sacrifices that staff in the care provided to those inside here at facilities like here in the heart of Phoenix. Today, yet again, broken ICU bed capacity, a record here in the state, as well as the number of ventilators in use. You know, there are some indicators that suggest that uh, here in Arizona, it's beginning to perhaps level off a little. The, I, the percent positive rate has gone down a little bit. But at the same time, we should note that percent positivity rate that is coming back is still over 20 percent, Allison. That is double what Florida is. Despite Florida's record numbers, the percent positive number here is still double what Florida is here in the state of Arizona, Allison. Vaughn, that is not good news. Uh, I know Arizona mayors want more statewide restrictions from the governor. You spoke to one of them. What did she tell you? Yeah, that mayor that I spoke to was Ana Tovar of Tolleson, which is a community on the outskirts here of Phoenix, about 20 minutes west of downtown, heavily Latino population. She is one of the mayors that has been an outspoken critic of this governor, but also written the letter urging a statewide mask mandate, but also about the giving the localities, these local governments, the authority to shut down specific businesses, because by and large, businesses operating as usual from restaurants to retail. And I should know, you know, it's 111 today. It was 117 degrees yesterday. At the same time, these mayors are seeing in their communities the spread of COVID. Why? Not necessarily because folks are going out to their local amusement park, like maybe you see in Florida, but because businesses are still operating the meatpacking plant is still open in the city of Tolleson. I want to let you hear directly from Mayor Tovar. I think she outlines what their situation is quite well. My community is about 88 percent Latino. And the vast majority of my community does not have the luxury of working from home. They are at the front lines here in Arizona. They are providing food. They're at our hospitals. They are risking their lives day in and day out so that people in our economy can move forward. But yet we're leaving them behind when it comes to the most crucial component, and that's testing. And test results, if you do get one, Allison, are still coming back. Most oftentimes, not in under a week, Allison. Yeah, that's what we're hearing. That's unbelievable. Vaughn Hilliard uh, in Arizona, thank you so much. Thanks, my friend. Florida reporting more than 12,000 new coronavirus cases today. Yesterday, the state reported more cases than any other state ever, 15,000 plus. NBC News correspondent Kerry Sanders is in Miami Gardens, where people waited in line for hours to get tested. Allison, some more disturbing numbers on the positive tests here in the state of Florida. Now on this most recent numbers, 12,624. That follows the record of 15,300 positive tests. Not only a record for the state of Florida, but really for the country, even exceeding when the epicenter was in New York for single day tests. It points out the problem and perhaps another way to look at it is if Florida were its own country, it would be number four in positive tests. That would be after the entire United States, Brazil and India. So when you look at it that way, you can realize that the problem in Florida is only getting worse. All of this coming at the same time that there is continued pressure to reopen schools. Now remember, in Florida, unlike other parts of the country, schools open in August. They don't wait until Labor Day here. And the cost of opening schools, well, that's a whole other part of this when you consider that you have to buy masks, you have to get hand sanitizers, you have to hire staff to continue with the cleaning and the wipe downs. It is a very complicated and indeed an expensive operation. Okay, it seems to me that there's a wake up call here. If schools are going to open, is there a cost associated with this? And I guess most importantly, have you been able to calculate what this is going to cost in dollars and cents? Teachers want schools to reopen. We know what has happened in terms of our students. But at the same time, we know it's going to cost about 20 percent more for next year um, to, to deal with and address the 
public health tools that need to be embedded into schools, like physical distancing, like masks and other PPE. And over my shoulder, you can see the cars that have lined up. People who began showing up here shortly after midnight to get their coronavirus test. The problem is that many people at testing sites around Florida have reported that it takes upwards of eight plus days to get the results. So if they have coronavirus but don't know it, get tested, go home, and then don't self-isolate, but rather are out in the public they may actually be spreading it unknowingly to other people. Allison? The coronavirus pandemic making Dallas-Fort Worth the busiest airport in the world. Travel at DFW basically cut in half, but that is still more passenger traffic than any other airport. MSNBC correspondent Garrett Haight takes us to Texas. Bouncing back from a low of about 200 flights a day to now roughly 700 flights a day has been enough to make DFW Airport the busiest in the world, at least for now. At DFW Airport's Terminal D, this is what recovery looks like. 90% of the airport's gates are open and half of its restaurants, a major turnaround from April's emptiness during widespread pandemic shutdowns. Typically, we would serve about 200,000 customers a day at DFW. In early April, we were serving 10,000. It's a ghost town. It was a ghost town. And today, we will serve about 125,000. Passenger traffic at DFW isn't growing, still down by nearly half. But by shrinking far less than other hubs worldwide, the sprawling Texas airport is now the world's busiest, climbing past Chicago's O'Hare and Atlanta's Hartsfield-Jackson, with more than 20,000 flights scheduled for this month. Airport CEO Sean Donahue credits the controversial decision by Dallas-based American Airlines to add back more flights and to fill every available seat on them, including middle seats. And because we are their largest hub, we are clearly benefiting from that. And the other aspect of that is 60% uh, of our customers never arrive or leave the airport. They connect into the airport. And that's driving a lot of the passenger traffic. Industry analysts see the pandemic forcing a change in how we fly, with airlines moving away from the direct long-haul flights booked by business travelers and towards more connections, benefiting hubs in central locations. Airlines are, are having a, a, a knife fight on a life raft. I mean, the, the, the state of the airline industry right now is, is brutal and has never been in a situation like this. For the industry to recover, passengers have to feel safe in the skies and at the airport. DFW has deployed a 150-person sanitation strike team cleaning constantly and installed more than 300 hand sanitizing stations. Masks are mandatory. There is a social benefit of travel. People like to connect with each other. It is going to come back. It has to come back. Industry analysts compare this moment in the airline industry to 9-11. They say the only way the industry will fully recover is if people are fully confident to fly again and that may take the development and widespread usage of a vaccine. At one point, more than 90% of the coronavirus patients at Houston Memorial Medical Center were African-American and Hispanic. Sky News correspondent Alex Crawford went inside the hospital to get a better look at the two pandemics in America, racism and COVID-19. Less than a week after we were last here, and the COVID situation's a lot worse. The medics are working 20-hour days. As fast as they're expanding, their beds are being filled. That has happened. Since the last time you came, you know, I had to open a brand new unit, which is next door, another 35 beds, just because this is totally packed. And the doctors have noticed a worrying trend. Many of the patients are people of color, specifically African-Americans. This is my home right now. Yeah. Latanya Robinson's a nurse but was working from home. She thinks she caught it from her son, who wasn't badly affected. It is serious. It's not a hoax. It's not, it doesn't have just one person name on it. You know, it's, it's like a, a green slime floating in the air and it could drop on anyone at any time. 
Despite making up only 23% of Houston's population, the latest figures show African Americans account for around 66% of COVID deaths. Jeffrey L. Boney beat the odds after nine days in ICU. People are just trying to figure it out as they go. He insists America needs to face ugly truths. For some reason, there are two serious pandemics that have plagued African Americans. One has been here since its inception, and that's racism. And uh, and the other is is COVID-19. Uh, those two are, are vicious, um, you know, pandemics that are impacting the lives. Uh, and the quality of life of African Americans in this country. The suffering by some is evident on every street corner in parts of Houston. People struggling to survive and just get by. The coronavirus has smashed the economy and those already at the bottom of the pile are the worst hit. But to many here, racism has had a far more devastating effect on their lives than the pandemic. We need change in the system. We need change in the system. That's all we're asking for. We're not asking. We're not asking for handouts. We're not asking for sympathy. We just want to be equal. For these guys, coronavirus is just one of many challenges. But that's why black people is is, is less moved by the sh because, bro. And I ain't just talking about black people as a whole. I'm talking about the slums, people in in poverty, people going through. We got other that we wrestling with every day. His brother, RJ Maybach, turned to boxing to pull himself out of poverty and keep himself out of trouble to the immense pride of his elder yeah, sibling. A lot, man. It's my baby brother. I think he's going to be the champ. This club was set up to help disadvantaged youngsters. Climb your chin, no. Climb your chin. Coronavirus hasn't closed it, nor has anyone been here. You know what I'm saying? So if you're here, you can't be out committing no crime or doing something to got no business or even out in harm's way, you know what I'm saying? The pandemic's brought hardship on millions of families. The lines of people needing food parcels include many African Americans, and now it's RJ's turn to help. I come from, you know, bottom, so I know how it is. I wish I had somebody like me, you know, growing up. This is the town where George Floyd grew up and where there are constant reminders of his killing and the protests against racism which followed. Now there's a growing demand for answers about why there are such racial health disparities amidst the coronavirus pandemic. Alex Crawford, Sky News in Houston, Texas. Watching NBC News now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Among the chaos, I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. When you need brutal honesty. This isn't about Donald Trump. This is about 400 years of racism. When you need answers first thing in the morning. What needs to be done to make ballots ready to go for the presidential election in November? When you need to go deep inside the story. What's a policy change in policing that you would like to see enacted? And hear from someone who's been there. Who's telling the truth and who's lying every day. That's the news story Americans want to hear. You need your morning Joe only on MSNBC. We'd like to think that we live in some sort of post-racial America. We're reminded time and time again that we do not. Now I reached out to you after I watched the mayor of Atlanta act as a mom trying to raise her son. And I think about you and your kids. I remember her coming home saying, why don't I have a ponytail like the white girls? It's okay to notice that you're different. You just have to not feel less than. That's my thing. I cherish the fact that we can have these discussions. I feel safe talking about this with you guys. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. We actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. 
a virus that knows no borders. A real catastrophe happening here in Brazil before our very eyes. Our global fight against it unites us. Here in Mexico City, the people I spoke to said if they don't work, they're not going to be able to feed their families. Our NBC News and Sky teams are on the ground learning from where it's been. The South Korean government is bringing students back over the next couple of weeks in stages. So that you can better understand how it will impact us here. Life across Italy is back to normal. It just doesn't look like the same normal as before. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. These are the United States, a united people with a united purpose. The future doesn't belong to the faint-hearted. It belongs to the brave. A great people has been moved to defend a great nation. All of us can extend a hand to those in need. What do you think needs to be fixed and what would count as justice in this case? Do you have clarity on what the president has actually ordered? I have to ask whether the Democratic Party can turn this around so that this is an engine for progressive political change. People are not six feet apart from one another for the most part. Are you worried that these two crises may dovetail in terms of the risk of transmission at these ongoing protests? And about face in California, Governor Gavin Newsom rolling back some reopenings as coronavirus cases there surge, ordering gyms, salons, churches and other indoor activities to close. NBC News correspondent Aaron McLaughlin joins me now from Los Angeles. And Aaron, uh, walk us through what's changing, what businesses are affected, uh, what's going on here? Hey, Allison. Well, Governor Gavin Newsom once again taking drastic action in the face of this pandemic, ordering certain businesses closed across some uh, 30 counties here in California, representing a majority of the state population. Those businesses ranging from gyms as well as houses of worship, hair salons as well, ordered closed across those 30 counties. He also took a further step for the whole of the state, closing indoor dining at restaurants as well as bars, pointing to some really disturbing statistics, the growing hospitalization numbers here in the state, some 6,485 hospitalized, and a positivity rate of 7.7 percent. That is a seven-day rolling average, and that is a climbing number. Clearly, authorities here are struggling to get the situation under control, now having to take drastic action that is really potentially devastating news for some of these businesses. It's devastating to have to shut down once, but to do it, have to do it twice, especially after having to invest to try and keep themselves open, to adjust to a new normal, the social distancing precautions and other regulations that, put, that the state has put into place to require some of these businesses to lose that investment. You know, speaking to business owners here, it, it is a devastating blow. Yeah, Aaron, you mentioned the numbers, uh, numbers that have just shot up over the last few weeks. Uh, how are people there reacting to the news? You know, people here are upset on the one hand. You know, I was speaking uh, just a short while ago to a hairstylist here in L.A. County, and he was really upset. He was saying, look, we were doing everything right. We were taking temperature checks. We were wearing masks. We were social distancing inside the salon. And now to hear that they have to shut down all over again, he was questioning why. But other people that are closely following the story understand that drastic action uh, was necessary and needed time after time, week after week. We have been warned here in California by uh, the governor of the state as well as the mayor of Los Angeles pleading with people to avoid gathering, to social distance, to wear masks, and clearly indicated in these numbers, people are not heeding that advice, according to experts, and now authorities having to take further drastic action. Erin, California also announced that students in Los Angeles and San Diego will not go back to campus this fall. They'll continue with classes online only. Uh, what prompted that decision? And is there any indication that school could reopen later in the year or, or are they not getting ahead of themselves just yet? 
Yeah, well, they're not supplying a timeline at this point here in Los Angeles, which is the second largest school dist district in the country, comprising some 700,000 students. The superintendent today saying that school will not be starting in person on August 18th. They will be happening instead online. Officials now scrambling to organize that to make that happen. He said he wanted to give parents some five weeks notice to start preparing for that eventuality, but he refused to give a timeline. But he said the numbers were not looking good. He was pointing to the positivity rate in, in L.A. County alone being 10 percent. He said there was not enough research about the impact of COVID-19 on children, and he didn't want his schools within L.A. County to become, in his words, a human petri dish. So taking this drastic action, but he also said he was not taking it lightly. This was a very difficult decision, especially when you consider, and he pointed the, the, st the statistic himself in the announcement that of the 700,000 children here in Los Angeles, 80% of those children, students, live in poverty. And according to surveys, 50% have seen at least one parent out of work due to the pandemic. You know, the schools here in Los Angeles County for so many families are an absolute lifeline. So to have to take that decision to delay the reopening of schools indefinitely at this point, because again, we don't have a timeline, it is a really drastic step right. for them to take. But uh, the superintendent here in Los Angeles saying he's taking it to protect people from this virus. Erin, just last week, the United Teachers Los Angeles Union recommended keeping campuses closed. Is there a push for other school districts in the state to close as well? Well, you know, th th that teachers union, which is the largest teachers union here in the state of California, representing thousands of teachers, certainly was a factor in the closure, I would have to say, of uh, the L.A. Unified School District. It seems that that would be likely uh, to be the case that the teachers don't feel safe and don't want to go back to school. How do you have school? So it seems that this perhaps will be a domino effect. Uh, for the rest of the state, just as yeah. the initial closure of schools was a domino effect. I remember I was in San Francisco at the beginning of the pandemic. A San Francisco Unified School District closed down and L.A. followed shortly thereafter. But again, we haven't heard any announcements from that school district or other school districts here in the state. All right. Some big changes in California, Aaron. Thanks so much for walking us through them. The Fairfax County, Virginia School District laying out its fall reopening plans and parents can choose how their kids are taught. NBC News political reporter Ali Vitale joins me now from Virginia. Ali, what options do parents have in Fairfax? Allison, right now it breaks down along two avenues for learning come this fall and parents have to make this decision by Wednesday. That's a deadline actually that got pushed from, early, from late last week into this week after so many questions about this process started happening from both local officials and teachers and students here, as well as the parents who are actually making the decision. The two avenues are as follows. One is a hybrid model. Two days a week, the kids would be physically in schools like the one behind me, Annandale High School. And then the rest of the week, they would be doing independent study, online learning. Then the other option is being online for classes four days a week, but no in-class option for those students. And quite frankly, those are options that have downsides and pros to each of the people who are considering them. And as we've been out here talking to people today, it's clear that a lot of people feel like there is no perfect option in this new normal of how you get back to education and learning in the midst of a pandemic. Allie, what are the teachers saying? Are they on board with this plan or do they have concerns? I think that there are concerns coming from everywhere. Even just today, I heard from a few teachers. One of them came with the several students that I spoke with this morning about how they were feeling about this. That teacher was saying she didn't think she would be back in the classroom. And then another teacher who came up, saw that we were live here, wanted to talk about his experience. He said he was a substitute teacher in the region and that he said that he wasn't going to be willing to go back because he didn't feel safe. And that's going to end up being an important piece of the puzzle here, because as parents are making this decision, it's also up to teachers to decide what they feel comfortable with. So as students are deciding whether they're going to be back in the classroom or not, they're also not sure what teachers are going to be back in the classroom. 
or if they're going to be teaching online. So it leaves a lot up in the air, namely where the teachers feel comfortable, what courses those teachers are going to be teaching and how. And then of course, the whole concept of grading. If you've got two avenues of students, some of them coming in person, some of them learning only online, there are a lot of questions about how you make sure that grading is fair across the board too. So again, there are these options and the school board and other officials are trying to work through what works here. But at the same time, you've heard a lot of criticism from the upper echelons of the Trump administration, namely Betsy DeVos, but not a lot of offers of solutions in that vein. All right, Allie, you mentioned you saw some students there today. What are the kids saying? What are they telling you? Look, Allison, this is a confusing time for a lot of the kids. And while it's the parents who are making the decision, I spoke today with three rising seniors who are all grappling with the reality that their senior year is probably not going to look like the senior year that they imagined for all of their childhoods. And so yeah. when I spoke with them, we had three very different decisions for what their falls were going to look like. I want to play for you now some of the sound that they told me and why some of them are deciding they're going to go back into the classroom. Others are deciding they're going to stay home. Listen. Me and my parents, we decided that I would stay home and I would do full time online. Um, because we were concerned about safety, especially because I have a younger sibling at home uh, and my grandparents occasionally visit, so we wanted to make sure that they weren't um, exposed to the virus in any way possible. When I first heard the news that there were going to be two options, I, my instant reaction was, I'm going to school. Um, but then I started attending all these, every single town hall that was presented to me, I started talking to teachers and I just realized that for um, my health, my well-being, as uh, well as my family's health and well-being, that I need to be staying home in the fall. So you're opting to be in class then. Is there any concern that you have about that decision? Oh, I have a, a lot of concerns because I feel like with both plans that like Fairfax County has put out, there's still a lot of like uncertainty in the air. A lot of uncertainty in the air. That seems to be the mood here on the ground and then also across the country as all of these different school districts try to figure out what's best for them. And I will say, for the kids that I spoke to today, they kind of had a heads up that this is what their senior year was going to look like, that it was going to be disrupted in some way because they saw what the senior class this year went through with virtual graduations and all of these different things being changed to make way for being safe in the pandemic. They knew that it was going to mean that their senior year look different, but that still doesn't change the fact that they're frustrated, they're sad, and they're anxious about this new reality. And I will say it was really just touching today because those two girls who we spoke to, they're really good friends in real life. When they saw each other and they showed up in this parking lot for the interview, one of their moms was with them and she said, it's just so nice to see them together in person because all I do is see them together over video chat. And so it just sort of hammers home again. This is all about connection and feeling connected to our friends friends and our classmates and for these students that's something that they're really giving up as they make this decision to stay home they're doing it with health in mind but at the same time they do realize that yeah. senior year just doesn't look like what you and I experienced Allison no not at all Allie and, and you said it I mean you bump into someone if you're out or or you actually have contact with a with a friend and it is like the yeah. greatest thing because we're all just talking to each other the way I'm talking to you or or over zoom and we're just not around each other that much anymore and it's rough yeah, it's really rough. It was so nice to see them get back together today to give them an excuse, even from a socially distanced parking lot outside their high school yeah. to get back in touch and to see each other in person. That's awesome. Way to bring them together, Allie. It was great to see you. And again, I hope I see you in person soon, too. That would be nice. <laughs> Florida Governor Ron DeSantis says schools will reopen for in-person learning next month, but the superintendent of Miami-Dade Public Schools says that could be difficult if cases in Florida keep rising. Uh, we are currently surveying parents specific to each one of our 400-plus schools right. based on today's conditions. If the conditions are on August 24th what they are today, where Miami-Dade is the center of Florida's epicenter, and Florida is the epicenter of our nation, then it would be very difficult for us to mandate the opening of schools district-wide. 
Dr. Benjamin Linus joins me now. He's an associate professor at Boston University School of Medicine and Public Health. Dr. Linus, thank you so much for being with us. What are your concerns about schools reopening, particularly in hot spots like Florida? Well, I think this question of schools reopening is a challenging one everywhere, and it really needs to be a local decision, state by state, and even district by district. Um, you know, there's examples around the world of schools reopening in the COVID epidemic and not having huge school-based outbreaks. But I must say that in pretty much all of those settings, they had some control over the epidemic before they opened the schools. It's not that they had no transmission, but they weren't in the middle of surge. I, th I, th I agree. I think it's very difficult to open a school if you're in the middle of a surge situation and to have your schools be the potentially only thing that's open in your society, to me, seems backward. So how do we prevent the spread of coronavirus in the classroom? What kinds of things would you like to see or think that we need to be thinking about as classes are able to resume? So I think it is possible to stop the spread of coronavirus in classrooms. And as I mentioned, there's data from around the world to give some hope that if you're not in the midst of peak surge, it is possible to open schools and not to have school-based break out, uh, school -based outbreaks, even if there is transmission going on in your community. It's not magical thinking. Everyone has heard these messages before. It's things like um, masks, social distancing, uh, affecting space a bit to try to make it possible for people to keep, you know, to keep apart, cohorting of students so you don't have everybody mixing, and instead you have, you know, sort of pods such that if there's one infection, it might be contained within that smaller group of children and not moved, moving around the school. Uh, I think it's important to be thinking about ventilation where possible. Um, and with those things in place, I think it is possible for teachers and students to be safe. But again, so much depends on community spread. You know, we've spent some time opening restaurants and bars in a lot of states. And because of that, I think we have a lot of community spread in places like Texas, Florida, Arizona, and now California. Uh, and that is threatening our ability to reopen our schools. So I hope other states can see that and perhaps change priorities, that if we really want to get our kids back to school in the fall, which I think is the right priority, we need to be thinking about what we're not doing in other settings so that we can prioritize school safety. Absolutely. Uh, here's a question for you from one of our viewers. A lot of students rely on buses to get to school. Are school buses safe and, and how do you keep kids socially distanced on the bus? Yeah, the bus is very challenging. I'm on a school opening committee, and we've been discussing this as well. Um, you know, there are things to do. It, it's Again, it's masks and distance and ventilation. It's easy to imagine things like opening windows, especially if you're in a warm climate. That might be a good solution. I think it could be hard. I'm in Massachusetts. Let's be honest. It's going to be hard to have the windows open in December. Um, so I, I think um, districts need to think about their busing routes and how many kids are going to be on the bus and trying to limit the numbers to make some social distancing possible. But it's really a thorny situation because, um, you know, there's so much disparity to be introduced there. I think that, you know, kids who are busing to school are often coming from communities of color, and those are the kids who are going to suffer the most by not being at school in many cases. But at the same time, those are the people who might be exposed to more risk by being on buses. And so it's really a challenging situation. Um, buses are one of the spots that we have to think carefully about. Yeah. I have another viewer question for you. This one is about children potentially spreading the virus to siblings or younger family mm -hmm. members, uh, very young mm -hmm. family members. One viewer asks, mm -hmm. what is the coronavirus threat for babies under a year old? How worried do you need to be there? Right. So I'm not a pediatrician, and I would refer to you a pediatrician for expert advice. I can say that uh, children in general have actually more mild um, COVID infection than adults. And it actually is um, sort of what a physician would call a dose effect, that as, right, like five-year-olds have more mild disease than 10-year-olds who have more mild disease than 16-year-olds. Now, if you're an infant under three months of age, that's a different situation. Any infection in the infant of that age is a very serious situation. Uh, but, you know, for a one-year-old, actually, there's reason to, to think that actually it seems counterintuitive, but that actually might be the person in the house who's the least likely to have severe coronavirus. Uh, you know, and as everybody knows, it's people who are older and have comorbidities that are at the greatest risk. So, and the other thing I would mention is that in studies around the world, actually we've not seen a lot of in-house transmission from children to children or from children to adults. Most of, this, most of the transmission that's happening in households is coming from adults who are exposed in the community and then they're passing it on to household members like their kids. Um, so I think that's really the major risk, more than child-to-child -child transmission. Dr. Linus, thank you so much for taking uh, the time to be with us today. Your expertise is invaluable. We really appreciate it. That's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. 
The UK announcing a controversial back to school plan. Students will be required to attend in person classes in the fall, and parents who refuse could be fined. NBC News senior international correspondent Keir Simmons reports. Well, here in the UK, some years of schooling have restarted, but mostly most children won't go back until September. So like so many folks there uh, in the US, I've been home educating my kids for months now. Just like there, there have been very heated arguments between teachers and parents and the government because, of course, schools aren't just a place for children to be educated. They're also a workplace uh, for teachers. But now all children will return to school in September. In fact, if parents don't send their children back uh, to school, then they could be subjected to fines. There will be all of the precautions that you'd expect, plenty of hand washing, uh, the children will be put in bubbles to try and separate classes, and even the dynamics of the schools uh, will be be changed to try and separate students. There will not be mandatory wearing of masks in schools. It's worth pointing out uh, that this decision can be made because the infection rate now in the UK is relatively low and that if that changes, if for example there is a second wave, then of course the government's calculation would have to change again. A huge day for high school seniors in China. Some of them missed months of school, but they are still taking the national college exam, a test they've spent years preparing for that could affect their lives for years to come. NBC's foreign correspondent Janice Mackey Frere is in China to show us what that day was like. And so ends what was arguably the strangest of school years. Around the world, distance learning became the new reality. Even graduations were done online. And schools that did reopen faced a whole new set of rules and challenges. Here in China, when the government decided to allow kids back into classrooms, there were social distancing measures like mandatory masks and separated desks, temperature checks and eating lunch and shifts. And not everybody returned at once or even made it back. It was a phased approach. Different grades went at different times, weeks apart. A big factor pushing education officials were the high school seniors having to write the National College Entrance Exam. It's called the Gao Kao. It's what guides every Chinese student through their entire school life. It's famous in that daunting, big pressure way. Think about it. These students spend years preparing for this one exam because the Gao Kao determines everything, which university you can go to, what you can study, basically charts the future. There was the extraordinary added pressure this year of schools closing down for the pandemic. The Gao Kao was delayed by a month, and when school Schools finally did reopen, these students were the first to go back. It's a huge deal for parents, too. They wait nervously outside the schools where students are writing the exam to give them flowers and reassurance. The students had missed over three months of school, but Stephen Leo figures it went okay. I just think it is a it is a regular test in my in my in my in my in my, in my high school life, yeah. but I'm now really really tired. That the Gao Kao even went ahead was a sign that maybe education could get back on track here. Schools were first ordered to close back in January, so many students haven't been inside a classroom for six months. And in Beijing, schools were closed again with that outbreak of cases at the wholesale food market in mid-June, just days before the last phase of kids in grades 1 through 3 were supposed to go back. Now, it's unclear whether the new school year will start on time, if it will be online or in person or a mix of both. International schools are also still trying to get teachers back, who've been stuck outside of China since the borders closed late March. Much of it is going to depend on the numbers. Take Hong Kong, for example. It had cases under control, so schools reopened at the end of May. Now there's another surge in cases, enough that officials are calling it a third wave. There are no confirmed infections at schools, but officials say they want to keep it that way. So schools there are closed again, a sort of cautionary tale for the rest of the world trying to find the way forward. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 
starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. It is said there's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. Perhaps the time has come to fully realize the dream upon which this great country was founded. Equal justice under the law. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. We actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Introducing Peacock. What's Peacock? This is Peacock. Let's go! It's streaming, launching, premiering. It's TV, movies, exclusive originals, original characters. Duh. It's sports. Breaking news. Socks. Tunes. Wait, there's more. More? Yes, yes, more, more. Tons. It's quick stuff, binge stuff, tough stuff, love stuff. It's trending, mind bending. It's late night, early morning. Good morning. It's you see this? You remember that? You watched every single one of those? It's for you, for ew, for aw. It's Chrisley, Pawnee, Monkey, E.T., O, oh, no. and it's free. Free, 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 free. Who's with me? That's Peacock. Yes, sir. That's who. Free? That's what. That's why. Come on. Boom. Mic drop. You can't not watch. We'd like to think that we live in some sort of post-racial America, we are reminded time and time again that we do not. Now I reached out to you after I watched the mayor of Atlanta act as a mom trying to raise her son, and I think about you and your kids. I remember her coming home saying, why don't I have a ponytail like the white girls? It's okay to notice that you're different. You just have to not feel less than. That's my thing. I cherish the fact that we can have these discussions. I feel safe talking about this with you guys. A judge blocked the federal death penalty today just hours before an inmate was set to be executed. It would have been the first federal execution in 17 years. NBC News justice correspondent Pete Williams joins me now. Pete, the judge blocked three executions scheduled this week and one for August. Could you tell us about our decision? Right. So this is a federal district court judge in Washington ruling in a case brought by the death penalty inmates themselves, the ones on death row who were scheduled for execution and the judge said the method that the government has proposed to use, a single drug called pentobarbital, which is a powerful barbiturate, uh, she believes there is evidence indicating that it can cause needless pain and suffering, that it causes a sensation of drowning and asphyxiation, and that therefore it, its use would be unconstitutional. So she has ordered the government to stop these executions that were planned. Now, the first one was planned for today in Indiana at the Federal Lethal Injection Chamber at 4 o'clock. Obviously, we're past that now, but there is still back and forth. The Justice Department has filed an emergency appeal with a federal appeals court saying, no, the judge is wrong. We should go ahead with this. Uh, so, you know, we're going to have to see what happens with, when these, with these court rulings that come out. Mm -hmm. But the, the, it used to be that there was a three-drug sequence, the three-chemical sequence, that uh, most states and the federal government used. And two things happened. One is the manufacturers of some of these drugs stopped making them available to carry out executions. And two, there were court challenges to them. So in response to that, that's why the government has gone to this single drug protocol. The attorney general last summer said we're going to resume executions and there were immediate court challenges and they continue right up until the time of the planned executions. Uh, Pete, you gave us some of the history here. Can you remind us, take us back a little bit, why we haven't seen a federal execution in nearly two decades, how it stopped? Yeah, there, there, there's there, been a series of lawsuits and a lot of rethinking about this. You know, this original three-drug sequence was actually conceived of by a pathologist in Oklahoma. He was the one who came up with this. Uh, and over the years, there's been a number of court challenges to it. Now, the Supreme Court has said, Obviously, because it's in the Constitution, there is nothing inherently unconstitutional about the death penalty. And it said, when you want to challenge a method of execution, you have to say that it, that you can't just say that it's painful because obviously it's, it's killing somebody. But you have to say that, that, that it's beyond just the, that kind of a normal, what you would expect in, in, in execution, that it's somehow way beyond that. And you have to propose something that is a less painful or more humane, if you will, alternative. Now, the 
the uh, inmates who are challenging this right now and have succeeded in getting a court ruling today say they've met the first standard, the judge agrees with them on that, and they say a less painful means of execution would actually be the firing squad. Now, that may sound strange, but if you think about it, it's the only form of execution for which people are trained. No, nobody gets training in the Bureau of Prisons. No doctors participate in this lethal injection uh, sequence protocol. But obviously, there are people in the government and the military who are trained how to shoot and kill people. The last uh, executions by firing squad were 10 years ago in Utah. But three, Utah and two other states do allow it, although it hasn't happened in recent years. So, you know, whether the... Whether the uh, whether the opponents of the death penalty have offered this as a sort of impossible standard for the government to meet, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But in any event, it's all tied up in court now. So, Pete, now that the Justice Department has filed an appeal here, uh, what's next? What can we expect here? Well, the government has asked everybody to get their legal briefs in by 7 o'clock Eastern Time Monday. Uh, and then the appeals court will okay. decide. At the same time, the government has simultaneously filed an appeal in the U.S. Supreme Court saying, hey, we wouldn't ordinarily do that, but time is of the essence here. So everybody's working against this deadline, this 4 o'clock deadline, which has come and passed. Now, obviously, there's two other executions scheduled later this week, one Wednesday, one Friday. So we'll see what happens to this first that was scheduled and what happens to them. But it's all in the hands of the appeals courts right now. All right, Pete Williams, no doubt we'll be talking to you about this one again. Thank you so much. You bet. The Washington Redskins dropping its controversial name and logo. The team made that announcement today. The name long criticized as offensive to Native Americans. Now the franchise is working on a new name and logo. NBC News business and technology correspondent Joe Lynn Kent joining me now. And Joe, tell us more about today's announcement and how we got here. Yeah, Allison, it is a long time in the making, and Native American movement leaders who've been working on this for decades have told me in interviews that they believe that the R word is the N word equivalent, and they have been seeing today's change and this announcement as a victory. But for so long, they didn't think it would ever be possible, and it's because of Dan Snyder at the Washington NFL team. And this is what he said back in 2001. We're never going to change the name of the Washington Redskins. Uh, and I think from a bottom line perspective, uh, what it means is tradition. What it means is competitiveness. What it means is honor. It is not meant derogatory. And, and I think that to take it that way is, is just to be able to get a podium and, and speak. Now, fast forward from 2001 to 2020 in July, when a lot of the big businesses behind the Washington NFL team began speaking out. You had FedEx, which has the naming rights to the stadium, call for a complete rebranding. Then the merchandise started to disappear from Amazon, Target, Walmart, and Nike. And that put a lot of pressure on the team. And that's what led us to today, when the Washington NFL team says that they are no longer going to be using the mascot or the name. They're going to be rolling that back. But what's interesting here, Allison, is that members of the Native American community have long been trying to have a direct dialogue with NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell and the Washington NFL team. They sent an open letter signed by 1,500 people and organizers in the community, and they tell us they still haven't heard back on that. They just want to be involved in what comes next. Yeah, Joe, how, how are Native Americans reacting? What are they saying? Because you saw the announcement from Washington today, and they said they're working on a new name and logo, but they didn't say that they were working with any Native American groups on that. Yeah, from what we know so far, based off of our interviews over the past week, there has not been much engagement on this front to the disappointment of the Native American movement leaders who've been long campaigning for this. I interviewed several people who are longtime leaders in this space, and they explained to me why this change is absolutely essential and what it does to the community when you see mascots like this, not just the Washington team, proliferate and be used in sports. Listen to this. And the evidence and the science shows that that type of behavior and when our children, our native children, see, like, for example, at the Super Bowl, 
racism on display as, as you know, for the entire world to see as the tomahawk chop is going in the background, right? And you see the fans out, you know, tailgating and red face and dressed up, that that is so deeply harmful to first and foremost, our children. We also still have a lot of work to do. Um, there's other teams that also need to, to, um, to listen and to understand that they need to make changes as well. The other teams that she's referring to there are the Cleveland Major League Baseball team, the Atlanta team as well, and, and, and actually thousands of teams when it comes to pro sports, college sports, yeah. and high school sports. So the hope is that this victory that uh, many describe today will help motivate changes down the line because this is certainly one major headline and one major team, but not the full picture. Yeah, hopefully this is just the start. Joe, you mentioned all of the major companies uh, who pressured Washington, uh, Pepsi, Nike, FedEx, uh, which, of course, you said sponsors the team's stadium. Any reaction from them today? What are they saying about, about the move? Yeah, so it seems pretty quiet so far. What we do know, though, is that there this has come from pressure. And activists and uh, you know movement leaders inside the Native American community tell me that they believe that you know cultural appropriation of Native culture uh, is a billion dollar industry, and that has now started to finally change. And so you can see that this moment that we're in, and we have to remember we're in a moment in the aftermath of George Floyd's death where so many people are calling for, for racial equality, the Native American community says we will not be left behind. That's what they're telling me, and they believe today is one step towards that. Let's hope so. Uh, Joe, always great to see you. Thanks so much for being with us today. Thanks. It started with a few bicyclists trying to protect Black Lives Matter marchers. They have since become an influential group of activists. The street riders organize weekend rides and flood New York's roads demanding change. The founders told NBC News Now why protesting on wheels is so effective. What do we want? When do we want it? Now! What do we want? Justice! When do we want it? Now! We began by actually riding and protecting marchers during different protests. There was no structure or process to protect them from the oncoming traffic and different things that would arise. Many feel that it's a safe entry point into protesting. I never planned on throwing my own protest. My friend got murdered by the police in San Diego when I was like 15. Those cops never got fired or arrested or anything, and people are still getting murdered every day. I felt it was my need to come out and participate. We're at a point where every week we have 50,000 bikes out, so there has to be a lot of growth as far as leadership and organization. It is a, taking an emotional toll on me, just because I have so many other people's hearts involved, but it's worth it. I think one of the main things that happens on a bicycle that doesn't happen when you're marching is the amount of distance you cover. And in the distance that you cover, especially for certain people who stick to very small pockets of the city, you get a landscape of the city. And in that landscape, you see how it's uneven, you see how areas are served and, and underserved. And that might not be as immediately apparent if you're marching, because if you're marching one mile, you might not go through seven different neighborhoods of various kind of classes, races, Etc. Etc. et cetera, whereas on a bicycle, you're probably going to cross it. So our rights, which we call the justice rights, you know, we like to describe them as a moving billboard. And it's a billboard that is amplifying the cause. And the cause is our fight against police violence, a tainted criminal justice system, and systemic racism. We're not just a protest, you know, we don't just say like, meet here, let's protest and go. We train them to be leaders, going to other protests like Occupy and seeing folks who began by volunteering with us, managing brigades of bikes. That's exactly what this is all about. I'm 16. Being part of the Street Riders, it really changes how 
I'm going to be growing up because as a, like a young age, that's where we build our like opinions. So my role is pretty much to get my members to block the traffic. We tell everyone to be respectful because they we're not like fighting the public. Not a protest against the people. Yeah. Protest against the police. So if we if you know that it's a couple cars coming and they got the right of way before we get there, you can let them go. I thought it was important to start doing training because we had a lot of volunteers. We had to make sure we were all on the same page. If somebody falls, you guys wrap around them with your bikes and make sure they don't get trampled on. And I'm not tired. I'm never going to be tired. I was tired of how we were living before. Take these rides not only as an exercise or a way to get out because you've been locked up in quarantine this whole time. Take this time to understand. This is a protest. It's not a party. It's not a joy ride. We're just using the bike as a tool to protest. We're not using the protest as a reason to bike. Hey everyone, I'm Allison Morris. You are watching NBC News Now. And yes, if it feels that way, it is in fact Monday. You are not wrong. Let's go to NBC News correspondent Savannah Sellers. She has the very latest headlines from NBCNews.com. Savannah, what have you got this hour? Hey, Allison, let's dive right in with another update on the coronavirus. A CNBC analysis published today found that more than a third of U.S. states are reaching record highs of new COVID-19 cases. This, of course, includes those hotspots like Georgia, Texas, and Florida, where more new cases were reported than any other state in the country. The nation's top infectious disease expert, who we've now all come to know, Dr. Anthony Fauci, gave his take on this staggering surge earlier today. We did not shut down entirely, and that's the reason why when we went up, we started to come down, and then we plateaued at a level that was really quite high, about 20,000 infections a day. Then as we started to reopen, we're seeing the surges that we're seeing today as we speak. Now, over the last few weeks, we've seen a handful of states start rolling back those reopening plans to combat this uptick in cases we're talking about. That includes California, where I am right now. This afternoon, Governor Gavin Newsom announced indoor activities at bars, restaurants, and movie theaters must close across the state starting today. He also suspended indoor operations for gyms, salons, and places of worship for 30 counties with virus spikes. We're moving back into a modification mode of our original stay-at-home order, not on open economy or off shut down, but a dimmer switch looking at conditions throughout the nation's most populous state as they present themselves, as those trend lines become points of concern. And while this pandemic challenges reopening plans, it continues to hold college students in academic limbo, particularly those international students. Now, the Trump administration recently announced that foreign students cannot stay in the U.S. if their college goes fully online this fall. But today, 17 states and Washington, D.C. filed a lawsuit against this rule, calling it, quote, cruel, abrupt, and unlawful. California filed a similar suit just last week, along with Harvard and MIT, so we'll be monitoring what comes of those cases. Meanwhile, NBA star Russell Westbrook says he's tested positive for the coronavirus. In an Instagram post, the Rockets player said he got his results before his team left for Disney World, where the NBA plans to press restart on the season in that bubble they're creating there. He also encouraged his followers to, quote, take this virus seriously and mask up. And lastly, a tragic update in the search for Glee star Naya Rivera. Today, officials said they believed they recovered the actress's body from California's Lake Piru. Based on the location where the body was found, physical characteristics of the body, clothing found on the body, and the physical condition of the body, as well as the absence of any other persons reported missing in the area, 
we are confident the body we found is that of Naya Rivera. Suspect Rivera, Rivera drowned in the lake last week during a boating trip with her four-year-old son. And just really some upsetting news to end on there, Allison. Oh, it's just awful. But Savannah, thank you so much for bringing us all the headlines. Appreciate it. Hey, everyone, I'm Allison Morris. You're watching NBC News Now. It is Monday once again. Let's go to NBC News correspondent Savannah Sellers. She has all the latest headlines for us from NBCNews.com. Savannah, great to see you. What's going on today? Hi, Allison. Happy Monday. Thanks for having me. And let's start, of course, with an update on the coronavirus. Cases climbed to over the weekend with Florida clocking in more than 15,000 new cases. And that is a scary new record. No other state has reported a single day total that high. And it's making some officials question whether it's safe to reopen schools. Do you believe kids should go back to school in person next month? Well, I, I think they can't uh, go back today, that's for sure. Things would have to improve uh, pretty dramatically over the next six weeks uh, for that to happen. And I think uh, that's our hope. And that's our, uh, you know, in terms of hoping that things improve. Obviously, we're always hoping that things improve. Earlier today, the World Health Organization also cautioned against reopening. Florida set a new record yesterday, reporting more coronavirus cases in one day than any other state ever. 15,299. That easily beats New York during its peak. Meanwhile, Disney World reopened over the weekend, the Magic Kingdom and Animal Kingdom, welcoming visitors for the first time in three months. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock joining me now from Orlando. And Sam, we will get to Disney. But first, what are health officials saying about the numbers in Florida? The state reported more cases than all of Europe combined yesterday. It beat New York's worst day by 3,000 cases. That is just nuts. It's crazy. The numbers on their face boggled the mind. And I think the level of concern right now, Allison, definitely getting dialed up. Governor Ron DeSantis is expected to speak at 5 o'clock this afternoon. He has not talked since that 15,300 number from Sunday. So this is going to be the first time we're getting his initial reaction to record numbers. That being said, Governor DeSantis previously has talked about testing and how that is contributing to the spike here. That would be true in this case. The last two batches of numbers we've gotten from the state, both have been records. 112,000 tests today, 143,000 yesterday, Allison. So that is likely going to be part of the narrative. Other health officials and elected officials, though, talking out right now. Carlos Jimenez, who is the mayor of Miami-Dade County, came out yesterday and basically said, if this continues at this rate, our hospitals are going to be full. The ICU bed capacity right now in Miami-Dade, as of today, just updated, is 97.6 percent. They are teetering toward that brink of maximum capacity. And he said, look, we're going to be running out not just of space, but potentially of staffing as well. Major levels of concern right now. Sam, let's talk about Disney. Uh, was it crowded there this weekend? And what is the park doing to keep visitors and its employees safe? As far as we can tell, Allison, it is not crowded. I say as far as we can tell, the main entrance is over my shoulder right now. Disney has not given us permission to get onto their campus, so we don't know for sure. We do know the videos that we're seeing and anecdotally what we're hearing, which is that they're having reduced capacity right now. There's an online reservation system. They're trying to intentionally cap the number of people that could be in the park at any given point in time for obvious reasons. Then there's the sanitization and what kind of protocols they're putting into place from checking temperatures from everybody that comes inside to making sure that lines, people are separated there and that seats are blocked off. You will not be seeing uh, multiple rows of people together unless they're in the same family. We did talk to a family from Marin County, California, about how they were preparing and what they're seeing once they got inside the park. Here's what they told us. They're doing sanitizing, masks. They have a face shield on the cast members. I mean, it is a very different park than when it was closed down in March. Has that changed your kids' experience at all? Brooke, has it changed your experience? Um, no, not at all. And Allison, it's important to keep in mind, it's important to keep in mind for many of these families, they plan these trips to Disney World months in advance, well before Florida saw this latest spike of cases. So it's a hard position to be putting families in what do I do with my kids? In this case, the Evans said that they felt comfortable, provided they were able to sanitize everything, keep their masks on the entire time, and understand 
it's just going to be a different kind of experience. Sam, they definitely get extra points for matching their masks to their uh, Mickey ears. That's that's uh, that's something you haven't seen before. Uh, let's talk about what happens if Florida keeps seeing more infections. I mean, is there a chance that Disney could shut down again? I think that's a realistic possibility, Allison. There's been no word yet out of yeah. Disney World down here. We do know this. In Hong Kong, where cases have spiked recently, Disneyland in Hong Kong is now going to close on July 15th. They're leaving their resorts open wow. with higher levels of attention toward cleanliness and sanitization. That's what Disney is saying there. But look what's going on. They're closing at, at that Chinese location in, in Hong Kong. It is entirely possible that here in Florida, we could see something similar. But again, we've reached out to Disney to ask about the numbers at the park, criticisms about opening at this point in time. We've heard nothing back. So I cannot tell you authorita authoritatively they are or are not going to do that. But again, they planned all this well before yeah. the most recent spike. Sam, ICU beds are filling up in Florida. What are doctors there saying about that and about Disney reopening while that's going on? So, so that's part of the level of concern as well, which is that across the state, Allison, yeah. they're now at 82% ICU bed capacity. That's not great, but it's not the dire situation that we're seeing in some parts of the state. Orlando area, where I am right now, Orange County, is doing okay, according to the state numbers anyway. Miami, we already talked about. I asked uh, Tallahassee Memorial Healthcare Director, the, the chief medical officer there, what she thinks about this idea of theme parks opening while cases are jumping through the roof. Here's what she had to say. And it does make you cringe in a sense of, if everyone was doing the right thing, wearing their masks and being socially responsible for others, we could probably get around a little bit more and do things. I think, Allison, Dr. Friel's point there is not necessarily that it's wrong to be opening up these businesses, but you can't control what people are going to do. You can only take action for your own agency, your own responsibility, wearing a mask, standing far away from groups of people. But not everybody is approaching it with that level of vigilance. And that is a big reason why we right. find ourselves in the position that we are in right now. Absolutely. Sam Brock in Orlando, outside of Walt Disney World. Thank you so much. <laughs> Exactly right. Thank you, Allison. Coronavirus hospitalizations in Texas hit a new high, and hospitals are now setting up temporary morgues. Texas Governor Greg Abbott warning the situation there could get even worse. NBC News reporter Priscilla Thompson joining us now from Houston. And Priscilla, tell us what's going on there in Houston. I see you're standing right outside an emergency room. Well, Allison, right now there is a medical task force here on the ground in Houston. It was sent from the Department of Defense, that team of around 85 clinicians and support staff. And they are speaking with hospital administrators about where those resources are going to be deployed in this region and how they can actually help support these hospitals as the cases and the hospitalizations here continue to spike. And we just learned, just received a release from Governor Abbott's office announcing that additional Department of Defense resources are going to be coming to Texas. Four more of these task force teams are going to be deployed to various areas throughout the state. We haven't learned which ones yet, but that is really the case on the ground here in Texas. And, you know, the mayor of the city of Houston, we've heard him uh, just this weekend really ratcheting up the language calling for a citywide shutdown here. He essentially placed a lot of the blame for what's happening here on the shoulders of the governor, saying that, yes, the state reopened too soon. And while he appreciates the mask order that is now in place, that is simply does not seem to be enough to contain the spread of the virus and what he's seeing. And this comes as just last week, Houston reported a number of days where there were more than a thousand positive cases here. And we are watching very closely. The mayor is going to be de delivering a press conference here in less than an hour to hear what he has to say about the numbers today, Allison. Priscilla, the federal government has extended funding for coronavirus testing sites in both Houston and Dallas. Is that making it any easier for people there to get tested? I know that has been uh, a bit of a difficult thing to do. Well, that's an important question, Allison, because what that, uh, that extension does is it actually keeps the testing sites that were already here, the federal sites that were already operating here, open. But it doesn't actually add additional 
testing capacity. So what that means is that the stories that we've been hearing over the past couple of weeks in regards to the long lines and the delays and the results, that's not going to change because there's not actually any extra capacity being added. And, you know, in addition to what we've been hearing just about those long lines, we're also hearing other things that are complicating the situation further. My colleague Morgan Chesky in Dallas this morning reported on a testing site there that was actually broken into and a lot of their equipment and supplies were taken. And so that site was not able to open today. Hundreds of tests that normally would have been administered there not able to be done. And, you know, the other thing here, Houston today has a heat index forecasted at 110 degrees. So we are dealing with some very serious heat here. Oh and we have seen over the past couple of days sites across Texas actually having to close down because it's not safe to have people in those lines and healthcare workers uh, doing those tests, administering those tests in that kind of heat. And, you know, that's something that we're probably going to see continue here as we get into really the, the busy time of hurricane season. And so it remains to be seen what's going to happen with these testing sites and the weather issue that's at play here in Texas. Oh, Priscilla, the challenges that you are dealing with there from the heat to that uh, break in, uh, it's just a lot. Uh, let's talk about the temporary morgues. It is so hard uh, to, to hear that, to say that. Uh, talk to me about what's going on and what it has been like uh, for these hospitals and their staff. Yeah. Well, not only is it hard to hear, but it's a it's a sort of concerning sight to see that those trailers are being brought in uh, to certain hospitals in Houston and throughout the state because uh, some of the smaller facilities are really reaching capacity in their morgues. And, you know, that is something that we saw in New York City whenever there was a hot spot there. And, you know, for the most part, Texas has been praised for keeping the death rate fairly low. But we have seen those numbers tick up recently. Last week was the deadliest yet with a number of days with record-breaking um, fatalities uh, related to COVID-19. And, you know, doctors that I spoke with here told me that, yes, as the cases tick up, it is very likely that the deaths will also tick up. Take a listen to what one doctor told me. We all knew in the scientific community that the deaths lag behind the cases. The, uh, there's usually a two, three week delay. And I, we, I, you know, we kept on saying the deaths are going to come. It's just a matter of time. And, and in fact, that's what we're seeing now. So the point is, everything about this tragic epidemic right now we're facing in Texas and Houston was both predicted and predictable. And, you know, Governor Abbott, for his part, has signaled that he does expect things to get worse. There is a delay in those deaths. And so the spikes that we saw last week and the week before, we're still getting a count on the fatalities that will come from that. Um, and so, you know, hospitals are preparing in the event that they do need that extra space, Allison. Priscilla Thompson, uh, it is a tough job. It is difficult to stand out there and report on things like temporary morgues, especially in 110 degree heat. Can't thank you enough for all of your hard work. Thank you, Allison. Wichita, Kansas, becoming a new coronavirus hotspot. Health officials say hospitals there are packed, they are short on PPE, and there are problems with contact tracing. NBC News correspondent Cal Perry joining me now from Wichita. And Cal, walk me through this spike. How did Wichita get here? Yeah, so we can actually identify exactly how we got here. Take a look at the chart going back to April. From April to May, the curve was flattened. From May to June, we actually saw cases drop in the state of Kansas. It's June into mid-June when we see that curve heading the wrong way. Now, on May 22nd, the state legislator actually passed a law that the governor had to veto. She gave up some powers, specifically the power to open up things as she wanted. That control then went to the local counties. Many of them opened up right away. It was a very sort of ugly political moment here in Kansas, a political battle, a partisan battle. Uh, it has led many people to say that that was one of the problems, that now Kansas is opening up too fast. As you said, there's a major problem now with the tracing of the virus. Part of this is the testing. The testing here is now in a major delay. It takes six to eight days to get your test result, which makes it very, very difficult to track the disease. On top of that, as you said, hospitals filling up. If you have coronavirus and you go to a hospital here in Kansas, you will likely now have to wait in the emergency room before you can be transferred up to the COVID unit Basically, a bed has to open up on top of that to make matters worse. The ICUs are also filling yes. up, Allison. So 
definitely a dangerous situation here uh, in Wichita. Cal, it sure sounds like it. What are health officials saying? What are they advising people? Uh, what do you do in a situation like that? Well, masks. Masks is sort of the first step there. And to yeah. sort of give you an idea of how difficult the political situation is in the county, on the county level, they passed a mask ordinance that is unenforceable. It's written into the law that it's unenforceable. No penalties if you don't wear your mask. So the city passed their own legislation making masks mandatory, especially indoors. It has created confusion. Take a listen to what one local council member told me. It's been confusing for a lot of folks, and that's been part of the issue is folks think that it's not serious. Then you have other folks who see that there is a mandate, but then they see there's not a mandate. And then we do pass a mandate. It just goes back and forth. And honestly, it's politics. And that's the sad thing. You know, public health shouldn't be a partisan issue. It's not red or blue. It's how do we keep you alive? Now, the major hospitals here work regionally. They take patients from the region. One place they're taking patients from is Tulsa. We've seen an influx in the virus from Tulsa. Many people believe that was because of the president's rally three weeks ago. As I said, the hospitals are getting full. And what you heard there from Priscilla is likely going to happen here. We're likely going to see some outdoor tented areas to try to treat people if the trend continues, Allison. Cal, it's incredible what the, the councilman said there. It is not red or blue. It is how do we keep you alive? Yet somehow we just keep going in circles around this one. Uh, I know the coronavirus, we have talked about this. It's hitting black communities across the country, especially hard. But what are some of the particular challenges for the black community there in, in Wichita? You know, a lot of it is access to health care. A lot of it is a trust issue. And talking to community leaders, there's just a lack of trust between the authorities and the communities here. There's, of course, the issue of underlining conditions. You have that a lot more in these communities. It's really about reaching out to the community, doing so on the ground, and it's about testing. One local group here has tested 3,000 people in just 20 events using a mobile testing center. That has made a big difference. But when you talk to folks, they'll tell you beyond the testing, it's about that wraparound care. Once you find out that you've tested positive, how do you quarantine away from your family? How do you keep your job? How do you take care of your kids? How do you get the kids to school? All of these are questions that people are trying to answer locally and do so getting into the community. You add to that, again, access to health care, very difficult, especially when the hospitals are full. But some good news here is that the testing is increasing. The number of people getting tested is increasing. It seems as though they've passed that threshold of trust. The initial trust issue, believe it or not, Allison, was here in Wichita. Many people believed that you could actually uh, yeah, contract the coronavirus through the test. So you saw people going out and trying to educate folks on uh, how that's not true, okay. trying to get them tested and to keep those tests confidential, Allison. Very important. Cal, glad to hear at least they're making some progress on that front. Cal Perry in Wichita, Kansas. Thank you so much. Hospitalizations and ICU capacity hitting record highs in California, making it tougher than ever to care for patients there. Dr. Alex Hakeem joins me now. He's an ICU doctor at the Providence Little Company of Mary Medical Center in Torrance, California. Uh, Dr. Hakeem, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Uh, what is your ICU like right now? It's very hit or miss. I have a lot of colleagues and we are constantly communicating with each other. There are certain areas that are really near max capacity and, and certain areas that were hit hard during the first wave that are relatively spared. So I think we do have the inter transferability to contain this second wave, but uh, it is 